It's a beautiful Easter Saturday. Welcome to the morning update for the Rip Curl Pro Pals Beach presented by Bonsoy, Liam O'Brien, Crip and Cola Pinto, Tully Wiley. Everyone checking out the early morning conditions. Hausman putting the fins in the mayhem. Ellie Harrison's profile still building in the women's quarterfinals. Gabriel Medina has Hausman early in the morning and Caroline Marks is getting a lap on the racetrack. She'll have the day off today. The reigning world champ has a good chance to absolutely blow up just like Sammy Pupo did with a big alley-oop this morning. Welcome to a nice, clean, beautiful offshore morning update here at Winky Pop in the state of Victoria in the great country of Australia. Looks like a beautiful day for pro surfing here on Saturday to set up some big heats in the round of 16 for the men. Thanks for being with us, Joe Turpel, with longtime CT standout, <laughs> Richie Lovett. Uh, Richie, it's a great morning. We've had a couple of days off, and it's looking really, really rippable here at Wiki Pump today. Yeah, super rippable conditions, glassy as just a, a perfect little five knot offshore. We've got a little bit of swell in the water too, so it's going to be a fun day of competition. Some of these heats, these matchups are incredible. So. We're in the best seat in the house. Everyone tune in. It's going to be a great day. Let's make it more official as we say good morning to Laura Enover with Renato Hickel. Yes, good morning, everybody. We are back and refreshed after a couple of great days off. Renato, you got some waves yesterday. How good. But uh, today we're on and it's gorgeous. Happy Easter weekend. What's Happy Easter, everyone. We're what, so excited. What's happening? Uh, it's, we woke up to a beautiful morning, really clean, glassy conditions, light offshore winds and as well better than we expected. So we're going to restart the competition with that hit six of the main round of 32. We have a big task ahead of us today. We're going to try to do 19 hits. Only men's today, women are off for the day. 30 minutes hit, the normal hit, and we have this tide running out till 9.30, and we're expecting a push after 9.30 with the incoming tiny conditions getting a bit better, a bit bigger. We're gonna have to deal with onshore winds in the afternoon, but we're gonna have some incredible hits today, no doubt. Amazing. So no overlapping heat for the rest of the round and then setting up for possibly a great finals day tomorrow. It will be a possibility. If we pull it off today, 19 hits, then we both men and women to the quarterfinal round. So it's a possibility to have a big finish on a uh, Sunday, Easter Sunday. It is a big task too because it's a fading swell tomorrow, but we have backup days on a, a remainder of the waiting period if we can do it tomorrow. Amazing. Well, you heard everyone. Buckle up. It's going to be an amazing Easter Saturday here down at Bells Beach. Oh, Winky Pop today. See you guys soon. Thanks so much, Laura and Renato Hickel, telling us a lot of great information, trying to max out the day here on Saturday as the heat's on. It already started. 30-minute heat kicking off with a round of 32. Heat number six, Ramsey Bukayam from Morocco and Liam O'Brien from Burley Heads in Australia. We finished uh, the first five heats of the round a couple of days ago. And we set up some key heats already in the round of 16. Morgan Siblick and Ryan Callanan already meeting in that first matchup for an all Newcastle battle there. And the fans already upstairs on the bluff checking out the opening paddle battle. But an exciting day, Rich, as we break it down a bit. So tides dropping for about another hour. And then yep. the onshores come up. Do you mind an onshore wind at Winky Pop, or do we kind of have to monitor how strong it'll be this afternoon? Uh, I actually don't mind it. You know, it, Winky Pop does handle an onshore, and it does present this little feathery lip where you can just go, okay, it's time to take to the air. Uh, so, uh, even, you know, natural or goofy, then they're, they're really going to be able to lean into that. Uh, it, it, it's a high performance wave down here. You know, there's no doubt about it. Uh, we lose a little bit of that open face carve, um, but it's a tighter radius turn down here at Winky Pop. But uh, this morning, beautiful groom conditions, so I expect to see a lot of face work, uh, some nice clean rail, uh, snaps and carbs. And uh, well, this is a great matchup between the, the goofy footer and then the big uh, natural, f uh, sorry, the goofy footer, Ramsey, and then the, the nice clean natural footer, Liam O'Brien from up there at uh, Burley Heads on the Gold Coast. Ramsey number 52, officially on tour this year after some injuries in the past. The Dramatic one on the opening day of Pipeline when he was officially going to make his start. And, uh, Moroccan fans and just fans of Ramsey, his peers, were heartbroken for him after a decade of trying to qualify. So still celebrating 
this uh, official arrival for Ramsey on the top 34. Yeah, it seems fitting, doesn't it? And uh, only fair that uh, Ramsey gets a good crack at the tour this year. Uh, you know, it was misfortune uh, at its finest. And, uh, well, luckily he gets to uh, go around in 2024. And thank goodness, because he's a real asset to the tour. A big, strong, goofy footer, and uh, he has a lethal backhand attack. So uh, given the right wall this morning, we're going to see him open up. But Liam O'Brien, he can bring something special here too. Liam O'Brien kind of showed the world that he could battle with the world's best fairly easily. His first wild card call up to the big stage was over at Rottnest Island or Wajamup, and he turned that into a semi-final result which was massive, taking down big names from Felipe Toledo in the early rounds, uh, Jeremy Flores in a crazy competitive three-man battle that we'll never forget. Uh, got past Miguel Pupo and made it all the way to the semifinals. It almost looked like he was just born for the tour. Yeah, it, he, he was ready. <laughs> Definitely he was ready. Um, but being a wild card versus being an actual member of the championship tour, I think it's a little different mindset, you know. As a wild card, you're coming in with really no restrictions, no pressure. You can open up. And then once you're actually made the tour and you're an official part of it, then there is this pressure that goes along with it because you don't want to give up. Your, you don't want to relinquish your, your spot on the tour. So, um, you know, there's that extra little pressure. But he seems to be dealing with it okay. He does need some good results, though, coming into uh, these next few events so cool to see the fans down here Saturday morning it's a tradition for Australians to to spend their Easter uh, here at Bells mm -hmm. Beach go on their Easter egg hunts watch their favorites compete if they have any work responsibilities that's all out the window they're here to watch this amazing event in its 61st edition the 50th that Rip Curl has been a part of it yeah, the town filled up pretty quickly yesterday, didn't wow, it? It went sure from did. like, you know, manageable to heaving overnight, which is really special. And uh, even coming down here early, plenty of people on hand to check out the action. And uh, you can see, uh, well, spectators lining the cliffs here at Winky Pop. Been a lot of big heats that have gone down at this venue. You know, we always talk about the Bells Bowl, but Winky Pop's been used for a very long time, including big finals. In the past, remember a Mick Taj final here, uh, John Schmulka, Sonny Garcia yes. was in the past. Uh, so many special memories at this high performance venue. And we noticed on that really solid day that we ran a lot of heats here, it actually turned into a, a solid canvas for the, the backhanders to really take all the wins that they were a part of on that day. Are you expecting the same kind of flow today? Uh, we've broken the sort of goofy versus natural down, and I think just to highlight the key advantage is the the goofy footers can square up a little bit and by that I mean a, a deeper bottom turn and then a really acute angle off the bottom and get up vertical where the natural footers tend to get a, a little bit of a longer arc they a bit more horizontal in the way they surf um, so it'll be interesting to see how they tackle it today that man there put down a couple of lethal uh, airs this morning on that uh, incredible JS board Sammy Pupo looks Looking inspired. Good. He said he wants to go all the way in this event. He's really focusing on the cup. But first thing in the morning, found a nice ramp. And look how casually it looks on that alley of rotation. Yeah, so good, so clean. The landing was absolutely perfect. Straight into the next turn. So uh, as a competitive surfer, Joe, it's always good to have that warm up and, and to actually have a good surf. Because if you come in, you haven't really got a wave, you maybe had a couple of falls, then you're not really going into your heat with a positive mindset. So Sammy looks uh, really uh, well established this morning and, and he'll be uh, looking forward to some heats this afternoon. Sammy Pupo got past Leo Firavanti as we will now see the opening ride of the morning. Liam O'Brien with some speed Whoop. and a throwaway punt. Incomplete priority with Ramsey now. Liam just wanted to get things started. Saw that he might be able to throw down in a full rotation, but loses connection with that surfboard. And now Ramsey will move in and yeah. kind of win that start of the competitive battle just to kick off with the best wave. It's always a little chess match at the start of these heats and no one really wanting to relinquish that position in the lineup. So these guys were deep up on the uh, the upper section here at Winky. And now you can see Ramsey coming down into the real takeoff zone. And these where the waves, uh, this is where the waves just cleanly run down the point at a, at a beautiful pace. 
So you'd have to say advantage to uh, Ramsey without really even having a score on the board yet. He now has priority. And uh, conversion, Joe, I feel like he's going to be a really critical part of today just because it is a little bit inconsistent. Wow, Ramsey looks like Lobby. Yeah, Ramsey letting this one go through and Lobby will get started. Nice redirect in the pocket, snapping right off the lip in the critical zone again. Cool flow and rhythm into a rapid cutback. Great variety for Liam O'Brien as he digs in on the open face and now shuts it down with a clean off the top. Such an easy rhythm to follow down the line, a style that you'd want to model yourself. But good change-ups too from carves to really drilling the lip section and Ramsey just drop an acre hoping for something better. Interesting decision from Ramsey not taking that wave. And a little gift there for Liam O'Brien. And Jeezy surfed that well. Great pace to that wave. Really good flow. Executed some uh, super clean maneuvers here. So let's see what happened. Ramsey not interested. Perhaps thought there was a bigger one outside. Lobby goes, yep, I'll take it. Starts off with this clean slice. More down the line. A more of a critical snap. Gets some tail release. Hits it again. Those little drifting slices. Big wrapping cutback. Really nice rhythm to this wave. And another one. Bit more variety there. And then gets the closeout finish. So multiple maneuvers down the line. This will set the judges scale for the day. So it's an important score. Beautiful view here from above. You can really see the path that these surfers take on the wave. And when I look at this wave, Joe, uh, I feel like Liam did the maneuvers, the exact maneuver that the wave called for at that time. That beautiful style where he just uh, locks that back knee in, brings it down, check that tail release there. Gets the control back down. Now he hammers it off the bottom turn, through the lip again, drifting. Perfect composure. Looking super sharp on this board. Had a little chat with DH earlier this morning. We'll break down the board uh, through this heat. And the variety there, the layback snap and gets to the finish. Had to make this last turn just to bookend it. Great ride. Just clean, perfectly matched surfing for Liam O'Brien to get a seven-point ride. So interesting to note, Ramsey with priority, not interested in that one. And O'Brien kind of making him pay for being so selective to start. So Liam went for the air, kind of threw away the battle for priority and recovered magically to that seven-point ride. Now it's time for a Bond University athlete health check. Ramsey Bolchayim told our AJ McCord that he dislocated his shoulder the day after the Lexus Pipe Pro. At sunset, he didn't make it out of the elimination round, took a 33rd on his way to Puerto Rico. At the ISAs, Ramsey surfed his way to a silver medal and Olympic qualification where he will represent Morocco for the second time in the Olympic Games. As we now look at... Liam O'Brien stepping into another fun looking running right, super glassy, already threw a couple of turns off the top and a snap to drift to shut it down. Yeah, Point smart seven serving. three's gone, his uh, total could put Ramsey in a combination with 19 to go. Uh, he's, he's executing a perfect heat under priority here. He's gonna make Ramsey pay for it by putting a little pressure on him. This is not gonna be a huge score, Joe, but it's gonna be enough to really start to make Ramsey think about his choices right now. Ramsey loves the first heat of a contest. Not every surfer wants to be out there on the opening hooter sounding on a day, but Ramsey said he's so motivated and focused. I'm not sure what he's waiting for as we look for the second replay of this wave. Yeah, it was kind of textbook stuff here from uh, Liam O'Brien. Just a shorter wave. Uh, he sort of built throughout the wave there. You can see Ramsey starting to question, going, hang on a minute, what's going on? Is he laying down scores and I'm sitting out here? So I wonder if in the free surf, we know Lobby was out there early. So he got a gauge on the lineup. I'm not too sure whether Ramsey actually got out there. He might even be waiting for something that perhaps won't come through this morning. Interesting when you drop anchor this long to see w if he can recover. A brilliant start from Liam O'Brien. Seven and now a 3-8-3. So Ramsey does need two new waves to take the lead in this first heat of the morning.
Medina coming up next, taking on Cole Hauschman. Our plan is to finish the round of 32 and hopefully finish the round of 16 for a potential finals day tomorrow. But we do have options even April 3rd. Wednesday has some promise. As we're getting through the waiting period here for stop number four of the season, a lot on the line for the mid-season cut as that cut happens at Margaret River, stop number five, going from 34 men to 22 for the rest of the season. And there's obviously a ton of incentive to staying on the top stage, fighting for a world title, but also Cloud Break is back on tour. Oh, and that's a special one. I did have the... The fortune of uh, being able to compete at Cloud Break during my time on the tour, it is a special event. You know, that, that wave in particular, uh, it, it's, it can be tricky, but it's magical. Um, it's one of those places as a surfer that you have to go and visit. So we see here Gabriel Medina getting ready for his matchup with Cole Hauschman. Gosh, huge heat, and Medina just put on one of the best combined totals of his career at Bells in the opening round of competition. So he sat some time off since then. 9-3-3, eight point ride. Aki was on hand for the call for that one. And there was some Aki magic from the booth straight to Medina's performance. But thinking about the waves today and the forecast that we have, courtesy of Surfline, we have Surfline Australia's forecast manager joining us, Hugh McDowell. Hugh, thank you so much for being with us first thing in the morning. Hi, my pleasure, Joe. Happy to be here this morning. Uh, and we can see there's some waves out there. Yeah, thanks for uh, letting us know what to expect. As far as just forecasting for this part of Australia, there's some challenges there. Uh, wh what's it been like working with this waiting period? Well, there's been some challenges in the waiting period. It, it was good for the first day. We saw some really solid swell for them. But then since then, we've been waiting. We've been waiting on this little pulse out here for this weekend. It's come in a reasonable size today. We're seeing sort of chest to head high sets and the odd bigger one as well. The challenges with it are there's not many wave boys out there, right? There's not much between us and the Southern Ocean here in Victoria, right? So we can't see those swells coming from a long way away in, in reality we're having to rely on models quite a lot of the time until they hit the Cape Sorrel boy and some of the boys around Victoria and then we've only got three to five hours notice until they're here at Bells Beach. Well Hugh I love talking over the surfline maps but since we've got you here in the chair do you mind running us through all the great graphics that you guys send through courtesy of surfline? Yeah of course no problem Jay. So we can see there's modest southwest swell in for this Easter weekend. We're a mix of mid and long period swell, and that's starting to peak out there at the moment. Eases through tomorrow morning, and then we're looking at another swell Wednesday through to Friday, peaking Wednesday afternoon. Much more solid than this one, but winds might be a bit tricky. And then looking at today at Winky Pop, we're seeing maybe a, just a little increase in size this afternoon, but that onshore, you're expecting that to get a lot more serious uh, later on today. That's right, a bit more breezy with the onshore this afternoon, so we're gonna start seeing a little bit more bump and lump on the wave faces. And then looking at the next four days, Renata this morning was saying tomorrow is a possibility, but would you be looking at then Wednesday at a finals day if we can't wrap things up on Easter Sunday? I would say so, yeah. Tomorrow looks like fun in the morning, maybe deteriorating in the afternoons. That's why I'll start Season, and then Wednesday, a peak and large as well. There we go. Thank you very much for the insight and Surfline and Hugh for being with us here firsthand. Uh, the call was quickly made for, for Winky Pop today. Uh, were you kind of expecting that and to kind of move off the bull? Well, uh, with a smaller swell, yeah, Winky Pop sort of holds it better. And then as we go through the high tides, you're not seeing as many heats over at Bells. Like it struggles with those high tides on the bowl. So, yeah, Winky Pop, we can probably run through the tides through the day today. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for, for joining us. We'll be catching up with you throughout the next couple of days. Surfline, our official forecaster, and Hugh doing a great job throughout this event here at the Rip Curl Pro Bells Beach, presented by Bonsoy. Liam O'Brien still the only one surfing so far. It's Ramsey is combo. We'll be right back.
12 minutes on the clock here in the round of 32. Heat number six, O'Brien out front, seven and a 383 as Ramsey sits with priority. He will roll in. The Moroccan now setting up that big vertical. Nice first turn. Nice blast again, looking smooth and powerful. Controlled vertical surfing for Ramsey to get started. Didn't have the link up and the length of ride of opportunities that Liam had on his seven, but you can tell he's been wide awake, focused on the lineup, doesn't need a warm up, and he's already surfing at a high level. Rich, what'd you see here? He sure is. Looks like he's uh, surfing pressure free at the moment. These two backhand hits and a third to finish things off. And this is what I was mentioning before, Joe, on the backhand. They can take a deeper bottom turn, get a little bit more vertical there. Watch the nose of the board up at 12 o'clock. Ramsey pivots nice and tight. It gets straight back on that heel side rail, leans in, gets that pendulum flow, that upper body movement. The lower body follows. Nice, tight pivoting turns off the top. Sets up this last closeout and again goes vertical. So um, a good three turn com combination for Ramsey to start things off. There's so much in those backside turns, aren't there? Just the power, the rail engagement, the flawless transitions. A small wave that, you know, might have been a, a three point ride for most. He could get a bit more out from the panel because how dynamic those turns are not being on a set wave. A 5-5 five, five for Ramsey, needing a 5-3-4 for the lead change. As we talk about backhanders, we always start with Ock, but more recently it's been Italo Ferrer winning this event. That was an emotional victory for Italo because it was his first major win of his career. Mm, yeah, it, um, it was a big one in the final there with Mick Fanning, and, and that was uh, Mick's final event, his goodbye to Bells Beach. And, uh, well, it was a pretty special one for Italo to get the win. Good surf, too. It was fun. Good waves. And uh, he was so stuck in. And what, <laughs> what a story it was just with the Australian crowd seeing Mick swan song going, oh, he's going to win it, this whole thing. And Italo was in his headspace. And everyone felt like the story was getting changed from this movie ending. Yeah, fairy tale. But then uh, Mick reminded us on stage with his class uh, how we still got the fairy tale ending. It was yeah. uh, kind of a good way for Mick to step away going, wow, that meant so much to Italo, seeing him celebrate. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, I think it is time to move on. Mick with four Bells trophies tied with Kelly, tied with Mark Richards. Kelly, the one man that could have the record for himself. And he did mention how that would be the absolute dream. He does have Baron Mamiya in this round later on today. Wow, that'd be something special, wouldn't it? Uh, uh, we're uh, we're looking forward to seeing, uh, well, the GOAT, the greatest of all time. Kelly Slade up. He'll be surfing a little bit later on today. 8.55 on the clock here. Ramsey representing Morocco said it was interesting growing up in his, his community. It wasn't a, a popular custom to will your kids into the ocean he said there's this element of fear you know of around being in the water a lot where him and his brother would get out there surfing and there wasn't a bunch of hot and up-and-coming juniors around to compare your surfing with and there wasn't big surf shops that you're growing up in and this big surf culture with big events to to follow he said things have changed dramatically there's people that actually make a living in morocco as surf guides uh, surf instructions and things like that but he always remembers how hard it was to get great equipment, so he makes sure that he's passing on boards to the next generation. He's got his uh, face on some buildings there that honor Ramsey and the connection to Morocco as they cheer him on on tour, and they also cheer him on in the Olympic Games. Yeah, well, he's, you know, basically the face of Moroccan surfing, and, and there are good waves in Morocco. Don't tell anyone, but um, yeah, it's uh, long right-hand point waves, and that you can see why Ramsey's backhand is so strong. He is comfortable in these type of conditions. It's inconsistent, Joe, and it uh, really is going to be a matter of when you get these waves, you need to convert on them. A fall today is going to be uh, a real critical moment. Looks like Liam's going to have a look at this one. Liam does have priority, and he's got some room to move on the scale, trying to better a 3-8-3. First turn, a nice searing carve off the top, quickly hacking it in the pocket down the line and then leans into it for the finish on the open face. Sharp surfing from the Australian, George Pitar loving it. 
And what a performance that he threw down as uh, one of the most exciting wild cards we've had this season on tour. Yeah, yeah, George is uh, a fresh face on the scene. Um, had a little crack at the challenges last year and was lucky enough to re-qualify, so he'll go around again. But getting his first taste of championship tour competition down here at Bells Beach, he's one of the Rip Curl riders. See Joel Vaughan in the background there. Interesting to note, uh, I, I actually don't think that Liam O'Brien is with a with a coach down here at Bells. Uh, he's There's a crew of these guys that are all kind of feeding off each other and helping each other rather than just have one individual um, sort of helping you steer the ship. Okay, let's watch the replay here. So streaking down the line, this wave standing up well. Beautiful carve to start things off. Kind of hops out of it, gets that second tap, and then this third hack somewhat restrained in my mind um, but appropriate for where this heat is at right now beautiful open face carve on the open art that is where most of the points are going to come from little check re-entry here and here's where he lines up this last turn so right now he's thinking okay i got this section the layback hack is the perfect maneuver for this section throws it down doesn't overcook it great timing and, uh, well, we've seen so many surfers go to that manoeuvre. Super reliable. Uh, I reckon Sonny Garcia really put that turn on the map. And he used to do it with so much power. Just used to destroy the wave. Gosh, and he used it everywhere, didn't he? Yep. He could use it at one foot Huntington Beach. He could use it at six to eight foot ball. It was just... Well, I saw him win bells against John Shamuka right here in conditions not too dissimilar. So much in that power hack, as he'll always be known as the, gosh, one maybe the most powerful athlete on tour, world champion in 2000. The most successful in the Triple Crown, as you see Cole Hauschman. There's a couple of powerful goofy footers in this next one, hey? He's got to be careful. It's taken a long time because there's little holes. You don't want to fall into one of those little traps on the way out to your heat. A lot of these guys that grow up surfing lowers, they often wax the top of their feet and then rub them together so you're not all slippery on your opening ride with all the, the algae and the moss on top of these limestone rocks. But Cole, with a, a lot on the line here, there's been this clip floating around on Instagram that one Cole actually reposted as well. He's about 11 years of age asking who his favorite surfer was in the world. And this young little Cole was uh, saying, yep, Gabriel Medina, he's got it all. Wow. He's breaking down all the Medina's strengths and how much he looked up to the guy. So talk about a dream come true. Cole's got a chance to battle with his hero coming up next at Heat 7. Wow, that is a special moment. And it's, uh, it's going to be a good matchup, that one. Two powerful, goofy footers. Gabriel Medina, he's coming back. He's in fine form. Looks like we're going to have a rider here, Joe. Right now, Ramsey's looking for a 7-5. Getting some speed. Nice controlled backside snap, hitting it harder on the second effort. Now third is a big blast in the pocket, really moving down the line, attacking the lip again and shutting oh, it down. Brilliant wow. surfing from the Moroccan. Leo Firavanti, one of his closest friends. He likes it. He's saying, yep, he got it. 7.5. It would be the best wave of the heat. So they'll be comparing it directly against Liam O'Brien's seven-pointer. And uh, I, I instantly think about variety here. So whereas Liam had a lot of different turns, Ramsey strong on the backhand, winds up. Second turn, really vertical and powerful, does it again. And a third, a fourth, and then gets the inside section and blasts it super strong. Positioning was perfect. You know, for a big guy, he's got so much power and leverage in the lower part of his body here. Just watch the leg movement, extension, compression. Gets even a little tail release there, Joe. Gets the fins drifting ever so slightly. JS is looking amazing under his feet. Cracks it again. Interesting to watch uh, the eyesight as well. So he's... Uh, Every time coming off this bottom turn, that's where he eyes off his lip, his attack point. Bang, you see the head motion, the upper body comes around and then the lower body follows. Really tight radius turns, powerful. Mate, that wave had it all. 
So Ramsey's looking for a 7.5, and the comparison would go quickly to Liam O'Brien's 7 that he had to kick off the heat. That was on Liam's second wave. He fell on the rotator. Ramsey didn't go with priority. Crunch time now as we pass the GWM two-minute warning, but this was the 7 for comparison. Okay, so quick snap to start things off. Opening carb, second one, tail release, a bit more radical. You can see the different sort of turns. More open face, more slicing, more carving versus Ramsey's vertical blast attack. So there's more variety in what, uh, what Liam did on the front side. And then here we go, Ramsey on the backhand, stronger, perhaps more powerful. There's more intent, there's more water displacement in those turns. Oh, that third turn was super vertical and again. So for me, the only thing that they could perhaps criticize on that wave, Joe, was just the repetition. I mean, they were super strong every single one of the turns. Here goes Liam. Last score for Ramsey, 6.8. Not enough. Liam still in the lead as he's riding this wave, attacking sections. Now looking for something to ramp up with. There's that tail high reverse. He gets tangled up on the landing. But Ramsey got his best numbers so far. Just two waves ridden in this entire heat. But short of the requirement, needing a 7-5. All judges, all five feeling that it was not enough. The closest was a 7-3 on the decision. I wonder. I wonder if it was that repetition that they just wanted to see, maybe something a little bit different, which is, you know, granted, hard to do on your backhand out here especially in these type of conditions where it is so smooth and the air is kind of a, a, a more of a high risk option for the goofy footers. Ramsey, he may get, no, this wave's not going to offer him anything. And now it's just coming oh, down to that wave that he let Liam go on with priority that Liam turned into a seven. It, it's always hard in the moment to break down wave selection. But it's pretty easy to do it in hindsight. A tough one for Ramsey because he was fired up. You can tell on that last 6.8 and a big result. Though still in the making for the Australian. Liam O'Brien is into the round of 16. He will be competing later on today against Ethan Ewing. A bit of a rematch Whoa, okay. from their battle they had at Sunset earlier this year. Okay, well, that's going to be a fun one. There's uh, lots to break down in that heat. That's a harsh one for... Uh, for Ramsey, tough commiserations. Medina taking on Hausman. Coming up next here at the Rip Curl Pro Bells Beach presented by Bonsoy.
always a favorite to come out down here to the state of Victoria to enjoy the city of Melbourne, to drive about an hour, hour and a half to the Surf Coast and check out Winky Pop and Bells for the Big Rip Curl Pro Bells Beach presented by Bonsoy, the longest running event on the calendar as we've got Cole Hausman, the rookie on tour from San Clemente with his hands full against the three-time world champ and his hero on tour. Finishing off his wave there, his best so far. He had two looks during the break. He even started off with the opening wave in the one range, took another look at a wave. So already trying to get an, a quick start against this man who is absolutely flying. Nice stretched out wall with a closeout oh. section for the backhand air reverse. And that one Medina can't ride out of. His second wave ridden in the matchup. He did get a start during the break as now we see the paddle battle and the rookie six foot three, 225. Looks like he's got a bit of a jump on Medina so far. Oh, wow. Cole's put the outboard motor on. You can see the legs kicking. <laughs> it's almost creating a wake uh, for Gabriel behind him. But uh, mate, these guys are two of the biggest, two of the strongest on the tour. Cole putting this one in. He knows the importance of getting priority in this exchange here. Look at Cole break away. I mean, Medina out paddles people all day long. Yeah, I think that given was that, a statement that right there, was Rick. a statement. He's like, nah, man, uh, yeah, I'm not giving, I'm not, I'm not backing down to you at all. Wow. He might be one of the fastest paddlers on tour, this man. Cole now Hausman. Now he's going to have to suck in some oxygen. Just take a little breather. Get ready. So Gabriel will hunt the lineup now. You watch. This is what he does. He cruises back and forth like a shark, just looking for waves and opportunities. And this is the type of thing he does in unraveling these uh, these rookies who are maybe a little inexperienced. I had a surf with Gabriel uh, down here at Winky the other day, actually, when they called it off. And I saw him make 10 of those backhand rotations <laughs> in, in the space of about 20 minutes. And, uh, man, he, he has been putting a lot of time in over the last two days down here. Kind of figured that we were going to be back down at the Winky Pop section. Interesting how he lands all those in the free surf and the one he needs in a heat. He goes down. He was very close to it. 4-8-3 and a 1 to start. Medina out in front. And Cole needing a 2-0-1. A fun all goofy foot battle. And we've got a goofy foot for the water reporting. Kaipo Guerrero. Kaipo, beautiful morning at Winky Pop. Yes, it's a beautiful morning. Bless Jarok and uh, out here in Water Run Country. It's uh, I and you know what? For Goofy Foot fan, what a way to start the morning in the water with these two. A must win for the rookie Cole Hausman. I feel Joe that like he really needs a result. Uh, you know, especially here, looking at that mid-season cut. And then Gabe Medina, Gabe's up to his old tricks again, going to the air. Hasn't put one down yet, uh, but we'll see. I, it, extremely entertaining heat for me to start off my morning out here in the water. Totally, Kaipo. And hey, you had a front row seat to Cole Hausman last year on the Challenger Series, going back to back for his wins. You felt that energy from San Clemente. Looking at the waves that we have today at Winky Pop, are you expecting him to, to really find his rhythm out there today? I, you know what, the, the, the sneaky thing about the big guy, 6'3", you know, 210 pounds, is he is really nimble for such a, a big frame. So I expect, uh, I expect him to come through here. He's always had a, been a surfer of talent that I feel that belongs on the championship tour, but he needs to earn his place right now. He needs a result. He needs to make it happen right now. As far as the, the face of the wave right now, Kaipo, things are looking clean from the top of the hill. What's it like in the ocean? Yeah, it's, it's really nice. It's, it's smooth out here. Uh, maybe a little bit of a ruffle coming through every once in a while, like kind of a variable vibe, uh, but for the most part, smooth. Smooth, glassy, rippable. What a way to start the day. Hey, Kaipo, we've got Medina up. We'll check in with you in a moment as we have him going through another top turn wrap. Gabriel throwing a vertical and gets the completion. The 1.0 is gone. And this was uh, what you predicted, Rich, without priority. He's one of the most dangerous guys to watch on tour. Yeah, he'll just put pressure on, on the youngster here. And uh, Gabriel's so strong. He's one of those unique surfers that has the ability to take a four-point wave and turn it into a six-point ride. And that's, you know, that that's one of the magical things about Medina. He's just so explosive, so creative on the backhand. Uh, we'll see all sorts of maneuvers pulled out in this one. You know, he won't just he won't just stick to a, a pretty straightforward backhand vertical. He'll mix things up. He'll get to the air. And uh, really, he is um, he's back in fine form. 
Gabriel Medina working with uh, Johnny Cabianca for a very long time. I think those early years, you'd see some Puka stickers on his board, and then it just became a full-time relationship with Johnny. And it's not one of those shapers that's making equipment for half the tour. It's a, a pretty personal relationship for the championship tour as we look at this wave. Yeah, Gab's just down the line streaking, getting to this uh, little moment down here. Quick snap, and then gets to the final finish. Just really slams the door shut. And here we go, Cole. Nice extension on the opening turn there. Gets the second and a third. Little disjointed here. Lost a little bit of speed and flow before that final hit. Great way to finish off. And this is Gabrielle under priority here. Clean snap. Small wave, but just gets some beautiful work done. And that uh, that closeout re-entry was the money turn. So strong on the backhand. Live action. Now watching Medina just throw a nice little float to start, bashing it off the lip. Nice little speed carve to cover some ground, hammering it again. Now looking for a big wind up and a solid, powerful finish for the three-time world champion. Hauschman now tracking down the line, float to cover some ground, punches out the lip, right back to that pocket again to hammer it. Nice flow and just so many different types wow. of turns and he will finish so strong. He's hooked on his fitness, his training. He's obsessing with the game and loves every part of it, learning a lot in his rookie debut this year. Catching up on some numbers, wave number three for Medina, 5-5, five, five. so he built on his score line. Hauschman, 3-8-3, three, three. and two more to lock in as we can see the separation there. Yeah, good exchanges and uh, the youngster is staying with him here. That was a great wave. A little bit more variation and multiple maneuvers down the line. Talking to Luke Egan this morning, Joe, they did a ton of work down here yesterday. Uh, tried a bunch of different boards and um, Cole found a, a nice one from Matt Biolis. It's a 6-2 uh, a driver three, but slightly modified uh, for the conditions down here. And, and when we're talking about modifications from a model, we're talking maybe a 16th of an inch in tail rocker and perhaps only in that last 12 inches of the board. So these, uh, these incremental uh, adjustments that the shapers make for their riders, We'll get back to a uh, little replay here. Medina starts off with a little rock and roll float up. Quick snap down the line. Third turn, more spray. Now he gets a bit more acute with the angles. Streaking down the line, setting this last turn up. Oh, geez, that pivoting action off those final uh, hits. Medina in this heat been something special. So this was uh, Cole's last wave. Streaking down the line, little floater projection to get to these... Uh, well, just rapid fire backhand turns. Five, six, probably seven turns on that wave. When you look at the actual wave though, Joe, I, I feel like Medina's actually stood up a little bit more, uh, offered a little bit more there. And if you look at the board path between Medina and Cole Hausman, I'd say there's maybe 20, 30 degrees difference uh, in it. I feel like Cole was maybe cutting his backhand hooks just a little bit shorter. Gabriel was wrapping his around more. Liking the breakdown, 19 on the clock. Priority with Medina to roll into this glassy right-hander. Already through his first turn, backhand float with some spice on it out in front, crushes the lip, back to a rooftop float again. Looking super smooth, pacing his way down the line with a lot of majors as he steps off. Their exchange before was probably both of their best performances so far, still yet to lock into the screen. And Medina already throwing up another great effort on the back end. Hauschman's wave before, 6-2-3. Yep. Gabriel's wave previous, a 6-6-7. Six, six, and so Gabriel out front waiting to see if he improved on a 5-5 five, five on that last one. Yeah, he's building. Look at Gabriel's score. Had the 4, got the 5, now got the 6. So uh, what's coming next? But uh, yeah, Cole stays with him. That 6.23, critical score at this moment of the heat. And uh, he needs to make uh, this next wave count. Big score coming if he can uh, find the right wave. Big win first thing in the morning for Liam O'Brien as he's hanging out with Laura. Yes, guys, number 12 in the world at the moment. Liam, first heat of the day. Talk us through the nerves and how you've approached it after a couple of days off. Yeah, it was really slow, so it was pretty nerve-wracking. Um, 
yeah, I just tried to hold my nerve and, and catch some sets. Uh, priority was almost a bit of a curse out there at the start because we both thought there was going to be a few more sets come and then there kind of wasn't. So I got, I got lucky when that Ramsey left the first wave of the set and then there was just nothing behind, which was a bummer, but yeah, it worked for me. Um, and then, yeah, it was just super slow through the middle of the heat. I think I only caught like two more waves. So just one of those ones you had to just hold your nerve and then try not to get too giddy and pull the trigger on the wrong wave. Well, you looked really good out there. Talk us through the board that you're riding at the moment and, and what, what changes you've had to make coming from the bowl over here. Uh, yeah, it's just one of Darren's DNA boards. Um, kind of got a square, I usually ride a square tail, but it's got a square tail on it, rounded square tail, a um, bit thicker in the rails as well. So kind of better for these sort of smaller, flatter waves. Um, but yeah, I haven't really ridden it much this trip, so I was a bit worried bringing it out this morning. But um, no, it seemed to work nice, kind of how I'd expected it to. So yeah, that was that was good. And I did hear you say before that board is sort of made off one of Ethan's boards that he rides. You actually are coming up against Ethan in the next round. <laughs> uh, what's it going to take to to get the jump on him? Um, yeah, he's been ripping, um, so I don't know. I'll just have to get the bombs and try and rip him myself. But uh, yeah, that board's kind of based off some of the stuff he rides. Um, I don't know. For me, it, it didn't didn't really work as well in like good waves, but um, in stuff like this, it's like really good. So yeah. <laughs> probably ride it in the next heat and see how we go. All right, and what's the plan between now and the next heat? Go home, you're going to sit down the beach and watch? Yeah, I'll probably get out here for a bit and, and try and reset. And then, uh, yeah, I'll just come back down and, and check it out before the next heat and try and do it all again. Amazing rest up. We'll see you this afternoon in the round of 16. Congratulations, Liam. Thanks, Laura. Good on you, Liam. Great surfing there in the first seat of the morning. Looking sharp. Can't wait for the all-Australian battle. Liam O'Brien versus Ethan Ewing in the round of 16. Still scheduled for today, conditions permitting. As Medina's just building and building. Started with a four, then a five, then a six. Now a seven, Rich. Yeah, he's got the seven. You can see he's winding up here. Again, another little rock and roll floater projecting down the line and again. This is what I was talking about, this variety. Even on the backhand, he's not just doing the one turn the whole time. And geez, those finish manoeuvres have just been so strong for Gabrielle. And uh, well, I've, uh, in the last 12 months, Gabrielle's really committed to riding an extra large fin now too, Joe. And he's one of the only, if not the only surfer on tour. Uh, most of our uh, competitors riding a large size fin. Gabrielle's, uh, he actually switches it up. He's got extra large fins on the side and a, and a large in the back. So he gets all that drive and acceleration uh, off those side fins and then uh, with the large in the back he gets that sort of pivot and release off the tail exactly there it doesn't get stuck he can control it and uh, you can see here just a little rock and roll floater here a little shimmy down the line and then watch him get on that heel side rail gets that deep bottom turn so strong man this guy trains the house down and just manipulates that board with ease 7.10 for Gabriel Medina, and it seems fairly common to hear a lot of the top surfers in the world actually going for a larger fin in smaller waves. Is that for everybody, or is it just your personal take? Uh, look, it all depends on the board, too. If you're going shorter with your board, you often kind of up the fin size, uh, and, and it's, it's sort of the opposite to what you'd think. In bigger waves, when you're taking a longer board, you, you generally go down in size because the board's actually doing more work for you. Nice snap to kick things off for Gabriel Medina. Really jamming down the line, ramping up. And how about that? Landing on the tail. Still fighting for the finish. He'll get it. Medina mixing things up for us. Trying to better a 6-6-7. Going to the air as Hausman on his feet. Pacing. Hoping that he gets a set that's going to come through. Gabriel Medina starting to have a lot of fun out there, Kaipo. Wow, that's the, that's the stuff that Gabe does, right? He's a predator. Once he knows that his competitor's in a vulnerable position, then he springs. That was under priority. That was such a quick rotation. Incredible. Looks like Cole's going to answer back right now. Good man, Kaipo. As we see this, Medina just seeing a big ramp opportunity, going for it. The full rotation had to really fight for the finish there, Rich. Yeah, he did, uh, but that's all the strength, all the training. It comes into play right at these moments. That core strength, that lower leg strength, he's able to just bring his body back over his board here. Good rotation. Pretty much goes the full uh, 360 degrees. Lands with the tail firmly uh, planted in the nose, pointing towards the shore. 
Cabriel, slight adjustment, stands tall, shows the judges, little finger click. He liked it. So are they going to pay the progression here? It was a smaller wave inside. It's funny even to note that Gabrielle's going up and sitting on, on Cole's inside. Normally, you know, you'd sit towards the outside of, of the man with priority. But uh, right, he's toying with him right now. And I think we're seeing the showman, Gabriel Medina, starting to uh, show up here. Uh, and that angle from the water was massive. This is what Cole just did as we saw that replay. OK, so this needed to be a comeback wave. Cole Hausman blasting down the line. That's a better one. More tail release. And again, more power and flow in this wave. Just dying out a little bit on the inside, but Jeezy got some good work done through the midsection. He'll get this last finishing turn. And then he gives us the finger click as well. So great snap to start off. Reads the way perfectly to this point. And I really like these two turn combinations in the middle here, Joe. Get some variety, starts to show us uh, a little bit more. The unfortunate thing is, is that uh, the wave didn't quite stand up enough on the inside, so the judges will show a little bit of restraint in their score, given that, that there wasn't that big final exclamation point. But check that out. The tail release controls it perfectly, goes straight onto the bottom turn again. Beautiful fan of spray. And that's what these guys do, these bigger guys. They're just able to get so much water displacement, and that adds to the effect of the manoeuvre. The intensity of manoeuvre looks bigger. Just love watching his rail work. So smooth and finessed with his size and power. He's such a weapon on the top 34. Had a lot of hype coming into the offseason after winning the Challenger Series for his work ethic, for all the wins he produced. It has his hands full with... The Medina family very happy. Sophia, his younger sister there, was in the trials to kick things off before the event started. Had a chat with her in the water and she was just so cool and saying how she had the heat win till about 50 seconds and then an, another girl got it and she's like, oh, that the other competitor deserved it. Uh, I just was so happy to be a part of the event. I was just so blown away by her just response and moving on from you know, having a close call not go her way. And uh, she was just so excited to back her brother in the main event. Yeah, it's really cool. Um, she was actually out there when I was surfing uh, the other day along with Gabrielle. And, you know, she's just so happy and friendly, obviously, you know, looking at what her brother's done and, and has aspirations to be a, a very successful pro surfer herself. Uh, the genes are strong in this family yeah, for sure. She was so <laughs> happy. It just, she gave me a little, Carissa more light, you know, how positive Riss is all the time. Yeah, Just for sure. Happy and gives you a glow. Andy King. What a legend. In the background there, Medina's coach. And those guys have formed a, a pretty special relationship, haven't they, over the last several years? What's it like hanging out with Kingy? Oh, Kingy is such a legend, man. He's so down to earth. He's one of those real Aussie blokes that just kind of calls it pretty straight. Um, you know, he won't beat around the bush with his feedback. He'll just deliver it how he sees it. But uh, really insightful. I think he said hi to you, Rick. Yeah, he did. Feeling the wind. Hey, Kingy. <laughs> uh, man, an absolute charger as well. Uh, an amazing surfer who's got a lot of stories to share with you. And I think he was really honored when he's getting a call from Gabriel Medina, who notably didn't really have anyone else in his corner besides his family when he grew up on tour. He'd get little bits and pieces from people, but he was kind of just on his own uh, track to winning world titles. And then to call up a legend like Andy King, it was a huge moment for the coach. Oh! As we see the first fall from Medina after the fall from the sky and the air attempt, but just a slip on what looked kind of like a routine start for the Met. Hausman now will have priority. And Cole's last wave was a 6.8, so this one's far from over. Cole with priority needs a 6.98 to try to upset the three time world champion. Round of 32, heat number seven is looking incredibly close. We'll take a Bonsoy brew break in just a moment and be right back.
Round of 32 has two goofy foots going for it. A rookie and a three-time world champ. Hauschman up now, throwing some water. Perfect transition as he hammers it again. Belting the lip line right in the pocket as hard as he can. With finesse to right away. His final turn, solid, and the rookie is stepping up. Medina's behind him, though. First snap there, little drift off the roof. Belts it vertically, well-placed turn from Gabriel. Now whips it and goes down right in front of Cole. It was almost looking like he was trying to get the completion and then get a jump start on priority very quickly there, Rich. That's exactly what he was doing. You could tell Gabriel in his mind was making the calculations going, am I going to better my 6.67? And he went, no, I don't think I am. So he opted out of that last maneuver because he wanted to hold priority here believing that perhaps Cole didn't get that 6.98 on this last wave, but Jeezy surfed it well. Here's the replay. So Cole takes off, hits that first section. The rhythm starts to get, uh, starts to wind up here. Almost lost it on the second turn, but cleans it up on the third and fourth. Coming down the line here, and you can just see there's a slight difference in the speed between Cole and Gabrielle. And the flow between the turns, I've just got to give it to uh, Gabriel Medina on the backhand here. Just seems to be accelerating out of those turns with a little bit more speed. And watch here, Gabriel sort of puts that last turn up, sees Cole and goes, no, nah, I'm out of here. I'm going to get uh, priority again and just hold him off. I think Cole did a great job trying to really surf that wave up. Those sections were fairly flat. He needed to be very critical with the white water connection there to go as powerful as he did. But he couldn't really get the score he was hoping for. He's hearing it now. 5.93 for last of Cole and not factoring in. Medina's a throwaway as well and the smart surfing and headspace from Gabriel getting out of there quickly was actually able to get first priority. When it's close like that and you have the first surfer go and the second one, sometimes you just keep the priority rotation going, but Medina earned it by getting a jump start. Yeah, yeah, he broke the uh, priority flow there. Here's a good shot of uh, Medina's board there. You can see he's got that nice thumb tail or a real squash tail as it's called. It's in between a round and a square tail. And that fin set up, that's the FCS2 performer template. Very neutral, probably, well it is. It's the most popular FCS template globally just because it is so uh, usable user-friendly, uh, goes in a bunch of different conditions, and he has the extra large in the side, that large in the back. Gabriel Medina's score line, you can see the highlighted numbers, his keepers, 710 and a 667, where with the top level of the sport competing at Winky Pop, sometimes you can see the challenge of scoring regular versus goofy in different ways to get a score, kind of like what we saw in the yeah. week before with Ramsey and Liam. When you got two goofy footers go you know, blow for blow, you're going, okay, fair Direct enough. Direct comparison, Easy right? comparisons back and forth. Yeah, look, Cole's putting together a really good heat. He's surfing so well. Um, you know, and again, as a coach, you'd probably just say, hey, look, you need to be on the best waves to beat Medina, and you're going to have to just tag it. Don't go outside your comfort zone. If you try and, like, do stuff that you haven't done before against Medina and feel that pressure of having to try and, like, surf out of your skin, uh, you know, you, you could open yourself up to make mistakes. He's just got to stick to his game here. If he can somehow wrestle priority back off Medina in this last three minutes and get a really good size set and then just tag it, he's got every chance of getting that 6.98. You see a lot of world champs who pay a lot of attention to detail, you know, especially focusing on fin design. When you think of Mick Fanning, you think of, you know, Felipe Toledo and, and, and many others. How's Medina? Is he, is he very thoughtful of, as far as what he's trying to figure out as far as fin template? Are concerned. Yeah, absolutely. You know, he, he's really written this uh, performer template religiously through his whole career. Uh, we have worked with him and given him all sorts of different templates to try. He keeps coming back to it. He just finds it so reliable. And, and once you have that baseline of what you know in a fin, you can kind of work your board around it. So little incremental changes you make to the board, that one consistent element being the fin, you can rely on. So all the all the work that uh, Medina's doing with Cabianca, it's all around board design and, and making adjustments there because he knows what his fins are doing. Love getting the inside. Sometimes you you feel like his program still fairly undercover considering is that one of the highest profile athletes on tour Cole Hausman important wave big fan of spray Whoa. belts it again with a slide putting a lot into every maneuver needs a 6.98 under priority as he shuts it down <laughs> oh wow 
He's asked the question. Crosby loving it. He's already standing by for the replay on the WSL app as we've got 90 seconds to go. Well, interesting moment. Medina looked at that wave and went, nope, there's not a 6.98 in that. And Cole Hausman just went, well, you just watch me. And he just tagged that thing. So uh, some really strong maneuvers on that wave. So impressed with Cole Hausman on how he handled this situation. So he's just done a Medina on him. He's taken the inside, found this wave, that second turn there where he blasts it, gets the little drift. Has that little slide and fin release. They're those little intricacies that the judges pick up on. Surfing in earnest on this one. Look at the spray there. Right, just basically showers Medina. And said, you've not only gifted me this way, but I'm going to do my darndest to take you down. Oh, spraying your competitor in the face. That's a big one there. 35 seconds. You don't want to wake him up, though. Waiting for Medina to potentially take this wave. He holds off. It's going to be close. We could tell, too, when he's unloading, especially on that second turn. He, he's hitting it so hard, he's borderlining disaster. He's almost catching a rail, but he's moving out of that turn with so much flow. Well, that was the most radical turn he's done of the entire heat, and he's given the judges something new to think about at the perfect moment. So it's all going to come down to this score. I don't think Gabrielle's going to get this right in time. Looks like it's just a little bit too late. Gabriel Medina still not sure what just happened in the heat as he rides in. Scores come through for Cole Hausman. The rookie has done it. A 7.47 to create his biggest heat win of his career. Eliminates his hero. He doesn't even know what happened priority. Yet. Now he gets the word. That was unbelievable. What a performance from the big man from San Clemente. <laughs> and the reaction from his crew. Crosby, Gabe Garcia on their feet, celebrating a huge heat win for Cole Hausman's career. Oh, Medina's just going, what just happened? A critical error. Just not taking that wave. Wow. I'm in disbelief. Big one there for Cole Hausman. He needs it behind the cut to survive his rookie season. And maybe the hardest task at hand taken on a giant of the tour. Big backside hammers from Cole and never got rattled throughout that heat. You could easily lose your headspace, Rich. Right there, outsmarting Medina. This never happened. Well, this is what Gabriel was doing to Cole, the whole heat going up inside, finding these little gems. That second turn there, that was the one. The judges got excited about it. It was crisper this wave. The, the rail stayed cleaner. There was no loss of speed. The flow was better in between turns. He'd been going hard every single wave and kind of wondering, why aren't I getting the scores here? But that was the, that was the wave he needed. There's a key line that the judges were talking about this morning when they send those emails out to the competitors. They're, they're looking at that complete flow from start to finish on the entire wave. And they've been sticking to that consistency with the scoring for Cole, finding a nice link up. Medina's still trying to wonder what happened there. Looks like he was uh, talking about the size of the wave that Cole had. Yeah, you can see he's just going, why, why there was a smaller one? But um, incredible surfing there from Cole House. This is a massive heat for him. He, like you were saying, Joe, he needs this. He needs this to climb up the ratings. Gabriel kind of needs it to to uh, you know, get up into that top five and keep himself solidified in that area. Huge upset. Luke Egan couldn't be more proud. A big performance for the rookie. Moving on into the round of 16. Kanoa Garashi coming up next against Jacob Wilcox. We'll bring in Ronnie Blakey and Felicity Palmatier for the call right after this.
The Rip Curl Pro Bells Beach, presented by Bonsoy, is brought to you by Rip Curl, the ultimate surfing company. By Visit Victoria, Melbourne, every bit different. By Eventbrite, proud sponsor of women's surfing on the WSL Championship Tour. By Oakberry, fuel yourself with the official acai of WSL Australia. And by Shiseido, official sunscreen partner of the World Surf League. Outside combo here in the round of 32, yes, yes, yes. overcoming Gabriel Medina. I was going to kick out after the first turn. You put so many combos together, and then you finally got one on the outside. They, had, they, you know, I was. I was like, it could be it because of the outside, and they loved it. So awesome! I was like, I was gonna like kick out for the first turn, and they kept going. I was like, fuck! Oh, thank God you did. <laughs> no, because you, you got because yeah. you did those combos mid wave before, yeah. and the wave was small, and the outside stood up for you, mate. That was amazing. Well done. So stoked for you. So stoked for you. We knew it was gonna be a good battle. Cole's got a lot of power. And matched up nicely with Gabriel Medina. Medina leaving the Rip Curl Pro Bells Beach again without the trophy. And we'll see how he bounces back over in Margaret's. Speaking of Margaret's, we've got a local out there in this heat. Jacob Wilcox getting things started here up against Kanoa Igarashi and really linking together some beautiful turns here to kick this one off. Heat 8, the round of 32, the Rip Curl Pro Bells Beach presented by Bonsoy, Kanoa Igarashi. On the outside now, looking to answer. This wave just not giving him the same momentum down the line, but he does get a clean finish, and we'll see what kind of work he did on the outside. Ronnie Blakey here in the berth, joined by Felicity Palmatier and Vaughan Blakey. <laughs> Morning, Ron. Can you believe it? Wow. No, can't believe it. Actually, uh, it was so wild, that heat. It just like looked like Gabe was just hustling and doing all that Gabe Medina stuff in the early stages and then just a couple of falls out of nowhere and just door swings open. Oh, unbelievable. Huge Felicity. Massive, massive result for Cole. Uh, I was actually really surprised that, yeah, Cole went that wave. It looked a little bit small, but those first couple of turns, he just linked them together so beautifully and yeah, got the big heat win. Well, we'll hear from Cole shortly, but right now let's hear from Gabriel Medina. He's with Laura. Yeah, tough end to the heat there, Gabby, for you. I'm sure you're very disappointed. A big mistake there, letting that wave go under priority. Talk us through it. I did the mistake. <laughs> uh, this is funny. Uh, this is the worst judgment I've ever seen. But uh, it's bad for the sport, you know. Uh, I know we travel. I've been through a lot of judging things, but maybe I feel like this is the worst one. Uh, but it's something that we gotta talk about. We pretend that it's not happening. It's it's happening, you know. It's it's bad for the sport and. Uh, I just hopefully it can improve and get better. Uh, hopefully they listen more to us, you know. Uh, but yeah, it is what it is. It's it's happening. And your take on that is that the wave was far too small? Oh uh, yeah, those. They gave me the best wave of the heat. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and the the last wave was pretty small. I didn't even paddle. Uh, but yeah, uh, I'm gonna try to focus on my surfing. But this is sad. Uh, yeah, you know, like so much traveling, so much in the line. We travel, we, we go far. Uh, our families are at back home. Uh, we, tra uh, we train a lot, and uh, yeah, I just feel bad. You know, it's it sucks, but it is what it is. All right, we'll see you over in Margaret River. I'm sure, you'll come back stronger. Wow, Gabriel Medina clearly frustrated, and. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a funny one. Difficult. I, I mean, from Gabby's perspective, obviously feels pretty strongly there, but but also you got to remember he's eyes on the horizon. He, he doesn't even really know what Cole did on that wave yet, so mm. he's got to go back and digest that. Um, but, yeah, obviously a disappointing result. It was a huge backside rotation that he threw down. There's always going to be those comparisons made. How do the, the combinations uh, of multiple maneuvers and clean flow stack up against one big individual turn and, and he felt like he had the edge uh, but it was you know uh, you don't have to guess what he was thinking <laughs> mm. 
Yep, lots of emotion there. It's uh, far out. Like, I mean, I was down on the beach before early this morning. Oh, we'll, we'll come back to that, Ron. Yeah, we've got some numbers rolling through for our competitors. Kanoa Igarashi up now. Nice hit on the pocket there. He's got a decent score on the way from that opening exchange, as does Jacob Wilcox. So we'll get uh, updated there. As Kanoa makes his way out, 21 minutes to go. And we have seen one of the real favourites in the uh, event this year, just showing great form, fall out of the mix here. But a, a strong performance from Cole and, and an important result that he's after too to save himself on this championship tour. Here goes Jacob Wilcox, second ride for him. First wave was a 7.33. As he loads up, he's got an, a, an amazing backhand approach, great variety and the ability to whip that board up vertically in a heartbeat. Plenty of drive down the line here from uh, Chippo Wilcox. He looks really fast. And, uh, you know, the, the, the difference between the two waves that we've seen in this heat so far is that Chippo is really fanging it. He's got plenty of speed, bit of power. Canal sort of working a little bit harder at this stage. Still yeah. got a good score on the board, though. Yeah, for sure. Having a hard time moving on from that last I know, yeah. <laughs> we, we got so much to uh, excavate and unpack there. But right now, let's have a look at this replay, Felicity. Uh, this must make you proud. <laughs> yeah, proud West Sozzy. No, this is a really, really big heat for Jacob. He's sitting at number 22 on the rankings. And to open up, you know, with a wave like this, 7.33 is beautifully done against Kanoa. And here we have a breakdown, this one, of Kanoa. Little jam in the pocket there. Layback hack oh, straight into that big first fin throw. Tons. Nice combo. Wow. Insane. Yeah, we kind of joined this wave on the back half, and uh, those f opening salvos were just insane. <laughs> big finish. Judges are uh, giving that one a 7.17. And this was the one where he was just working a little bit harder. But still getting so much spray out of the top. Love the way that Canal can hit the lip and then disengage and board slide. It just adds this little element to his turns that not a lot of surfers have. But Chippo's just fanging here. And uh, big power moves. We've seen that this morning, you know. It's, it's been a battle of some big bodies, really powerful surfing. And, uh, yeah, it's made for some pretty exciting close finishes. Check the torque there. Just really driving through the turn. So much water coming off it. And you wouldn't even say it was one of his major major manoeuvres. It was almost like a bit of a check. Yeah, that was just a transition turn, but just beautifully done. It's, like, it's non-stop. Here goes Mr. Meticulous again. Mm -hmm. Just always has that pinpoint timing. Amazing variation on the forehand as he just slips across the coping a couple of times on this one and loads up Ooh. for the big finish. Three dynamic moves, pushing the tail free. A number of times, and right behind him, Jacob Wilcox does the same thing. So Jacob has jumped up into the lead. Last ride, ride came through at a 4.5, and he tries to safety that last turn. Lack of commitment there has cost him, and he didn't get any release in that tail. So it uh, might have cost himself a really good score, but we've heard from Gabriel Medina, and uh, let's get to the, uh, the high side of the seesaw now <laughs> and check in with Laura Enneva. Yes, guys, down here with Cole. That was such an important heat for Cole. Crazy end to the heat there. You know, you chipped away at Gabby that whole heat. You went that wave under priority at the end and you absolutely shredded it to get the score. Talk us through it and what that wave looked like coming to you and, and how surprised you were that he didn't go. Um, yeah, I was, he was sitting inside me, so I knew he was going to either try to burn me on a good one or just take whatever wave from me. But. Um, I saw it coming and it kind of broke pretty far out in the sense it wasn't like the biggest way, but it broke far out. And I was like, okay, I might as well go and do a turn before he can go and then see if he goes or not. And I went and I did the, I did the first turn, he didn't go, so I second turn hit it and it was my best turn of the wave. And then at that point there, I knew there was only like two minutes left. So I was like, I might as well surf the rest of the wave and it had to get inside to it. So um, right off the bat, the wave didn't look good. And then it kind of just stood up and I surfed it. I mean, I was under priority, so I kind of had no choice but to go. And he was kind of doing that to you all heat, catching waves under priority and turning them into something. Uh, what was your approach going out there against Gabby, knowing he's just so deadly? Um, yeah, he's probably one of the smartest competitors on the planet. And um, yeah, it was interesting because out there, you you don't know. Sometimes the first wave of the set's best, sometimes the second one is. And he kept going under me, and he'd go on the first one, and then he'd get a better score. and then. 
next set I'd go on the first one and then he the second one would be better so I I just I had no idea and he was just staying really busy and um, yeah I just try to stick to my game plan and um, try to kind of just pick the eyes out of the way but it's so tricky out there and uh, yeah it was a fun heat honestly I was just gonna go out there and try to do my best surfing and um, have fun with it. And you know this has been a tough start to the year for you you're down in the rankings you really needed this result how, how was your approach coming into this event? Were you just focusing on trying to do your best surfing or you just want to be up, up the top? Um, yeah, it's a weird mindset because you don't want to stress on the cut because then it just makes your life harder. And then you, also you just want to enjoy it and kind of like... Love you, Hawk. Love you. This guy has helped a lot too, so... I'm going to go get ready. All right, good luck. Um, yeah, I mean, he's helped me have a good mindset just on like, hey, you're on tour, enjoy it. You know, this is what people dream of. And um, I kind of was telling myself like, each heat is a heat to make the cut, you know, and that was a big heat for me to make the cut, um, leading on to bigger results. And yeah, I'm just trying to enjoy it. For me, that heat was like, that heat was more of a dream than even winning a comp or a title or something right now. Cause I mean, you guys saw the interview, I was like 10, 11 years old talking about how Gabby is my favorite surfer. So um, just to have a heat with someone like that at the highest level is, um, is a dream for me. And to come out on top is another, check on the box so yeah just taking it heat by heat and try not to stress <laughs> oh, i gotta put the mic down because my arm hurts but thank you cole <laughs> uh, good luck into the next round thank you guys appreciate it they're the same arms that Give paddle him into his moment, Laura. <laughs> yeah. Oh, mate. That, <laughs> I was going to say the same arms that paddle into like 45 foot waves uh, as well. A few yeah. more push-ups, Lazo. I, I, I did love the, uh, yeah, they are the same arms that, that tackle jaws. But uh, <laughs> I, I did love the, the clip that, that Cole um, shared on his Instagram as an 11-year-old talking about Gabriel Medina being his first serve. You've got to remember how big these moments are for these mm. rookies coming up against one of your heroes to get a victory. It's something he'll never forget. Uh, probably a forgettable one for, for Gabriel. <laughs> really put us in the hot seat I here too. I just dropped it. a long black on my chair. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. It looks a bit suspect. Really, yeah, it does look suspect. <laughs> Feeling it, though. I wonder uh, if he knew that he had rain buckets on Medina with that first turn as well, because you know when you you know where someone is in the lineup and you want to spray them in the face. Like, right. <laughs> yeah, that was <laughs> our whole childhood. To each other our whole lives. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, out there at the moment, we've got another big heat on our hands, and it's Kanoa Igarashi who holds the lead. His last wave at 6.6. We'll see if Jacob Wilcox can track him down. Rip Curl Pro Bells Beach, presented by Bonsoy, is brought to you by Surf Coast Shire. Head to surfcoastevents.com.au to find out what's on. By Bonsoy, the official milk of the World Surf League. By Bond University, not for profit and not to conform. Bond University exists for you. By WeatherGuard, official portable storage of WSL Australia. And by Hydrolite, official oral rehydration partner of WSL Australia.
Welcome back to the show. Ronnie here with Felicity and Vaughn. And we are into Heat 8, the round of 32. And it's a good one. Good scores on the board for both these competitors. Great opening exchanges as Jacob Wilcox goes on the hunt for a 6.44 here. Couple of big hits already. Squares up on the final section and gives it a bit. But Kanoa Igarashi out in front at the moment. He's just uh, picking this lineup apart with his just scrupulous no, uh, this, approach. This is an so. epic heat. Uh, it's, you know, we had a, a little bit of a slow heat to start things off. Ramsey Booker, I'm not really getting any waves. And uh, some pretty high drama in the Cole Houseman Medina heat. But this one's just been blow for blow. Uh, Kanoa and Jacob really matching each other in this one. And I'm just loving it. Like every single time one of them looks like they've got a good wave and, and seems to be getting ahead. The other one will pull it back. So this is a good start on this one too. I absolutely love the speed out of this turn. Whack, tail up and over the back. And he's just looking really loose and fast, Chippo. Uh, the last turn, again, you know, he didn't want to make that mistake from the last wave where he, he kind of missed the opportunity to really hit it with authority. And he, he got a 5.17, so there was points left. But this one he closes out beautifully, Ron. And uh, I just, yeah, I think he's looking really sharp here. And Jacob Wilcox, his best result in a CT event is a quarterfinal finish, and it happened here at Bells Beach. He, he's got an incredible amount of experience for uh, a CT rookie, just in that he had so many call-ups as a, a wild card and a, re a replacement surfer. Kanoe Igarashi's never made a final series at Bells Beach, and he's also got some pretty interesting memories from surfing here at Winky Pop. He, uh, he did what most surfers don't do on a right-hand point break. He went left, <laughs> tried a full rotation there. This is before he graduated the CT ranks and broke his leg. Oh. So oh. that was way back in 2013. So, uh, yeah, he's... <laughs> Lovely memories. Yeah. Oh. He's Not. got some tough ones. Old Chalky, he's out there again. <laughs> Chalky bones. We'll see if, uh, <laughs> see if he can take a positive from this heat. He started off beautifully. Yeah, he has. But Kanoa's an interesting sort of study. If you look at his CT career, he's had some amazing finishes, got himself to the WSL finals in 2022, dipped down to 14th last season, and that's where he finds himself in this event at the moment. Only one CT win. Had that big breakthrough victory in 2019 with a, an unbelievable finals performance in a great battle with Jeremy Flores. But at that point, I thought, OK, the, the floodgates are open, going to open now. Kanoa's going to go on a, just a, a mad tear, and it just it hasn't happened. He hasn't been able to convert again since. Yeah, he hasn't. This year, you know, he started off, he got a 17th at Pipe, then got the second at Sunset. I was pretty uh, excited to see that. He was just surfing so well, and then ninth over at Portugal. We think he's sitting at sixth on the rankings now, so he's kind of in a pretty good position, and uh, i got to echo what I was saying before. This is a massive heat for Jacob. And with that last score, he just went up into first. So 6.57 for Jacob. And as we see Jake on screen, obviously helping coach Kanoa during this event. But yeah, it's another massive heat. And I just love that these boys are going blow, blow for blow. And it's real contrast in approaches. Obviously got one goofy foot, one regular. And feels like this heat's just going to keep seesawing. Yeah, well, one of the, the reasons that, that Jake's back on tour is because of Kanoa. Watching from the sidelines last year, he ended up just ringing him and saying, what, what's going on with you? Like, where, where are you? And, um, yeah, I think Kanawa sort of just went, you know what, like, I need to hang around a, a complete competitive lunatic like you. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, pulled Jake out of his day job and got him back on tour. And, uh, obviously, with, with Jake answering that call, uh, a few other people went, oh, hang on. If the scaly one's back on tour, I'll, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to lean into him as well. And Sawyer Limblad uh, getting an amazing uh, heat win to keep her place alive in the draw. She's working with Jake Patterson uh, as well. So Ethan Ewing surviving uh, so far in the contest. So he's got a nice little stable again. But uh, I think those other competitors can kind of thank Kanoa really for, for getting Jake back. Yeah, and I was uh, talking about Jake the other day to someone going, you know, his wins are so massive. Uh, won J-Bay twice, won Sunset twice as a CT event, and won the Pipe Masters. Yeah. This is when Andy and Kelly are in their prime at the top of their game. The Cooley kids are on tour. Like, he was he was doing stuff that really he had no right to do, but that just shows <laughs> you the nous and the absolute mongrel in him. He is so competitive, and I don't think anyone loves it more. Like, 
he loves the competition as much as he loves surfing and he loves surfing a lot so yeah it says a lot about you know just what made this guy what crafted him yeah look at him leaning into uh leaning. this heat six and a half minutes to go kaipo is out there in the lineup kaipo what a show this heat's been yeah, it's been a great show. Ah, I don't know if it's been the show. It's been pretty strategic, actually, between the two. And, you know, right now we can see Jacob Wilcox under priority uh, paddling out there. He did take the lead. Uh, we got into play. I just wanted to highlight the Apple Watch. So I'm, I have all the information that Jacob is getting. So Jacob, on his watch, knows that he has a 7.33 and a 6.57. He knows he's ahead, and he knows he is in second priority. He also knows that he's under six minutes remaining. So uh, I feel a really good by the positioning out there, Ron, that uh, Jacob Wilcox playing the game well. Really playing it well at this point in time. 6.57, kind of recovered after uh, a fall on a previous ride to get himself the lead back here. Kanoa's after a 6.74, out there with priority and just waiting for that opportunity. But but both guys look really switched on, Felicity. Yeah, they do. And oh, I, you know what? You can sort of see the texture on the face of the ocean right now ever so slightly that wind sort of coming around and what I've liked about Jacob's approach on his backhand is sort of given this tiny little tuft of foam for him to be able to go up and drift the fins on as we have a look here Kanoa yeah Kanoa lining up and uh, has a lot of speed to lay into this full rail carve getting right back to the source through that first turn Tidy work in the pocket again as he hammers down the line. Speed float to set up this finishing move. Swings oh. the reverse and rides out with ease. Throws the fist up. And that will uh, will get the old snake pretty excited. <laughs> and he puts his hands together for good reason. And uh, Cave Matson uh, there throwing his hands together. But that was that was solid you know where we talked about this guy's precision vaughn just that, how well he times his move when he's on you know he keeps those rails so tidy yeah yeah he's just got so much variety too and as he sort of loaded up into that end section air rev you could just tell he was like i'm i'm throwing this thing it's gonna go uh just into full backing himself mode which you know it's always the way where these surfers really start to hit good form like those sorts of moves can be the one that really kick in that momentum into the rest of the event. But this is such a strong ride. Throws the tail. And, uh, yeah, really nice technique there. So much variety. It, yeah, I was going to mention that. He, I think he knew that from the start of this wave, like, these were great time turns. But I think coming through to this inside section, he obviously gets this little float here to go down the line. He knew he needed to go to the air. And just to have the confidence to be able to do it and throw it all on the line for that last manoeuvre, I think it's it's with a shoe and it's pretty close that he's going to get this score like that was that was super critical last turn of the wave and just did it with ease didn't he loved it yeah <laughs> I, I think earlier on he, he had a really nice wave and um just with those steep sections he couldn't help himself but just go to that kind of trademark kanoa fin throw turn and he mm. did it three times it was like a little repetition r repetitious and on that occasion started things with a roundhouse you don't see too many of those out winky and then you know no Two turns were the same on that ride. 7.47. He's back in front. And Wilcox is after a 7.32. You you mentioned, Felicity, the importance of this event for Jacob. You know, wants to relieve some pressure heading into stop number five. But I, I know for you, you, you want to see him at cloud break this year. It, it, it would be awesome for him for that opportunity, a long running left it to really show us what he can do. Oh, uh, it, it'll be amazing. You know, I just think back to seeing so much footage and, and I've personally just seeing Jake about it, you know, waves like Nalu and all the big long left-handers that we have in Western Australia and waves of consequence. I mean, he would just be going to town out there. But right now with two and a half minutes on the clock, he's chasing a 7.32 which, you know, is basically he's just got to do like what he did on that first wave. Mm. Good thing for him right now. He's got priority. Yeah, he's not thinking about his forehand at the moment, is he? No, he's thinking about that backhand attack. <laughs> yeah, he's uh, an exceptional talent. Just his edits uh, in the lead up to graduating to the CT ranks were, were just amazing. Into, into dust, uh, default. Uh, oh, mate, some, some of the best. And, and you know, had, had a lot of people saying this is the best guy out there you know, with competitive aspirations, not on the tour at the moment. And here he is. And this is a good test, Vaughn. Well, we all know he packs it. He packs it <laughs> deep. He packs it hard. But, yeah, these are the challenging conditions, man. Like, uh, you get out here, it's just all about putting your, 
your contest hat on. And uh, he's done a really good job here. He's built a beautiful heat. But, um, yeah, these guys have been lifting each other throughout this thing. Uh, they both didn't really want to let the other guy get away with it. And it has been a bit of a slugfest. So can Jacob land a knockout blow with, you know, a minute 20 on the clock? That's what we're sitting here chomping at the bit to see. Just needs to repeat the performance on that opening ride and he'll be all good. But you've got two surfers out there, 26 years of age and uh, really looking like they're switched on and ready to have a good run at the event title here. Only one of them, of course, is going to make it through this heat, though. Kanoa, you mentioned his return to the top end uh, of the ranks with that second place finish. Doesn't want to drop the ball here and pretty remarkable to me to, to think about Kanoa and the fact that he hasn't broken into the final series here before. Yeah, it, it is a bit remarkable. I, I think, I mean, maybe this could be his year right now. It's looking pretty good for him. But I just feel that, yeah, I think his surfing does suit here. I mean, I think back to just what I was seeing at, at Sunset, that big right-hander and just how well he performed on finals day. And if he can sort of bring that momentum and uh, how he was performing there to the bowl, if we get an opportunity to get back there, it's looking pretty good for him. It looks like he might have got the job done here. Jacob Wilcox splashing the water in disgust and uh, oh. Kanoa making his way in. But uh, you've got to give props to the uh, the Olympian. Kanoa, he will be uh, surfing for Japan again in Tahiti later this year. Jacob shakes his head. I mean, if you reflect on it, there, there was a moment in that heat where Jacob potentially was on his way to uh, a better number than the 6.57, just with a fall at the end. So there was sort of opportunities for them in that one. Yeah, there was. And I think, you know, it's just, it's good. Like you said, Ron, it's really going to make that job a bit harder going into Margaret River now. A bit more pressure as obviously that is the cut event. So good thing for Jacob is that he's home. So it's going to be feeling at least that's going to be comforting. Kanoa 2-0 against Jacob Wilcox head to head as he moves on through to the round of 16. We'll take a quick break. More with action. More action after the break. Have a look at the paddle battle here wow. between these two competitors to get the inside position in the opening stages. Big Tully Wiley, the winner of the trials, not backing down to the current world number one. And the reward, a straight closeout. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Tully Wiley up against Griffin Colapinto here in Heat 9, the round of 32. And let's have a look at the replay. Oh, Whoa. it's all elbows. Holy dolly. <laughs> Just no respect. It's that's that's the cool thing, you know. Like he, he might not have got the result he wanted, but he's letting Griffin know right here, hey mate, I'm gone. Get ready. It takes a lot of guts. Yeah, to this be is able to my town. That's a lot of guts. Well, let's see if it upsets the uh, rhythm of the current world number one as he leans into that first turn, slashing away at this one, just waiting for some steeper wall to work with. There it is. Banks into it a couple of times now. And now starts to free that tail up as he moves through to the inside. And eyes off a finish here 
And it's a clean hit from Griffin Colapinto. Tully's going to get an opportunity to reply. But uh, this one is uh, a closeout. So an easy call to kick off that one. Ronnie sitting alongside Felicity and Vaughn. And you'd love to see it, Felicity, <laughs> in the opening stages. You know, someone surfing in, in just their second championship tour event and just going, all right, I'm not here to muck around. This is uh, it's just it's a bit of argy-bargy in the early AM hours, as we see Tully. Bang! Nice vert there. Tully's going to be campaigning on the Challenger Series this year after a really strong run through the regional QS in the Australia Oceania region. Second time in the event was uh, bumped out in the elimination round a couple of years back. And he's still looking for that first big number. Griffin on the outside, trying to get back to the takeoff zone. Looks like he's going to put up a, a mid-range six with that first ride. It comes short of 6.5, Vaughn. Yeah, really just cruising, it looked like. Um, some good little stingy moments there from Griffin Colapino. Last turn had a nice little, uh, you know, something to it. But, uh, yeah, just you'd say a cruisy one, a, a bit of a starter. But uh, Tully, yeah, he's, uh, I think... You know, from what I've seen in the past 12 months, he would be one of Australia's most improved surfers. Like 12 months ago when he surfed in this event, um, he was just at the start of this real performance uplift, you know, and uh, he, throughout that uh, regional qualifying series, he, he just got better and better and better. And when we saw him at the uh, recent board riders battle, he was just, uh, a, you know, he'd lost a bit of weight. He looked lean, he looked powerful, and he was the standout surfer of that event replay here felicity of griffs yeah i think got to echo what uh, Vorno was saying that it looked like he was only in gear one or two here but everything was super smooth super super silky obviously got the fin throw there at the end but just a really good well put together wave first mm. wave of the heat banks of six five yeah and tally just still looking for that reply but, uh, you know, that, that scale's been set at a 6.5. The comparisons have been made to that. I think if you were being critical, you'd say the first couple of turns weren't, were nothing from Griffin. Uh, the numbers came kind of on the work that he did further down the line. So, you know, if Tully can let go of a couple of those big backhand nooners <laughs> to kick off these rides, he could be looking good. And I, I do like, I don't know if I, I'd, I'd put it the way Richie Lovett did uh, last time we saw Tully surf. He said he looked like a swollen version of Matt Wilkinson. <laughs> but uh, maybe just a, a slightly taller and more built-out version of Matt Wilkinson. <laughs> swollen. God. He's a big boy, oh, though, boy. He's a big boy. He, he's huge. He's actually, um, uh, you know, in a really strong peer group uh, from down this way. And uh, one thing that he is going to have to his advantage in this heat is crowd support. Like, you get down there for the Ellie Harrison and the mm. Tully Wiley heats, it is loud. It mm. is full atmosphere. <laughs> and uh, they're going to be cheering on Tully really, really loudly here with plenty of vigour. So that's going to factor into him if he can find a bit of momentum. Griffin now looking for a backup. Or maybe even a stronger number to go with the 6.5. Whips it on the first turn. Has a lot of speed here. Finally gets the opportunity to commit to a turn. And again, swings the reverse. Oh. Pretty reliable move for him. And uh, that'll give him a, a pretty healthy heat score total here in the uh, opening 10 minutes and put some pressure on the, the young gun. This just hasn't made a mistake. That was beautifully surfed. Just the connectivity throughout that whole wave, the flow. There wasn't any little skatey, bobbly moments. Just straight from one turn into the next, really flowy. I feel like in my eyes that wave was better than his first. So that's a lot of a pressure already to put on Tully. And Vaughn, uh, just with that big paddle battle at the start, you know, Griff's kept a real cap on his emotions and, mm. and just surfed a very smart heat so far. Nobody keeps a better cap on their emotions than Griffin Colapinto. <laughs> we, we know what his mental preparation is leading into not just, you know, day-to-day -day life, into events. Uh, he's, it's kind of like a big picture thing too. He, he really focuses throughout the year. Tully now just uh, looking to get things going. He's had a number of rides. This oh. is wave number five and he's Starting to put it together now. This wave is really giving him some great opportunities to attack as he gets through to the inside and finishes one off finally. This will get him back in the heat. You hear the whistles from that local crowd. Vaughan mentioned the, the peer group that he's part of, even the surface that he overcame it. 
crack the main event is uh, impressive. Xavier Huxtable, Todd Rosewell, Willis Drum are all great surfers. But from the Torquay Board Riders Club, Vaughan, uh, a club that's been around for 45 years, and there's no shortage of huge names in that grassroots organisation as we see the replay here at Griff. Yep, so smooth. Uh, a little bit busier here. I think he uh, just has a bit more intent on this wave and sort of pushes out that uh, air reverse on the end section just to add the variety. Perfectly placed in the pocket there. Freeze the fins. Then Tully, this will be interesting to watch from this angle because we were kind of looking across at it before. Down the line speed, up and over. So connects these ones really smoothly. And a nice big backside vert. Cracks it with power on the inside. Gets the combination to finish. And that's the wave he's been waiting for. I think this one, you know, the start here was a little bit slow. He almost had a little bit of a bauble there. But these two turns I was really impressed with. He just had this really beautiful projection as he like, popped the fins out. And just he was kind of behind it and just ended up with that technique that he has, he's just able to project out over that section and got the finish. He definitely needed a wave at this point because Griff is sort of running away with it. This one's going to get him back into it. But uh, I'm just interested to see where they're going to go on it because the beginning of the wave for me just looked a little bit... No, it wasn't that as strong. It had good strong points toward the end of the finish. Not so much on that beginning opening combo. Yeah, you're picking up on the speed and, and that's something that, you know, I, I kind of recognize in, in championship tour surfers Vaughn it seems like at this level things just move a little bit quicker and as a, a wild card you've got to step up and get to that that kind of fast fast twitch approach yeah I remember when uh, Mark Ocalupo was on the comeback to the QS uh, after some time away uh, when he was building into that world title year 25 years actually Ron since Oki won the world title so doff of the cap to the great man but <laughs> yeah I think he went to Barton Lynch it's a famous story and he, he said you know well, what do you think I have to do to to get back into the game and Barton was just like faster mate everything is faster it's so fast and I mean I was down on the rocks before with the crowd and when you're there and you can actually see the speed of which the waves run down the line and the speed that these guys generate out of those waves, it is mind-blowing. Like, you're down there just thinking, wow. I mean, Medina is a good example in the opening stages of his heat. He was just fanging it. <laughs> and uh, it's just so cool to see. And, um, yeah, sometimes you don't really pick that up in the broadcast just because you're sort of moving at the speed of the surfer with the camera angle. But when you're down there, you're just like, wow, this is something special. Most definitely. Well, uh, tricky conditions today. It's a little smaller. And the uh, coaches are helping their surfers get the ultimate game plan. Oh, yeah, this way. You're a fucking weapon, Noah. I can hear you in my head. Well done, pot, pot, pot. <laughs> 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 I can hear Snake just going, come on, come on. I was so rattled with the scores they were giving you. You're six four. I thought you should have had like better than his first wave. Yeah, I, I kind of missed time like the first like five turns. No, I said the first turn you missed. I thought like I missed every turn except my last one. Yeah, well maybe. But it was it was that. nice though. It was like ten through water, but you yeah. missed the first turn looked totally missed and no nothing. Yeah. And then you kind of like went through water. Well, I thought it'd be like water. a I thought it'd be like a low seven. Yeah. I thought Sorry, it was better sorry. than the first one. Yeah, I thought, at first I thought it was, and I started criticizing it hard on that maybe it's a seven two or seven three. Yeah. But geez, you took it, put it all on the line. Yeah. I loved it. So strong. I didn't know whether to punt on that first session where I did the float. I loved it. Or the second one. I loved it. Loved I knew it. that was going to be my last wave. You weren't waving, so I was like, oh, no. <laughs> is it small? <laughs> no, there was nothing behind. Yeah, yeah. Which means. Yeah, that's the one. I was going, you couldn't let that one go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Kanoa Garashi, big smile on his face, which is uh, nice to see. Mate, how yeah, good. good is copping criticism with that much enthusiasm? Mate? <laughs> yeah. mate, you blew that first turn, you missed it, it was sick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but also, I, I like the fact, Jake, said, I thought this score was good, and Kanoa, like, his honest appraisal was, yeah, yeah, I missed a couple of turns yeah. there. I missed the first five turns. Uh, so, you know, he was not feeling like he would switched on just yet, but he, he certainly did towards the end of the heat. And like Jake said, you put it all on the line, and... I think for any of these competitors, Felicity, that's 
got to be the ultimate feeling when you risk it and pull it off. Oh, I'll risk it for the biscuit. <laughs> but yeah, he absolutely did. And it's a good feeling. And he, he did go to the air those couple of times on that last section. And it's it's really risky. I mean, if he did fell there, he probably potentially might not have gotten the score and it would have been a different outcome. So for Kanoa, that's a good heat win. And yeah, I, you know, I always love listening to Jake uh, mm. from a coach's perspective when he comes in. He's never afraid of uh, dishing out a few hard truths, is he? Yeah. <laughs> well, Jake's had the opportunity uh, of ringing the bell with some surfers he's coached and uh, never got one himself. But mm. the, the dream's still alive this year, Vorno, to make his uh, big coaching return here at Bells Beach. Yep. Kanoa's a uh, pretty prime weapon in his artillery if he wants to get that experience again. It's uh, He's looking so good. I, I really agree with Felicity, what she was saying before. This wave, whether it's big bells or or really fast down the line, small winky, he's got the style to, to really match it. Get yeah. some big scores and he, he'll be a threat. Yeah, he's a, just got to overcome all that sort of sad history that he's got with this event. Yeah. He's, he's got to turn that around. But he's certainly capable. He's got the skills as we see Griffin up here. Wave number three, been scoring pretty nicely. Let's see if he now starts to put the foot down with a couple of decent numbers on the board. He looks a bit more aggressive on this one. 16 minutes to go as he whips the reverse again. That's a go-to. I mean, it's a great little uh, card to have up your sleeve. Oh, I don't think it's one of those versions of that turn that's going to take him, say, up into the excellent range, but it's just a, a tidy little finisher. I just love the way he really waited for that first section and was able to open up into that big carving manoeuvre, which actually set him up for that next turn because it gave him a little bit of coping to hit for that foam climb. So just such a good read from Griff at the beginning of that wave and just had good tempo the whole way through. So, and then finishing with a bit of progression there at the end, but this is the, what I'm talking about. He really waits for this first section, drops down, goes to this carving manoeuvre, and that actually creates this bit of foam for him to actually go up and release the fins on for that second turn. So, yeah, good read on this wave from Griff. I really liked the beginning of that and then knew we needed some variety, so I thought, why not? Let's just chuck the fins here on the last turn. This is crazy. Like, uh, I'm thinking about that paddle battle now, <laughs> you know, just the adrenaline spike that Tully would have felt, you know, being shoulder to shoulder, really physical battle to try and just get one up over the other competitor. Griffin has responded oh. with a really oh. cool, measured so cool. world number one performance here. And, and Tully, maybe that adrenaline is just into him because his wave selection's a little bit off. He's had a few falls and uh, he just needs to sort of regather. Maybe just sit in the moment a little more and, and just be really careful not to let Griff run away with this. That was great. This is going to be a good score. Yeah. Yeah, it is. 6.47. And uh, Tully just trying to regather himself here he's going to have a, a pretty big number to chase down now as he whips up into that first turn that'll help his cause drives up into the pocket again still plenty of time on the clock for the local boy as he starts to find his rhythm on this one oh just gets a little bogged down on the end of that ride was after an 8.14 you can tell there that He's a little frustrated with himself. That, that wave had a weird little ridge in it that just wouldn't let him get out in front and just, you know, find the tempo that was going to match the wave. He was just kind of having to manufacture everything there. Just frustrated. You could see it. Yeah. As soon as he pulled off, he was like, man, what is going on? Yeah, that temp the tempo just wasn't quite there. And you could definitely see it with that rivet in the face of the wave. Looks like Griff's maybe having a look. Maybe going to paddle into something here. But, yeah, that tempo was just slightly off. For Tully on that last one, you could see his frustration. Oh, look at this thing. One of the bigger waves that we've seen roll through, but this one just doesn't line up that well. But Tully may be in a better position here. He looks down the line, doesn't see much. He's going to kick out of this one. So scores coming in for Tully on that previous wave. It's a 4.6. Doesn't change oh. the situation for him as Griffin now is on a bigger wave. Beautiful first turn to get started. Little float there. Had a couple of mid-range sixes. Would love to, to push harder and get himself up into that excellent range now. But at the moment, in control, Kaipo. Yeah, I mean, so everything started, I feel, at the beginning of this heat with a battle between... Yeah, just losing uh, Kipes on the, the audio there. 12 and a half minutes ago. Tully looking at his watch. He's aware that he needs an excellent score. And, you know, when you think about the surfing that we've seen from, 
from Griffin. Yeah, it's going to have to be a, a pretty exceptional rider. It's been mistake-free, clean stuff to get a couple of mid-range sixes. Definitely Griff has a, another gear he can go to, as uh, you pointed out earlier, Felicity. But, you know, that's going to... You know, if he's going to turn this heat with a single ride, it's going to have to be, a, I'd say, one of the waves of the day. Well, I think it will have to be the wave of the day so far if, if, he, want, if he wants to turn it right now. I think... It's, I actually thought that maybe this that set wave that Griff took off on, I thought it was going to allow it like run a bit more and he was actually maybe going to potentially get to get go excellent. Uh, that one just kind of closed out in front of him. But, it, yeah, Griff's got a lot more gears that he can click into. Uh, we haven't seen the full potential right now. And to see that he's sitting out there with a couple of, you know, six fives, it, it, that's dangerous for Tully, you know, because I just see Griff having a lot more gears to click into. Feeling good after a big heat win just moments ago. Kanoa Igarashi with Laura Anava. Yes, Kanoa, what an exciting heat. We were just saying, you know, slow, slow waves this morning, but we know it's building throughout the day. But that heat was fireworks. Both of you with 14 points. Talk us through the end of that. It must have felt good. Yeah, I mean, when the waves are, are like this, it's uh, there's not really like one wave that's a lot better than the other one. It's really it's really tight and the, the waves are run, running really nice through the reef. So. It's just about who surfs better, I feel like, and, and um, you know, it, it was such a tight heat. Um, you know, I had a lot of fun just going blow for blow, for blow with Jacob. Um, we've had a lot of good heats in the past, and uh, we had a, a Rip Curl Grom Switch final uh, at Rincon a few years ago. I mean, maybe 10 years ago. Um, and uh, we were laughing about that in the water, but it's, it's nice to have a heat with waves. Amazing. And you're in sixth position on the rankings at the moment. After that win into the round of 16, you have officially made the cut must feel good. Talk us through your year so far and what you're most proud of and what you're looking for. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, it's nice to be uh, in a good position going into the back end of the year. Um, you know, I, I had a tough heat, a tough loss here last year that I felt like it kind of sort of, um, you know, set a bad pace for the rest of my year. So I feel like this event at Bells is really important. It's uh, right near that kind of mid-year uh, mid area where you sort of have to start, you know, gaining ground and, and people start, you know, the top five start kind of like you know, separating and then the mid pack, everyone start, sort of starts separating a little bit. So I feel like this is a really important event to, to make sure you get as many points as you can to, to go into the back end of the year um, in a good position. Amazing. Well, we'll see you later on today, hopefully in the round of 16. Uh, I just want to say something in Japanese. Uh, I just want to say something in Japanese. 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 I just want to say something in Thank you. Igarashi has made the cut and also looked to. to really hold his position at the top end of the ranks. He wants to be in that final five, but he had a, a disappointing finish when he cracked the, the WSL finals last time. He'd love to get back there and give it a, a proper dig as we see. Wow, Tully putting it on the line on that first turn. It does kind of put him a little behind for a moment though. Back in front, starting to, to really just loosen up here. And that is the wave that he needed. And he's still got a lot of time. But on the outside, Cola Pinto, so much speed. As he just goes full F1 into that big frontside carve and finishes the wave off. And a, a little appeal there to the panel or, or his crew at the bottom of the steps here at Winky after finishing that one off. So a great exchange. It'll be Tully's best. And Griffin might just improve his heat score total. There was a little hint, wasn't there, on that last wave, that, that one big frontside hack that got that... Uh that big set going and um you know we made mention of it it looks like he's building he's building but that was easily the most aggressive he's been in this heat so far but tully wiley the back half of this wave is fireworks some big big power moves and uh, even though he did lose a little bit of rhythm after this turn so a big hangout to get things going just gets a little caught behind but then he uh he starts really getting to work here off the bottom jams that that was a massive turn and the big unit just cracks it on the inside. And he gets the crowd involved. So uh, that's going to be important for Tully too because he'll be feeling it as Griffin comes down the line and just unleashes. That was pure fury. And Powell on the inside even throws the tail into the layback and he doesn't lay down too long either because the judges, you know, they don't want to see you patting the dog and <laughs> just being lazy uh, in there. Uh, a little rest. 
clicking it up a few gears. That, that He definitely had a different speed to that wave that we've seen compared to those earlier 6.5s uh, from Griff. So, yeah, I mean, he liked it too. You could tell by his body language as soon as he finished that layback jam in the pocket. He was like, come on, like, I'm feeling it. I'm feeling it. Yeah, he, he got to be a little bit, like, it does kind of feel like he's been cruising, hey? Like, yeah. it doesn't really look like he has been going really hard at it. Uh, in the same way that the Kanoa and Wilcox heat mm. really was like a bit of a slugfest. We're going to take a quick break here. Just under seven minutes to go. Griffin Colapinto currently hanging on to the lead. the show this is the rip girl pro bells beach a beautiful saturday morning we're at winky pop and this is live action the current world number one ratings leader griffin colapinto is throwing everything at the end section well just before the break we saw him tap into a nice set let go of a big front side carve back it up with a few hits on the lip and he did turn in an 817 this wave isn't going to factor in but felicity he gave it everything yeah, he did. You can just tell he just wants to go bigger and bigger now. I probably heard that 8.17. He's like, right, let's take it up another notch. This air even bigger than kind of one of the bigger airs we've seen this morning. But he just didn't quite come out in front of that foam enough and, yeah, went down. But I'm, I'm liking what I'm seeing from Griff. I feel like he's feeling more and more confident with every wave he's kind of taking off on. And For sure. It's been good to watch. Yeah, ran himself over then. <laughs> uh, so he's out in front. Tully Wiley, the, the local boy. Torquay board riders surfer is out there looking for an 8.4. But uh, it, it's just a, a really cool mindset that, that Griffin's tapped into today. He's out there having a look at insiders under priority now, looking to really put it to, to bed here. Swings the reverse on that first section, whipping that tail. A smaller wave, so he's having to really push it if he wants to get himself a, a better number than a 6.53. Tommy Whitaker throws his hands together. He likes it. Yeah, he seems to just to have uh, clicked into a bit of a I'm having a surf now mode. Mm. He uh, He's getting busy on the inside. He's picking off smaller waves, and he's just uh, getting himself into a state of high energy, I think. Yeah, he gets himself uh, really just focused uh, and in the moment, but can click into that competitive animal uh, as we saw at the start of this heat. But, you know, big on his meditation for now and, and probably a, a good time to bring up that it's been 40 years since two of the uh, original yogi slash meditation gurus uh, surfed a final against one another here, Shane Horan and, and Tom Carroll. <laughs> yeah, well, I've, uh, I've done some meditation work with TVC, the two-time world champ, and it's 
Mate, it's cosmic, all right. <laughs> you go to some pretty special places when you meditate with Tom Carroll. Yeah. Into the cone zone, a pipeline. You, you get to see all these places, mate. Yeah, that was uh, 1986 that wow, they surfed the final against so one cool. another. Yeah, Shane Aran, uh, victorious and uh, always riding uh, interesting equipment, but he won $6,800 that year. Look at this, this little inside wave, 7.4. Griffin turned it around with that... that it was actually the 6.53, so it's not even in his top two anymore. But that first turn was the first time we saw him really engage with a little bit of intent. Mm. Felt like he was just sort of almost just like, I don't know, finding his way around the lineup a little bit to start off with. And now he's just fully on the flare. And we're going to see if Tully can uh, turn this into a near perfect number here. He needs a 9.27 now. Nice hit couple of times now he's been in this main event and he always has a, a couple of solid scores but he needed something huge there he needed more than what he he gave on that ride as oh. griffin right behind him and as you said he's just surfing out there now swings the board around again won't go into the top two but felicity he's just sort of maintained this he was sort of in the slow lane had he, his foot halfway down and Tully wasn't really uh, keeping up with him. And then when, once Tully dropped the 6.3, Griff put his foot to the floor and he's just sped off. Oh, yeah, he t definitely has. He's clicked it up a few gears. He's in gear three or four now, maybe even possibly five. But He, he might even be doing doughies in the yeah. car park. Right? <laughs> he's really put the foot on the accelerator. Uh, but, yeah, like the 817 was beautiful. That 7.4 was a smaller wave. He's like, may as well swing. Let's go. He's... What you said, Vaughn, he's clicked into that um, yeah. free surf mode and he just looks like he's not falling. He, he's got his feet really heavily in that wax and yeah, he's just yeah. taking this little one in, just a bit of a joy ride. He strikes me as the kind of guy, if he was going to do a donut in a car park, he'd actually have his arm out the window <laughs> throwing a shaka. Yeah. Oh, man. After that performance, that was unreal. The 8.17 was just, <laughs> it, was a, it was so good. It was like that first turn was just a full sear fest. And uh, yeah, a couple of big hits on the inside as well but geez that was just world number one all over the shop wasn't it it was it was always going to be a, a difficult task for griffin uh for tully wiley up against griffin cola pinto griffin so well rounded and tully you know showing his strengths with some some good backhand hits and uh it'll definitely be fun to watch in that first challenger series uh, event up there at snapper rocks there are the results though and it's a, a confidence building Round of 32 performance for Griffin Colapinto. We are going to take a, a quick break and we'll be back with more on a beautiful Saturday here at the Rip Curl Pro Bells Beach presented by Bonsoy. Kelly Slater coming up shortly. The Rip Curl Pro Bells Beach, presented by Bonsoy, is brought to you by Cooper's Brewery, the official beer of WSL Australia. By Boost Mobile, official telecommunication partner of WSL Australia. By BioGlan, official vitamin partner of WSL Australia. By GWM, 
official automotive partner of WSL Australia. And by Mophie, the official portable power bank partner of the Rip Curl Pro Bells Beach, presented by Bonsoy. Mophie, stay powerful. What a big morning it's been in the round of 32. Heat 10 just getting started. Miguel Pupo taking on Crosby Colapinto. Crosby's big brother Griff, number one in the world, just got the win over local boy Tully Wiley. It started off aggressive, but it was Griff just flowing down the line, got the job done. Thanks for joining us in the set here. Joe Trapel with Richie Lovett, who put on the jersey several times at Bells, and also Winky Pop here for the call. Now we've got Miguel versus Cros. Crosby, the rookie on tour that's actually leading the rankings against the veteran Goofy Footer. Yeah, this is going to be an exciting matchup. And again, we've got Goofy versus Natural. We've got the young San Clemente uh, fella. Just watched his big brother get through and put in an amazing performance. So uh, let's see if he can follow suit. But Miguel Pupo, he's had some amazing performances down here at Bells, um, you know, the Winky Pop section has sort of been a bit inconsistent for him. So let's see if he can put it together. Yeah, he's one of those surfers that can turn in brilliant combined totals over the years and then sometimes would just get stuck maybe in round two, round three, had that one performance where he made a finals day out here. But a lot of up and down results in his history at Bells Beach, but it didn't really speak to his form at times. That kind of reminds me of his reputation at Tahiti, his single championship tour win of his career, when if you're just pulling up notes and looking at results previously, you'd be like, oh, maybe he struggles with this event, but he would be getting eights, eight fives, and sometimes just being in those super heats where he was just losing it at the end. So when Miguel won Tahiti, I remember talking to him about that. He's like, this has always been my favorite. It just was a matter of time before I went on the roll and won the whole thing. Yeah, and, you know, it, you, that's one thing you cannot take away. Once you have that win, and especially a win at one of those uh, primo prime locations <laughs> like a Pipeline or a Tahiti, you know, that trophy sits on your mantelpiece forever and forevermore, and it's an amazing achievement. So, you know, he's been touted as one of the one of the most stylish surfers on tour, especially on the backhand at the bowl. We've seen him put in some fantastic carving uh, turns turns on the backhand. It's a little bit faster down the line today, so I think we'll see uh, Miggy, uh, you know, speed up that approach a little bit more, maybe get a little bit more vertical. Remember that year at Snapper Rocks where he went all the way to finals day, surfing about two to three foot snapper. It was really running and rippable. That was the year Toledo won his first event. He had these like inverted under the lip backhand floats. We, we saw him do a version of that at the Bells Bowl the other day. Yeah, yeah, we did. And uh, well, again, we've talked about being adaptive, uh, being able to adapt to these different conditions, these surfers. And uh, Bells normally throws everything at you through the entirety of the event. We have had uh, big conditions early on. Yeah, we've got these fun, rippable walls down here at Winky Pop. And uh, what a day, packed. I just went for a little walk up on the cliff there, Joe, and there are people everywhere. <laughs> Easter Saturday, it's getting super crowded. The car park's full and uh, a lot of people being able to interact, being able to get up and close. Uh, our surfers come right into the car park and they have to walk through the crowds to get down to the stairs. So a pretty special moment. Kanoa went his seat earlier and I was just walked past his car parked in the parking lot and they're almost inside of his car with yeah. a big line. Uh, they're just waiting their turn to say hi to one of their heroes. And some have made the trek down on the rocks and then upstairs here on Easter Saturday. It's still 1040 in the morning local time. It's really comfortable here in the state of Victoria weather wise. The, the slogan goes, if you don't like the weather, wait a minute. You can get about four seasons in a day here pretty easily. Hi, everybody. Yoo here on hand, Shout watching out the Jumbo to the car park. Yeah, really cool space there to uh, to watch the event. We've got the big screen down there, lots of different activations. Get yourself a feed, pull up a little uh, bit of asphalt and settle in for the day. Oh, it's but great. super low tide still, Joe, down here. You can see all that reef exposed down here at Winky. And uh, that means the waves are going to be a little steeper as the tide fills in through the afternoons. It may get a little slopier on the wave face. We see that water texture has come up already, and we've seen our surfers start to take to the air and take advantage of those little copings. The other day, I was looking at Crosby sitting in the water in his opening round here, and I'm like, what's different about his jersey? I kept like, scratching my head going, hang on a second. I mean, it says Cola Pinto. Right now, that, that's his jersey, 66. But then in the other day, the opening round, it was flipped. I mean, I guess you think about it, 
same last name as his big brother. Yeah. His brother is in yellow, but I think he had the wrong jersey on. Yeah, really? <laughs> oh, he did too. <laughs> Look Never at that. Mind. That's 99. That's Griff's jersey. Oh, wow. I Good asked him, up. I actually texted Crosby. I'm like, All right, did you just get your brother's jersey? And he's like, no, I didn't. <laughs> I just gave it to him. I don't even think he realized it <laughs> as we watch Miguel. Nice snap through the first section. Throwing some water off the tail. Nice vertical and transition. There's that style and pace that's so brilliant. Looking smooth. Belting it vertically again. Nice tag on the finish. And Miguel starts off in a fantastic way. Yeah, that's a really good opener. Uh, geez, as you said, pace on that wave was, was perfect. The first two turns as we watch the replay. Just take note as he doesn't overcook them. Keeps that board pointing down the line once the wave slows up. Then he really starts to dig into those more powerful, more, more uh, you know, with purpose type maneuvers. Crosby just having a little look at that one. Not quite, uh, not quite big enough. Didn't see enough opportunity on that one down the line. Gee, free surf session would be all over that thing. <laughs> but uh, in a heat situation, there's a certain type of wave that these competitors are looking for. They're always looking at these swells as they approach. You have to make that split second decision. Is there enough points on this wave, you know? And they're basically reading the wave as it's coming closer to them. And they'll know, they'll go, okay, I feel like I can get a seven or an eight out of this thing, or maybe even more. So they'll pull the trigger and they'll go. One more look at the start here. You see Papupo on the positioning, uh, like a veteran here. Yeah, it looked like, uh, Gri uh, sorry, Cross was gonna have a look. If uh, Miggy didn't go, but these first two turns, see how he kept them down the line? Now the wave slows up. The radius of the turn, full up. Jams this off the backhand again and finishes strong, more vertical on the final hit, stands tall, shows the judges it was complete control for that final maneuver. Here's where it starts to uh, get a little steeper on the wave face. And Miguel starts to build up his rhythm here. Through the lip on that one, nice and radical. And then watch the board, pow, just hits that final section. Great slow-mo action there. You can see the board. Watch the nose, pointing down the line. Love watching this sort of upper uh, and lower body marriage on these backhanders. That one's vertical. You can see that upper body twisting around. The lower body follows and the transition from heel side rail to toe side rail. So bang, on the heel side rail here. Watch him transition onto the toe side rail now through the turn. That back arm almost acting like a, a pendulum weight to help him maintain speed and balance throughout these turns. Incredible flexibility with all our surfers on the tour across the men and women's field. Strength and flexibility, two of the key ingredients to being a good surfer. Yeah, it's a different type of build, isn't it, from other yep. sports? Uh, watching the footy with you last night, just brick walls running down <laughs> yeah, the field. Yeah, those guys are solid as, man. Where these guys have to maintain their mobility, their flexibility, and be able to have incredible strength throughout their lower body. Griffin Colapinto, number one in the world coming off a huge win what an opportunity for griff second time he's worn yellow in his career but the earliest in the season that he's had it you start thinking about great california performances here it always starts with tom curran at bells you put richie collins in there as well he's got a bell that was uh, one of the most dramatic ways to ring that bell yeah he was lying on a stretcher oh. <laughs> and he won the event. Landed on a rock, had to get pulled out of the final. And our good friend Potts was in there just scratching his head going, okay, I'll wait for a wave and it just never came. And they had to do the ceremony by the ambulance. Uh, Richie Collins uh, taking that Bell's title back in the day. As we see Crosby still waiting. Opening ride for Miguel Pupo, 6.83 to start. Yeah, great start there at uh, instantly. Uh, puts a bit of pressure on your opponent and Crosby sitting there just going, don't think about that score, just worry about what's going to happen on my next wave, my first shot at this heat. And chatting to Cade Matson earlier this morning just in the car park, Joe, and he was just saying how to warm up surf. And he goes, do you know what? This, this feels so familiar, these right-handers down at Winky Pop, so similar to the lowers right or the uppers right in California there at Trestles. 
And uh, it's a really, it is, the slope of this wave face is incredibly similar to both those waves in Cali at Trestles. So, um, uh, you know, Griff looked incredibly at home and, and I think Crosby will just tap into this wave as well. It's a great balance of both of those waves as we look at a nice backside snap, quickly moving into a big hack to slide for Pupo. Hits it off the white water out in front. Nice arcing carve. Now more vertical with some speed. Hacks the float. More maneuvers for Mikel as he absolutely ripped that thing to shreds. Big start for Cross. Nice, huge open face hook. Oh. Throws the fins and controls it. Nice, beautiful attacking vertical to shut yes, it down. Yes, variety on the forehand. It's it's a thing of beauty to watch. You know, you can on your forehand get a little uh, stuck in that repetition of going horizontal out onto the face, getting the cut back. Uh, but Crosby showing uh, a whole bag of tricks in this one. And that's going to be a good opening score for him as well. But Miguel, that backup score, this is going to be a, a great exchange. Let's check the replay here. So Miguel, he took the first one in the set, clicks with that first turn, comes around, vertical slide. And again, a bit more projection down the line here on these turns. Now it uh, starts to slow up and Miguel gets that rhythm on the backhand, looking fast, looking sharp. Really crisp turns there. And then here goes Cross on the outside. Clicks that first turn, gets a little tail release and slams it on that second one, nice and radical. Down the line here, gets the tail throw. Finishes off with a nice slam on the closeout section. So from the water angle, you can see the fins just controlling that. So at that one point, he's actually riding backwards. You know, there's no fins controlling the board at that point. It's all just, uh, you know, a transfer of weight from that front side leg, uh, from the front leg onto the back leg. What a great difference from Pupo's waves into the big man, Crosby, just really showing his advantage with the size of his turns, his ability to show off that range and power and flexibility. Nose pick is such a radical progressive maneuver, especially down the stretch of of your opening ride. That was really yeah, risky right yeah, there. Yeah, super high, a high risk maneuver there. And the judges are going to take note of that. You know, they always look at that critical element. The degree of difficulty is, is a huge part of the judging criteria. And Cross just uh, almost skimboarding for a little second there before the board gets uh, turned back around, shoves it back under his feet, gets that final turn. What a great difference we have here. The speedy backhand of Miguel Pupo, who gave us a lot. Big verticals, floaters, carves, managed speed so incredibly well. And then Crosby having the pace, big carves, a lot of variety, tagging a bit more progression on the scale, waiting for that first score to come through. Last of Pupo's in, 6.7, so his start was just a touch better to 6.83. Miguel Pupo on the JS Industries, growing up uh, riding surfboards shaped by his father. Wagner Pupo, longtime competitor, building the, his kids' boards uh, from day one. And even throughout their career, sometimes they just have a trusty board shaped by Wagner in their quiver to use it on the CT. And both brothers, Miguel and Sammy, focusing on JS full time this season. Yeah, good call. Seems to be working. Sammy's board looked uh, incredible the other day and this morning in the warm-up. So they've obviously uh, tapped into all of uh, JS's knowledge. He's obviously been making boards for, uh, for surfers down here for years. Good-looking wave approaching. Miguel has priority, and he will pull the trigger. Miguel Pupo looking to better one of his sixes here as he sets up with some speed. Tracking down the line first turn, a carve through the lip. Now stepping on the gas, backhand float, and he's just left searching. Interesting how sometimes a wave with more size isn't necessarily the one that you're looking for. Yeah, it's all about the swell line. And that one actually pushed a little further down into the bay, had a more horizontal wall on it down the line, and as a result, closed out through the lower section. So uh, this is great for Crosby because now he, he gets the priority situation. He can take the pick of the next set that comes through. And 
hopefully answer back. So starting with a 7.5, great score to kick things off. This is Miguel Pupo's last wave. You can see a little bit of downtime, Joe, as he started to wind up, gets that first turn, but a little weak off the top. And again, he's just stretching, looking for a section down the line, which never eventuates. So uh, healthy score line though, 13.53 heat total. Pocket sixes, but Crosby advantage with that 7.5. Even had an eight, one judge uh, throwing an eight for his opening ride. So they're really tapping into the variety and appreciating uh, maybe a little bit more displacement of water. Miguel Pupo up to 24 in the world on the live rankings. Crosby Colapinto, number 11 in the world, just outside the top 10 in his rookie debut. Can go to worldsurfleague.com and open up the rankings, and you'll see at the top it'll say live rankings. So that's updated after every single heat in real time. For Miguel, it's going to be the focus on the cut since he's two spots in the wrong direction to surf a complete season. The wild card for this year after an injury from last season. The veteran who qualified with Medina and John John Florence had his debut at Bells back in 2012. Had a tough early round knockout in round two back then to get an equal 25th and then built his relationship on this wave and has that one quarter final in the past. 11.20 on the clock. Cola Pinto with a big 7.5 will finish out heat number 10 right after this. Round of 32 continues on a beautiful day for competition. Crosby Colapinto attacking that whitewater section. Nice flow up to the top of the wave. Drawing off the bottom, there's the arc in the pocket. Nice section to attack with the tail blow. Beautiful surfing from Crosby to back up the 7.5. An incredibly strong start for the rookie on tour as he's trying to get the lead off Miguel Pupo. Crosby felt good on that one, but one man that was watching over the balcony was his big bro in the bright yellow jersey. Griff is with Laura. Yes, Griff, watching a fun heat with your brother out there at the moment, but let's get to your heat first. Drop some absolute bangers there. It just felt like the wave started pulsing and it all came together for you. Talk us through it. Yeah, that was insane. It's, um, it's kind of seems rare these days to get a heat that has that many waves, so I was just slapping it up. Amazing. And coming into this event in the yellow jersey, you're feeling good, you're vibing today, your brother's out there now. How good is this? It's what dreams are made of, being here with your brother. Oh, totally. It's insane. Uh, the crowd's just got a pretty good one. I think he needs maybe like a mid-six. So, yeah, if, we, if he makes this heat, we're going to be up against each other in the next round. So, um, <laughs> it'd be pretty rad. My parents are here. So, to have our first heat on tour together, this would be a good time for it. Well, what a dream. I wish you all the best of luck. I hope it happens. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Laura. How cool is that? Everyone was trying to will that to happen, especially the Colapinto family in his corner back in Portugal. It would have been a matchup in the final 
but Crosby went down to Ethan Ewing in the semis. But you can tell Griff he, how invested he is in his younger brother. Yeah. Uh, very similar to Miguel and Sammy. Uh, when Sammy's in the water, Miguel is almost in pain watching. You know, he's just so invested in Sammy's success. And the same would go for Griff as the big brother for the Cross. I have a feeling, though, Joe, that they don't want it to happen in the round of 16, though. They want it to happen in the final. Uh, so, you know, if, if Cross does get out of this heat, it's going to be a crazy good matchup. And they're both going to need to stay focused on the job at hand and not get caught up in the, in the family feud that could uh, maybe bubble up. Guess when you focus on the mainland U.S., you think about uh, the Lopez brothers, uh, Shea and Corey, got to experience the tour together for many years. You look at the Hobgoods as well. Yep. Uh, twin brothers that for a long time, it was hard to know which one was which, especially in photos. They talk about how many times that, that you know, the wrong brother got photo incentive or credit for, for a turn. They would know right away who it was, that their style was so similar. And their stickers were typically all the same for majority of their career. Yeah, when they were both riding for Rusty and then Globe, and then, yeah, the boys, big shout out to CJ and Damien. These guys were uh, amazing to watch. My favorite surfers. And then you go back to San Clemente. Pat Godowskis and, and Tanner Godowskis had some time on tour together as we look at uh, the history of the sport. The great Derek and Michael Ho. Flavio Neco Paterats for Brazil. Bruce and Andy had some intense moments together on tour. There's CJ and Damien. CJ, the 2001 world champ, and Corey and Shea been fun uh, talking to those guys recently and also Tanner and Pat uh, that was a, a fun one Owen and Mikey Wright you could just add Tyler in there as a, just siblings on tour and then this year with Miguel Sammy Crosby Griff Sammy Pupo advanced yesterday wow, there's and, a lot huh pardon there's a lot of brothers <laughs> there's a lot through the years yeah for sure it's pretty cool when you look at those powerful surfing families and how rare that is to both make the tour make together the tour, and actually right. have like longevity on tour. A lot of those. Had yeah, it's like incredible. More than a handful of years together on tour. Yeah, I was actually just kind of the memory started getting jogged in because I was actually on tour with a lot of, you know, those uh, pairings, the brother pairings there. So it was uh, some good times for sure. And uh, it's pretty special to watch the Colaprinto brothers. Going at it now. Cross out front, 7-5, and then the 6-9-7 did get the lead change. So Miguel Pupo down to second, eating a 7-6-4. And there's the younger bro, Sammy, feeling the stress, trying to channel Miguel. A lot of love in this seat. Sammy Pupo has Matthew McGillivray later on today in heat number two of the round of 16. And Sammy's been breaking a lot of surfboards in the last week or so. So JS had a special delivery for actually both brothers to make sure that they've got what they need for this entire event at Bells. Looking like next couple of days will be busy and We'll see when we finish this contest. Back to this one, though, Crosby's wave. Yeah, so this was the front-on replay of Crosby's last one. Big phone climb, kind of radical. Comes around this section, gets the little tail slide, and then this big blow tail to finish off. So really strong finish there. And a very unique, kind of interesting floater to uh, tail release. Watch this, climbs up and then goes, bop, just gets a little release up the top there. Clicks it into gear there for the uh, second to last turn and then pounds that final section. Super strong, really balanced uh, stance on his board here, Crosby. Watch this tar release, little slide. It's only for a millisecond, but it's, uh, it's these little intricacies that the judges, they pay particular attention to. And in that one there, completely blows the tail out. All three fins free on the board, out the back of the wave. And uh, really difficult maneuver to master there. Lots of turbulent water as the wave closes out. Crosby ahead, Miguel Pupo, three minutes on the clock with priority, waiting for that next opportunity. 7.64. John John Florence looking calm. He has Cade Matson 
coming up in heat 13 of the round. We're in heat 10 at the moment. You always stay on this really big property up at Bells and they can like have a little chip with the golf clubs out in the yard. Watch all the kangaroos hopping around, hanging out with his uh, good friends, his coach, Ross Williams. Is uh, one of his best friends, a, a great filmmaker, Eric Knudsen, creating some incredible movies and just even short video parts of their life on the road. John, a guy who's won the bell in the past, looking to get the yellow jersey back here at stop number four. He's done things that are crazy above the lip, a 10 point ride for a full rotation at smaller Rincon conditions when he was still called a grommet of the tour. It's also crazy when the Bells Bowl is absolutely lit up. So we'll see how he goes with, you know, three foot running Winky Pop. He's been working hard on small wave equipment and yeah. really excellent in all conditions, making him a two time world champ. But down to a minute 45 now as we pass the GWM two minute warning. Miguel, the one with priority, and he has been ripping, super surfing really quickly, putting together a lot of major turns, but what is he looking for at the moment? Uh, it's a wave. It's a f special kind of wave he needs, Joe. He can't just take off on anything here. This wave needs to be able to offer him, you know, multiple scoring opportunities, a couple of decent sections where he can get super vertical on that backhand. He's going to need to blow the tail out, get that release. Show the judges something radical they haven't seen from him already on those opening two rides. Minute to go on the clock. So it comes down to if that wave actually comes through. Been really impressed with Cola Pinto's uh, just composure as a rookie this year. Even reading uh, write ups on the rookie class, you know, where he wasn't favored to succeed and handling that and moving forward. And now leading the rookie of the year charge here at stop number four under the coaching of Tommy Witz. But I felt the belief in his surfing back in Europe. Enjoys his time. Incredibly goofy. Likes to joke around and have fun. Doesn't ever feel like he's under pressure. Well, Cross has got to push him into this if he, uh, well, he's going to have to go. It's the last effort. 22 seconds. Pupo needs a 7.64 to move into the round to 16. Looking for a big ramp oh. and disconnects. Oh, an awkward landing. And Pupo will end up incomplete. That'll cost him the matchup. And Crosby Colda Pinto will have the matchup with his big brother Griffin in the round of 16. Wow. Well, that sets up an incredible heat in the next round. So some good surfing there. Crosby only stood up on two waves, but he definitely made them count. This is just a victory lap as he comes through to the inside. Board's looking good. He'll be gaining confidence now. Can even tell when he's just at half half speed. He's just going through the motions and he's blowing his tail out. Everything's working for the cross. 14.47 total opening with a 7.5. He is feeding off his brother's momentum. And it'll be an all Cola Pinto battle. Tommy Whitaker is going to have his hands full. Yeah, that's a uh, poses an interesting challenge, doesn't it, for Tommy? He's got to um, somehow be fair in the delivering, uh, you know, the advice and the coaching uh, tips for for both his surfers here. And uh, this will be as fun to watch the coach as it is the surfers. Lot to look forward to, including seeing the goat paddle out next. A four-time Bells champ. 11-time world champ Kelly Slater taking on Baron Mamiya coming up next.
today, I think it may be different. Fun waves, fun restaurants, fun things to do. It is amazing to be back in Australia. Right? The coffee wins coffee. worldwide. One of the coolest things about the state of Victoria is that you have the city of Melbourne, which is such a cool city. The coastal part of things and the Great Ocean Road. What a day, hey? So good. Beautiful day, big heat on the line here. Kelly Slater versus Baron Mamiya as we see Baron Mamiya roll in. The man from the North Shore of Oahu throws down a first turn, a little bit sticky, but he'll slide off the coping quickly and recover into a snap to slide. And now Baron fits it in the white water and puts another climb up there. Just seeing the lump and bump on that one didn't look easy to perform on, but his opener is out of the way as he takes on the goat once again. Kelly sliding into position and Slater up. His board looked magic the other day. Looks clean through the first turn. Carves through a lump as well. So a couple of speed bumps the boys are dealing with at the moment. Yeah, I think that wind has just picked up ever so slightly. We're, we're, we're uh, predicted to have uh, come up to about sort of 10 to 15 knots by this afternoon. It's probably still around seven at the moment. It's. It's not too too strong, but it is creating these little ridges on the on the swell line on the face of these waves and both our surfers in the opening exchange is just getting a little caught up there. So we see the rankings are uh, Baron Mia, number five. And well, that's an interesting one to see next to Kelly Slater's name, number thirty-three. Yeah, missed out on Portugal. He had the, the hip surgery last September. And it took him a long time to recover. He said he still deals with a lot of soreness and stiffness. I, I even saw uh, one of our friends, a chiropractor, Jason, walking down the hill. He said he was really baffled on the movement, the limited movement that Kelly had in his foot when they first started working together here in Australia. But he's putting everything into this event. You could tell there's uh, the sentimental value for Kelly, you know, coming into what is now his 95th heat here at Bell's. But he's telling a lot of great stories. He just feels like he, he's really trying to enjoy every bit of this moment here at Bells Beach. Yeah, I feel like we've been saying it the last several years. We don't know if we're going to see Kelly here again. And, but, you know, you kind of get the feeling that, that that statement is starting to ring true a little bit. And, uh, well, it's special times here. And I'm sure the fans are just lapping it up. And we saw the, the reef at, at, uh, down at Winky Pop there is actually crowded on the, on the reef right next to the water's edge. So this, this is how things started. Kelly opened up the heat during the break with this 1.83. Got that little speed jam, but really a throwaway. And then Baron rolled into this one and turned in a four-point ride. Yeah, so uh, you can see here just getting a little stuck, Baron, on that opening maneuver. Clean second turn, though. Clicks with it. Gets a little stuck again, but almost turns it into a, a, a funky radical style tail slide. And then again, timing was a little off. The flow just really wasn't there too much. And as we've seen time and time again, Kelly gets that little water splash going on, just keeps him in the moment. It's almost like a little medita meditative thing for him. Yeah, that one looked like he had a little frustration with the splash, and then he flowed into this, what was a 2.67. Yeah, and again, gets a little caught just like Baron did. So uh, Kelly opting to get out and take priority and just wait for a better wave. Kelly with four Bells titles, and it wasn't always easy. It wasn't one of those events that he was just always taking over when you think of basically every other event on tour. Bells kind of kept him honest at times. He won back in 1994 for his first Bell, but his second Bell wasn't until 2006. Oh yeah, so a little bit of time between drinks there for Kelly. Certainly uh, worked it out, though, and uh, became one of the greatest to ever put on a show here at Bells Beach. Uh, in particular, that one big carving cut down that he did on that uh, on that huge sort of eight to ten foot face. The end of the Bells Bowl just sticks in my memory. And then uh, on the other end of the scale, that big flying rotation. Uh, that massive air 10 pointer was uh, incredible. And he ended up losing that final to Mick Fanning on the big full rotation. But yeah, his first win, he was just 22. That was uh, over Martin Potter. Potts always told us it was a funny one because they kept falling. They both were just trying to win that thing so bad, nothing was working, and Kelly ended up taking it on. There's a, f a photo of 
Potts shaking Kelly's hand on a ride into the beach, and Potts always joked about it. He's like, yeah, that wasn't really me back then, you know, shaking their hands. <laughs> he, he came up with the, the product of Rabbit Bartholomew and MR and, you know, really giving it to your competitors, but he said he just had to shake his hand. It was the passing of the torch type moment as Kelly hits that section hard through the white water. Looking good so far. Quick tag in transition, punt into reverse. Nice, clean. Great wave, that'll be the best score of the heat so far. Kelly gets to the completion, shows that little radical element at the end. A lot better on that wave. Yeah, smooth, a lot of zip out of that surfboard. Always dedicated to improving surfboard design. He's been like that since day one and created his own surf company where he could work with a, a lot of different shapers around the world, not just one main shaper and you know, balancing with his mind on what's possible. Who knows what he's going to come up with in the future? Uh, just throughout the whole entirety of Kelly's career, he's been the one who's who's pushed board design and evolution probably more than or well, modern day surfboard, uh, pushing the design on modern day surfboards more than anyone. You know, he came on to the scene and was riding those little Merrick slippers. They were skinnier, they were narrower, they had more rocker than all the other boards on tour. Uh, and then, you know, a couple of decades into his career and then everything went the other way, shorter, wider he started experimenting with the quads and even the five fin setup the replay here of Kelly up and over that foam section great speed projection down the line quick snap then gets to this final rotation here uh, you know it wasn't too high and the rotation not a hundred uh, not 360 degrees but still radical nonetheless just holding speed and you can see here this uh, chatter this little bump on the face of the wave has just turned up a little bit. So making things difficult. Second wave of the set will now probably be the more favoured one. As that first wave of the set generally cleans out the uh, the runway. And then that second wave of the set, the face is a lot smoother. Kelly might look at a little pick up here down the line. Nope. Kelly's form at Bells and with all of his wins uh, went along with world titles. It was always a good look at his world title type form when he was taking out this event. At 22, his second win at 34, so a big stretch in his career. And it's really cool okay. for, for Glenn Micro Hall. Kelly, Kelly and Micro went golfing together in Hawaii and they started talking about working together at some point this season. They golfed together again the other day and Kelly was in the golf cart with Micro's dad. And it was, uh, you know, for both parties, they're both really happy to, to join forces for an event this year. Yeah, really cool. And, um, you know, Micro has been on the scene for so long. Uh, he's been uh, on the tour at this high level, so he understands the, the sort of stress, the commitment, the focus that's needed. Uh, obviously, Kelly, you'd be thinking, hang on, what more could this guy need in terms of knowledge and and, uh, and coaching, but really at this level, it's almost like having a sounding board uh, for Kelly, perhaps just going, hey, you know, I've, I'm thinking about writing this board or this is my heat strategy, what do you think? And, and just having someone with experience to bounce that off, uh, I think is really cool. Micro's so level-headed too, you know, you don't really ever see him uh, as a motive, as a, as a coach such as Jake Patterson, who you really know what's going on in his mind. He's very expressive. Um, and obviously Kelly liking that calm nature that uh, Glenn Marco Hall has. And uh, yeah, well, the partnership, we could see it go all the way here. You may see Kelly go all the way to the finals. That'd be something special. Yeah, you, it's a good reminder too that Kelly's not just showing up. You know, He's serious about he want, this. He wants to yeah. win every event that he's a part of, even though he knows it hasn't come easy. He did win an event in 2022, which will go down as one of the most significant sporting moments as he won pipeline over Seth Moniz when it was absolutely firing about a couple of days before turning 50. Yeah, but since then, the winds have, haven't come easy. They've been scattered, few and far between. Kelly obviously surfing through, uh, through injury uh, for the remainder of, uh, well, for most of 2023 and uh, then opting to have that hip surgery. It was a major one too. That was not just a little uh, cleanup surgery. There was a lot going on there in the hip. 
but also just talks about his career again of just longevity. It was like the first time he ever needed a wild card, you know, and, yeah. and then he goes right into a surgery in September. So I think it was about time he got a bit of a tune-up after all those years of just putting on crazy performances for over three decades and 11 world titles, going through so many different rivals, like from 92, his first world title. Runner-up that year was Damian Hardman. Wow. How cool is that? <laughs> and then 94, Shane Powell, runner-up in the world. The famous high-five moment at, P at Pipe with his good friend uh, Rob Machado was runner-up in Kelly's third world title performance. Waves on the way here. Priority with Baron Mamiya. Baron had the four, so needs a 3.58 to take the lead off Kelly. Setting up his first turn. Nice little fin ditch to start. Nice healthy looking top turn arc. Driving through the white water with some speed. Cleans it up with a wrap. Small inside track for Baron. He winds up and carves his way through. So a solid wave for Mamiya. Good enough for a lead change. Yeah, I think that was uh, a better wave for Baron Mamiya. You could see he had more flow. He was connected. Live action with Kelly now. Kelly off the bottom. Nice connection there. Bigger wall. A lot of speed. Big fin throw. Aggressive layback, but he can't hang on. Yeah, it was only the two-turn combination. So Kelly knew he had to throw everything at that final section and just pushing a little bit too hard. Gosh, he's got a lot of spring and... How responsive Kelly's board looks. It's yeah. impressive. Yeah, yeah, super responsive. And um, uh, I don't know whether Kelly's riding a fresh one for this heat. Uh, he was, uh, he sort of put the call out. Anyone coming down from the Gold Coast, I think he had a couple of fresh shooters up there that he wanted to get down here and try. But um, whatever's under his feet at the moment is looking really spicy. He's looking good, enthusiastic, connected, clean in his approach. This is a difficult wave to surf here. So Baron just puts a little bit more weight on the tail, clicks for that first turn, keeps it all moving down the line here. Now he gets that big wrapping turn. The nose of the board directed straight back at the whitewash. So that shows you, shows you the turn path that he was going through. Streaks down the line here and gets a big tail slide to finish off. Really front footed uh, in his style. And Kelly. Clean snap. You can see staying lower. It's more of a balanced approach uh, from his front leg and back leg. Real central kind of stance, whereas Baron Mamiya, a lot more weight on the front foot and his back leg, almost like a steering uh, element to, way he, to the way he surfs. So Kelly looking back, waiting for scores from Baron to come through. And it looks like... We will see the lead change in Barron's favor. Nice, clean, arcing in the pocket, bit of variety there. Barron riding a CI 2-point pro, 6-1 by 19 by 2 and 7 sixteenths. It's uh, kind of the model most CI team riders have been riding. McGillivray on that same model, both Ellie Harrison and George Pitar were riding that CI 2-point pro as well. Here from Bells and Winky as we look at Baron under priority. 487 got the lead and it's going to rip into this wave. Little fin blast there. Driving off the lip again and he'll get caught incomplete and the situation will stay the same. Now looking at Barron leading over Kelly Slater with 13.45 on the clock. We're going to take a quick break in the round of 32, heat number 11, Bonsoy Brew Break time. We'll be right back.
Time to crack open the vault and flash back to 2006. What a year this was. So many big heats. Kelly Slater versus Joel Parkinson. Parka already one of the best at Bells as his career was just getting started, really. And Kelly was on a 6-1 Simon Anderson shape. He had won the first now two stops of the season when you add this one as Bells was stop number two at the time. But look how his form was. Look at the length of that 6-1 from Simon. Remember, Simon, the guy that introduced the thruster, and that was that aggressive down carve. And gosh, a triple overhead section with so much power from the Southern Ocean. So many major highlights from this year. There was that famous Aki Andy Irons heat where Aki just launched off the ski and went right into a 9.9 .9 as we will go, go right back into live action with Baron Mamiya coming off a of float. Throw tail and incomplete as he's trying to force a score under the priority of Kelly, but he still has his lead. The 487 and a 4.0. But that 2006 win was significant in a lot of ways. He ended up winning a, another world title that year. Runner up was Andy Irons, and Andy was runner up from 2005 as well. So that was on the back end of Andy smoking Kelly for three straight world titles. And then Kelly was answering back the two following seasons. Yeah, I was, and that was just an incredible rivalry between uh, Kelly Slater and Andy Irons. That lasted, uh, you know, so many events. They were up against each other and, you know, just battling for the world title right down to those final moments. But, yeah, just seeing that one big turn, that was the turn I referenced earlier, that big, giant cut down, huge wave, and that Simon Anderson board looking so good under Kelly's feet. Wow. Simon's done a lot of great things at Bells. Oh, yes. His win here in 81, introducing the thruster, but also making that incredible craft. I can't even count how many times I've been around an event where guys like Snake or people are just going, get him a Simon again, get him a Simon <laughs> yeah. again. Because those are those moments that you feel connected to. You know, seeing a turn like that in 06, you know, as a surf fan, which sometimes the surf, biggest surf fans are on tour <laughs> watching uh, Kelly compete, and they just want to relive that magic again. We, uh, like, as his fellow competitors when we are on tour with him, we did not miss a Kelly heat. We always wanted to be down there to see what would happen. He just, you know, he was that good. Couldn't miss a moment with him. Kelly now looking, using priority on this wave, needs a 3.97. Floats the first section, another float to cover some ground. And just attacking with floaters to extend his ride. Snap through the white water that time and a big layback. Oh, he no. can't hang on. Oh, he knew it too, right there. That was the lead change if he had made that turn. Did all that work down the line. Those final two sections just caught an edge. Uh, he'll be reliving that now, just going, no, so give me another chance at it. So advantage to Baron Mamiya here. So a, a pretty low scoring heat so far between these two guys. A little bit of trouble with this bump on the wave. Let's see what happened. Final moments. Looks like he hits it absolutely perfectly. Gets the tail release, kicks the fins out. You can see the nose of the board just purling there. Just caught that front side edge and then went over the handlebars just needed a little bit more pressure on that tail pad you would have rode out of that we've seen kelly make that turn what thousands and thousands of times just not used to seeing him fall on a turn like that ever 3.43 so that was it the fall keeping him in second and baron will hang on to priority in the lead down to eight minutes on the clock Baron has that memory of being with Kelly at Pipe, who was heartbroken as the wild card that year, where Kelly had 20 something seconds on the clock, uh, counting down a bomb's coming. It looked like Baron's day to go all the way in the event as a wild card, and Kelly got a crazy one at Pipe. That was the turning point where Kelly went all the way to pick up his 56th championship tour win. Uh, just that number is incredible. The amount of victories that man has had. Kalani enjoying the action. Such a fun time for Kalani and Kelly, expecting their son in a few months to be born. They've just been filled with a l congratulations up and down the staircase around Australia. And Kelly knowing that he really wants to put on a performance in front of all these great fans that have been by his side since day one. 
Jake Marshall's right there, walking slowly on the shelf. To make sure he doesn't slip off or fall into a hole. He's got Frederico Marias in Heat 12. I've been really impressed with Jake in the free surfs this, this week. And also just how confident and calm he feels. I think in his head he's doing quiet math, even if he hasn't gotten any official reports from WSL on the cut. I think he's just feeling good on his positioning on tour, and it's a, a venue for him that feels like Southern California, so he's uh, in a really great place. I feel like he's uh, got into a winning rhythm. Uh, you can get into a losing rhythm. Jake's into a, a winning rhythm at the moment, and he's running with it. He's been uh, trying to find it the last couple of seasons on tour. Looks like we might have a, uh, some live action here, Joe. Kelly gliding in, looking for a 397. Snap to start. Whitewater, he'll just carve through it. Punches out the next section, just responding off the whitewater. And now we'll go into a nice, cool power hook. Not laying back as extreme as he did on the one he fell on. You can see he's just trying to make sure he got enough to turn the heat. But Barron's on a bit of a bigger wave here out the back. Carves in the pocket. Nice punch out in the whitewater. There's that cool ribbon, rhythm in the pocket for Barron as he throws some water. Driving into the lip again. Attack mode on the inside wall, and Barron takes it all the way through. Yeah, uh, that was a great wave for Barron Mamiya. Kelly picking that one, uh, first wave of the set. It was a little bit bumpier, and that was that second wave of the set that I was telling you about, and Barron got one there. He got some clean, open sections to work with. Started to open up a bit more. Barron's going to, Kelly will momentarily, I think, get the lead back perhaps, and then, well, Barron will take it back off him. So Kelly, you can see here, just quick snap to start things off. And then there's a few sections here where Kelly's just working down the line, doing these projection floaters, trying to get to some open face here. So these, those turns there, not really gaining a whole lot of points. And then you can see shows a little bit more restraint on that final turn. And then Barron instantly out the back, bigger, stronger turn to open up. Then the second one, bit more electric, gets vertical, gets the wrap for the third. Nice slashing turn there. So he's just up the speed on this wave here. Multiple turns, good variety. And he knew right at that moment there, I have to finish this wave and I'll bank a good, decent number. Great surfing from Baron Mamiya. Traveling to Australia with uh, one of his best friends, Makana Pang. First trip for Makana to this part of the world. Excited to be by Baron's side for Bells and for Margaret River as well. The Goofy Foot, famous for posting crazy clips of Pipeline and all over the North Shore of Oahu. As scores are coming through for Kelly, like you predicted, Richie, a 5.2, enough to get the lead. And so Barron is chasing a 5-2-3 on his last. And we'll see if Barron gets the lead right back. He got that for sure, and then some, in my opinion. Um, I, I was actually a touch surprised with the 5-2. I thought it was maybe just a little under that, but... Um, the judges obviously appreciating that final turn. It was kind of radical. Kelly ditched the fins out a little bit. Well, that's what you love about a judging scale with five guys on. They dropped the high and the low. There was a 4-8 thrown. Yep. That might have been where Richie was leaning. As we see the score coming through for Baron Mamiya, a 6.5. So there's the separation from the 5-2 to a 6-5. Baron in the lead. Kelly does have priority. And now needs a 6.18. Wow, well, he's been in this position uh, so many times throughout his career. And, uh, well, I've been on the receiving end of it as well. You know, have had the lead against Kelly, stole it uh, in those final moments. So let's see if he can do another buzzer beater. You see those splashes happening there. And yeah. it just always makes me think of uh, what his relationship might feel like with the ocean. Every ocean that we surf in around the world, it's, it's mystical, it's magical. It, it's brought him to tears, you know, even going to that last win at Pipe. He's like, there's something that's going on out there. It's yeah. sometimes hard to describe. And Kelly is so articulate when it comes to describing everything in the sport. There's like some magic that he relies on that it's brought him to victories more often than not. Yeah, well, the people who have this special, you know, relationship, it's, a, it's an intuition thing. It's a rhythm thing that you can kind of tap into. You know, some days even when you're free surfing, you'll paddle out and you'll just be in the right spot every time. 
in a crowded lineup, people are going, how's this guy getting all the waves? You know, that you just kind of tap into that sometimes. And, and the uh, Dolphins join him at J Bay and he just follows them up the point and <laughs> no. gets, gets the wave he needed. Yeah, crazy stuff happens. The, the Kelly factor, we've seen it, um, you know, winds just turn offshore somehow and it's, uh, it's something to behold. Let's see if he can pull it out here. Under two minutes to go. Yeah, crunch time passing the GWM. Two minute warning, Kelly. 95 heats at Bells in his career, getting close to 100. A chance again to break the record that he shares with Mark Richards and McFanning with four Bells titles. His last Bells trophy back in 2010 went along with the world title as well. That was his 10th world title year. He clinched in Puerto Rico. His 11th world title clinched in San Francisco two times, but that's another story. Down to the final minute. Kelly watching the uh, the clock here, checking his Apple Watch. He knows there's a minute to go. I think both these guys would would be the first to say it hasn't been their best performance. They've showed a little restraint on some of the waves. Perhaps just, uh, you know, a little hesitant, just wanting to uh, make put some good scores on the board. Definitely trying to figure out these uh, conditions that are slightly changing in the last half an hour. Kelly paddling towards Barron. Kelly has been undefeated over Barron in their two previous meetings. But as Kelly looks at the time, he has a quick chat. Might be seeing an opportunity, starts flowing the other way, looking like he's a little interested in something coming. So right when I thought he was getting ready for the handshake, Kelly's moving up the point quickly. 15 seconds to go. Well, he's trying to go up and meet this swell and cut some time out so that if uh, the, do the clock does count, count down, Kelly may have an opportunity to get to his feet. It's counting down here. I don't think it's going to come in time. And just a little bit out of reach for Kelly, but this is what he saw as he runs out of time. And the greatest of all time eliminated by Baron Mamiya, world number five with 11.37 combined total. Kelly's board looked great, had the fall though on the wave that he could have got a decent number. It still looked sharp though, had some great turns and you can kind of feel some great decisions that he was making throughout that heat, just a little bit out of sync with the sets that were coming through and Kelly will be eliminated in the round of 32. Barron moving on to surf again today in the round of 16. He looked good though, didn't he, Joe? He's looked connected, the, ma the maneuvers were there. Uh, and unfortunately for Kelly, Barron just waved. Well, he, he found the best wave of that heat and, and surfed it very, very well to get the top score. He certainly did. Kelly will get this wave in just a little bit too late, but he's such a competitor. He's gonna probably try to feel it out just like he needed a score. Up, oh, looking casual, he'll be calling it a day. Just always great to be around Kelly's company at these events. He lifts the energy every time he paddles out. His car was just swarmed with fans this morning. At the top of Winky Pop as he was getting everything together to compete. Yeah, it's going to take him a few hours to uh, to leave the beach. If he does in fact choose to leave, I wouldn't be surprised if he sticks around all day. He's just uh, such a student still at 52 years old. Loves it. Big win for Baron Mamiya as he moves on. Jake Marshall coming up next to take on Frederico Marias. We're bringing Ronnie Blakey and Felicity Palmatier for the call.
The Rip Curl Pro Bells Beach, presented by Bonsoy, is brought to you by Rip Curl, the ultimate surfing company. By Eventbrite, proud sponsor of women's surfing on the WSL Championship Tour. By Yeti, built for the wild. And by Bailey Ladders, official ladder partner of WSL Australia. Welcome back to the show, Easter Saturday, Kelly Slater, the 11 time world champ, the greatest of all time, has just been knocked out of the contest by Baron Mamiya, an incredible record that he has at this event, four victories, that was his uh, 27th run at the title here, believe it or not, and uh, hopefully we get a, a chat with the, the great man in the not too distant future, but Baron Mamiya surviving that heat, moving through to the round of 16 as we get set for another big clash here. And it's gonna be a, a lot of fun. We've got Jake Marshall and Frederico Marias out there here in the booth, Ronnie Blakey joined by Felicity Parmentier. Always uh, hoping the, the best for Kelly uh, as he, you know, we obviously reached these last few years of uh, he, him competing. You just never know when he's gonna call it. I know, it's, it's, we're just kind of hanging on the edge of our seat right now. You just never know, but I've got to be, just go back to that heat. I think there was a couple of moments in there. Kelly kind of went for that, in the, my eyes looked like a bit of a throwaway air there. And I sometimes think, oh, if he could have just nailed that last turn, would have been a bit closer, but yeah, I guess we're, we're all just waiting a uh, bit of breath to see what Kelly does. Yeah, it's going to be huge. Uh, but Baron Mamiya uh, wanting to keep that role alive. Had the incredible start to yeah, the I year with the victory at Pipe. Here's Kelly breaking things down with Glenn Hall. It's just like a little heavier than when I ride. Yeah. So it's like it got away from me a little bit. But if I made that, I probably nice. got scored. 100%, yeah. yeah. It came off huge. Yeah, no, I, but I, you know, it wasn't a great wave. And in my mind, I was thinking that well better you know yeah. that'll be my better score now yeah but later i'm gonna have to better something else but i thought i might as well push this thing as hard as i can yeah. at the end here even though i knew it was going to move me in the lead but if i didn't do something big i was going to really kind of have to replace two ways maybe for sure i think of, it was the right thing to do it was, it was early in the heat mental. yeah the section i just i just good. was a little discon disconnected from my board yeah that's a board that's good though oh it looks sick it looks really awesome. good. It's it was just that, it's just who, who got the better one, yeah, right, you know? Yeah, he ended up one of that last yeah. clean one at the end. He was smart to let that first one pass. 100%. I couldn't believe it when I, he didn't paddle. I was like, yeah, wow. Yeah. Because it was over there, yeah. I thought the whole set was going to move down. Yeah. You know, like we talked yeah, about, yeah, yeah. I, I thought it would close out and be a runner. Yeah. But his just held back. He's see. held yeah, back and didn't yeah. chase off. Good job, man. Yeah, 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 yeah. Good luck. Um. Baron Mamea gets one back on Kelly Slater. As we get set now for Heat 12, Jake Marshall will take on Frederico Marais. And Jake Marshall having a great year, looking really sharp. Uh, maybe reached, you know, uh, his best level performance-wise on his road through to this uh, current position that he finds himself on the rankings. For sure. I mean, he's had a great start to the year, two ninths and a fifth. I mean, and he's sit coming into this event sitting at number eight on the rankings. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm really looking forward to this heat though. I think both these guys, their strengths are their forehands and on waves that are longer running sort of more point break waves. Last year I got to see Fred uh, at, uh, in Irisira and he just looked so put together out there. And then obviously Sunset Beach, he always does really well, right hand point break. It is small today though. So these guys, both bigger guys as well. And we've obviously moved to Winky. So different venue from the bowl, but yeah, I'm looking forward to this. I feel like it's, even though Jake's sitting out there uh, on eighth on the rankings, I feel like this is, in terms of the, their surfing and, and the way they approach, it's, it's sort of similar. Yeah, Frederico Marias, he's got that big forehand rip that he can go to. His best result as a CT campaigner came back in 2017 at J Bay. He had a, a second place finish there. Had some am amazing numbers and overcame you know, some of the greats on his road through to that, that result. But the, the big finishes in championship tour events, it, it's been a while. He's had uh, big weights between uh, between his best finishes. This year has been a struggle, 17th through the first three events of the year. And came into this one rated 22nd on the live ladder with the, the success of some other competitors. He's already dropped down a couple more spots. So he needs to keep rolling. This is a, a crucial heat for him. For sure, and I, I think 
you know, I just think back to when we just got to listen in on that audio with Kelly and um, Glenn Micro Hall, and then Kelly just saying, oh, you know, he was on the better waves. And I feel like today that's crucial. You know, when it gets smaller, and even I think back to even heats earlier this morning, but it sort of makes it the playing field more even. I feel like when it's small like this, it's even more crucial to be on the best waves today. Whoever gets those best waves, as long as you're not falling and you've got that connectivity, I feel like you, you're going to win. It's wave selection today is a big one for me. It sure is. It's going to be crucial for Frederico and, and trying to find the edge over the inform Jake Marshall. But Vaughan uh, competitors, you know, they relish the opportunity to, to surf uh, against the big names. And there's no bigger name than Kelly Slato. A big win for Baron there. Yeah, huge start to the year for Baron Mamiya. And it continues getting into the round of 16 after a win over the Goats, mate. The Goat, it's uh, nothing better than coming up against the greatest of all time and getting a win. Yeah, um, even at 52, I was uh, really nervous. <laughs> uh, I've never really beat Kelly in a man of mine heat. Um, so, yeah, it was nice to, you know, finally get him on one <laughs> before, you know, he retires or whatever he does. <laughs> Totally, man. Um, it was a it was a funny one, wasn't it? We've seen some heats this morning where there's been pulses and plenty of opportunity. That one really did come down to wave selection. And we even heard Kelly speaking with Micro then saying, you know, Barron was on the two best waves. Yeah, I uh, my first one in the heat, I actually completely just blew. Um, I kind of like, I don't know what happened. I was like a little nervous or something, but like I was just got way too on my front foot. And I started just digging rail and then I was like, oh, like I got to clean that up. I got to get some waves. And then like I couldn't get over a like a four the whole heat and I was like oh what and then I let him go on that one and he only needed a three so I was like yeah I, I looked at the wave and I was like okay this is for sure he's gonna get the score and I was watching and I always was like oh the second wave is always the best mm. and I kind of just sat there and was just so freaked out and I let him go I was just like oh please please be a wave behind this and luckily yeah there was a six five and yeah that was basically the difference in the heat that's the way it works mate sometimes you just got to <laughs> Nail it down and hope for the best. But um, no, uh, epic performance there, Baron. And um, you know, how are you going to prepare for your next heat? Yeah, I'll probably just go home, um, just cruise, hang out with. Uh, I got my buddy McConaughey here, my girlfriend, and my filmer, and then Brent Powers from CI is helping me out. So I'll probably just go back cruise, and that's about it. Awesome, mate. Congratulations. Right on. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Thank you, Vorno. Yeah, Baron Mamiya. He's. Uh, it's so cool to hear that, you know, feeling the nerves coming up against Kelly. I, I think everyone does, you know. I think you realise suddenly that there's more eyes on you in, in that clash than, oh. than just about any other. And, you know, we're, with Barron sitting so beautifully uh, atop, at the top end of the ratings, there's a, obviously a, a lot of heat on him to maintain that position. And, and Kelly's just so crafty. <laughs> you just never can count Kelly out. I mean, he's been around for so long. He's surfed so many heats. He's been on the ropes like that before and just pulled a rabbit out of a hat. So mm -hmm. it's never over. And I mean, I, even on my break just then, I walked down and uh, there was just people everywhere to watch Kelly. And I think we're all just, we're all, we don't know what, what the call is. We don't know what, he's, yeah. what he, where his mindset's at. And yeah, there was just people everywhere. It was packed out there. It sure was. Everyone wants to get eyes on him. Well, we've had a heat restart, so not a lot of scoring opportunity in the opening 10 minutes of heat 12. So we've given them a, a fresh clock and we'll see what rolls our way now. But uh, the first head-to-head -head heat for these two competitors and we'll see who will come out on top. But I, I've been super impressed with Jake's, um, you know, resilience. He, he's sort of had a, a pretty rough go at it last year. Didn't uh, survive that cart, fought his way back on the, the Challenger Series, and he's just looked like a different man this year. He had a couple of ninths, the big result for him over there in Portugal with a win over John John Florence in that event too. And I know he's had a couple of victories over John now, but he is one of those guys that I just think he, he has all the moves. Whether confidence has been an issue for him, I'm not sure. But this year, and, and he said it after his... Uh, his first heat, he just feels like he, he's in a really good place. I think it's just momentum, right? I mean, we can have a look at his results right there. You, you can see the two nights, Pipe and Sunset, and then the fifth place, fifth, <laughs> fifth place finish over at Portugal. And I think it, it, it's really hard to get on like, on a roll here, and it's really hard to get momentum sometimes. And when you have it, you've just got to make the most of it because it can quite easily go. And then all of a sudden you, you feel like you're training, you're doing all the things, you're dotting all the I's, you're crossing all the T's, your boards are feeling really good. And sometimes the cookie just doesn't crumble your way. 
and you can just be sitting left sitting there scratching your head being like, I just, what am I what am I doing wrong and at the moment it seems like things are just falling Jake's way and sometimes even you'll get in those heats and those moments where you know calls won't quite go your way and you think they should have and Right now, things are flowing for Jake, so we'll see if it, the, that momentum continues. Great shot from the Melbourne flight cam, just having a, a look at the uh, the cliffscape here at Winky Pop and, and the crowd at the top of the hill, also uh, a big crew down there on Easter weekend in the car park, watching on the big screen as Jake Marshall gets us going here in heat 12, the surfer from Encinitas, California, ripping into this one. Setting the fins free. He's just had this amazing flow through these last two contests. And he puts it to work again on his opening right here. Yeah, I think we uh, will see bigger scores drop, but that's a real positive way to start. Oh, super positive. I think he probably would have liked that end section just to be a little bit more of an exclamation mark. But nice flow, nice connectivity there. And uh, good to catch a wave. I mean, we did have that restart. So the guys have been sitting there for a long time. And this one was a smaller one, and you can see Jake was further on that inside there. Starts off with that little foam climb. Nice wrap there. Gets a bit more vertical here as he's able to punch it through the lip a couple of times. Bit of fin release, but I think he would have probably liked a little bit more of a stronger finish. But you know what? Got a wave under the belt. He's in good touch. He's got great feel at the moment. It's just the placement of his boards, it's like... He's getting a lot of speed off those little projection floats, and it just gives him a, a bit of momentum to, even on a, a really a dud wave, you'd have to say, he's able to kind of release some tail, throw some uh, some water around. Jake heading out, you know, uh, really was one of those guys who, who was knocking on the door of qualifying for a couple of years. I think one year in Hawaii even, um, it looked like he was inside the the qualification mark on the old QS system and uh, ended up getting bumped out in like the last event. And uh, yeah, I think he had a qualification party and everything. So he had to rebound from that. And, uh, you know, to his credit, he was able to do it. Frederico Marais, he's a, another resilient competitor who's had a, a tough go of it at uh, of late on the championship tour, but has gone back to that Challenger series and just grinded his way back onto this CT. You got to got give a lot of credit when surfers do that. It's it it's a, it can be really hard work, but mindset, physically, mentally, emotionally as well, trying to mm. regain. And I, just to go back to what you're talking about with uh, Jake, and you know, thinking that you're a sure bet and you're a shoe in, and yep, okay, like that's where my mindset is. I'm going to be on tour next year, and then to be kind of relegated out of those top ten positions. I mean, that that's hard to bounce back from. And these are guys that haven't been to that top end of the ratings. And, you know, they, they are sponsored, but, like, they're, they're not on these big money contracts. So they, they've got the stress of, of that as well to, to deal with, Felicity. We know how difficult it is if you are one of those kind of competitors just grinding for your results and your position on this CT. It's crucial to stay on this tour if you're going to make a living out of the sport. Completely. It, it's a lot of expectation too, and I think... It's a, it's a fine line how much expectation you put on yourself because a lot of these guys' contracts will be results-based and results-driven and performance-based. you know based. And, you know, if you're going event to event and you're just not in that rhythm or you're, you're only just making that cut, you know, it, it's really difficult to sort of... And, you know, you try and say, oh, you know, you go out there and you surf and you try not to think about that. You try not to think about the cut or results. But at the end of the day, that's dictating so much of your life and your career. And, you know, if you, if you can even afford to get it, go around and do all this. So, yeah, it's it's a tricky position to be in. So this is a head-to-head -head matchup between two of the real battlers on the, the CT. Who is going to stand up and, and get the job done here? 517, I, I mean, with the way the conditions have been and a restart, mm. it, that 517 is looking like a, an absolute gem of a number right now. For sure. I even just had a look over at the back of my shoulder now and kind of looks like that onshore might be kicking up a few notches too. You can even see it here at this shot was look at Jake, just the texture on the face of the way of the ocean right now. Looks like that onshore breeze might be kicking in a little bit and. Yeah, look, things are very slow right now. So this is Jake's 517. And I've got to echo what you said, Ron. I think he just surfed this wave so well for the size of the size of what it was. 
had great connectivity there. He's sort of manufacturing a score, really. So it made something out of nothing and pretty impressive. And with, you know, 22 minutes on the clock, a, a 5-1-7 as a backup is not looking too bad. Beautiful. Yeah, all those little flowing mm. moves in between, that's a, a crisp hit there on a, a kind of a nothing section. For sure. No, you can just really analyse his technique here and just the beautiful flow that he has. And then with three turns, different variation, really pleasing to look at. I mean, this last section here, you can kind of see he went up for that little foam, foam climb. He probably would have liked to have had a little bit more of an exclamation mark there. But, you know, at this stage in the heat... <laughs> with, you know, basically 20, 21 minutes on that clock. This is looking like it's going to be a good backup. A couple of lines coming into the bay now. So let's see who's potentially going to get a wave here. Yeah, deep. It's Jake Marshall. Frederico Marias from Portugal is going to get his first ride. Let's see what he can do with it. This guy is all about perfect timing in the pocket. Moves a lot of water, a couple of good hits on the outside and just cranking out a couple more turns to finish this one off. Yeah, that, a friend needed to go and obviously Jake took off. He didn't have priority up the point and having to uh, surrender that wave to Fred. But yeah, that wave there was small, but Fred knows he's got to get moving because time's ticking down on this clock. So this is Jake, he takes off deep, decides to kick out because Fred is using that priority. Goes up into the lip there for that little fin throw. And another nice fin jab there. For me, straight away, I just feel like this wave didn't quite have that flow and connectivity that Jake's did. I just saw a different sort of pace here. Nice finner here. Releases them really well. But I think, you know, even when I look at the face of this wave and I compare it to Jake's, Jake's just was that little bit smoother. So maybe that's why it was providing that sort of, yeah, smoother face, bit more connectivity. I see them being pretty similar scores. It just depends, doesn't it? Because if you lack the flow and between manoeuvres, you can make up for it if you do bigger turns. And it did feel like Fred had, a, at the start of that ride, a couple of bigger turns than maybe what we saw from Jake. So mm -hmm. I think it's going to be a pretty close exchange to kick things off here. Seen some greater events play out here at Winky over the years, one of my favourites. It was way back in 95 when uh, Sonny Garcia got the victory over a good mate of mine, the late great John Shamuka here at Winky. As we see Jake on his third ride here. This one's giving him a bit more speed. As he glides down the line, he's going to get a big finish there, but unsuccessful in riding out. He left some points at the end of that ride. Oh. That'll drive him mad, but he did good work before that. You were spot on with your uh, your guess uh, on Frederico Marais' number, 4.5, so fell under Jake Mar Marshall's 5.17. So uh, the judges probably picking up on that, just a, a speed and flow difference, but Jake was on a jam here. Oh, he was on his way to a very, very good score. I think it's still going to be a great score. They, but lots of variety straight away, up until lip carving turn. Releases those fins, gets around this section. All the hard work was done. He just needed to tap that, but he put a bit too much mayo on it. <laughs> and didn't quite get that finish. I, I honestly think that was, this could be a moment in the heat right here, you know, especially with it being a little bit slow right now. But those two first turns were really well timed. Beautiful variation as well. And this had a wave had a very good speed to it as well. Straight away, it's a bigger wave than those first couple of scores that have been dropped. Just got to be thinking right here when he comes around this section, I was thinking, OK, wow, hard work's done. Go up, hit this section and releases the fins and just put a little bit too much on it. But I mean, the numbers are coming through. And I, like I said, I did think it was going to be a good score, regardless if he made that last turn or not. Yeah, 6.33. I think that was, you know, really knocking on the door of oh, an yeah. excellent number. It was looking like an impressive turn, but Again, you just you can see just how on he is. Uh, moving a lot of water, clean flow. The sharp eye looks amazing underfoot. And Jake Marshall out in front. Frederico Marais chasing a seven now. Yeah, uh, look, it's, it's becoming a, more of a tall order from Fred. But, you know, they've still got 17 and a half minutes on this clock. Kind of looks like there might be a couple of little lines rolling through. But I just love that last wave from Jake. I wish, I wish he made that last turn here. 
definitely was on his way to an excellent number there for sure. Just beautiful, silky smooth surfing and definitely looks like he's on. The quarterfinals, they're set for the women's event. They look amazing. Uh, we won't see them out there today, but we'll, uh, we'll look to get through the, the round of 16 for the men, hopefully, and establish some quarterfinal matchups there. But we've got a lot to look forward to already in the round of 16. Uh, the Cola Pinto brothers are going to be surfing against one another. How exciting. They've dreamt about that moment for a long time. We've heard them talk about it. Then in the first set of the round of 16, too, you've got Morgan Siblick and Ryan Callanan. Now, wow. those, those guys both from uh, Newcastle, the Merriweather region. They have uh, had a head-to-head -head clash before, so that'll be a lot of fun. Ethan Ewing, Liam O'Brien. Right. It's wow. on. <laughs> it's looking fantastic, that, uh, that round of 16. But we still do have some, some big heats to get to, through in the round of 32 as well, which is uh, going to be fantastic. It's going to be a good afternoon here at Winky Pop. 16 and a half minutes to go. Jake Marshall setting the pace at the moment. Looking like it's a little bit slow going right now. Huh? It, looks, it seems like to me that the conditions, as we see, look at all the people out there today. Hello, everyone. It always <laughs> pulls a, a big crowd, the Rip Curl Pro here at Bells Beach, presented by Bonsoy. And we've got exceptional fans down here watching on the big screen. Hope you guys are enjoying the show. Hope everyone's loving it back home as well. Yeah, it's absolutely packed out there today on the last break. I just went for a little recce, went down to the steps at Winky, went down and got another coffee. And wow, people are really enjoying themselves out there in that sunshine, aren't they, on this Easter weekend? Always, always does. Like I said, pull a big crowd down here on, on Easter weekend. But also, I think there's just a, a lot happening at the moment. Uh, Kelly Slater obviously surfed earlier. A lot of um, speculation about what Kelly's plans are, are going to be moving forward. And uh, I, I don't think people wanted to miss the opportunity to, to get eyes on the greatest of all time. Um, unfortunately for Kelly, wasn't able to survive that last heat. But yeah, there is a, a lot of people down there to see him, obviously. And so many other stars in the draw here. Oh, I mean, even just looking looking forward, I mean, there's so many good heats. This, this next heat, we've got John John Florence coming up against Cade Batson. That's going to be another cracker. I feel like John at the moment, obviously, coming into this before this event at number two seed. And he's looking like he's on fire this year. He is in very good nick. He's injury free. He seems fired up. All his post-heat interviews that I've watched this year just seems like, yeah, he's got a different sort of mindset coming into this year. And I'm liking it. I'm really, really liking it. But he's coming up against Cade, and I also think Cade's in good form at the moment mm. too, and I wouldn't be surprised if John might be a little bit nervous. What, what we've got out in the water at the moment is an incredibly even matchup. When you look at two surfers who have great forehand approaches and the ability to combo up a, a number of different turns on their forehand, but Jake has the advantage of incredible form and it's on show at the moment. He, he just looks sharper, he looks faster, and everything is just being executed a little bit cleaner than his rival at this point in this heat. But um, yeah, there is a couple of matchups that I think have, have been tightened up with the conditions being, you know, mm. on the marginal side. Uh, and we saw the, I, I think the benefactor of that earlier on was Cole. I think yep. his chances against Gabriel at Winky Pop yep. on a smaller day where it's a bit more inconsistent and Gabriel's not able to go searching under priority and find medium-sized waves, you know, gave Cole a much better shot at the heat win. And uh, I think it's going to give Cade Matson a, a chance, a really good fighting chance against John John Florence in that next clash as well. Oh, 100% uh, I agree with that. I think we'll get back to that point in a second... Yeah, we've got some movement on the outside here. Good looking way for Fred Rico. Let's see if he can fight back here. And he does hit that first section hard, knowing though that he's got to push on those first two hits to really make it the ride count. He overcooks it. And Jake Marshall gets the opportunity now to dump the 517. Just loses contact for a moment on that second move. And it puts him behind for the final hit. So uh, neither surfer really making the most of, of the opportunities there. 13 minutes to go. Federico will get priority back and the opportunity to save himself here. Yeah, he's kind of kind of lucky there that Jake didn't convert and improve on his situation, that Jake fell on that last turn. I think, I mean, Fred's wave was looking like it was going to be all right as well. His wave was that first one of the set. So it kind of did have that a little bit of lump and bump. You could see it when he took off. Uh, but 12 and a half minutes are left on this clock and... 
it's it's looking tricky out there at the oh, moment. Man. It's looking very slow. Talk to me about uh, just how challenging challenging it is as a championship tour surfer when you you get to this point in the year and you're coming up against someone who's in sort of career best form and you've been struggling to break out of this round. I just think it comes down to a mindset thing and how you're approaching it or if you're even paying attention to any of that. I mean, you're, oh, of course you are. I mean, you just look at the rankings and you see where you are compared to the person that you're coming up against. But I think nerves are obviously coming to mind. I think there's been a couple of falls already in this heat. But for me right now, it, it is clear that Jake is in good form. He just looks like he's had, got a lot of flow. Well, hopefully Fred can pick things up a little bit, clean up a few of those errors. But... At the moment, it's looking hard, and we'll see if Fred chooses to use priority here. He does. He does. So this is his chance to, to get himself back in this heat, improve on the 4.5, chip away at the requirement, or maybe even with an excellent score, he can jump up into the lead here. 11 and a half minutes to go, pushing it. You know what? On that final turn, he had to do something exceptional to, to get himself a decent number. But on the previous ride, I think you could see the nerves mm. and just the, the lack of confidence in Fred. Like, second turn, stock move, you know, something he's going to pull, yeah. you know, 10 times out of 10 uh, in a, a standard free surf. He's struggling to do with the jersey on. And Jake, you know, with all that speed, just cuts a beautiful line through this wave and finishes this wave off with a great release, complete rotation. And this is going to be better than the 517. And uh, the requirement's going to grow here for the, the surfer in blue, Frederico Marais. Silky smooth surfing that was. That was beautiful to watch on the eye. I, I love that. And I think every wave now that Jake gets, one thing that I've noticed, we'll just break this one down. He just had so much speed. The face of this wave is very smooth. This is the second wave of that set. So that first one's come through. It's cleaned up the lineup. And he just looked like he was never going to fall on that last turn. The confidence is in the casual approach too you know he's not taking off dropping to the bottom and thinking i have to bash this first section i have to get this big old opening move in now it's a beautiful beautifully timed lip line float to gather as much momentum as possible yeah in my eyes it almost looks like fred is forcing the forcing the forcing it a little bit whereas when i look at jake he's just got a beautiful tempo to it and it kind of looks like he's really waiting for these sections to present themselves and not yeah, forcing that issue, whereas I think Fred takes off and there is a, that little bit of desperation there. And he knows he needs a big score. I mean, we even saw him, go, he needed to do it because he needed to, on Fred's last wave, the one where he fell, he went for that air and, you know, he needed to do it to give a bit of variation, a bit more spice. But you can, you can sort of see that desperation there, whereas Jake's taking off, there's a beautiful pace, tempo, and yeah, that momentum is just very clear. There's still plenty of time on the clock for Frederico Marais to turn this one around. Nine and a half minutes remaining. We're going to take a quick break. You're watching the Route of 32 at the Rip Curl Pro, Bells Beach, presented by Bonsoy. I've been going to the surf coast since my teen years and get to go back every year now on the CT. It's really special. 
I love the tranquility of the surf coast and just the beauty of that whole drive is just spectacular. It feels very peaceful. The waves are really fun. Everyone's very welcoming. When Bells is on, it's so iconic. It feels like a good reset, so I love it down there. I'm with you, Ryan Callanan. This is a special part of the world, the surf coast. Italo loves it. This is where he broke through for his first CT win, and he wants a second, and he is coming up. Do not miss that heat. He's going to be surfing against Rio Waida, the Indonesian, in heat 15, round of 32, out there in the lineup at the moment. We can see John John Florence making his way into the lineup. His heat's going to get underway in about six and a half minutes' time. But he is uh, getting a, a nice deep position there here at Winky Pop. So numbers in for Jake Marshall's last ride, 6.4. He's really uh, built a, a nice, healthy little lead here on the, their scoring exchanges. He, he's managed to add two points on each of Frederico's waves, and that's left the Portuguese surfer chasing an 8.23 with just over six minutes to go here. And I think an eight right now is a bit of a hard task. Oh, man. It, we obviously had that restart at the beginning. It is quite slow out there, and that wind is kicking up a little bit. And in my books, that 6.4 was a very good 6.4. So, you know, you can see where the scale's at. And, you know, Jake's 6.4, that was great. That was three big turns. That was variety. So Fred's got to be doing something bigger and better than that. Another two points more on that. So... It's a hard task right now for Fred, and I think I've just got to go back to what I was saying before. I feel like you can see the nerves in his surfing, and looks like there's a couple of bigger lines coming through, though, so a couple of opportunities. In my opinion right now, that second wave of the set is providing that cleaner face, so we'll see what way Fred tr decides to pull the trigger on. Mate, I, I get a twisted stomach surfing in the opening round of the senior men's at <laughs> North, North Avalon Board Riders. Uh, so I can't imagine <laughs> what these competitors go through. Uh, Frederico has had a lot of opportunities to save himself in this heat. Let's see if he can make this one count. Nice first turn. Up into the pocket again. A good size wall for one of the bigger surfers on the CT. And this wave is a lot nicer. It's a, a put together beautifully. Plenty of punch in each of those moves. And he's going to chip away at that requirement in a big way. Oh, that was beautifully done. That was great. He needed a wave exactly like that right now. You know, I'd say that's his best wave so far in my books, which means he's going to make that requirement a bit less and look super strong, look powerful. That's the most confident I've seen him look this whole heat. Definitely. Here he goes. So this wave here, uh, three big belts straight up into the lip. Second one here, timed really well. Gets a third one. Three similar turns and then finishes off here. Gives it a little bit more mayo on that fin release. <laughs> Love it. Yeah, the, the last turn's definitely the strongest. But, you know, uh, like you said, he, he's really swung into this wave. Yeah. Uh, there was no nerves on show. He was in attack mode. It's going to be his best ride for sure. And the requirement's going to be a lot smaller oh. as we head into the final four minutes. Last turn was fire. Yeah. Absolutely flaring on that last turn. Those fins were so high. That was beautiful. There's a lot more confidence there. I couldn't see the nerves. It's exactly what he needed to do. Yeah, I'm sure he'll go into these final minutes going, OK, that's it. That's, that's what I expected myself. And, and let's see if he can deliver a, a thrilling finish to this one, which has been dominated by Jake Marshall so far. But, you know, domination looks a little different today. A couple of mid-range sixes looks pretty solid on, on your scorecard. I think right now, obviously, time is the enemy. Three and a half minutes on that clock. And Fred's going to have to put a bit of distance between himself or Jake. Or if another set comes through, he's going to have to force him to use that priority because he needs another opportunity, obviously. We know that. And... I mean, it's just, it's, nerv it's nervous times right now for him. He, and he needs, he needs a result. Two surfers chasing uh, their best finish in this event. Frederico Marias. He has had a couple of quarterfinals here in the past. And Jake Marshall, he's kind of struggled to break into uh, a final series with his two previous performances here. But this could be his year with the form that he's showing at the moment. Good number here for Frederico Marias. The biggest wave of the heat. And it gave him the opportunity to, to let go of a number of turns. 6.67. And the requirement now just a 6.06. He's right back in it. 
For sure. And I, my mind goes back to that one wave where he went for that kind of more radical finish, I believe, and then he fell. And I'm just thinking he got, is that, am I remembering correctly on one of those four point rides? One of his last turns he fell on and I'm just thinking, well, you know, I wonder if that would have been the extra point and a half they would need to be in the lead right now. But yeah, 6.67, that's the highest wave of the heat so far. And he's made that requirement a lot less, so he's chipping away at it. And I loved what I saw. It looked so confident. It was the biggest, biggest wave we've seen. And just four big manoeuvres, that last one especially, I think a lot of the points coming from that one and that big fin release at the end there. The GWM two minute warning. Pops up on the screen there, and it's a warning for both competitors. Frederico Marias has flipped the rhythm back in, in his favour almost uh, with that last ride. And Jake Marshall now would be feeling the nerves. He's got to defend the lead that he's held for, throughout the, uh, the majority of this heat. He's been working with Chris Gallagher for a number of years. Got to be thinking now, you know, a minute 20 on the clock. There's been quite long lulls today. I'm wondering if we will even see another roll of the dice. Well, that's the, you know, the, the thing that Frederico will be uh, really uh, knocking himself for, you know, is the poor start. Like, yep. you just don't know if you're going to get the opportunities in the final stages at the moment. It, these guys have already had an extra 10 minutes in this lineup because mm -hmm. there was no waves at the start of their heat. So we, uh, we gave them a fresh clock, and now Frederico is just praying for, for a two-wave set, really because uh, he's got to get rid of Jake Marshall and then obviously perform really well on his last wave to turn this one. Oh, and, and Jake's not silly, you know. If any wave comes through now with 40 seconds on the clock, you're going. So yeah, especially after what we saw uh, happen to Medina oof, earlier on. Oof. So yeah, he, he'll be definitely sticking close to Frederico here and, and making sure that no opportunity is passed by. I just go back to the start, well, even the restart, you know, were there a couple of opportunities where maybe Fred could have converted, even those couple of fours, there was a fall from Fred as well earlier on, so maybe a few mistakes made there. And in my eyes, I think the, the win has been just the quality of waves that, that Jake's had. They've just had that really nice, clean face and, yeah, able to put together a couple of uh, six, sixes. The run continues for Jake Marshall. He overcomes Frederico Marias here in heat 12 and makes his way into the round of 16. But Fred banking a 6.67 and maybe has reconnected with some form before heading over to, to Margaret River to try and save his place on this championship tour. We're going to take a quick break. When we return, we've got a former winner out in the lineup. John John Florence taking on Kate Matson. Surfing's you take my religion and I've got my culture and it's just community day in day out.
My name's Anthony Hume, aka Humey. Everyone knows me as Humey. I work for the WSL on the, the site team for the Rip Curl Pro down at Bellswitch. The event actually starts with an opening ceremony and I've been a part of that from pretty much the day they started doing it. And I play the Yidiki, which you all know as a didgeridoo. With the surfers and the opening ceremony and the cleansing part of it, they reflect. We feel proud to give that to them to help them prepare for their competitive ride. You know it's love and, and it's connections. Bells just glows. It's just that presence. It's a beautiful place. Good on you, Humey. Always great to catch up with him and awesome to get those behind the scenes stories from the Championship Tour events, thanks to Yeti and WSL. Out there in the lineup now, we've got a former winner. John John Florence is taking on Cade Matson here in Heat 13, the round of 32, looking for a spot. Obviously in the round of 16, but looking to ma maintain his position at the top end of the ranks. Kate Matson looking to get himself above that cut line before we uh, wrap up stop five over in Western Australia. You can feel the pressure building. John John Florence has a look at one here on the inside. And we were chatting just during that last heat. You know, these conditions do kind of, I think, bring the, an upset into uh, the, the conversation because it... it it even things up. There, there's a lack of consistency in the set waves, which gives Cade the opportunity with good wave selection to maybe find an edge over John here. 100%. I think today wave selection is everything. This heat right here on paper, you say, oh, of course, uh, John John's going to have the upper hand. But today, it, it's just been a way. It's been the wave catching game. It's been wave selection. It's who's on the better waves. And if you're not falling and you're being consistent and you've got that flow, I feel like you're getting the win, and it definitely has the recipe uh, for an upset today for sure. I mean, we've already seen it in earlier rounds, Cole taking down Gabby and, you know, Cade right now. This is his rookie year on tour, and he, he's chasing a result here. You know, he's had a string of 17ths in the first few events of the year, and right now this is a big moment for him. This is a big heat for him. If he was to get the win here, it sort of alleviates a bit of that pressure going into Margaret River. It doesn't make it the task so hard, you know. If, if he doesn't get this win here, he's looking down the barrel of a potential... He needs to win the event, basically, to save himself. So it's, yeah, so super crucial right now. And when you think about these two surfers and their head-to-head -head history, you don't have to think back far. Same round, Portugal, John John Florence, Smoke Cade over there put up a, a really healthy heat score total. So... The Grom has some work to do. Let's see how he opens things up here. Such a, a powerful surfer. Great variety on that forehand. Oh. Plenty of spark in these first few hits. He looks up for it as he finishes off strong on the opening wave here. And John John Florence, he'll be looking to, to match a pretty decent ride here. Cade's uh, had a an amazing run the, the last few years. We'll talk about that in a moment, but let's see what John John can do. Beautiful opening round heat that he had in pumping conditions at Bells. Now we get the opportunity to see him here at Winky. And just working this one over, flowing, being patient with where he chooses to place that major turn, and he sticks it on the end of the wave. Oh. What do you think, Felicity? Where do you see these two, uh, two scores falling? Oh, I'm going to need to watch both replays before, <laughs> <Good call. laughs> before I make my mind up. Yeah. But straight away, when I saw Kate take off, I was like, okay, he's in good momentum here. He's in good cool. flow, looking spicy, looking really sharp. But then, and I, I said, okay, I was going to, my thoughts were, well, that's one way to take it to John John Florence. I mean, you've got to put him on the ropes, but then straight out back behind him, John takes off and also drops an absolute banger of a wave. So before I make a decision and... Uh, yeah. <laughs> do my own judging. I'm, I'm going to have to watch those replays. Let's so, have a look at it. Yeah, this is Cade. And I just love the beautiful flow that he had here. Nice variety too. It was a smaller wave compared to John's, this one. And he gets the finish looking really good. You know, watching this back, this and now we can compare it to John here. Bigger set wave for John already in my eyes. I'm thinking... John's probably going to get the jump just with this size of this wave. Also the variety too, going from that carving manoeuvre into the lip a couple of times and just toying with it here and then getting that oh. uh, progression there at the end. It, when I watch it back, it's a John. 
it's just John Call for me, for sure. He's so on this year. He's been looking brilliant through the opening events of the season. Second place finish at Pipe. Quarterfinal at Sunset. Wow. Ninth place finish at Portugal. He wants to, to get himself in that final five so bad. Well, look how far forward his front foot was there. It was basically on the nose of the board. Oh, look at that, though. <laughs> basically on one foot. It's so good. One-legged squats coming in handy. Yeah, he's a, he's a lump <laughs> of a human, John. He's, you know, he's not a, a, a lanky sort of slight guy. There's a, a lot of him. But he just is incredibly agile and really does absorb any kind of pressure when he lands those rotations or any kind of air just beautifully. Uh, it, it's just rock solid stuff. Slightly bigger wave, as you said, mm. and just, I don't know, a bit more clout yep. and, and purpose and, and intent in each of those manoeuvres. A bit more manly, if you will. But uh, Kate doesn't give much away to John uh, in, in height and stature. Kate's no. a big grom. <laughs> Always has been a, a bit of a man child. Big boy. <laughs> big boy. 6.83 for Kate Matson, the surfer from San Clemente. And John Job Florence bags a 7.67 on that, uh, that first decent scoring ride. So uh, a nice close exchange here. You've got to love it. John Florence won the event in 2019. And uh, yeah, just has had some unbelievable performances here. He's got the highest heat average this year. So even though he hasn't had the victory, you know, that suggests that he's got incredible form running through the opening stage of the season this year. Looking really fit, looking at 100% health, which is, I think, what all surf fans want to see. We've missed him from, you know, that, that full campaign a lot over the years oh. as he tries to whip the reverse out of the pocket there. You've got to be thinking if he made that, he was on his way already, like leaps and bounds in front of Cade. You know, you get that back up really qu in quick succession from that 6.67. Really smart, obviously fell, but you know, Kate's 6.83 was great surfing as well. I think just the only thing that let him down was the wave height, and because that wave height was smaller, his just the maneuvers just didn't look as big. You know, John just got the jump. Obviously, he had that progression there at the end with that big fin throw, but yeah, Kate's wave height just slightly let him down. And I've got to be thinking, you know, if Kate gets the opportunity on one of these bigger sort of set waves, I'm I'm really liking what I'm seeing from him. I think if these two are a meeting over on the bowl and it's six foot, um, you know, Cade's going to really struggle. Uh, but here at Winky, you know, I had a chat to him after his uh, a really solid elimination round performance where he's one of the top scorers uh, getting the jumper on Cole Hausman and Callum Robson. Uh, he said he, he felt those similarities between Winky and Trestles. He felt right at home. That's going to really give him... So some confidence, a bit of fuel in this this massive heat. So, uh, yeah, we'll see how he fares. 6.83, great opener. John didn't back up the 7.67 with that last ride. So Cade has the opportunity now to, to get himself in front and maybe put some, some pressure on the two-time world champion. Sure, it looks like he's going to go this one too. Yeah, easy decision here. Needs to really dig in on these opening sections. If he wants to get an excellent score, nice hit there, loading up. A measured approach isn't going to get it done against John John Florence out here at the moment. Cade knows that, but he's just waiting for a good opportunity. He never really finds the section on that wave. No, it, it almost seemed like he would... Uh, timing was good. If I'm going to be hyper, hyper critical, maybe slightly... <laughs> so, so, that's what we're here to do, right? Yeah, slightly late on those couple of first turns, maybe just ever so slightly. But uh, he's obviously going to get out in front here. He only needs that 1.65. Let's just have a look here. And straight up into the leap. You know, you know what? Actually, timing was perfect. Who am I kidding? I'm kidding myself. <laughs> I just... <laughs> <laughs> well, he, just, just, he just needed the big major turn. Yeah. Like, it, it's, he's pieced it together pretty nicely, but I think even Cade's, like, on that wave, just saying, just give me something, stand mm. up, give me something I can really rip into. It, it was sort of dot-to-dot -dot surfing, not really getting the opportunity to, to rip the paper in half. For sure. I think he needs a set, too. You know, I think a set today and, a, like, the second wave of the set where it's got that clean face on there, I even saw it. Um, in Griff's heat as well against Tully. Just 
Griff being on those set waves of the second one, it was just really clean, smooth, fast surfing. Uh, Cade needs a set because there's just that clear difference right now between John's high score and Cade's. Yeah, Cade still gets that lead though, 5 one, seven. And that's, you know, what, what he wants to achieve out of that ride. It, it wasn't the one that's going to help him seal the deal and, and win the heat. But at this point in time, he does force a, a rotation with that priority. He gives John John something to think about. John after a 4.33 here. So Cade making his way back out. Just over 17 minutes to go. And uh, Vaughn, what about that board for Jake Marshall? It just looks incredible, flowing beautifully out there. Us, Ronnie, uh, Winky, Jake, the board, it's all come together beautifully. Uh, a big win there in a heat that was pretty wave starved, mate. Less than 10 waves ridden in that heat total between you and Freddie. But when you were on them, you made them count, mate. For sure, yeah. The beginning was uh, pretty brutal with the whole restart. I mean, I was stuck at least we got a restart. But um, yeah, I don't know. Sometimes it just seems like it goes through lulls and weird phases out here. And we actually had a good run of sets through the middle portion of the heat. And, um, yeah, I was stoked to get a couple. I honestly, like, didn't really get the best waves. I had my best wave. I, I probably fell on the last turn. So it um, was a little bit of a funky heat for me, but I was stoked to uh, just get through and get another chance to surf later. Richie Love had mentioned in the broadcast that, you know, at different times in your career, you get some momentum, and it's really important to just lean into that. Um, do you feel like you're in that headspace at the moment? For sure. I mean, I feel like I'm uh, I'm surfing really well at the moment. I've got great boards, um, competing well, and you know, my first couple of years on tour were like just a little bit of a struggle, I would say, for me. And I don't know. I was kind of dealing with some injuries, and like maybe my mental confidence wasn't really there. But now I feel better than ever, and I feel like I'm right up here with the best guys. And yeah, I don't know. I'm here. I'm here to win. So um, I'm feeling really confident, and I'm ready to go for the rest of the event. And just give us a little bit of insight into your board, mate, because uh, as they said, it is absolutely just crispy out there. Yeah, I switched. Um, the board I rode in the first round was a different one than the one I rode today. It was like a little bit smaller. So I actually jumped on the board that I rode in Air Sarah for my second place finish on the Challenger last year. And um, the wave here is really, really similar. So after that event last year, I kind of put the board away and figured I might need it at some point. And yeah, I've got some other new ones that work good, but sometimes it's nice to go back to something that you feel really confident on and that you know is going to work. And yeah, it feels great in these kind of slopier, like a little bit crumblier waves. So I'm really amped on my equipment. It feels amazing. That's <laughs> really good, man, because I know you were bummed to us crease that magic board the other day yeah. in uh, your first round. Mate, Baron Mamiya next heat. How are you going to prepare for that one? That's going to be really fun. Me and Baron have been friends for a super long time, and uh, Baron used to ride for Hurley, so we had a lot of like trips growing up, and we used to like just like have so much uh, funny like I don't know, like we'd talk so much to each other, just like yeah, I'm gonna get you whatever, like you know. And, um, so it'll be really fun to surf a heat with him on tour. I don't think we've had a man-on-man -man heat, so I'm sure it'll be uh, cool. And it's it's just rad that we're both um, able to be up here surfing at the at the highest level and. Um, yeah, it's going to be really fun. I'm excited. Another round of 16, mate. You could go even further than that. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers, Vorno. Thanks, mate. Jake Marshall into the round of 16. And uh, just really looking to solidify his place up at the top end of the ratings. Came into this one in eighth. And uh, maybe a chance to, to climb a, a lot higher with some big names falling out of the mix at the pointy end. 14 minutes remaining here. Kate Matson does hold the lead at the moment. John Florence after a 4.33. It's just, uh, we, we heard Vaughan mention it, you know, not a whole lot of waves ridden in that last heat. And uh, that's something that, that John, I'm sure, would have addressed with Ross Williams, his coach. You know, you don't want to be reckless and take every wave that, that rolls in but you, you can't pass up opportunities especially if you're you're in that second spot for sure and i also believe that we we saw it that last heat had that restart you kind of need to have something in that first block of the heat because you don't really want to be chasing two waves when it comes down to less than half of that time remaining because we've seen some really big lulls today. We even heard Jake talk about it. You know, it was obviously quieter in the beginning of his heat, but then in the middle they had that flurry of waves and you just, I mean, these guys are watching it though and that they'd be probably timing the sets and knowing sort of how regular, not regular it is. But you don't really want to be leaving it to that last minute at all. Uh, John's out there with priority now, 13 minutes on the clock. He's only chasing a 4.33. It's a small score for him. And you've got to be thinking that he's going to be on that next set when it rolls through. Such a, an amazing talent.
John Florence. He, his numbers here are ridiculous. When I was mentioning before, this year his heat score averages, uh, his heat score average is the highest. But at Bells Beach, he and, and Jordy Smith have a heat score average that's 15 points plus. Uh, the only surfers here in, in the mix that, that can boast that. Um, it, it's pretty impressive, you know, to, to be able to come here as many times as they have and, and sustain numbers that high. Oh, I just think John's surfing suits this wave. I think his strength is his forehand and his calves on his forehand and the variation that he's able to get in those carving manoeuvres. I mean, he's got a lot of strengths on tour. We all know it, but, I mean, I personally love watching him at Margaret River. Mm. Just beautiful romance that is over there. Oh, Big right-handers, bit consequential. And I think the same thing happens here at the bowl. Where, you know, you get him in waves where it's a bit bigger, a bit more power. And he just feels so at home. He's just able to put the board on rail. He feels so comfortable. And it's just his bread and butter. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of dangerous to invest too much into the, the history of numbers and averages. But surely, you know, Cade Matson is sort of saying to himself, well, his, his average is around 15 points plus. That, that's kind of my goal. I need to get a couple of high-range sevens and, and to really give myself a chance here because the, the truth of the matter is John's had a lot of slow heats at Bells and Winky over the years too, low-scoring heats. So that average is brought up by not just 15-point-plus heats. It's brought up by 18-point-plus heats. He has done huge airs uh, at sizey conditions uh, over at, at Bells. He's also lit up Winky, so it's... You know, it's going to take a lot for, for Cade to hang on to this position at the moment. But right now, he's right where he needs to be. 11 minutes to go. John John Florence, after a 4.33, we're going to take a Bonsoy brew break. Winding back the clock to 2014, John John Florence in a round four heat came up against Kelly Slater and Gabriel Medina and dropped a 10 point ride. And what did he get for it? A place in the quarterfinals. <laughs> a little different these days, yet he's throwing a 110 Tundra cooler at the competitors who can drop a 10 point ride in competition, filled with Yeti goodies. But Florence back then just so corked out. I think he's added a quite a bit of muscle to that frame these days. <laughs> he definitely looks a lot bigger these days, that's for sure. A lot of power in his surfing, big carving approach, but uh, yeah, that uh, that's a sought-after prize. We we love our Yeti goodies. Yeah, and, Yeti. Uh, so do the competitors. Yeti 110 filled with a bunch of Yeti goodies. Yeah. Glenn Hall can have an ice bath in that thing. <laughs> Eight and a half minutes to go here, and John Florence is patiently waiting for his opportunity. It's got to be nerve-wracking, even when you're uh, as experienced as John and you've, you've been in this position so many times, you know, uh, you just, when the conditions get slow like this, there's an infrequency in the, the set waves, the door is open for underdogs to, to get the jump on you. So we'll see if John can hold his nerve here. I, I think he will. I think he's definitely going to hold his nerve. I, 
he's been in this position a lot and I just think back to this year and the last few events and the form we've seen from him and just the confidence that he's bringing to each event. I think if he's given the opportunity, you know, I, I think he will convert. I think he's 4.33, that's a low score right now. He's already got that 7.67, the highest single wave of the heat. And from what we saw on that wave, it, things are looking good for John. Well, I think it's getting to that position now where John has to have faith in his 7.672. And, and yep. you've just got to remember that, you know, there's, there's a points different already in the 6.83, almost a point in the 6.83 and 7.67. So if a, a medium-sized wave comes in, it's such a gamble. But I, I, I feel like he has to take it just to get the lead back and ensure that he's in front. Like, can you... Is it one of those days where, with priority, you bank on a, a big set wave coming? Not, not today. I mean, we've had long, long levels today. You can't... You, John's going. If a, if a medium-sized set's coming through, John will pull the trigger. I think so. You have to, because... You just don't know if another opportunity is going to come through. Yeah. I mean, that could be all she wrote. And then, what, you let a medium-sized wave go through. And kind of when we saw that mistake earlier on from Gabby with Cole and he had priority, just let that sort of medium-sized wave go through and Cole converted. And I just don't think you could you can leave that to chance today. He only needs a 4.33. John can do that in one turn. Yeah. So and, and if you can get him a 5.33, it just pushes that requirement up for Cade and then... You know, then he's got that, that same dilemma, like, am I going to get an opportunity? So, yeah, I just... Oh, no, it's hard. <laughs> it's so hard. You know, if you, if you took a medium-sized one and then Cade gets a, a bomb on the outside, like, I, I don't think a coach at, at that point would scrutinise you too heavily. Well, you, we don't have a crystal ball, you know. We, we, we can't see or predict what these sets are going to be like when they come in. You, I think he'd be mad not to go. Uh, he could totally prove me wrong and wait right down to the last minute. And looks like we will have some motion in the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> it feels like there's some energy rolling our way, fingers crossed. Just under six minutes to go here. And you, you just, you know, like if, if you're in this situation, John John Florence, you, do your feet start to feel a bit slippery at this point? <laughs> oh, no the way. creeping in. Probably waxes the top, I'd say. Probably just a quick little oh, rub of the yeah. feet on the top of the feet. You that know? old trick. Yeah, the it's waxing the feet. Something Who? that the, the surfers like to do, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. And Shane Beshin was uh, one of the first people that I ever saw do that, waxing the top of his feet before he paddled out for a heat. And then he rubbed the bottom of his other foot on top of his waxed foot. Especially at waves like Winky, where you're running out over that slippery, sort of weedy bobbly reef there. I mean, Margaret River comes to mind when you're walking out through the keyhole in winter, all that sand get, gets washed away. And that, those rocks there become super slippery. So I've seen Kelly wax his feet a lot. I've seen Jack Robbo wax his feet a lot. It's a thing. John John. Just standing on his board, just saying, come on. I've been, it's been like probably 10 minutes now. He's been waiting for this opportunity at this 4.33. Oh, it has gone a bit quiet it, from that pullback shot. It kind of looked like we were going to have a few sets start rolling through, but kind of just dissipated into not much. And if I turn around and sometimes, you know, bells can be the indicator of what's going to push down the point further to Winky. And uh, looking at the bowl right now, and she's looking a bit quiet. <laughs> yeah, not a whole lot at the moment. So uh, it, it might just be a, a crack at a medium-sized wave here that, that John is banking on to turn this heat around and get himself into that round of 16. Four minutes to go. I'm even thinking it might be coming down to a crack at a small size wave at this point. Just quickly, Kate Matson's story is pretty uh, remarkable. He had a, a back injury a couple of years back. Um, I think 2022, he was really struggling. Um, opted for surgery. Uh, at one point, he was wondering if he'd ever be able to get back to his best and, and realise his dream. Uh, really committed in, intensely to his rehabilitation and got himself a, a great run of results on the Challenger Series to make the grade. And uh, it, it's fantastic to see, you know, like for someone so young to overcome that already, just to get here, it, it's a, a massive achievement. Oh, surgery and, and for a back injury, I mean, that's major. And especially for someone like Cade, who's, you know, in, in the earlier stages of his career, you'd think... Uh, one good thing about injuries, I mean, if you look at, well, maybe a silver lining to come from that is it does give you a good perspective, a bit of a reality check maybe. And I, it, sometimes when you pair everything right back, the expectations are lower, 
I mean, we've seen it a lot. Beware of that wounded warrior and people just come back even stronger than what they were before. And I mean, I'm stoked to see Kate on tour. I feel like he belongs here. I feel that his surfing is very smooth, very connected. I mean, he had a serious dig at that first event in the year. Mm. If we cast our minds back to back to all that day and whoa, he just had the craziest wipeout. And you could just see how committed he was. I mean, he was always going to go that wave and yeah, it just looked so death defying though. But he came up and he was fine. Uh, but yeah, he's chasing a result right now. He's obviously sitting out there in that lead, but scary place for him right now. Oh. Yeah, probably uh, even scarier for, <laughs> for John John Florence, who's just desperate for this 4.33. But yeah, Kay, part of that, that big San Clemente push, uh, there was you know, a, a cast of them that graduated to the championship tour last year, and, and many of them uh, are riding Matt Biolis' boards and Sawyer Limblad, Crosby, uh, then there's Eli Hanneman, Cole, obviously, joining that uh, that long list. But yeah, Cade has has done incredibly well. And, and you know, I think you're right. Perspective is is sums him up beautifully because uh, even though he's had this run of 17th, he has really enjoyed his time on the championship tour this year. He's buzzing. He's got a big smile on his face every time you you bump into him. Super warm character very popular amongst his peers and and right where he needs to be at the moment leading john john florence with uh, an opportunity to break into the round of 16 for the first time this season got to be thinking now i mean back to that point eight that john has in his score line did he fall on that one I, my memory is not serving me well right now but wow it, it's pretty nuts we we've really only seen that one flurry of a set in this heat yeah, John had a look at one at the start of the heat. It kind of closed out. Um, he's making a move on the inside here. This is his opportunity. Cade in his face, just making sure he commits that wave. John, head down, paddling, pushing to get into this one. And he does. Needs a 4.33, loading up. Has some speed. Nice little hit there. Under pressure. John John catches a bit of a rail, but looks to clean it up here on the inside. Pushes oh. it, can't ride out. 40 seconds to go. Doesn't feel like a 4.33. Definitely doesn't feel like a 4.33 to me. That that was a very, very small wave, so you could see how hard John had to scratch to get into that one. I don't think he know he probably knows it too. I just he's gonna need more. Heavy situation for John Florence. That wave just didn't really give him enough push. He surfed it, he was on his way. But even that last turn, I, I just don't know if there was enough pop and release I in it. I don't even know if he made that, if he would have got the score, to be honest. No, it, you compare it to Kate Matson's 5.17. Wow. And the Grom has survived. Kate Matson, 21 years of age, has just got the jump on a former winner, a two-time world champion here at the Rip Curl Pro Bells Beach, presented by Bonsoy. An important result for him. And uh, John John Florence... You know, he's trending backwards oh. with his results at the moment, but the good news for him is he's heading to an event that someone's going to have to wrestle the trophy away from him over there. But uh, disappointing, really let down by the conditions here, John John Florence. But Cape Matson getting the job done. And he is moving on. That was major. That, that, that was a oh, major heat win for Cade and, and super important for Cade. Cade needs to alleviate some of that pressure before the cut. This is He's on his way. But disappointing for John. I mean, really, there was only that. There was one set that came through in that in that heat. One set at the beginning, and other than that, they were just sitting around. And we thought John might have a swing at at least a medium-sized wave, but it just didn't come to fruition. Well, that was the only wave that he got the opportunity on, and uh, didn't happen for him. John, John, out of the event. Kate marches on. We'll take a quick break and bring in Jordan Rich for the call.
32 continues here at Winky Pop. Yago Dora taking on Ian Gentile. Ian Gentile representing Maui and Hawaii. And Yago Dora, big part of the Brazilian storm, turned in his best season to date last year in 2023 and came incredibly close to making the WSL finals last season. Just came off a tough result in Portugal, getting an equal ninth where the year before he turned into a semi-final finish. That was kind of the result that really pushed his fire and really heated up strong through the mid-season cut and beyond. A dangerous, goofy foot. He was being coached by his father, Leandro Dora, but Ian Gentile also working with Leandro Dora this season. So some friendly fire here. Joe Terpel, Richie Lovett for the call, a man who's won lowers and Holly Eva and Many, many more brilliant performances, quarterfinals here at Bells in the past. Richie, this is a, a cool one to break down, regular versus goofy, and, and two good friends with a lot on the line. Yeah, yeah, there's plenty on the line here. And we've seen Yago uh, over the years put in some just amazing performances. I feel like, uh, you know, he can really take to the air. One of the goofies who's uh, super comfortable in going above the lip. And, uh, but Ian Gentile, he's been on some sort of a special role over the last uh, season, really improving his performances. Here he goes, up and riding. Looking to control the start as Ian Gentile kept paddling deeper than his good friend Yago, and we'll see if it pays off. Nothing yet for the Maui boy. Then connects with a nice off the top, still working hard, sneaks in a climb, and steps off. Didn't go home in between events, so from Portugal, he just came straight to Australia to continue to enjoy his his job as one of the best surfers in the world. A moment that he uh, had as a junior where he actually thought maybe this wouldn't happen. It all came true as we look at this last replay. Yes, yeah, streaking down the line, gets a ton of speed. Starts to open up with this section here. Quick snap, keeps that momentum going. And a little shimmy on that, uh, on that final moment there. Up and over the roof as it came down. Nothing, uh, the score is going to uh, be below a mid-range score, I feel like. This is live action here with Yago. Dora now hitting the lip. Nice, tight, compact backhand surfing to start, but trying to get some more out of this wave. There's a vertical hack. And trying to put a little bit more into the end section. Yago Dora, number nine. Has such a cool style on tour, and like you said, crazy above the lip. Especially backhand, I remember in, at Karamas, Red Bull was putting on that Airborne series. It was just so cool to talk to all the best air guys in the world. They just look up to Yago so much above the lip as we look at his opener again. Yeah, so uh, I feel like Yago gets the opening exchange here. And uh, these moments right here, gets up and over the foam. Bang, hits that one vertical to finish things off. So we've seen a 3.83 drop in for Ian Gentile. I feel like Yago's will go a little bit further north of that. Not too much. Um, scale just uh, set for this heat as Yago paddles back out. We just finished a big heat where we lost a huge name. John John Florence out because of a great performance from the rookie. Cade Madsen is with Vaughn. Thanks, Joey. Yeah, Cade. Wow. So good, man. You were saying <laughs> on the way up the stairs that you uh, hadn't done a post heat interview since you've been in the CT. Got two under your belt and uh, really good results as well. Yeah, it feels good. It was a bummer that he didn't have too many waves, but uh, yeah, I can't complain with the outcome. I was super stoked. What's changed for you, do you think, mate? Um, you know, a bit of a tricky start to the year. Obviously, a rookie season, there's so much to learn, but something's clicked here at Bills. Yeah, I think the first couple of events, I might have been just like a little more like second guessing like everything I was doing, and now I feel like I've kind of like warmed up into it and kind of like know exactly what I want to do and I kind of just want to like enjoy it more. And I feel like this event I'm like kind of just enjoying every like little thing like walking down like the bell stairs and just like enjoying it all. So yeah, I'm really happy. Mate, doesn't matter how much you enjoy it, when you see your name against John John Florence in a heat sheet, you know that you've got to bring something really special to the table. Yeah, I had him in Portugal too in my round of 32. So I was a uh, little uh, kind of ha wanted to get him back. So I was really, I was, Definitely happy to get him back and, uh, yeah, get a couple of fun waves while I was at it. <laughs> That's awesome, mate. And um, who are you getting ready to, uh, oh, sorry, how are you going to get ready for your next heat? Um, yeah, I think we're surfing again later today, so I'll just go home, reset, and come back down and watch that Cole Pinto heat and then get fired up for my heat. 
Unreal, mate. It's so good to see you doing so well. Congratulations on taking down an absolute giant, former winner and two-time world champion, John John. Appreciate it. Thank you. Well done. Cade Madsen, an absolute legend of a human, hard-working athlete, backing himself, and he's going to be dangerous no matter who he draws. Uh, tough start to the season, especially when you're reminded that you haven't been having too much time on the glass talking about post-seed interviews. But I, I just feel like he doesn't wear his losses like some other, you know, rookies that it could be a lot of weight on your shoulders, a lot of question marks on if you belong. I think Cage is going to continue to to move forward and just continue to just go on to the next one for him. He's he's got the round of 16 to enjoy at Bell's Beach. Yeah. And uh, as a rookie, you know, you, you can either take two uh, avenues here. You get totally bummed out and just be, you know, freaking out that you're not making heats or you can learn from it and you can actually go, OK, what happened? Why did I learn? What, why did I lose? What do I need to learn here? Why do I what do I need to pick up? But I, I kind of like the fact that he's enjoying it, too, because you can, as a rookie, also put too much pressure on yourself and just be like, OK, I've got to get super serious. I've made the tour. But, you know, sometimes you just got to be in that good mind frame. Uh, be happy, just be appreciate everything that's going on around you, and that's when you'll do your best surfing. Now setting this one up is Ian Gentile. Flowing through that first section with the float. Another climbing type maneuver to cover some ground. Catching up to a section where he can really connect with a big hack. Now a carve, and he'll keep that flow going down the line to find a finish, which was the most aggressive big hack to slide. Catching up to Iago, stepping off his second wave so far. Yeah, Gentile post uh, midseason cut pressure last year. I think he really got to relax and enjoy the tour. We really saw that in El Salvador where he made finals day and did a couple gigantic alley-oops. It just looked like he was going, OK, now I can really enjoy this whole thing with out thinking about pressure and numbers and results and his surfing I felt completely changed totally hardest thing to do in these first five events especially for the rookies is like just not think about that cutoff after the fifth event let's have a look what happened Yago Dora here's the replay on his second wave a little bit of foam and turbulence on the face but he cracks that first turn gets the drift but only the one maneuver Joe so a quick in and out and in contrast Ian Gentile streaking down the line Almost weightless with these two flowing uh, floaters here. Now he grinds the lip. Saw a little moment of fins just flashing out of the lip there. And he gets a bit of a cut down straight into a snap and then goes for this strong finish. Close out re entry, bust the tail out. That's a better ride for Ian Gentile, the best ride of the heat so far. Ian Gentile's parents are from Brazil, a place called Fortaleza in the far north. Great professionals have come out of that region, like Pablo Pauli Paulino, who won multiple World Junior Championships. Uh, Silvana Lima, just, a, just right around the corner from Fortaleza. She won the Bells title, former runner-up in the world, one of the best ever. Fabio Silva, Heitor Alves from that part of the world. Uh, his family was able to ha move to Maui and raised in on that beautiful island, but he speaks perfect Portuguese which definitely helps with life on tour. And you can see good friends like with Yago Dora. Last score coming through for Ian Gentile, a 6.0. Now Yago needs a 5.01 to take the lead. But yeah, it was a crazy story when Ian Gentile actually had to stop surfing for a bit, being on the QS and challengers. And even there was a time when there wasn't priority in, in, in four-man heats where his kind of personality, he was just going, oh my goodness, I kind of want to do something else. And then I think the priority update where he could take turns and not just get hassled out of situations really helped a guy like Ian who has that purity in his surfing and just wants to ride good waves. And all of a sudden everything turned around and I feel like he's just getting better and better. It's been fun seeing Ian Gentile get really comfortable on the championship tour, Kaipo. I know you have a lot of great memories of him growing up in Hawaii. Yeah, I mean, just the youngster coming through, and uh, and Ian's going to be really comfortable here. Uh, again, I mean, it's cliche, Maui Glass, right? He comes from <laughs> the windiest of the Hawaiian Islands. This is just another day at Hokipa for Ian Gentile with the splash and the si and the side onshore wind. And with that, I'm going to give you an Oakberry's uh, conditions update. You have three to five foot right now. Talked about the side onshore wind, right about 17 miles per hour or so. So definitely some texture. 
definitely some sections to negotiate, but Ian Gentile, this should be in the Maui boys wheelhouse. Such a great call there, Kaipo, with uh, the Maui glass. When you're over there on Maui and, and out at Hokipa, it's just a, it's a thing. Like, you just never get glassy conditions. You know, and when it's just looking like this, there's a little lump on the wave. They're like, wow, it's glassy. Smooth day. There we go. Let's go rip. And uh, Ian Gentile got used to surfing with a lot of crazy wind directions. I think that's why there's so many great aerialists from that island, yeah. like uh, the Matt Miola, the Albi Lair crew. If you know where to go at the right time, you can definitely use that wind to your advantage above the lip yeah cool it's uh, it definitely helps you know and if that wind's going away from you as it's kind of coming down the point now so it does make it a little tricky to land those airs and and have that board sticks to you, stick to your feet so when these surfers do go take to the air today you know you know that when they're making that air that's pure skill man Andy Irons, a three-time world champ, once said that Ian Gentile was the best Grom on the planet. Really? There was a, wow. a clip that was released, and he was fresh off, I think, a perfect final in the NSSA Open Boys Division, had bid sponsor backing, was going on surf trips with his heroes, and it was just such a time for Ian Gentile. He had to regroup from that and put himself in a position to qualify. And he's doing great right now on tour. Leading the heat over Yago Dora with 15.30 still remaining. We'll continue with the Rip Curl Pro Bells Beach presented by Bonsoy right after this. Time to watch the Pulse big day at Winky Pop for the round of 32. And what a morning. A rookie Cole Hausman dealing with the cut has his hero in the lineup. Gabriel Medina, the three-time world champ, who is fresh off that gigantic heat total on the Bells Bowl. He looked quick. He looked inspired. 710667. Then with priority, Medina let the rookie go, and Hausman went to town. Crushing a couple of big sections, went all the way into the end section and finished on his feet to get the score and upset Medina. Louis was proud of that performance, said, you just beat your hero. Then it was all Cola Pinto, class in the yellow jersey. An aggressive start against Tully Wiley as far as a paddle battle is concerned. Tully then paddled into a closeout and it was all about Griff. Now Crosby took control, maybe more incentive to draw his brother in the round of 16. He looked very selective, very patient, radical. 7-5 was his start, then backed it up with a 6-9-7. Not surfing like a rookie, looking like a seasoned vet, using a lot of that rail and that mayhem. He's got a grip and cross. Cool combinations even built to a 6-5 at the end of this heat and eliminates the greatest of all time. His first win over Kelly in his career. Thanks for watching the Pulse. The big story from the morning, Rich, was going back to that huge upset 
from the rookie on tour, Cole Hauschman, really making a smart decision just to paddle into that last wave, actually moved up a bit deeper, and then without priority, was happy that Medina didn't take that wave off him at the end. Yeah, well, it's it, the kind of script got flipped, you know, and that's what Medina was actually doing to Cole Hauschman through the entirety of that, uh, of that heat. He kept on sneaking up the inside and getting these ones that were breaking a little bit deeper. And this was that last wave. Yeah, so it's that, that start, opening combination is where the judges uh, really found all the points and then the strong finish as well. But, you know, that second turn of, of Coles is arguably the biggest face turn of the heat. Uh, a lot of water displacement. And as you can see here, this second turn, he just gets all that tail release, really blows the fins out. Critical moment right here. And we know that uh, degree of difficulty and that critical nature of the turn is something that the judges really paid. We love close seats and I just had a quick chat with the head judge uh, Luli you know Luli's watching the panel and not sitting down writing the scores down but he just said I believe the judges really loved that first combination of maneuvers in comparison with other similar rides and they took their time to review all judges reacted that that was the score to turn it and seeing that strongest committed combination to kick off the wave that ended up being the real difference with not a whole lot separating the backup waves upon review for Cole, it's a huge heat win with uh, momentum that he needs to feel if he wants to surf a complete season in his rookie year on tour. Yeah, critical moment, no doubt, and a frustrating one for Gabrielle, obviously. You know, he's looking to solidify his place in, the, in that final five. He wants to get right up there. And Cole, well, he's surfing for his career and, and his spot on the tour. So, you know, every single one of these heats, um, you know, they are crucial in, in the entirety of the surfer's career. And that's why there's so much passion involved with them. Yago Dora backhand float to start this one off, holding the bottom turn and a nice rapid cutback. Easy pace to follow as he's tracking down the line. And now oh. hits it up off the lip to shut it down. It's interesting when you compare big performances from a previous season, where I was curious to see Yago's form because last year he was a bit higher in the rankings before heading into Bells Beach. And the only difference with his start was the third in Portugal instead of the ninth. But he actually had the same results at Pipe and Sunset. Really? And then just caught fire, obviously making finals day in Europe. So his surfing's still there. He's still finding his rhythm on tour. It's interesting how, like, when someone finishes sixth in the world, you're ready for them to, to show up and blow up at the first Absolutely, event of the season. Absolutely, but it's not that case, mate. It's etchy sketch. You just shake that thing, and it's a clean slate every season. Good wave here from Yago Dora in particular. This final turn here just slams it so hard, and that's a great comeback wave. So uh, this is the 5-6 uh, the from Ian Gentile. Really silky smooth style and a crisp turn off the top there. Very committed. You can see he just bust through the lip there. See how that tail goes free and then he re-engages. All that turbulent water trying to knock him off. But Ian just using all that leg strength. See how he gets nice and low. Just gets that, um, you know, that sure footed uh, sturdy stance. Gets nice and low and then... Uh, Gets the stand tall after that to show the judges that he has completed the maneuver. You ridden a Mayhem before? I have actually, yep. I've ridden them uh, throughout my career uh, occasionally. Would you get them when you were competing in California or mm. would you kind of pack one on their own? Uh, just every now and then I'd tap in and more so late. I've just jumped on boards that my friends have had and, and uh, you know, really admire what Matt Biolis does. He's an, an incredible shaper. Ian's actually riding the, the driver 2.0, a little rounded pintail. Um, and Matt was saying that it's it, it's got a slightly lower volume to it and a slightly lower rail for uh, the tall kind of lanky frame of, of Ian Gentile so he can kind of uh, knife into it. Uh, it was something he wanted that sensitive feeling under his feet some some surfers like to have it you know a bit more of a boxy rail blocky rail with with a bit more volume in it and that kind of sits you up on the water a little more and liking to have that sensitivity in the rail where he can really knife into it so uh, all these little um, you know special features that go into the individual board for the individual rider Ian Gentile on the mayhem clean sweep to start Chunky section, drifts through it to create some space oh, and punches it out wow. again with the layback slide. Silky wrap again and now sets up a beautiful hook oh, using all of wave. that rail. Yeah, you can celebrate. That felt good. It looked good. 
Gentile went to second with the previous of Dora coming in at a 6.4. All mayhem matchup as far as surfboards are concerned. And Gentile looking for that 6.34 to get the lead over his good buddy. Both coached by Iago's father. Leandro famous for a world title coaching moments for Adriano de Souza and on the junior level, Lucas Silvera. Yeah, it's looking spicy under his feet, isn't it? That board of Ian Gentiles. Actually, both these surfers, the boards are looking fantastic. Watch this. Clean slice off the top. Sort of navigating through these bumps and smoothing them out through each one of these turns. That one there, that big layback attack. And gets a swooping cut back and down to the finishing turn. Bang, big wrap again. So uh, great variety on that ride. This will be a great angle here. Already popping the fins on that first turn and again on the second. And he wraps it up. Quick cutbacks down the line. Beautiful fan of spray. So Ian Gentile, you can see more of a, an upright stance. Fairly narrow stance too, compared to some. But just always hunting down the line. That turn there in particular, frame that, freeze that. That's a poster right there. Oh, man, I'm putting that on my wall for sure. But Yago is looking to answer. Quick tag there in the white water. Throws the tail oh. high and doesn't what? reverse. Shows even more control as he's firing himself up. The guy can get radical on demand. Spontaneity, creativity, that's what Yago Dor is made of. Needs a 7.11. Cool to see those fins flying free, Kaipo. Oh, it's I get to see them in the, coming down the line and then out the back every single time. Like you said, Joe, fins free for both Yago and Ian. Uh, the Maui boy doing a good job. Like I said, fo focusing and funneling that his inner hole keep out here. But Yago on the backhand, so quick, so precise in his board placement. I love these back and forth battles. So true, Kaipo. Pretty rad to see two good friends going blow for blow, changing the lead. And then this is what Kaipo saw. Fins in his face and especially backhand. So difficult to accomplish. Oh, it is just on the backhand. Look at this. Just so inverted. Come on, drone. Get out of the way. Let's watch this. <laughs> <laughs> and this is actually harder to do, what, what, what uh, Yago does here. So instead of going with the full rotation, he goes, no, hang on a minute. I'm just going to ride prone for a second and then bring it back around. Takes an incredible amount of control to be able to do that. And you can see the reaction from Yago. He was pumped on it. Because the idea there, Rich, is you can keep your motion forward and just keep that spin going. Or you can show the judges you have control with your fins out and actually pulled around forward. Impressive ability to pull that off for Yago. And judges have to make their comparisons. That's what it's all about. Remembering what's happened so far, seeing if Yago, if he did enough to get at least a 7.11. Gentile 7.5 is the direct comparison, and it should be right there. Scores coming through, 7.63. Dor gets the lead back. Gentile now needs a 6.54 as he holds priority with 3.30 to go. What an amazing heat this one's been. Such a great battle. The lead being exchanged almost with every single wave. Some great surfing there. The judge is obviously getting really excited about that maneuver, showing a lot of progression, degree of difficulty. Both these guys in a crazy spot on the rankings would take the top 22 for the whole year after Marker River. Ian on the live rankings, 20th in the world. So he's right near that cut line. Yago, 18th in the world. So very important to move up the rankings and get a spot in the round of 16. Yago happy with that crazy fin throw. He can mix it up as well with that section if he wants to go above the lip. And now with second priority, he's taking a higher spot on the point, kind of similar to, to what Cole was doing at the tail end of his heat. Yeah, it's an interesting strategy because uh, what can happen here if Yago looks at a wave and, you know, takes off, then Ian can actually just steal it off him uh, as that wave moves down the line. So Ian's obviously happy with his takeoff spot. He'll, he'll have his line up. And he'll be uh, just thinking, this is where I think the best wave is and this uh, place to take off on the wave is. 
But Yago, maybe just trying to get into his headspace a little bit here, just thinking, oh, OK, yeah, hang on a minute, am I reading this wrong? So tactics coming into play with under two minutes to go now. Such a close battle as we pass the GWM two-minute warning. Yago Dora representing Brazil so well, his first CT win of his career last season. And it was an incredible location to get it done at home with his friends and family in Sakurama. He, he's from Florinopolis, but his whole family was there up in the northern region of Rio de Janeiro. And Sakurama was the playground where he got the wild card, beat multiple world champs on the way to a semifinal finish. And everyone started taking note, oh, wait, this guy's not a free surfer anymore. He belongs on the tour. And you see that competitive energy coming out of him. His dad talking to Matty Benrose. And Matty looking up pretty serious there because every time I talk to him, he's pulling off a prank or joking around. I know, man. <laughs> you got to be careful with that guy. He will get you. <laughs> he will dead set get you. No, we love Matty Benrose. He he can switch the serious face on when it's, when it's game time. But uh, every other minute of the day, it is a practical joke up. Watching Yago going down the line. There's that first snap looking solid. Nice carve on this inside corner under priority of Gentile. Probably felt might as well just give something for the judges to look at. Keep the reps up. Put some energy behind Gentile. Oh, both these guys have been surfing so well in this heat. And now Gentile looking to maybe turn this one around right here. He will catch this wave, needing a 6.54. Taps the float. He's got some work to do to cover some ground. Still working on a big section and oh, misses no. it on the rotation. And Yago Dora will get the win and head into the round of 16. And it all came down to keeping his head in the game through several lead changes. And how about that? Just rock and roll backhand float. One of the coolest styles in the game of pro surfing. And really needed to move up in the rankings, get closer to the top 10 picture. What a great battle. Congrats, coach. Both athletes did great there. Yeah, doing well. Everyone in the camp is uh, performing. And that man on the screen, Yago Dora, he's moving through to the round of 16. And just look at the tides come back in off on the reef now. Two hours ago, there were people standing another 10, 20 yards to the left in front of the waves. Tide's coming in fast. And a great job to Yago moving on to the round of 16 to surf again today. Great job to the officials who allowed a lot of fans to get down low on the beach. It was more than I've ever seen at Winky Pop and then had to gather them up the staircase once that tide started filling in. A little bit tougher than the Bells Bowl for spectators here locally, so they're taking advantage of the Jumbotron and the car park and getting a good spot on the bluff to watch some incredible surfing like we just saw from Yago. Coming up next, a world champ, a Bells champ, Italo Ferreira headlines the heat with Rio Wido. We'll be right back.
The Rip Curl Pro Bells Beach, presented by Bonsoy, is brought to you by Rip Curl, the ultimate surfing company. By Visit Victoria, Melbourne, every bit different. By Eventbrite, proud sponsor of women's surfing on the WSL Championship Tour. By Oakberry, fuel yourself with the official acai of WSL Australia. And by Shiseido, official sunscreen partner of the World Surf League. Yago Dora fresh off the win. There's a congratulations from his dad, the Pata Banks, and then from Matty Benrose. Uh, good on you, mate. Well done. <laughs> what a great crew to have back at you in an event like this and just year round in the world title race. Itolo just getting started against Rio Waida. Thanks for being with us on the host set. How good is this? Joe Trapel, Richie Lovett, George Pizarro, the wild card into the event. George, is so cool. I found an old interview with you, and it was like, what's your dream heat? This is a year's back, and you're like, bells, bowls, pumping, in the final with Kelly, and I'm like, it might happen, man. It was just so cool seeing you in the event and, and do some incredible surfing, man. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me. It was, um, it was definitely a pretty special experience. Like, I don't know, I just always thought growing up, bells, hearing the hell's bells in the morning and then walking down, and um, I don't know, being there on the first day was just so surreal, and when I actually heard you talking about that in one of the heats, and I was like, oh, actually, imagine that. That'd be pretty crazy, but didn't end up happening. But, wow, just such, an, such a crazy experience for me, and I'm just, yeah, just so thankful for the opportunity. Thanks for joining us for the call. We've got George with us this entire heat. Racetrack section for Rio Wida taking off deep on the point, and this guy is so quick. He gets there, snap to slide, hitting the white water quickly. Aggressive through his points as he will wind up with some open face. Cool carve off the top for the Indonesian and oh. lights up the finish. I want to go surf. Look at that fin throw into incomplete. Those turns from Rio, those so enjoyable. How hard he had to work just to get down the stretch, Rich. That was fun. He was miles up the point on that one, Joe, for the start of this heat. So obviously fighting for the inside position, that was something that he obviously wanted against Italo. And I feel this is exactly what he needs to do. Put Italo under pressure, start to maybe push him to, to go outside of his comfort zone. Because you know that Italo is going to just hammer it on his backhand. He's going to probably take to the air as well at some point. Uh, I feel if uh, Rio can just stick to his game plan like he did on that first wave with some really solid surfing, have a chance here. One more look from the top here. George, take us through this wave. Yeah, well, obviously, I was actually watching them before. They were so far up the point for that inside. But I don't know, Rio's so quick, so he just he managed to get around from uppers to lowers, which is pretty impressive. And I don't know, he's got such a nice click snap there that just like has the explosion on a pretty soft section. And I don't know, just linked it together so well, not much movement in between, and then just found the clean water and finished it really nicely. Gosh, and then that oh. one, exploding rich. Yeah, solid turn to finish off. Uh, great wave there for Rio. Let's see what Italo did. So that foamy face that he has to deal with. Clean snap to start off, and again. And then comes down, as we know, pushed a little too hard on that final turn. Doesn't get the rotation. As we think about how things started in the Rip Curl Trials, uh, let's go back then because that wasn't broadcast to the world. Uh, what happened? Who's in the final with you? What were the waves like? Yeah, it was pretty sick, actually. We got Winky a little bit similar to this, maybe a little bit more consistent and cleaner, but I don't know. We had It was me, Alistair Reginato, Dylan Moffat, and Mike Madonna in the Solid trials. Solid heat. Yeah, it was sick. It was two actually two-man semis, so it was me and Reggie and then Dylan and Mike, and then yeah. in the final I had Dylan. It was just so back and forth. Oh, I think here goes Italo. Still enjoying our time with George Pitar, Rip Curl Trials winner, ripped in the main event as we have Italo, former Bells champ, going for a little snap on that big section. Winding up off the lip, there's a big power move on the backhand of Italo. First wave was a 2.5. And starting to build, that's his second effort against Rio. Rio's opener locking in at a 6.17. So Ferrer playing a little bit of catch up there, Rich. Yeah, uh, it was a great opener for Rio, and obviously uh, Italo's trying to match it here. Good looking away from the takeoff. 
Just a little downtime to start things off. Now he starts to get to work. Just got a little off balance. Good projection float up and then comes through to this final section. Gets some tire release there. So a little bit disjointed between the maneuvers. So uh, the judges will take note of that and keep that score relatively low. Might be mid-range. George, do you study the CT athletes and really look what they're doing and as far as even heat prep goes since you've been kind of shadowing them in the Red Bull athlete zone during this event? Yeah, for sure. It's pretty, it's definitely a different feel. Like I almost, I, I don't know, my heat prep normally is pretty average. Like I'm sort of just floating around, but being on this stage and having that Red Bull athlete area zone, I was like, I got to go in there like an hour before and get all ready. But I don't know, just watching everyone and it's just, it's, it's really serious and it's just, they just take so much pride in what they do. And I don't know, it's cool. It's a cool energy. Oh, here goes Rio. Rio Wider, 617 on the opener. Starting to jam down the line. Crispy little float there off the bottom. Continues with that forward progression down the line. Hits that section. Little two for one in a short space from Rio. Finding a little link up on that combination on the tail end of the wave, Rich. Yeah, he's looking good, isn't he? Nice and light on his feet. Just making those little subtle adjustments in between all the bump. Doesn't seem to be worrying him at all at the moment. Great backup wave. Yeah, so fast, so quick. His Instagram video parts are like movie ending segments in high performance conditions like this. Take us through, George. Yeah, he's just flying down the line. I feel like just trying to time it so well at Winky, it's you got to just match the pace of the wave, and he's doing it so well there, just waiting for the section to present itself. And that click snap he's going to so well. And geez, he fitted in well. It was a pretty quick wave, so definitely a nice little backup score to that first one. There's that view from the water there, seeing how quick he gets to the finish. Look at that. Not a lot of surfers could have got that far, Rich. No, no, absolutely. And again, you know, I just see shades of Danny Wills in this guy, the way he surfs and the style and just how fast he executes these maneuvers, especially these quick turns like that off the top. You can see he kept the board directing down the line here. He knew this final section had uh, some good points. Had to make the decision there whether to do uh, multiple turns or just go for the one. Oh, almost pearls, almost caught an edge. And somehow managed to get two turns in the space of, uh, well, any other human may have only got uh, one done. As we see him finish there and turning in a 4.67 for that hardworking effort. Italo 4.5, so Rio still out in front as we hit the 20-minute mark. Uh, George, so much to discuss. It, you were in that heat with Ethan Ewing to kind of close out the day. So that was like the last thing we had to talk about all the rest of the afternoon into the evening. And man, your phone was blowing up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it definitely was. It was um, it was pretty classic, actually. Like, I don't know, it was, it was a tricky heat. It was, it was tough waves at the start, but we ended up getting a few towards the end. And I don't know, it was, it was, I was just honestly just happy with, with the heat. It was just so fun to go back and forth like that yeah. with Ethan, even though it wasn't any crazy scores. But just to have that and to be able to put a few turns together was fun. And then everyone was sort of blowing up my phone for a while there. And I didn't, I didn't really, like, I didn't think it was that crazy, like that big a deal. But um, I went home, actually, and I watched it. And, yeah, I, was, I thought he beat me. But I guess everyone sort of has an opinion. But that's all right. It was... Um, it was just fun. I was just happy to have that experience and to even show up against it. the number two in the world was pretty crazy for me. It was definitely surreal. Uh, the best part about pro surfing is, especially in an event like this, I'll get in the car park and someone's still talking about a discrepancy from the 80s. Just different opinions like that's going to be in pro surfing forever and fun for you to be a part of it, like especially as a wild card. And I just thought you're posting an interview in the moment, like you're just fresh out of the water. And then your interview that I read on Stab Magazine, yeah. man, total class and just uh, really cool just to, to hear where your head's at as a young competitor. That was really refreshing to hear from. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I don't know. I just, I guess I'm, I'm never really looking at it in a negative space. Like this is something I've dreamed of being here. And like I got this opportunity from WSL and Rip Curl through the trials. And I don't know, they gave me that. And I, there was no way I was going to look at it in a negative way and for me to I don't know, like I was saying, to even have that heat with Ethan was so special. And yeah, I was just, I just wanted to really show my thanks and I was just happy to be here. And I'm just learning from the experience. Like I'm, I'm pretty early on in my career, I think. And 
just to have that sort of moment and to have those things go on, you learn so much from those those types of situations. That was going to be my next question. Any major takeaways uh, for you in terms of, well, the, the way you performed and your surfing or, or perhaps how you go about competition from now on? Definitely a lot with the preparation. Like, I've never really, when I was growing up, I never really had a, a coach there with me. And I was actually, this event, I was working with Timmy McDonald. Yeah, cool. And um, I don't know, we just... We just got along really well and we just had like a good bond sort of thing. We were just gelling really well and able to talk to someone and talk to someone through that. I was actually, we, we chatted a lot at the start of the Challenger Series, Rich, and um, just having that there, that definitely for me worked well because my mind can race a fair bit before these heats, especially like in that first one, like the first heat I had out there, was on my mind was just going everywhere. I was just like, I couldn't even stand up on my first wave, but um. I don't know, he just, he just sort of brought it back and we just figured out that it's just another heat. Like, a, even though it's on this crazy stage and you've thought about this moment for so long, like, I've been surfing heats for so long now and it's just, you're just trying to beat the competitor and you just, I don't know, surf to that. But a lot to do with that stuff, just kind of keeping everything in perspective and knowing what you can control and going from there. Uh, yeah, cool. Love it. We're going to continue our conversation with George, and let's hear from the winner of the last heat quickly. Yago Dora is with Laura. Yes, Yago, what a fun heat, surfing against good friend and sparring partner, Ian Gentile, going back and forth. Talk us through it and, uh, you know, just how, how exciting you guys made it for us. Yeah, that was really fun. It felt like we were doing a mock heat we usually do, and that was fun. It's really good when you can go, like, get scores every exchange and like we were he was he was, would get a score and then I would get it back and that was that was a really fun heat and talk to us you know in the lead up to the heat obviously your dad uh, your dad working with you both how how do you guys approach that do you just take it out in the water and leave it there or yeah for sure um, we we didn't talk too much today actually uh, at breakfast we were still like super friendly and having fun but uh, like two hours before our heat we kind of went our separate ways just to focus and like be in our own game and that's what we did but after the heat we hugged and back to being friends now <laughs> amazing back to making dinner together tonight uh you'll, you'll be coming up against Cade Madsen in the next heat you know hopefully the waves stay stay well but what, how are you going to approach this next heat yeah yeah I just want to keep doing the same keep picking right, the right waves and keep surfing and doing what I do uh, I feel like when I get a good rhythm I, I can go pretty far so that's what I'm, I'm going to try to do again keep riding waves well, you're looking amazing. Anything you'd like to say to your family and friends back home? Yeah, uh, obrigado a todo mundo que está no Brasil assistindo. Sei que já está tarde aí, mas continue na torcida e vamos embora. Próximo round daqui a pouco. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Laura. Great job, Yago Dora. Into the round of 16. He has Cade Madsen. Double shock is for a performance like that. Backhand tail throw is radical, and that was the difference. And turning the heat at the end it switched leads about four or five times throughout that matchup that's what you want to see as Rio still leads this one Italo holding priority needing a 6.34 to take the lead and still enjoying our time with Rip Curl wild card winning the trials earning it George Pitar from Manly how often do you guys run into each other do you see Richie love it all the time at home or yeah, pretty often. Pretty I've, often. I've moved up to the Goldie just recently. So oh, you did? Oh, not, for the High Performance Center? Yeah, yeah, and just going up there, and I'm actually living at Morgan's place, so just <laughs> we're just sort of surfing heaps together up there, and the waves are just a touch better than Manly. There but um, we, we still Morgan. claim him, though, Joe. We there still we claim go. he's from North Stank. That'll be attached to you yeah. forever. I'm yeah, definitely still lose from, from North Stank. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> How's Morgan as a, as a housemate? Is he clean? Is he... Um, yeah, he's massive. good. He's yeah, is he good? good? We're, we run a pretty similar program because we um, he requalified for the Challenger as well last, at the end of last year. So we've been doing pretty similar stuff. But uh, oh, here goes Rio. And congrats on that. We'll be following you through the Challenger Series once again. Rio, look how quick he is already. Smooth open face. Nice carve through the roof. And he's got to get out. It's Italo's turn with priority. A little speed jam to float section there he'll float it again now he's created some space a series of kind of backside turn hacks in the white water kind of like get all that white water you're kind of floating it see if you get a little more out of the next one and did well to go pretty far down that line you could tell Ito was just hoping for something really big so he can go 
giant above the left. Yeah, it felt like he was chasing pretty much that whole way. But uh, what about Rio? He went miles up the point there, you know, and uh, he actually had second priority, and that's why you saw Italo uh, take that wave down the line. Now uh, Rio back in the takeoff zone. But uh, he's got a good lead here. He's put a bit of pressure on Italo. 12 minutes to go. Semi comeback wave here. I think, you know, this may be Italo's best scoring ride, this last one. But um, we're yet to see that big standout moment in any of Italo's waves where he really gets to open up that backhand that we know and love. As we see this wave flowing through, he'll paddle over the top of it. Last for Rio, 293, just for the start of Italo's last wave. Got out in plenty of time for Italo to enjoy the rest of it. But yeah, George, looking forward to the Challenger Series again. Uh, kicking off soon at Snapper and and beyond. Uh, what are you looking forward to now that you've you've had some reps and you, and you've seen it all before? Yeah, it's definitely definitely a different feeling coming into that this year. Like I don't know, going into it last year, it was just so new and I was just like there was so much doubt there and it was I'd never been to so many locations and um, I don't know, it's just gonna be it's gonna be fun, especially starting at Snapper. That's always good. As we see this last one, Rio with so much speed. And then to Italo, Kaipo Guerrero's in the water, just watching how fast these guys are going. Two of the fastest on tour, Kaipo. For sure, I mean, two of the fastest that I've seen today, Joe, just speeding down the line, Italo on the backhand, and Rio, Rio's in a, just his gear, is in, he's in fifth or sixth gear, skipping sections. I mean, his first wave, he started way at uppers and cleared so much ground to make it all the way through. So, yeah, you're right, Joe, uh, two of the fastest surfers that we've seen today. I guess Kaipa, I mean, you've been watching. Has anyone been sitting as high as Rio today? Is anyone what? I'm sorry, Joe? Been sitting high up the point, like as Rio sitting, or is he sitting the deepest so far today? Yeah, I mean, well, I feel that as the tide comes in, we're going to see more and more of uh, the surfers moving up the reef to the upper section. So, um, and, and Rio started way up there, but gained all kinds of ground down the line. Good man, Kipes. Thank you. Rio White, a 617 was his opener, then 467, still keeping that. Itala with three waves ridden, which is always peculiar. Sometimes he's got about 19 by now. <laughs> But just the pace of the waves at Winky Pop are, are kind of holding him back, which I guess if you're trying to find a way to beat your competitor, if it is inconsistent, that's going to help you against Itzolo because that guy can surf his way to rhythm and yeah. about, you know, sometimes even 10, 15 waves will just keep going. Totally. This a par wave and do one of those crazy rotations, something uh, super unique on the backhand and, and get a big score. But really important here for Rio he can he can really start to close this one out uh, with a with a high scoring ride so uh, really that comes down to wave choice I think Felicity said it a couple of heats you know wave choice has really been a key uh, in getting a heat win today Rio with priority starting to move with the sets that are pouring through at Winky Pump looks at the first it's breaking underneath them the second one might do it just repositioning himself down the line in a good spot so far. He's got a defending, or he's got a former Bells champ, a former world champ in the water, so he can't afford any mistakes. Rio driving off the bottom, keeps that projection turned down the line, then digs in a bit more on the tail drift, smooth off the bottom and tags it. Wide on the wind up, big blast there with the fins out. Winding up for another beautiful finishing move, just classy surfing from the Indonesian, bettering a 4.67, briefly looking at Itzolo. And it's just a throwaway. But how about that magic, George? That was fun to watch. That was epic. Wave of the heat. Yeah, that was sick. It, it had that, that second wave of the set. The first one came through, and it sort of took the chop away a little bit. And I don't know, he just linked the, these turns together so well. He just waited for it. and teed off. It was, it was pretty sick. Oh, great pace here. Rio riding the Sharp Eye 77 model. Just uh, drifting through these snaps. Just putting the right amount of power uh, and weightlessness as well. You know, he's just, he's hitting them with a lot of power, but then getting a little drift at the top. Just playing with the lip. Total control. Rio out in front right now. And uh, Italo with work to do. We're going to take a Bonsoy brew break, but we're still hanging out with George Pitar. So send in questions at WSL on Instagram. We're going to ask him about his goals, his life, his surfboards, what he had for lunch, everything else. We'll be right back. <laughs>
Heat 15, still going. We're still hanging out with George. And we still got Rio in the lead. Wyatt had thrown down a 7-5. And Italo needs an 8-2-7 now as he's ripping down the line. Good, cool pace, looking calm, patient. Sweeping through the white water there is Italo. Another climbing snap, and he oh. bobbles and falls. So Ferrero needing an 8-2-7. So we focus on the rankings real quick. Italo, number 12 in the world, heading into this contest. Rio, 21st. As we roll in, Rich, what happened here? Well, Italo uh, starts to wind up. And at this point, I was thinking, wow, this could be the start of his comeback wave. A nice clean snap on the second. But then the third here just got tangled up a little bit on the bottom turn up there, just trying to jump up onto the onto that foamy section. And it's just uh, his waves are just a little disjointed, whereas Rio is finding these cleaner open faces that are allowing him to really get more flow between his turns. And we're getting a lot of questions in right now, George. For you mind taking a question from out there? Yeah, of course. From, thanks for talking on at WSL on our socials. Uh, this one coming from at Peter Mel. Hey, ah. the Condor. On your page. Wants to ask George, who's your favorite surfer on tour, and what is your go-to favorite CI model? Thanks, Pete, for the question, my friend. Um, probably, probably A. Mike Lani, to be honest. I just think the way he surfs waves is just so different, and I don't know, I've always, like, on the Challenger, watching him going through there, I was just so impressed with him. And then, every, I don't know, every heat, I'd, I'd like never miss one of his heats. I'd think he's, and he's such a stand-up guy as well. He's so like, so nice. He's such a legend. And um, I don't know, my probably CI model. I, I I run a few actually. Like I, for my smaller waves, I'll ride like a Fever, and um, and then maybe like three foot and and above, sort of two Happies and CI two Pros. Okay, cool. Yeah. A lot of cool. in there. Yeah, they're all in there. Would you ride a, a CI2 Pro today? Or, I mean, in the event? Uh, in the event, yeah, yeah, both. And what all is, heats I rode just picking that pro. model specifically, what does that do and what's that supposed to do? Um, I think it's just got a, like a really good, like forgiving rocker for pretty much most waves. And then it's also like holds as well. You can put in a round tail and, oh, here goes Italo. Italo running down the line on the Timmy Patterson program as he's got some speed, trims it quickly, a lot of momentum for that carve. Nice pace coming out of the turn and trailing it off the lip. Great composure and connection from a world champion. First ever big win of his career right here at Bells in front of a maxed out crowd and Mick Fanning's going away party and trying to break down an 827. Loved his energy there, Rich. Yeah, that was much better from Italo. You could just tell there was more flow connecting all those turns. And uh, for a moment there, I thought, oh, he's winding up to go to the air. But then uh, I'm glad, actually, that he chose to just uh, do a series of maneuvers to finish that wave off. So it was always going to be a, a story of two waves, and he's uh, got one in the bag now. So just streaking for speed now, up and over this foamy section. Clean snap. And then here, I was just thinking, OK, he's going to work down the line, try and get a bit of an air going, but just uh, slams that uh, final closeout maneuver. Board looks so spicy under his feet. Those Timmy Pattersons always sit in the water so well. It's crazy how much he moves his feet the whole time. It's a good point, George. Do you feel like your footwork is similar? No, I don't, definitely not. I think Italo is just like, he just knows his board so well. And it, you just see him get speed from places that you wouldn't be able to get speed from. And especially... I feel like Winky on your back end when it's bumpy like this is so tricky to find like the clean sections and he's just, I don't know, he's just reading it really well. Italo in attack mode as we see the big man, Jordy Smith. He's got a rematch of his Bells final, which he won. Kiowa Belly was runner up. This year it's going to be around a 32 heat. Kaio on the Rusty program jumping on. Those surfboards a few years back, they've been looking incredible under his feet. Different type of year for Kayo. Last two back-to-back -back have been incredible starts in Hawaii. Passing the GWM, two-minute warning, minute 44 on the clock. Last of Italo, 6-0-3, not enough for the lead. Rio still out in front, holding priority. Now with 90 seconds to go. George, the seat went by really quickly. We're under crunch time here with just about 
minute 25 on the clock. Looking forward to seeing uh, some big things from you on the Challenger Series. You see Rio's brother looking on. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's been it's been fun in here, <laughs> breaking it down, watching the heats. It's uh, it's cool. It's a cool setup. Oh, come in any time. Hey, George, the whole experience of being on the CT, it must make you even more hungry. Yeah, for sure. It's a, it's pretty crazy feeling where you just want more and more, really. Oh, here's a lot. Hit a low last. Needing a 7.64 here under priority. Rio letting him go on this one. And now getting to this inside track. Can he pull off a miracle? Going for the fin oh. throw, and that's not going to be it. Losing the tail on the finish. Well, nine times out of ten, Italo will stick those. But obviously feeling a little bit of desperation here. It looks like it's going to be Rio moving through. Great performance from him. Very disciplined. And just picking the right waves, yeah. So true, Rich. Yeah, just interesting how uh, Italo, with him being out, not in the top ten now for the first four events of the season. And now Rio getting the victory lap to close this one down. That beautiful snap to slide has been really reliable for him. Little fin throw and under pressure, already knowing he had the win, George. Yeah, that was that was quality. That was good stuff. He looked so solid on his feet, that whole heat. It was really impressive. Loved watching that performance from Rio as he's into the round of 16. Uh, George Pitar, your plans kind of from now until the Challenger Series ends, uh, what, what are you going to be doing? Uh, I'm actually heading over to WA. So I think I got into WA, yeah. Hey, so, what? I, yeah. just, I have to check yes. my emails. I'm the last to know. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I can't believe it. It's pretty crazy to get two CTs back to back. <laughs> wow, <laughs> that's bit cool, a, man. Bit of a wig out. So, um, yeah, I'm going to head over there next week. And I've never been over there, actually. So it'll be good to get a, like a, a week in early before the comp and suss the wave out. And then, uh, yeah, after that, head over to Snapper and get the year rolling. <laughs> What a great year for George. Well done. Hey, best of luck, and I'm um, happy cool. to know we'll be hanging out. What was that? <laughs> the North State Claw, man. <laughs> Is it really? Yeah. Am I allowed to do that? Or? Do it. Give it a <laughs> <laughs> the energy was out of control. I love it. George Pitar into the event at Margaret River. Late breaking news, and what a legend. We're going to take a quick break. Jordy Smith, Kyle Belly, a rematch from a final here at Bells. Ronnie Blakey, Laura Enover coming in for the call. And flick. See you soon. Welcome back to the show. We're here at Winky Pop for the third day of competition at the Rip Curl Pro Bells Beach, presented by Bonsoy, setting up 
The round of 16. This is the last heat in the round of 32. And it's a replay of the 2017 final. Geordie Smith up against Kyle Belly. Geordie, the second longest serving member on the championship tour at the moment. Out there in the red, Kyle Belly. You'd have to call him a veteran as well. And uh, he's going to be out there in the blue jersey. The Brazilian who's looking to make a big climb up the rankings. Geordie Smith, interesting to note on that, that live ladder. He came into this event in seventh, but at the moment he's dropped back a couple of spots because there's been some surfers leapfrogging him on the rankings in uh, Kanoa Igarashi and Jake Marshall. So Geordie wants to maintain his spot at the top. He wants to get through this one. You just know that and wants to uh, give himself a good shot at ringing the bell for a second time. Ronnie Blakey sitting alongside Felicity Palmatier and also joined by Laura Enova. How do you see this one playing out, Flick? Does Geordie hold his edge over Kayo at Bells? Geordie's surfing at Winky, and I think that's a little bit different. I just feel like... OK, good call. Yeah, I, I don't know. It's just a bit more down the line. It's small. Obviously, no, Geordie is one of the biggest mm. guys on tour at 6'3". I just think... Today is just one of those days we've seen a couple of big upsets and I really think it comes down to who's going to be on the best waves and the clean face waves today. And if you don't fall and you've got good connectivity, I feel like you're a shoe in for the win. Feels law like uh, today the, the favourites here at the, uh, the Rip Curl Pro Bells Beach. Um, the, the, the underdogs have kind of had the anti-venom in these marginal conditions for, for those big names. Yeah, they really have. I feel like it's just, you know, it's come down to that wave selection. Some some of the guys getting wave, wave starved. And, uh, you know, I think this heat, I mean, I, I understand what you're saying about Geordie, but I do see shades of small J-Bay out there where he could just stick to the pocket and get some really nice surfing done. However, I wouldn't even say Kai is an underdog. He's just, this year, he's so far down the rankings where we're not used to seeing him. He's usually right up there. He needs this result, so he's going to be surfing with a lot of urgency right now and trying to do everything he can. And I, I see him going to the air and pulling out big progressive manoeuvres. So it's it's evenly matched for me. I think that they're both, you know, and for Geordie, you know, he said he's dropped down from seventh on the live rankings, but he also wants to be gunning for that top five. Oh, he sure does. With a, a couple of wins at, at Trestles when it was a, a stop on the, the regular season schedule back in the day, you know, he... he He'd have a fantastic chance if he got there. But, yeah, Kyle Belly, you know, he, he wants to maintain pace with those surfers who were also below the cut line with him when he came in because a lot of people are already moving through to that round of 16. And he doesn't want to be the guy who's kind of left behind in that, that race to get to the, the bubble or, or within it. So, you know, we, we know how important this heat is to turn around a, a bad start this season. But Kyle, 30 years of age, plenty of experience. Thinking about these two and uh, their history here at, at Bells at the Rip Curl Pro. You know, two heats, both massive scoring heats. They met in uh, the fifth round back in 2016. Both of them had 16 points plus. And in their final, they went excellent again. Geordie Smith had a heat score total of 18.9 when he won the bell. And jo uh, Kaio was on 17.46. So That was an absolutely amazing final. They were just going wave for wave. But, uh, yeah, unfortunately, just, you know, the last few years, we've just found ourselves here at Winky or, you know, small small finals day and stuff. But, I mean, we're so freaking stoked that we got the uh, <laughs> that first day <laughs> one in the bowl. Stoked. That was amazing. Yeah, that was awesome. These two, though, were, even though geordie has got the, the jump on Kaio here at the Rip Curl Pro a couple of times, when you look at their head-to-head -head history, they're matched. Four wins apiece. And, uh, yeah, you know that Kaio, with the numbers that he served up to Geordie, doesn't back down to the big challenge. Definitely not. I, you know, it's been an interesting year for Kaio. Uh, usually we're used to seeing him in, you know, in that top 15, that top 10 even. And Kaio, he started off with a 33rd at pipe and then two 17th. So it is crucial for him right now, especially what you said, Ronnie, where, you know, there's those lower seeds that were below the cut line start making heats. It puts the pressure even more on Kaio and... If he doesn't get a result here, he's going to basically need to, you know, do an Isabella Nichols and win Margaret River to keep his place on tour. Yeah, you just you imagine, you know, when you know when someone's trying to jump on a train that's moving. <laughs> a lot of the, the competitors on the rankings are on that train, and Kyo's <laughs> running behind it, reaching out, trying to, to grab on to something, and uh, he's got to make it happen here because otherwise he, he's going to need to you know, final, you'd think, at stop number five, seeing as though he was way back in 30-second spot 
coming into this event. Let's have a look at these two head to head, as I mentioned, four wins apiece, but when they battle one another, big heat scores. Really solid, and uh, yeah, I, I hope we get more of that here today. Wow, so this will be the decider. Look at those heat scores. Yeah, it's so close. Look at Kaio puffing up there. <laughs> Making the biceps look bigger. <laughs> <laughs> I know that trick. But Jordy Smith is definitely, um, you know, no easy, easy beat on any right-hand point break. In the opening round, he looked unbelievable. Having a look back on his road through to victory in 2017, pretty sizing conditions that year, Law. Yeah, there really was. I mean, this was just an unbelievable event, and we scored for waves, and, you know, Jordy at the bowl, we were just so used to seeing him in these finals, quarterfinals, semis, always on finals day, and uh, he just has done some unbelievable surfing over the years, just throwing into the lip and these end turns. Th those, you know, signature calves. <laughs> and, oh, I love the ear of Jordy. I, th uh, I thought he was going to curse himself <laughs> there because, you know, it was almost ringing it before he won it. Yeah, fully. And we know that's a no-no. That well, he's had some great claims awkward. over the <laughs> yeah. years as well. Oh, like, he has. He loves a claim. Remember there was the Superman or... Oh, I remember he went on a claim fest when he won Brazil. That was amazing. Years ago. But yeah, as I mentioned before, massive heat score titles in that final. 18.9 for Geordie with the win. 17.46 for Kaio in second. Not much doing in the opening uh, stages of this heat so far. Just a, a couple of throwaway scores for the, the surfers. Slow times right now, isn't it? Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you brought up those wins uh, or Geordie's uh, approach uh, in smaller conditions, especially at small J-Bay. He actually won J-Bay in, in, in a tiny year. Um, I think uh, it was Adam Melling in the final with him that year. And, you know, he, he can still flex his repertoire on a knee-high wave. It's amazing. You can still let go of full rail power turns and also throw airs at us. So we'll see. It's a, a lighter, fitter-looking Geordie in, in 2024, and, and we'll see if that shines through on these walls. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, let's look at the positioning right now. It looks like Kyo's sitting a bit further up the point. Got some waves running oh. running through here. So I think Geordie's got priority here, so I feel like he'd have to be, be taking this one. Yeah, it'll just be a positioning play from Kayo down the line here. But Geordie is going to use that priority. Big foam climb to get started. Bit of texture on the face. No drama so far for the big South African as he whips that tail up and over that final section. You can see he's had a, an equipment change from that opening round. And uh, that will be the best number of the heat so far, but not expecting it to go huge on the scale. I think he'll be he'll be stoked that he actually made that because there was a few bobbles there. There was a lot, of, a lot of lump on the face being, you know, the first wave after a set, after not having many waves come through. There's always that little bit of extra lump. But he did well to hang on because, you know, with 18 minutes to go, if he'd fallen there, that just would have been bad. <laughs> <laughs> he needed to bank that, which he did. Just been talking about... The, the favourites and some of their weapons being neutralised a little bit by the smaller conditions. For Geordie, it, it just takes away that huge forehand carve that he possesses and where he holds a real edge over Kaio here. So he, he's got to be nimble and sharp and get that pocket work done. Yeah, well, he did. And I um, mean, he went straight up into the lip for those last two turns. Started with that floater and then two big cracks into the lip. And yeah, got to echo, echo what you were saying, Laura. He really did need to make that last turn. It was kind of touch and go there. A lot of lump to contend with, but with, you know, a lot of this heat chipped away already, uh, you can't be affording to fall on that last turn there. And, I mean, that, that actually was only a one-wave set, that one, so wasn't much opportunity even behind it. You know, I, I think today it's just going to be crucial if you can find those waves with that clean face. It just looks so much better. It looks so much more crisp, and you really are able to find that connectivity and that flow. Yeah, and just get on rail. I mean, essentially, those were three almost foam climb floaters that yeah. he, he just turned into, like, sparky turns. As we see all the crew down here on uh, Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> Loving it. Big shout-out to everyone. I know what day it is. <laughs> <laughs> Going to have uh, one of the... Uh, Torquay board riders, best ever. He's taken out the club champs a, a couple of times. Andrew Flitton and his band playing down there this afternoon. I bumped yeah, into him yeah. before. Great core lord from this local area. Uh, here goes Kayo now, looking to respond. Jordy had a 4.83 on his ride. Kayo's moved down the line now. 
put himself in a, a better position to swoop on this one. A busy ride so far, a lot of turns, didn't get the, the chance to truly open up, but he knows that with that series of manoeuvres, he's likely going to better Geordie's 4.83 and put himself in a good spot here. Yeah, that'll be the best way of the heat. Uh, he got that open face for that first calf, so that would have been nice, and that differentiates him and Geordie's wave already. Uh, then just kind of those foam climbs going down the line just to get to that end turn. He, he added a bit of spark and a bit of fin flare at the end, so I think... You know, nothing, it's not going to go too high, but the judges would like it. They would like the flow there and uh, that he banked off quite a few turns and, and got that progression. Yeah, as we see here, this is that first carve that you were talking about, Laura. It was nice to see him open up on that first turn, but for the rest of the wave here, it just felt like he was chasing it a bit. He did the best he could and he, and he surfed it really, really well. I mean, timing was great. And just dealing with that lump and bump, you can see it on the face of that wave. He he timed his turns really well. Yeah. I mean, he loved it too. You could see the little claim, but th this was nice here. It was nice to be able to see him actually go and put that board on rail like that and get that variation on the wave. For sure, yeah. I mean, that onshore wind is providing us with this gorgeous little crumble here, which is very fun. I mean, there's nothing like doing these turns in a free surf and they <laughs> actually feel really fun. And he kept his speed throughout it. And he just had to, he knew he had to just get down the line, make these as pizzazzy as possible to then put a stamp on the end. 617 for this wave and really you'd think that it's all based on the first turn and the flow yeah as you said chased it a, a little but definitely put a solid finish on this wave but nothing wrong with the 6.17 out there today 15.1 15 minutes remaining uh kipes the competitors what kind of conditions changes are they dealing with at the moment uh, Ron, it's just the incoming tide, right? The tide has, uh, there's a pretty large coefficient with the low and the high tide. We're nearing high tide. And what we've seen is, you know, the surfers moving from the lower section here at Winky Pop up to the upper section there as the tide's filling in. And, and just to touch on the surface, the playing field, um, it's tricky. It's yeah. tough. It's bumpy out here. You got to fit your turns in between these sections and you have to be fast to make it down the line and clear these sections. So there's a bit of a challenge out here at the high tide winky. What about just watching the, the form surfers, you know, deal with these desperate competitors trying to fight their way up the ladder at the moment. There's been some, some big upsets. Big upsets today, right? And challenging conditions oftentimes breed upsets because of the challenging conditions. So I think that's what we've seen play out throughout the day today um, with those big upsets you're talking about, Ron. Yeah, for sure. And Kayo, he's got his hands full here. Big challenge, Geordie Smith. But he, he has, I think, really put the pressure back on Geordie with that 6.17 now. Geordie, I uh, mentioned that he's been on, on tour for an age now. He's the second longest serving member. He's 17th year on the CT, six victories. They've all come on the forehand. Uh, and we talk about it a lot, Laura. For Geordie to get himself into this uh, final five pitcher, he has to convert on the right-hand point breaks. Yeah, he really does. It's his strength. I mean, it's his bread and butter. We love watching Geordie in big open face waves. That is where he's he's just come to, to life and come alive. I mean, obviously that, w that win in Brazil, he went to the air quite a lot. We saw, we saw him going to the air a lot in the earlier days. But uh, I feel like, you know, I love that every time we see Geordie come back year after year, he's just reinventing himself and he's just bringing an extra spark. And I feel like the spark's there this year. He started the year with a fifth place at Pipe into a third place at Sunset. Lost out in this round at uh, Portugal, so he'd be, he'd be wanting to try to get back into the, the final day picture of round of 16. Well, something uh, rolling by at the moment. Geordie's not biting and nor is Kyle Belly. He's got plenty of time to find that spark. Just under 13 minutes remaining. We'll take a quick break. More to come after this.
Well, as part of our global WSL One Ocean initiative, we're partnering with Heartwood Habitat to create nesting boxes to restore habitat for local endangered species. And a donation from WS Pure will support Heartwood Habitat throughout the year to help create habitats and hollows for local species, install nest boxes and conduct wildlife research. Tell us what you're doing to protect the ocean by posting on social media with the hashtag WSL One Ocean and tagging at WSL and at WSL One Ocean in your posts. Back to it here at Winky Pop. Ten and a half minutes remaining. Geordie Smith not getting a wave during that break. Still holding on to his priority and looking for a 2.25 at the moment to get ahead of Kyle Belly. Beautiful Saturday down here. Huge crowds on hand to see the world's best tackle tricky conditions here at Winky Pop. We've seen incredibly close heats. We've seen some upsets. We've seen surfers out there just begging for an opportunity and struggling to find it. But uh, ultimately, it's the same story at, at any event. You know, you're going to get days where you've got to make it happen. And Kai Belly's doing that at the moment. 617 on his previous wave. He'll ride this wave to the death just to milk any kind of points out of it. Actually opted out. But, um, <laughs> yeah, he's, he's got Geordie chasing a number here at the moment. How do you think the uh, the big fella's feeling out there at the moment, Felicity? Nine and a half minutes on the clock. I, th I think he'd be slightly worried. <laughs> I would be. If I was in Geordie's position right now, I'd be slightly worried. Just seeing how a few of these heats have played out today, knowing that, well, I mean, just go to back to what Kuiper was saying in the water, we're coming up to that high tide mark. You know, there's been some really sleepy heats. I've got, my mind straight away goes back to the John Cade Matson heat. John had that, you know, high seven and was just sitting there waiting for a wave. He only needed a 4.33, but the ocean just didn't provide. So, I mean, we've seen long lulls. Nerve-wracking. It's nerve-wracking. Nerve-wracking times. Well, surviving the nerves in that last heat was Rio. He's with Joe. Thanks so much here with Rio Waida. Rio, that was a really impressive performance against a guy that's won bells. He's a world champion. I couldn't get past your positioning. You're sitting so deep up the point. What were you? What was your plan up there? Because the amount of speed you're getting was incredible. Uh, yeah, first thing we, me and Italo paddle, paddle out together, and then I guess he wants to take the deeper spot, and I just kind of follow him, and then, you know. You know, I checked the time, still have seven minutes, just kind of head down and follow where you're going to go. And, and then I guess he gave up. So I was like, so I got that winning advantage and I, I got a little boost, confident boost. And uh, I know I've been serving here a lot and working with micro. So, you know, I've been aware of the takeoff zone and stuff. So I feel like that's helped me a lot. You know, my first round was my mistake was I was in wrong spot, so you know I've been surfing a lot here at Winky, and uh, of course trust my trust my what can I say my speed and my surfing. You know, even I take off really far up, you know I just get speed and try to get around the station and surf like I'm always do. So I'm stoked. Looked really impressive, uh, high performance, really, really composed. People writing in saying even a young Michelle Berez with the power you threw down. Uh, do you and Micro make goals for this event? I mean, what, what is your whole game plan for this entirety of the event? Um, not much goal, to be honest. Just, you know, I'm still, I'm still a baby in this tour, so I'm just trying to learn and, you know, just focus on what I've been working with Micro, the surfing and the positioning and, uh, 
you know, there's a lot of things, and uh, Michael been helping me, helping me a lot, you know, since last year after the cut, and uh, you know, I feel like I grow so much since since first day I worked with Michael. So I'm really grateful to have him, and uh, maybe if I if I'm gonna think what go that in my head is uh, to ring the bell. That's it. <laughs> That's the one we wanted to hear, Rio. I know you've got a lot of fans back home in Indonesia. You want to say hi to them real quick? Yeah. Hello, everyone. I'm really stoked to make the next round and uh, I'll be surfing again today so I'm really excited and uh, I just want to say thank you everyone that's supporting me and then I'm really grateful to have all of you guys of course my family sponsors friends back home and uh, love you guys and see you guys soon Suksama. Suksama, thank you back to you Ronnie take care thanks Joey Rio uh, buzzing I like that comparison he, he does possess that that similar kind of fast twitch power rap that, that Michelle Berez used to just grace us with but back out in the lineup now six minutes to go and a big exchange Jordy took a ride it's clicking off turns as he made his way down the line but almost felt like he was not kind of connecting the way he normally would let's have a look at a replay of it Felicity yeah this is what went down during that interview there was a lot of, just once again so much lump and bump has to be that high tide doing well to connect the dots but just that last, you know what? It was, I think, right now, only needing that 3.68, but you know, right behind him, Kyle Belly got to work, and I wanted to see if he got anything done before that first that that first turn that we saw. But you can see I, the comparison between the first wave of the set and the second. Yeah, yeah that was yeah, that was the big thing. I mean, Geordie, I think he's going to get rewarded for those waves because for those turns, because there was flow, but there was no open face. Once again. Kyo Obelli finding the open face here. So he got to do only two turns, but the judges will, will love them. So, Yeah, I think pretty comparable to Kyo's first scoring yeah. ride and probably with the strength of Geordie's finish, he might get a better number. And, and he does, 6.9, so just a little bit better. But Kyo really, you know, got the, the benefit of Geordie's ride smoothing out the lineup and only got a little bit of room to move, but he could be way more committed. So only two turns and he turns in a 6.6. .6. Yeah, and Geordie's still chasing. Yeah, on top of that, Kyo, uh, Kyo with only the two turns, his wave was shorter, so he got out the back and, and mm. stole priority as well. So he's in a good position there. His fiance, I'm sure nervous moments just once. Oh yeah, especially oh. with this guy hunting around the lineup. But yeah, she's... Uh, really been a huge inspiration to Kayo as a, a former athlete herself, kind of called him out on, on just his dedication to his craft. <laughs> and he, he just really kind of turned things around, didn't he? He had a, a really solid run at it last year. I, you know, I, I think he's having to really trust that, that all the hard work will eventually pay off because he's had a tough run of results. It's, it's the hardest thing ever when you know you're putting more than ever mm -hmm. into your, your tour campaign and things are falling apart more than ever. And you're just like, how are the results not coming when I'm doing everything right, ticking every box? And, and that's the, the brutality of this sport. It's, it's something that's really hard to understand when you're like, I'm doing everything and, and it's still just not happening and converting into the results and the points. But uh, you've got to keep you got to keep the faith and you've got to try not say, not, not be too emo emotional about it really. Just, mm. you know, even if Kyo wasn't to make the cut, I'm sure he, you know, he'd just have to pick himself up and uh, blitz through the Challenger Series back on next year. But I mean, anything can happen here. And we see this cut bring out the best in those surfers that are at the bottom of the rankings. And that's why there's also been a lot of upsets today. Yeah, he's, he's climbed two rungs on the, the rankings ladder. <laughs> the live ladder, he's up the 30th position at the moment. And you can check that out on, on worldsurfleague.com. Click into the rankings and and watch the results change as these surfers progress. I mentioned Geordie Smith came in at seventh, back to ninth at the moment, with Jake Marshall and Kanoa Igarashi already progressing through to the round of 16. So he'll be aware of that. You know, he, he sort of lost touch with the the final five pitcher over the last few years. Hasn't had a crack at a world title there at Trestles. Wants that opportunity this season. Well, this is going to be an exciting two and a half minutes right now. Looking over my shoulder, there are some lines coming through at Bell. Oh. So I think mm. there's going to be opportunity for them both to find something here. Jordy just trying to sell Kyle, I would say, into anything to get that priority back. An extremely committed sell as well. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, he, he just really wanted to, to try and make Kyle second-guess himself there, and it didn't work at all. 
Wow, it's two minutes on the clock. I think it's really telling that last score of Kyo's. I mean, he got a 6.6 .6 for two turns, and that's just super telling to what the judges really want. Out of you know, uh, For me, that's saying they want really smooth, controlled, committed surfing. I mean, Geordie's 6.9, it's still a high score, but he banged off about five turns on that wave, mm. whereas Kyo did two really nice, smooth, controlled turns and posted a 6.6. .6. So, I mean... Jordy, I'm not sure if he knows that, that that's what Kaya got that 6.6 .6 on, but Jordy, it could get it on one or two turns. I, I think I think he had time to turn around and see yeah, Kaya's last turn. So a minute and a half to go. We've just seen the GWM two-minute warning come up, and we've got energy coming our way. A couple of set waves. Jordy eyes off the first one. Kaya's going to take it using his priority. Wants to try and better a 6.17 here. Loading up. Goes to the air. Gets the double grab. Lands it clean. Now onto the open face. Roundhouse cut back. Building for a big finish on the inside. Swings the rotation. Lands straight legged and can't ride out. Jordy on the outside. It looks like that wave might have capped and broke on him, but he's going to make his move now. After a 5.87, looking over his shoulder, loading up with speed. We know he's got big airs he can go to. Throws the rotation. He can't ride out. And with 40 seconds to go, unlikely that we will see him get another opportunity here. Wow. I was almost going to say that could have been a curse of priority if uh, that second wave of the set mm. had cleaned up. Mm. But I think the second wave of the set was actually too big and pushed wide, and, and so Geordie's wave had a lot of foam on it then. 20 seconds remaining here. And Geordie's opportunity to ring the bell for a second time this year is going to slip through his fingers. Wow, it looks like there's actually a set on the way, but I don't think it's going to make it there in time. Kyle Belly, he knows the importance, was already up two spots on the live ladder. And you watch him climb again here as he makes his way through to the round of 16. And another former winner out of the mix here. Well, that's so important for Kayo. Such an important win. <laughs> wow. It was a, a close one, not a lot separating the competitors. But Kayo finding an edge. And when you think about their history here at Bells Beach, getting his first win over Geordie in this contest. We'll take a quick break. We'll be kicking off the round of 16 here at the Rick Curl Pro Bells Beach, presented by Bonsoy, right after this. We're about to get the round of 16 underway, but here's Kelly Slater leaving the event site here at the Rip Curl Pro Bells Beach. Yeah, look at how popular this man is. He's given us so many amazing moments down here, four incredible victories, a number of finals appearances as well. And the crowd just relishing the opportunity. 
to get shoulder to shoulder with one of the greatest athletes of all time. Let's get set for another big heat that's going to decide our first quarter finalist here at the event this year. And it's a clash between two Novocastrians. Morgan Siblick taking on Ryan Callanan. And these guys hustling for inside position. No friends in the lineup as Morgs gets on the attack. Throws the fins on that first section. He's looked super sharp on his road through to this point in the competition. Felicity, but uh, Ryan Callanan. A finalist last year will be hard to beat. Oh, this is a cracker of a heat. Two Aussies just going to go absolutely at it. That first line's from Morgan already. I absolutely loved it. Just super spicy fin throw there at the end. And uh, his heat the other day was also awesome to watch. But Ryan on his backhand out here, we know is deadly. Got a couple of really big treats for everyone out there watching online. Uh, first up, we're going to have an extended interview with Kelly Slater on the WSL post show this afternoon. Vaughan caught up with him just uh, after he was knocked out of the event. So stand by for that later on today. But we've also got your second treat. Jacob <laughs> Wilcox join us. Uh, JB, I know you didn't uh, get the result that you wanted here this year, but a good performance against Kanoa. You were surfing so well. Yeah, it was pretty fun. I'm actually pretty puffed. I just ran up the stairs. <laughs> I was down on the beach. I'm going to watch Morgan's heat and um, had to run up, so excuse me, I'm kind of yeah. out of breath. But, well, that um, gives us a little bit of an insight into just like what the competitors are dealing with here. It, it can kind of take it out of this place. Yeah, that's it. Um, no, it's, this morning was fun though, had a fun heat. Um, felt that like that's probably the best I've felt this year actually, like making smart decisions and like competing well. This year I've made some pretty bad decisions in my um, heats and it's kind of let me down. So it's been a little bit frustrating, but here I am. I'm happy to be in Bells, beautiful place. WA soon. Happy days. Beautiful, mate. <laughs> we love the attitude and uh, we've loved watching you uh, compete this year. I, I know you haven't had the results that you've wanted, but uh, if, you, if you've just found your form, it, it's come at the perfect time. Margaret's will be a big one for you. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I'm looking forward to getting home. This uh, start of the year is pretty intense, but it's enjoyable. It's a, I'm living my dream. We love it. We love to hear that. Uh, Morgan Sibling's out there at the moment, one of your good mates, travel buddies, teammates. Uh, this guy, we've seen him reach, you know, the, the highest uh, point of the, the championship tour, cracking the final five and, and getting himself a fifth place finish. He's come so close to getting back to the CT the past two years. From what I've seen of his surfing this year, it, it looks like he's so back mentally. Yeah, yeah, Morgs is, I reckon he's on. Watching him against um, Robbo the other day, the, I think that was a big heat for him mentally as well, like just knowing that he can still like compete at this level and smash it. Um, last year was hard, he just missed out from qualifying. We travelled to a lot of the events together and we surfed like a few heats together that were quite important. But um, no, I, I'm kind of, uh, this is a hard heat. I love Ryan, <laughs> I love Morgan, um, and I'm kind of, I'm going to be on the fence a little bit, but I'm super excited for this matchup. Um, I'm excited to see how Ryan goes out here on his backhand. I love watching him and, um, yeah, Morgs, good start. Six really six good seven. start. Solid start. Let's talk about that because, um, you know, typically everyone's looking for excellence out there. But, but today it feels like if you can bank a six at the start of your heat and win that opening exchange, you're just loving life. Yeah, especially now. I feel like I was down on the beach before. It looks a lot harder to surf. Look, this little bit of onshore. Oh, here we go. This was the uh, very start of the heat, so Morgs. <laughs> I love it. You know, that, that fight for the inside has really worked in his favour here, but there's the, the release. Surfing good, eh? Just, just so powerful. And the thing I liked about, uh, have liked about his uh, run in this contest, Felicity, so far, is that when Morgan was having his oh. stellar year in 2021, he was just in full attack mode. There was nothing safe about his surfing and it seems like he's back there oh 100 percent that last fin throw was absolutely crazy he's up and riding again looking to back up that number moving with a, a lot of speed down the line just hammering slapping it isn't he what punches oh. through that final section again yeah so that'll be a tidy make little backup good. score <laughs> make it look real good like it down there before like i was saying it looked like the wind was kind of chopping it up a little bit it looked hard to pick where you're going to put your board and kind of the section that you're going to hit, but Morgan's picked two really nice clean waves, and how's that snap? The little firecracker oh, snap. It's beautiful. I think that it's just been the biggest takeaway for me, even just watching that last heat. I saw Kaio get a, you know, mid-range six for just two turns, but it was a clean wave, and I just got to echo what you were saying, Jacob. It's hard to find those waves that are clean with that clean face, and Morgan's doing such a good job at finding them just straight up into the lip there a couple of times, and 
he's looking sharp. He's looking so sharp. Really solid stuff. Let's have a look at this slow mo. What are, what are Morgan's real strengths, Jacob? I think uh, his power. Like he's just um, he's quite a compressed surfer in his power and just like that explosivity he gets out of the lip like that. He can do it so quick and whiff it around, but he also throws a lot of water. I'd say that's his um, his strengths. And yeah, it's like he's just feel. I feel like he's just been like completing so well in this event and not really missing any sections and yeah, slapping it. Here we go, Ryan. Ryan in response now. He's found a bigger wall to work with, and that could be dangerous with this incredible backhand approach. Plenty of vert in that second turn as he brings it through to the inside and gets a really solid finish. That was nice as well. Oh, yeah. This is heat. Yeah, I feel like when Ryan gets a good wave, he kind of does a little no claim claim. Like, stands <laughs> tall, like, kind of loves it, and I love seeing that as well. And he smashed that wave. Right, uh, Morgan's so solid on his first two waves. You know, I'd say that Morgan hammered his waves, and then Ryan, with the, the benefit of a bigger wave, was able to throw the sledgehammer. Yeah, straight away, that second turn was so well timed third one as well but yeah just the size of the wave for me with Ryan's is just a little that bit of difference between Morgan's second wave and Ryan's first um, but I like what you said Jacob I think I think he knows he's on he's yeah. feeling it uh, and this is going to be a great heat <laughs> yeah Ryan's not huge on claims but the body language there was suggesting oh I'm good <laughs> I'm really good <laughs> I think he's going to get a great score out of that one let's check in with the winner of the last heat an important heat win for him, Laura Kayo, beating Geordie Smith. That's massive. Yes, Kayo, you and Geordie have had some amazing matchups in Bells Beach in the past, a final together actually, but obviously today a bit different. The conditions are hard. You were just saying you can't make any mistakes out there. Yeah, I surfed with Geordie round one and he got two really big scores and I think his style surfing matches so much this, this style of waves and yeah, I'm just really happy. I, I don't know. I've been on a hard year, I've been training so much, I've been putting so much time and I'm still motivated after all the, the hard results I got in the past few events and I'm just like really stoked to finally make it out the round three and yeah, it feels good. So hopefully like in the next heat I can actually surf better and loosen it up a little bit. I feel like I've been so pressure of like not making any mistakes and catching the right waves that I'm still a little stiff and as soon as uh, more heats I surf the more I'm gonna surf and the better I'll surf so hopefully the next heat I can get better waves and do big turns. <laughs> well on the live rankings you have jumped up three spots you're in 29th at the moment just talk about how throughout the year you know those hard heat losses not making it through this round how have you been able to keep your, yourself motivated and your head in the game? Yeah, I've been doing this for a long time, almost 10 years, and uh, the tour is, there's a lot of ups and downs, and with the cut now, it's like, it's really hard. There's so much things that, uh, so many things involved um, before the cut, like if you if you don't get a good batch of boards straight away, there's no time for fixing and readjusting, so like there's so much on the line, and we try to prepare ourselves so much on the past five months to have everything dialed and like things just don't go your way sometimes and um, I know this the last two events and yeah it's it's a lot of pressure but not like either way either way I'm I'm happy the where where I am today mentally and I feel motivated uh, if things go my way uh, that means that I surf good and I deserved and if it doesn't it's all good too so um, I'm really here to fight really hard and and surf my best, so I'm trying to just do that. Amazing, Kai. And any shout out to friends and family back home? Yeah, thank you everybody that that been watching. It's really late in Brazil, so yeah, thank you so much. And let's go one more heat. In Portuguese, let's hear it. Valeu, galera. Obrigado aí quem ficou acordado é, de madrugada no Brasil. Tá difícil aqui, tá devagar. Deve estar uma luta para assistir, mas é isso. Tentando meu melhor. Mais uma bateria hoje. Vamos com tudo que ainda tem chance. <laughs> Thank you, Laura. <laughs> Jake, I want to ask you, you know, uh, Kaio, he said he's almost been on tour 10 years. You know, he's not one of those massively hyped names, but he's a fighter and he's had some amazing finishes, um, overcome world champions in heats. You know, once you get to the, the CT, I, I think when people are on the rise, you know, you, you have to have a, 
a certain attitude and, and want to believe that you can beat everyone on tour. But once you get there and you see someone like Kayo who's really grinded it out to keep his spot there, does it give you a newfound kind of respect for people like him? Yeah, for sure. He's, a, he's definitely a fighter. Um, I think sometimes people don't realise how hard this actually is, like um, competing against the best people and then, like, you got to be on your game like all the time. Like you make, I feel like the first couple of events I made mistakes and they were so crucial. And it was like one mistake and like that's the heat done. Uh, I feel like you just got to be so onto it and like you can't discredit what Kai has done. He's um, had so many, well, ten years on tour. He just said like that's not easy to do. Like um, yeah, it's it's impressive. But yeah, I feel like sometimes yeah, you 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 watch this from home or like even myself in the past. I'm like oh yeah, that's that's gonna be good. I can't wait to get there and. Um, then you get there and you're like, yeah, this is actually really hard. <laughs> but not that I didn't think it was going to be, but um, it's definitely challenging. But that, I feel like you, that's kind of why you do it, right? To challenge yourself and um, to, I feel like it makes you a better competitor and better at what you do. So, Yeah, I, I, I definitely uh, recognise that uh, of all surfers that graduate to the tour. They kind of instantly start looking at people who've been there a long time and saying, wow, like, we're a few events in and I'm, I've got a real challenge in my hand to stay there. And then you, you see someone who's been knocked off to a come back on to a, and still fighting. He, he's moved up three spots now on that live ladder, starting at 32nd spot. He's into 29th. He's got a ways to go, but you've got to respect the fight. Oh, you have to respect the fight. And, I, you know, trying to stay on tour is one thing, but I think also those surfers that hang around that bubble area or, or fall off and then they get back on the Challenger Series, they fight it out on the Challenger Series, they get back on the tour. I mean, that's a whole other ball game in itself. And I mean, we've watched some great people do it and then had some great comebacks. People like Molly Picklam, her first year on tour falling off, Jao Chianka was another one, fought their way back on the Challenger Series and then ended up in that final five uh, conversation, WSL finals that following year. So. It, you can it's incredible stories, incredible heartbreak, and and also some amazing moments too. And I mean, the cut has just been something that you know when it first came on the scene, people were a bit hesitant about it. Oh, I don't know about this, and but I think it's also I think it's really pushed performance. And straight off the bat too, you know, there's no sleeping around. If you qualify for that tour, you can't sort of wait to find your momentum. It sort of forces these big performances early on in the year and. Yeah, we've just had some great battles. We have. We've got a great battle out in the water at the moment too. 7.1 for Ryan Callanan in second spot. Only needs a 5.67 to jump up into the lead. Kaipo's out in the water. Kaipo, what are you frothing about? Uh, I got a few things to froth about, Ron. First of all, I'm frothing on the dueling Novocastrians out in the water right now. Second froth is sibling rivalry. Heat number five coming up in this round of 16. We're going to have Griffin versus Crosby Colapinto. And, you know, interviewing Crosby when he qualified for the championship tour, I asked him, what was he looking forward to the most? And he said, surfing against his brother. So Crosby's going to get his wish. Can't wait to see that. That's what I'm frothing on. Oh, who's going to win, Cops? Wow. Uh, <laughs> hey, we talked about <laughs> difficult conditions, breed upsets um that one's a toss-up ron i can't take a pick in that one it is definitely gonna be a toss-up but it's worth sticking around and watching guaranteed you don't want to go anywhere with that one i'm a little brother <laughs> say crosby gets it jacob what are your thoughts it's gonna be a good heat it's gonna be a great heat um are they gonna flip a coin say, for priority you reckon I don't, no i don't reckon i was actually out of, <laughs> i was out in port in the surf in portugal with him and um uh, Griffin burnt Crosby on a wave. They must have had something happen. I think Griff paddled for the one before, and they were just going at it. And I was like, "Yeah, boys, I love this. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> Get into it." Well, so. Hopgood's famously had a hell stoush out at uh, the Bell's Bowl <laughs> one time, just screaming at each other. It was fantastic. Yeah, I love, loved it. I love the passion. But uh, Kipes is right. We got a, a, a great battle happening between two Novocastrians. Bit of head-to-head -head history between them, and it was Morgan Siblick getting the jump on Ryan Callanan when they met in the quarterfinals at Merriweather. Oh. Back in 2021, Morg throws it away on that wave. He is leading this heat, but he really had a, a good size wave then. Felt like he was on his way to another good number. Just butchered that second turn a little bit. And you could see he watched that wave run off as he fell or two. He was looking down the line like, oh, no, it was not a mistake. Oh, you, don't, you don't do that to yourself. <laughs> he did. You worst, can see him looking. That's the worst feeling. That's the worst feeling. But he's in a good position and he's surfing good. This uh, this looks like such like those sections just like keep flapping down here they're quite hard to surf and hard to time but 
He was looking good. And he just maybe pushed a little hard, a little through the lip. It's so strange here. I feel like you have to surf underneath the underneath the lip, but um, when it's a little bit light on shore like this, you kind of have to hit the lip. Just got a, a little loss there. 17 and a half minutes to go. Uh, Jacob, you you were inspired to your your, your best finish in a, a CT event as a wild card here, making the quarterfinals. Seems like rip curl team riders. You know, you want to come and put a good performance on in front of your sponsors. This is the home of Rip Curl, obviously. Uh, you know, but you also get sort of the extra support from the, the grandstand down there as well. Yeah, it's, um, it's pretty special. I've been coming here. I think Rip Curl brought me here my first time when I was 13 um, to watch the event. And oh, I'd, 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 I'd love to have a bell one day. So um, <laughs> thanks for reminding me how shit I did running. <laughs> You're welcome, but, mate. <laughs> but, um, but the quarters is good. Yeah, oh, oh yeah, that, yeah. That was a great year in 2019. That was amazing. But uh, yeah, it's so cool coming here, Rip Curl. It's like, feels like it's Rip Curl town um, when you go down there. And yeah, it's um, they've been so supportive of my surfing career. And yeah, being able to come back here and show them a bit of love and um, see what Rip Curl is really all about and like where it kind of all started. It's really special. I uh, had a little walk through the the back of the factory the other day and it's like a museum uh all the you know the the unbelievable like uh construction room with all the the wetsuit uh templates and it's pretty remarkable all the patterns and uh yeah it just it is like walking through a museum and incredible images from the different easter classics from back in the day you know, some of the greats sitting under the cliffs watching the event unfold and, and photos from that big year as well. Oh, I love walking into the Rip Curl store. You look up on the on the ceiling and there's just all these beautiful all these beautiful images from over the years and super bright, colourful, poppy. I love the bit of fluoro in the wetsuits back then. It just, yeah, awesome place. And I love walking into that Rip Curl store there. It looks great. Bit of movement on the outside here. Ryan Callanan's been super composed with his priority on the outside. And he's only after a 5.67 here. He works this one over. This wave hasn't really stood up that nicely for him, but it's going to give him the opportunity for a nice little finish here. What do you reckon, Jacob? Oh, it's hard to say. <laughs> uh, he surfed it well. He looked like he was pretty fired up at the end of it too. I like that. Um, yeah, it's, it's close. I feel like the wave might have let him down a little bit, but yeah. Um, sort of, it becomes a game of comparisons once those first scores drop, doesn't it? And you've got to like think back to just the speed and, and punch that Morgan had on his six-point mid mid-range sixes, and, and then start to ask yourself, is this stack up against those? Yeah, that's it. Well, that's what it has to be a point under Morgan's first wave, so that'd probably be a good comparison. But yeah, I feel like sometimes out here, all the different angles can make the the waves look so much different. Um, might look really good from one angle, then you watch it from another angle and it looks a bit different. So I feel like that can kind of factor in a bit. So I love seeing that front on angle. I feel like you can mm. get the best kind of read of what it looks like from that. Do you think that maybe that's where there's some differing opin opinions on what these rides fall? Because obviously the, the judges aren't scoring off all these camera angles. Mm. They're, they're kind of looking down on the lineup. It's a, a yeah. kind of a different perspective. I think them. the different perspective can definitely um, alter how some of the scores come out. Um, Looking down on it, I feel like sometimes you might miss a few of the small intricacies of... <laughs> that's a big word for me. <laughs> no, you nailed it. <laughs> of, well, you did reasonably well with yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, almost got it, <laughs> eh? Um, of what makes, like, a, a wave look good. So, yeah, I feel like it can definitely play a little bit of a factor, but... Yeah, there's sort of no denying excellent surfing, though, yeah, and cool. Morgan's looked really sharp on his earlier rides. Now finds a bit more space to open up spread the wings and glide through a big carve and Very again nice. punches through that finish and swings that tail around. So waiting on a couple of numbers to drop now and it's going to be close between these two once those scores fall. That was beautiful and just the what, the face of that wave was so clean. You know, you compare it to Ryan's and Ryan just looked like it was a little, the what you said, Jacob, that wave sort of let him down a bit but that one from Morgs was just crisp and it seemed like he didn't have to fight against anything. It was just flowing. The tempo was nice. They were three big turns. Morgs is moving at a, a faster pace. Like, yeah, yep. you know, that, that is for sure. It might be the waves that he's tapping into. They're a bit more down the line. But yeah. Ryan's first ride, it sort of just allowed him to, to move at a, a slower rhythm because the wave wasn't going as quick. It was a bit bigger, pushed off the reef a little bit. But Morgan's just, like, fully got the foot to the floor here. 
yeah, his timing was so nice on this wave. Just gets it early, frees up the spray nicely, and yeah, nice variety as well. Like this last turn, he kind of really punches it out. Yeah, that would have felt good. But yeah, it's a lot cleaner wave. Hey, Morgan's been really fine in them, but mm. his surfing's been um, elite on them. But 12 minutes to go. I feel like that's. I feel like this morning the sets are kind of coming in six minute intervals, so I reckon we could get um, a couple more. Morgs already has the lead. We'll see where his next number falls as Matthew McGilbray from South Africa gets ready to hit the lineup. I've been going to the surf coast since my teen years and get to go back every year now on the CT. It's really special. I love the tranquility of the surf coast and just the beauty of that whole drive is just spectacular. It feels very peaceful. The waves are really fun. Everyone's very welcoming. When Bells is on, it's so iconic. It feels like a good reset, so I love it down there. Ryan Callum loving his time down here in Victoria and wants to uh, extend the vacation by progressing out of this round of 16 and into the quarterfinals. He's currently up against it. Morgan Sibley continues to build here, dropping a 6.83 on that last wave. Morgan now up out in front by a pretty good margin and Ryan needing a 6.4 to turn it. Ronnie Blakey sitting alongside Felicity Palmatier and Jacob Wilcox. Jacob, uh, mate, obviously uh, you're really focused on getting yourself above the cut line, but can we get another edit out of you this year? I mean, <laughs> into the dust default, like they're two of my favourite clips that have dropped the last few years. Cheers, Ronnie. Yeah, I, I, I love making movies and love kind of going on surf trips. It's, I feel like I'm struggling to find the balance of doing them both just because it's so intense doing the tour and trying to give that 100%. And um, qualifying last year was um, took a lot of it took a lot of effort so it's kind of took away from that part of it but mate, there's always something coming but it just <laughs> depends on how long it takes <laughs> um, maybe some search trips I'd love to do that um, recall launching launching the search again so I've got a couple of cool ideas for that so hopefully we can make that happen but yeah well the big uh, priority for you mate is getting yourself above that cut line <laughs> on the live ladder uh, equal 24th at the moment so we know that uh, you're going to need to to really step up at home but uh, it'll be a great place to do it because it's a, a tricky wave and a way that you know yeah, better it's, than most. Uh, it'll be good, hey. It's um, going to be nice to be going back home. I haven't been home in probably three or four months now. Um, so, yeah, I look forward to that. How uh, good. Yeah, it's going to be good. Wait, we all look forward to it. We love it over there. <laughs> Eight and a half minutes to go here. And uh, Morgan has just surfed a, a really strong heat so far. Felicity started with a big score and, and has been building. Oh, Morgan is just looking so fast and uh, his board looks amazing. He just looks very in control as well. And he's managed to put those scores together with oh, just 
I just feel like something bigger is brewing. If he gets another set, his wave selection has been on. He's been picking waves that are just so clean. His, his placement of his manoeuvres have been on point. I feel like there's an excellent score is coming. I just have a feeling. <laughs> yeah, well, Ryan's still hanging on to the, the highest number. Proud moment for, for Richard Dog Marsh last year with Ryan equaling his result, his best result here, which was a second place finish. It was a, an awesome final with Ethan Ewing. Uh, Ryan, uh, particularly on the, the bowl, Jacob, he's surfing, looks so good there. Uh, he, I mean, he, he looks good everywhere, but on the bowl in particular, he, if you've got a full event over there, uh, he would have a, a great chance of winning, you'd think. Yeah, his surfing looks great out there. It's um, a bit Oki-esque, kind of, you could call it, but um, I love his surfing out here as well. Watching him last year in the event was... Um, Really cool. It, looked, it was similar conditions to this kind of, it seemed, on the TV. But, yeah, Ryan's definitely can't count him out. Seven minutes to go, got priority. I um, feel like the advantage of the back end sometimes is you can you can whip it up and manufacture a score sometimes a little bit easier. Um, but, yeah, there you go. There's the boys down on the beach watching. <laughs> Who we got there? We've got Timmy Mack, George Peter, Corbin Hutchings, um, Tully Wiley, big man Lobby. <laughs> Moose behind him. Is that your golf crew? Yeah, yeah, that's a um, bit of a golf pack there. We've actually teeing off at five, so <laughs> hopefully I'm out of here before then. Uh, <laughs> All right, we might keep you in here for a little bit. <laughs> yeah. That's all right, won't make a difference. I'll still shoot about 500 over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's great. There's a, it seems like each country, you know, uh, has a, a lot of camaraderie, but uh, especially you young blokes that have battled through the Challenger Series together. It's great to see crew that even that aren't even on the CT down here cheering you guys on in this event. Yeah, it's cool, hey. Um, we've definitely got like a good a good friend group and um, travel group that, I don't know, we just all kind of love getting behind each other and supporting each other. And um, yeah, we all kind of just love surf comps, I guess, too. So that's why they're all down here. And yeah, it's um, all, oh. a few of the boys are in the trials, so yeah. that's why they're down here as well. But here we go, a couple of sets. Yeah, the Melbourne flight camp, clan, flight cam here giving you a great perspective of the Winky lineup, and you can tell just how long it can stretch on for when there is a good swell running here. And Ryan Callanan's hoping to tap into one of those swell lines and unleash this ferocious backhand approach, which he possesses. Already up four spots on the rankings on that live ladder in the 14th position. Doesn't want to stop that roll, but yeah, that's not going to help his chances. That wave had so much lump and bump in it, real hard to read. And you just see how difficult it was on his back end too. He just got, got a bit hung up there on those couple of turns. His wife Nino uh, on screen there, watching on nervously. But uh, he's going to be up against it now because Morgan's going to get that priority and, and he's still going to have the lead. Yeah, he's just like trying to navigate all those bumps and try to find the clean kind of pocket to put it straight into it. He's doing well though. If he gets a little caught on this and it might have thrown his rhythm a little bit going into the next one. Oh, here we go. He's picked one off. A little rebate on the inside, but doesn't like the way that one feels. He gets out of there. Four and a half minutes to go. He'll head to the top. And you just know at this point, Richard Doc Marsh has got that little black book out. And he's just <laughs> writing all kind of notes down. Oh, oh there you go. It. Speak of the <laughs> little notebook. There we go. <laughs> Looking stressed at the oh, moment. Man. Looking so stressed. <laughs> I mean, Jacob, you're semi-coaching your friends sometimes when they're in heats as well. Like, I never see you looking as frustrated as Richard Doc Marsh, <laughs> but look, it's nerve-wracking sometimes, huh, when you're, you're willing oh, someone on to a victory. Oh, for sure. And I'm, it's... It's hard, like, <laughs> like it's so hard to know what to do. The oceans, like, can change so quickly. If Ryan's still, like, so in this um, with his surfing as well, like, but it's just the ocean. Sometimes the ocean can just let you down. I feel like the ocean's been so slow today. It's been a lot of um, kind of... There's been lots of waves still, but, yeah, it's just in moments like this when you need a wave or you want a wave, sometimes it feels like it just doesn't go your way and doesn't come through. So we'll see who has the rhythm in this heat. It seems like it's gone Morgan's way so far. When you think about the uh, history of this event, mate, what stands out to you as the all-time, the all-time Rip Curl Pro moment? Oh, that's a good question. I remember when I was, 
I don't know, maybe 14 or 15, and I was, it was a Mick versus Kelly final. 2012. Yeah, probably 2012. That's, I'll take that. That sounds good. <laughs> um, and Kelly did the big air reverse. I think Mick like started off, got some good scores put up, like on him and had pressure on him. Then Kelly did that big helicopter like air reverse. It was like at the bowl. It was like howling offshore. Did Mick end up winning that final? Can't the Kellycopter, we call it. The Kellycopter, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the way Mick Fenton tells it is that halfway through the air, he was looking in and Kelly's flying through the air and halfway through the rotation, they might made eye contact. <laughs> Stop. And then Kelly Stop completed it. the rotation, stomped it, got a 10-point ride. And at that point, we'd never really seen a big individual turn. Uh, that was crazy. Fetch a perfect number at Bells. It was a point break. You had to surf the wave start to finish. And people were scratching their heads, but Fanning, great relationship with this wave. He had an air of his own to finish off a, a wave, and he put himself on the two best wave. But there oh. it is, the helicopter. Wow. Wow. It was the moment where they locked eyes. <laughs> <laughs> but that it was, yeah. So relevant still, right? Like oh. 12 years later, like that's such a crazy air. Still probably a 10 he point ride. Needed one yeah. of those today in his heat. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, it was so an amazing fun. moment and it, it was an emotional year. Uh, Michael Peterson had just passed away and uh, they had a, a moment, it was meant to be a moment silence before the final and everyone just got on their feet and clapped their hands and they were just applauding and Kelly and Mick were out in the lineup doing the same thing. Yeah, that's cool. As the story goes, Kelly tried to talk to Mick, Mick brushed him, <laughs> got the best wave in the opening stages, Kelly thought, Rawr. but he, he was fired up. You know, uh, there was people who thought Kelly won that final, but you can't take anything away from Mick. You know, he took two uh, classic Bells Bowl waves apart for a, a couple of excellent scores. Time ticking by here. We are under the GWM two-minute warning now. And Ryan Cullinan still on the hunt for a 6.4. Morgan Siblick hanging on to this lead, getting the opportunity to compete at the championship to a level once again and taking that opportunity with both hands, but he's going to give Ryan an opportunity on this one. Needs a 6.4 out of it. Drives up into the section a couple of times. It's a smaller wave, so he has to go hard. He's got that wild inverted handstand-like backhand reverse that he can go to. Oh. And he swings it, but can't make it stick. Oh. And Richard Dogmarsh, he kind of knows that it's gone now. That opportunity's lost. He had the right idea, though. I yeah, feel he like did. he had to go for that, and he's so consistent with that move. It was just, yeah, that section, that was hard for him. I mean, how many points, really, were in that wave? And He juiced it pretty well, right, like, for what there was there. But, yeah, it's, that's surfing, right? Yeah. Difficult conditions today, and it's, it's meant that when you get a ride, you've got to make it count. Morgan Siblick did it a few times in that heat. And he's going to get himself the win here, Felicity. Yeah, he is. Another big win for Morgs. And there's the boys. What a heat, though, between those two Aussies. So I've just got a feel for Ryan. You know, it always sucks when you get the highest wave, single wave score of the heat. You just can't find that back up. Pretty impressive numbers from the two Novocastrians. But it will be Morgan moving through to the quarterfinals here at the Rip Curl Pro. Bells Beach, presented by Bonsoy. Jacob Wilcox, mate. Uh, Looking forward to seeing what you can do over there uh, at Margaret River. Cheers, and it'll mate. be nice to be home, mate. But uh, great Looking surfing here uh, at Bells. Perfect. Thanks for having me, no, guys. Mate. Thanks, having, Chico. Um, Good luck this afternoon. <laughs> Keep us updated on how you score over there. Talky Sands? Talky Sands, yeah. All right. Good <laughs> luck. Right. We're going to take a quick break. More action coming from the Rick Curl Pro at Bells Beach right after this.
The Rip Curl Pro Bells Beach, presented by Bonsoy, is brought to you by Rip Curl, the ultimate surfing company. By Visit Victoria, Melbourne, every bit different. By Eventbrite, proud sponsor of women's surfing on the WSL Championship Tour. By Oakberry, fuel yourself with the official SAE of WSL Australia. And by Shiseido, official sunscreen partner of the World Surf League. We're setting up heats in the quarterfinals. Simplick just beat Ryan Callanan. As we start off this matchup, Matthew McGillivray versus Sammy Pupo. McGillivray climbing to get out in front, even a thin throw on that last transition. Now the redirect on the open face and shuts it down. Maddie McGillivray loves a right hand point break, loves to mix it up with his turns. He's got a really unique style and could go a long way in this event. We've had one South African ring the bell in the past. That was Jordy Smith. Jordy lost to Kiowa Belly in that final rematch earlier today. And Sammy Pupo is going to get a turn to roll into this one to get things started. Sam Well, pin throw on the first effort. Looking solid as he comes around the corner. Third maneuver will be a nice little fin throw off the top. Catching up to the end section and shuts it down. Maddie getting on the board. Sammy to follow. Joe Turpel with Richie Lovett. Longtime CT standout for the call. A cool heat for these two competitors with both with a lot of great skill sets to, to get a win today. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I've got to give the edge to Sammy Pupo just only on current form of the last few heats. Uh, he seems to have um, clicked with that board from JS Carbon Technology. But let's have a look at Matty McGillivray first, up and riding. Taps it off the first section there, streaking down the line. Projection floater, foam climb, little tail release. So mixing it up. Now a nice clean slash, gets to the finish. Little blow tail. So on reflection, not a bad wave there for Matty McGillivray. Sammy Pupo. Definitely uh, a little taller in his wave selection. But uh, a few crumbly little sections to deal with. Little drift off the foam there. And then a uh, nice little close out slam, but uh, a beautiful slice up the top, gets that tail release. That was the best turn of this wave. Gets up and over the foam here, so just kept keeping that speed running down the line. Another little check turn off that crumbly little lip, and then bang, hits this final section. Comes down sturdy, positioned, well balanced. Sammy Pupo's got some work to do. Opening year on tour, finished Rookie of the Year, had some big performances. As we check out their rankings at the moment, they came into this event in a tough position. Samuel 28th in the world, McGillivray 22nd when you open the live rankings. Sammy Pupo now up to 24, McGillivray up to 20. So you can follow that on worldsurfleague.com. Big heat for both of them to get a little bit more room. Huge. Only just inside the cut oh, for Matty McGillivray. What a to nervous be. place to be, man. <laughs> and they felt it before. Sammy just fell off tour last season. Then he went on to win Snapper Rocks, and it kind of looked like he was just going to have a walk through back onto the tour. And then he had an awkward run where he couldn't make a heat, <laughs> put tons of pressure on himself heading into Sakurama. Yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, it's never a fun thing, you know, when you're uh, dancing around that cut line and you're under putting yourself under under pressure. And, uh, you know, these athletes, they want to perform, you know, pressure free. So it's important to get that good start. Last heat was won by the wild card. A familiar face. Morgan Siblick is with Vaughn. Morgan. Welcome back to the CT, mate. A huge result here with a, a big win over hometown mate Ryan Callanan there. And uh, you're the first quarter final of the Rip Curl Pro presented by Bonsoy, mate. How are you feeling? Oh, I'm so stoked. I just like want to do well here, get some coin and uh, get out. So I'm stoked. <laughs> mate, it's really obvious to everyone watching that you are surfing with just no weight on your shoulders. Uh, how much does that factor into you being able to surf at your best? Oh, it feels so good. I, I, know I feel like a lot of the guys here 
have a fair bit of pressure with the cart, so um, it feels good to come in here pretty free and feeling good. And I've been working on my boards pretty, like, so hard with um, Brandon Leckie and uh, feel like I've dialed them in pretty good mm -hmm. and they're feeling so solid under my feet, so I'm just stoked. A couple of really heartbreaking near misses on the Challenger Series over the last two years, but, you know, making the quarterfinals at an event like this must just fill you full of confidence and, and help you believe that this is where you're meant to be. Yeah, it feels so good. Like, my last year on tour, I pretty much didn't even make a heat, so it feels good just to get a couple back and boost the confidence a bunch and, I don't know, just stick to my process and, um, I don't know, have a hell time with everyone down here. We've got a hell crew down here and all the boys on tour. It's um, sick to be hanging out with them again. That's epic. That's unreal, mate. Um, just finally before you go, you know, uh, like I said, it was a local heat against your best mate. Is that something that lifts your game or, or helps you to surf even with more sting? Oh, no, nah, not really. I don't know. I swear I never beat Ryan when we're at home in board riders. He always smokes me. So uh, it feels good to get a win here over him. Um, but he's been doing so well this year, so it's epic to see him just kind of find his feet on tour and just being the usual guy that's going to be in the top ten. It's so sick. Well, people who love pro surfing love watching you get through heats, mate, and uh, we're so stoked for you to see you into the quarters. Best of luck in that next round. Thank you. Phew. Thank you, Vaughn. Morgan Sidlick back with a wild card and a power shake from Vano. Those two have spent some time together. If you guys haven't seen Postcards from Morgs yet, it's a Rip Curl movie that was kind of the debut for him globally to get his profile out there. Yeah, Morgan was just unheard of globally. They knew him in Australian surfing circles, and I remember meeting him in Hawaii when he qualified. I was like, what can we look forward to? And he's like, I have no idea. He just hadn't had time to, <laughs> to digest it yet. Then I was like, well, how do you say your last name? And he's like, you know what? Say it however you want. And I'm like, no, no, this is your career. We got to figure it out. We got to say it one way. And he's like, ah, oh, Siblick works. But there's a lot of different versions of it, you know? And he's, yeah. he's just a mellow cat. So he was like, yeah, just go with whatever feels good. <laughs> it's just cool to see him rise to that fifth in the world finish that first year. Yeah, it's good. And, uh, you know, struggled for form, really, to be honest, uh, in the years following that. And, and it's great to see him uh, back to that level. Like, that's that's the best heat I've seen him put together. Uh, these last few heats in the Rip Curl Pro, you know, have been amazing for Morgan. He's clearly back in form, doing a lot of work on the boards, as he said. Um, and he's been working with Brendan Leckie. He's uh, riding that round tail, uh, Sharp Eye Inferno 72 model. It's a single to double concave. Uh, and he's gone a little bit narrow too, so perhaps uh, that just giving him the space to be able to, you know, free up that surfing. Um, but uh, you, can, you can just tell when he came onto the tour, he was surfing without restriction or pressure, and then he felt the pressure, the performance went down, and he's now gone back to that space where he's just being able to free himself up again. Samuel Pupo already off and running with a 667 from his opening wave. McGillivray had the 4.5 on the start. Now it's the South Africans' turn here. Tap float to start. Another one just feeling his way off the top. Nothing major yet. Now digging in on the open face. Pushing some water out the back end section. Throw tail reverse for McGillivray. Yeah, nice. Clean, tidy little finish to that one. Just got a little stuck on a couple of those opening maneuvers, but cleaned it up nicely. So backing up that 4.50 advantage to uh, Sammy Pupo. That 6.67 out in front at the moment. Still a long way to go. Maddie McGillivray and Sammy Pupo have had three previous heats on the championship tour. McGillivray undefeated against Samwell. They've had a heat in Margaret River, Tahiti, and even Bells last year in the round of 32. Maddie won as we look at this wave again. Yeah, just tripped up a little bit on those opening pumps down the line. Now he cleans it up. Catches that little edge there. So, uh, you know, just forced the issue to get that blowtail rotation in. And uh, I really can't see this breaking into the fives. And Matty's going to need something more because I feel like Sammy's going to uh, pounce on this next set that comes through and he's going to, uh, you know, put in another great performance. He just looks on at the moment. Matty McGillivray has been all in in his career, spending a long time away from home. Even when the world shut down a few years back, he just hung out in Australia and lived out of a suitcase. Just did whatever he could to put himself in big events. 
this year even in the off season he just spent the time majority of it in Hawaii just preparing boards preparing his mindset for some of those challenging waves on the planet pipeline in Sunset Beach loving this guy's dedication he's gotten tens by showing off his uh, barrel riding ability and how late he can take off and then you kind of go into a nice fun right hander you're just going wow this is going to feel like he's right at home. Maddie looking without priority after paddling back out Sammy just a little bit out the back so Miguel Avray is going to see if he can better his low score now. Stepping on the whitewash and he'll step out situation remains the same. Yeah just looking for that uh, way with a little bit more open face. Those pockety little moments where you can really set that rail, jam the turn, perform that clean maneuver, but really difficult to do on a day like today. Tides filling in. We're down here at Winky Pop. Geez, we've seen some good surfing today, though. Reflecting back to the morning in those glassy conditions, and man, it has been a real uh, display of performance surfing. We've seen everything from open face hacks to carbs and airs quick snaps I've seen it all yeah we have and some really exciting close heats Liam O'Brien getting through this morning in the first heat of the day on that lower tide then Cole Hauschman under pressure of the cut he's into the round of 16 Kanoa Garashi finding his flow and rhythm and magic he'll have a heat with Hauschman later on today in the round we had Crosby get past Sammy's brother earlier to now set up an all Colda Pinto round of 16 heat, heat number five. Crosby, a rookie. Griffin, number one in the world. Yeah, that's going to be a, a pretty rad matchup. The whole family is on deck. Mitch and uh, Camille here just uh, spurring their boys on. And uh, at some point, this was always going to happen. They were going to meet up, hopefully in a final, but it's happening in the round of 16 today. Who's your money on, Joe? Who? That is a big <laughs> Putting one. you on the spot. Cross right? and Griff. Wow. We want to hear from you at WSL on our socials. Who's going to win that brother matchup? You know who put it out there first was Crosby. He made a post. He's like, who you got? <laughs> and so that'll be really fun. I know they're enjoying this opportunity with seating and just the way the world works on tour. It's like you never know and you're going to get another all brother matchup. So we're going to go all in on this one. Uh, Griffin being number one in the world that, you know, that feels like a fair call. But gosh, Crosby's so happy go lucky. And then Griffin might feel pressure of just being the big bro. And might, if anyone's going to force him to let his guard down, it might be his younger brother. Why don't we put 10 push ups on it? You take Griff, I'll take Cross. Done? Well called. We're on. Fair. You guys do the same at home. That'll be a fun one later on in this round. Miguel Avray leading this one 4-5 and a 3-8-3. And now Samuel. Decent size set here. Yeah, looking like he's just going to let it go through. Matt, he's going to do the same. Mm, it's going to touch wide on them. So Miguel Avray hanging in there for South Africa. Giving Jordy some backup on tour once again. Now turning, Soup, Sammy Pupo making a move. He's got so much speed on that JS. Into his wow. first turn. How about a down carve? Oh, no. And then gets stuck. Oh, Seed that is a get out of jail change. free card there for Matty McGillivray. Because uh, that one big opening carve had all sorts of points on it. He just needed to uh, finish that with a one or two turn combination, and that thing would have been up almost into the excellent zone, I reckon. Let's see what happened here, Rich. Yeah, beautiful looking wave from the takeoff. Shades of J-Bay really streaking down the line here. Sammy gets this opening carb down, holds that rail for much longer this time. Gets back on that heel side, up, and just didn't quite get up onto the lip enough there. Just caught his toe side edge as he was uh, going up into that turn. Shame. Opportunity lost. Okay. 
the brother heat getting prepared with their coach Tommy Whitaker. Tommy coaching both the boys. A lot of love there between these two. Their father a lifeguard and a teacher but also had a surf camp and that's where they were just surfing trying to impress all the the campers that were getting a lot of knowledge from their dad on the ocean and on riding waves. And they both had a different journey to being world class surfers on tour. For Griffin, he was kind of the obvious one coming up as a young competitive surfer through the USA Championships and the NSSA. Crosby, I guess you'd call him maybe a late bloomer as far as just dedication to the craft. He always had the talent. I think Griffin really reminded him hey, if you work hard, you could do this. And now he's just unbelievable. Watching Sammy Pupo flow down the line, trying to recover from the fall. Driving through that fin throw reverse. Oh. And shuts it down. That clean off the top of the whitewater section. I can't believe how quick that guy can reverse that around that board is so fast. So responsive under his feet. Solid call from Jason Stevenson to bring him some extra backup boards for this event. This one's magic as we watch it again. Yeah, smaller inside wave streaking down the line. Just pumping over these sections, blows the tail, gets the reverse, shuffles the feet back into position and just hops up onto the lip to get that final maneuver in. So this is what those epoxy boards do, Joe. Uh, this is a full carbon construction. EPS core epoxy resin and they, they just twitch under your feet they feel so lively uh, and spicy it's a uh, it's working so well here for Sammy Pupo with 16 minutes on the clock let's see what Vaughn's up to very very special guest down here at the Rip Curl Pro Bell's Beast Jocelyn Newmuller and Annie Goldsmith the 2023 ISA Adaptive World Champion and first and second place at the recent Adaptive Australian Adaptive Pro. Welcome. Thank you very much for having us on. Oh, it's a real pleasure. Guys, in the last few years, um, there's no doubt, you know, parasurfing has just had such a big profile explosion. And it's unreal to see you guys doing so well and getting such great results for Australia. Yeah, it's unreal to be part of this movement where parasurfing right around the world is growing and hopefully leading towards Paralympic inclusion in the future. But it's fantastic to be part of this movement in improving the visibility of parasurfing and just trying to push the level that parasurfing can achieve. So it's great to be out here watching legends of the sport make the most of these waves on offer. It really is. Um, at the recent Australian Adaptive Pro, an amazing event up there at Byron Bay. Uh, I've never seen so much just incredible energy around a surf contest before. How was that for you guys, that experience? I think it was fantastic. I think from my experience, it's one of the, if not the best, event that I've been to around the world on this yeah. tour so it was fantastic to be a part of that and see the community get around it and see some epic scores be dropped across the entire contest pushing the limits and expectations of what can be achieved in parasurfing. What about you Annie? How did you enjoy that experience in Byron? I just love being um, part of the community there like everyone gets around everyone and it doesn't matter your disability they all just get around each other. In Australia, we are so lucky to have so many legends in parasurfing. Uh, Mark Mono Stewart, obviously, I think he's a five-time world champion now. Sam Bloom, Emma Dieters, uh, Barney Miller from down at Coffs. I mean, how important has the success of these guys been to you guys? I think these people that have come before us have really paved the way for parasurfing in Australia. So it's fantastic to see all of these legends of the sport still involved in the sport and everyone's there to support each other which I think is really unique and special within parasurfing because everyone's competing together across different categories but they're just helping each other push the limits so it's fantastic to be involved in such a supportive community and have those legends of the sport around still supporting yeah. and improving and winning events like Mono it was so cool to see Mono win the recent Australian Adaptive Pro as yeah. well. And just finally uh a big moment for you uh, last year you were the Australian Adaptive Pro, uh, Surfer of the Year and recently at the Australian Adaptive Pro you scored a 10 the first 10 of your career 
Yeah, no, that was very exciting. Managed to get that elusive 10-point ride and finish with a 19.33 total to take out the top heat total of the event. So fantastic to be able to pull that off in competition and hopefully back that up with a few more this year is the goal. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, listen, guys, so great to have you down here at the Rip Curl Pro Bells Beach. Hope you enjoy the action and we look forward to uh, seeing you later on in the week. Thank you so much for having us on. <laughs> Magic. Thank you so much, Vaughn, and great to hear from Annie and also Jocelyn there winning in 2022 and 2023 world title tour wins. Uh, really cool that they're hanging out, enjoying all the action at the Rip Curl Pro Bells Beach presented by Bonsoy. Always fun to see who you're going to get to meet at a big event like this. Some legends hanging out and a big one for the two brothers, Crosby and Griff. They're still hanging out, preparing for a big heat later in this round. Take a Bonsoi brew break. We'll be right back. You're watching the Rip Curl Pro Bells Beach presented by Bonsoy, and you can get the special merchandise from this event. If you're not here on site, get it at WSLstore.com. If you are here at the event, you can walk up on the top of the bluff near the Winky Car Park and find yourself the store. We can get all that one-of-a-kind merchandise to represent the event here in 2024. It's never the same. You got to keep it. For the years to come, there's a lot of people here where you meet them and they've, they tell you how many bells that they've seen. A lot of fans here have seen more than 10 bells and they wear their old shirts to represent their dedication to the sport that they love. Sammy Pupo taking on Matthew McGillivray. It's been all about Winky Pop lately in the last couple of days of competition. You can see that staircase and where those colors are showing Maddie with priority. That's where the judges are set up for this event. You have that viewing deck a little bit higher up. That's kind of the, the VIP zone for coaches and really athletes. It's a different type of feel when you're around the corner at the Bells Bowl. A little more beach to hang out on, especially with this higher tide. The officials were really cool with letting the fans down earlier when it was low tide and then had to escort them up the stairs when they were running out of room. Adam Roberts in there with that blue shirt on. It was the wild card that made the final against Parco years ago. Now run in surfing Victoria. Ethan Ewing and Liam O'Brien, an all Australian matchup. As we transition back to live action, Sammy Pupo, light on his feet, looking for a major impactful move to release. He just left searching there, but his way before 517 has him out in front of Matty McGillivray. Yeah, he's uh, kind of taking a Pretty commanding lead here, but uh, Maddie's still in it, needing a 7.34, but we I think we've seen really a wave that, that's going to allow him to, to get that 7.34 yet. So I, I like his strategy of just being patient, waiting for a set. Looks like we might have a bit of a set approaching the lineup now. So uh, Maddie will be calming his nerves here, assessing the wave as he's paddling right now, thinking, yep, this looks like I can get some uh, some good numbers on it. Hopefully it doesn't run off too quick. Here we go. 
McGillivray right now setting up his first turn. Nice hack there, passing Sammy Pupo now. Driving into that whitewater section, connects well. Off the bottom and throw tail, controls it forward and rides away. So getting the completion there, three different times of terms, and now Sammy Pupo is going to be able to roll in just for a moment, up and out. Matthew chasing a 7.34. It's interesting with where they sit for a lot of the waves they were catching earlier, then a big set comes, and you see him, he had to hustle to make sure he got a piece of that wave, and the rest of it just ran down to lowers. Yeah, it's always tough as a, as a surfer when you have to make that split second decision whether to keep racing or just do the maneuvers with the wave that's in front of you. The sections that just turn up right here. So uh, Matty up and through the lip there. Gets, uh, thought he was going to go for the full, res full reverse, excuse me, at that point. But he brings it round, recorrects. It's on the CI uh, Pro. And it's looking really good under his feet here. You can see just grabs the rail, steadies himself there. And what that does is allows him to just control the way the board's moving under his feet a little bit better. Perhaps will improve on that 4.5, which will be, uh, will make that requirement. We'll bring that requirement down and, and he'll stay in this heat. Richie, who are some of your heroes at Bells Beach? Uh, Tom Curran was one. I always used to look at Tom and, and uh, just love the, the sort of uh, fluidity and style. Um, obviously, you know, that, that classic matchup with Oki uh, back in the day. It was, I was sort of torn between Tom was my favorite surfer at the time, but then so was Oki and he was the Aussie. So, you know, it was pretty cool to watch that as a grommet. And, you know, uh, and then after that, obviously, you know, watching Kelly out here, you know, and, and competing against him. Um, Joel Parkinson and Mick Fanning spring to mind as well as, you know, Joel's approach here, that smooth swooping style, you know, almost looking lazy at times, but, you know, just so much flow in, in the way he connected all these turns. So, um, yeah, there's a couple of good names. Those are some great names. And you also made the quarters here. Yeah. Who got you? Um, I can't remember actually. Okay, we'll have to yeah, look that yeah, one up. Yeah, we'll have to look that one up, but um, I, I did have success. You were just focused on the bell. Yeah, like. you know, at that point. Oh, no, it was Corey Lopez. There we go. Me. Yeah, Corey got me. Um, but I, like George, actually won the trials here one year, and that got me into the main event. That was the first pro event that I ever competed in. So that was a really special ex uh, experience, and um, yeah, you know, I've been coming down here for a long time now competing competing here as a junior and then through the Australian circuit and then obviously the 10 years on the championship tour. So, um, yeah, I'm feeling old. Right yeah, now, no, as, as we're talking all. about it. It's like a second home to you. <laughs> yeah, well, it's cool. You know, it's, yeah, it really is an annual migration. You know, as a surfer, you, you need to come down here, even if it's not during the rip curl time, you know, the rip curl pro time, just come down and, and feel the energy of the area. There's so many good waves around here and, you know, it's a really, really special place. Yeah, great seeing Aki and having him join us for the call the other day. He's still ripping and still the benchmark for how to perform on this wave on, on your back end. Uh, I, would, I would say that every goofy footer that's come down here, um, you know, really looks to Aki for inspiration and, and for kind of tips and advice on, on how to approach the wave because he just does it so well. Um, so, yeah, if you can unlock some of that Ocalupo magic, then uh, you'll do well down here. The other day, Mark Richards uh, tagged us in a post of the judging criteria uh, from back in the day. And he remembers walking by uh, Michael Peterson, the late, great Michael Peterson MP, had the criteria just taped to his his window in his car and he just studied everything the judges were working looking at they were actually had points for certain types of maneuvers back then yeah it was crazy uh, I, I had a look at that post the other day and it was like bottom turn six points you know uh, w speed weave is another five points and like the list was huge there was like 20 to 30 different things that the judges were kind of ticking boxes and just adding up the points and I was like made me think imagine if we actually had that judging criteria now like who would win you know and would we, we would see a totally different approach. You know, this is modern day surfing where we really focus on two of the best waves, the, the biggest and best maneuvers, critical maneuvers done with flow. There's, you know, it's a completely different way to judge now, but interesting how they used to do it back uh, in the day. Oh, it's come a long way, hasn't it? Oh, totally. And, uh, it, and Bells has seen 
every update in the criteria since day one, since the criteria was invented. How do we decide who's surfing the best? And, you know, without everyone who came before and went through all those years of growing in the sport, you know, we wouldn't have the system that we have today where it's top two waves, no wave maximum, really highlighting performance. You can get a 10 on one individual turn if it's that big. They want to reward radical surfing. And, wow, there's so many great memories. And looking at the ocean pop up with some waves here, Sammy Pupo wants to dig in. Hustling now to cover some ground. Oncoming section, he'll just tap his way through. Throws an arcing cutback. Still has a ton of energy. Time to throw the tail towards the beach. It gets the reverse. McGillivray on the next one. Winds up off the bottom. Nice clean snap. Deeper off the bottom for another hammer there. Oh, Throws the tail wow. in transition. Wow. There's his reverse and McGillivray with his arms up celebrating. Oh, I was thinking in the back of my mind when Sammy Pupo took off on that wave, I was going, the second wave of the set is always going to be smoother. And uh, Manny McGillivray, he sold Sammy Pupo on the first wave of that set. And you could tell there was bump on it. There was all this texture. And Sammy had to kind of fit his maneuvers in. The second wave of the set was much, much smoother. You can see here, look, there's intent with Manny McGillivray. And, he, and Sammy goes, all right, I'll take it. So streaking down the line here. Plenty of bump to deal with. Just a little uh, down the line sort of floater. Quick snap and then gets to that final finish and, and really like to be critical. You know, it was a nice, you know, rotation, but it was fairly pedestrian in that it was flat and there wasn't much height to it. But Manny McGillivray tags that first section, blows the tail out and the second improves. So with each one of his turns, he was building more critical, more high risk. And then the big finish, which, which the judges are going to love. That was massive. The transition smooth, big sections to work with as well, Rich. Well, at that point, Matty only needed that 6.12. And have a look at that. The tail just pointing all the way to the shore. Now he digs those fins in, gets the rotation, comes out clean. And that was an instant reaction from him. That wasn't like a, oh, was that the score? He knew that that was a great wave. He knows that that's going to be a big score. And that was a, a very natural sort of claim that we're seeing from Matty here. That was so smooth. The judges have sent out the message to all the surfers in the morning. They want to see that flow from start to finish using the entire wave. You have any stumbles on a wave like this at Winky Pop or Bells, they're taking note of that. It's all about that overall performance, and McGillivray just nailed it. Pupo up and out. Still waiting on scores from that last exchange down to 20 seconds. McGillivray doesn't claim too often. They're going to have to compare Matty's last wave directly with Sammy Pupo's first wave, the 6.67, as this one's counting down. It's going to be close. He had some good turns, good three solid maneuvers on that wave, Joe. Now we've run out of time, but the most important exchange just went down right at the end. McGillivray undefeated against Pupo in the past. Let's see if he can keep that and make it four in a row. Clutch effort there. You can tell how fit he is. One of the best paddlers on tour is McGillivray. Growing up on point breaks. Uh, this is like what Jeffrey's this guy does, Bay. man. He is and solid. Numbers coming through for Matty McGillivray. A 7.77 <laughs> seven <laughs> as he hits up. the jackpot wow. there and takes the win on the last exchange. Big performance from the South African to go from second to first in the dying seconds and turning in a brilliant three-turn combination. What a performance. That is uh, just determination, persistency. <laughs> he, didn't, he doesn't go away, this guy, man. He just hangs in there. He stays with it till those final moments. And I think he pointed at Morgs because he's like, I'm coming for you in the first quarter final. Two good friends in the first quarter final together here at the Rip Curl Pro Bells Beach, presented by Bonsoy. Brilliant surfing from the South African. Up next, Ethan Ewing takes on Liam O'Brien. We'll be right back.
You're watching the 61st edition of this really special event, the 50th that Rip Curl has been a major part of it. The Rip Curl Pro Bells Beach presented by Bonsoy. Watching Liam O'Brien get things going with Ethan Ewing in the lineup. Driving off the top a bit, just kind of a tap there, and he will kind of run out of room as he steps off. Liam from Burley Heads. We've got Ethan Ewing from Stradbrook Island. They've got some great mentors to look up to. Jay Bottle Thompson coaching Liam for a long time, and they're still really proud of their recent win at the Australian Board Riders Battle at Burley. Not just a surf event, but a marathon sprint to tag your, <laughs> your competitor. They did a great job, Thomas Woods and company, about bringing it home for Burley. And with Stratty, B. Durbage got Mr. Consistent on tour, former runner-up at this event as we Look at Liam's start during the break. This is a 3-5. Yeah, just the opening uh, wave here from Liam. You can see he's sort of coming behind the section uh, all the time on that wave, so no real special moments. And then this looks like the replay of Ethan Ewing's first wave. Jams it off the, the first hit, streaking down the line. Have a go at the speed here. Still more momentum down the line and just throws <laughs> the, absolutely everything. The kitchen sink at this final section. And uh, the big layback hammer to finish things off. Great surfing there from Ethan Ewing to open things up. And what about that for a score, Joe? 8.5 on his opener against Liam O'Brien. This man can do that on demand. He's so efficient with his wave selection. You don't see him kind of running away, picking bad waves off. He's always just right where he needs to be. And an 8-5, what a signal to his good friend and rival of Liam O'Brien. They've had some insane heats together over the years. Liam now scratching for one. That one's going to roll in underneath. His way before a 2-5-7. And we'll see this one get started. Remember uh, Ethan Ewan going for back-to-back -back Bells trophies. And we've seen that happen in surfing history, but it's a really tough challenge to... Win one year, show up the next year, and show that you're still the best at a CT venue. That's beyond impressive. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a very difficult thing to do. But we've seen it done time and time again. Perhaps Ethan can do it here. You know, so a fair few of those, um, you know, bigger, I guess, favoured names have, have dropped out of the draw here. So that spells opportunity for not only uh, the crew that haven't had a win down here at Bells, but also for Ethan Ewing to... Uh, Go for the double. So Liam O'Brien with that big score on the board from Ethan Ewing. He needs to stay focused here. He needs to stay in this. Wave selection is going to be critical because you know Ethan is not really going to mess around with taking any inside waves unless he absolutely has to. 28 minutes, still heaps of time on the clock. He'll be looking to put a huge number on the board and really shut Liam out of this one as, close, as, uh, as quick as he can. So Liam needs to um, answer back with a good score on his next wave. First surfer to go back to back, uh, the Bells Beach Easter Rally, it was called. It was Australia's Nat Young, 66 to 67. And then the same thing happened in 68 to 69 with a man named Ted Spencer, kind of owning that era here at Bells Beach. Uh, Nat Young, uh, one of the most famous Australian surfers from that time getting the bell, and those bells were made by a guy named Joe Sweeney. He was the guy that extended the dirt track down to bells uh, back in the day, and he also would go in his garage and get the bell, put it on that cool wooden frame. He made the trophies all the way until 2016 uh, when he passed away. An absolute legend of this event and a big part of just getting it started in the first place. Yeah, it's a pretty special trophy, and uh, we have the the great fortune of, of sitting next to it all week long here in the booth. As they say, you got to win it to ring it. And uh, heaven forbid you give that thing a ring and you haven't uh, won the event. Yeah, I'll never it's forget. Lifetime of bad uh, luck. Neil Ridgway told me that. He's like, oh, yeah, you can't ring it. Because back in the day, it used to be a tradition where people would let their friends ring it. You yeah, know? yeah. And I remember Taj, when Taj won, he brought the bell home to everybody and had a huge party. And 
the way Taj said, I think everyone was ringing it, and then someone rang it off the trophy, and it flew off oh like the second goodness. floor and almost took somebody out downstairs. Well, I think the caveat is that if you win the bell, you're allowed to oh give permission give permission to <laughs> ring it. But if you ring this thing before you've actually won it in the heat, then uh, yeah, I think you get some bad juju. For Adriano sure. de Souza, member on stage, yes. he won uh, first male for Brazil. Silvana won in 2009, but when he won. He rang the thing off the trophy. He it meant so too. much to him. Fell wow. off and he picked it back uh, up. You would. If you got the opportunity to ring it, you'd ring it hard. As we roll in now, deep positioning way up the point there for Liam O'Brien, needing a 5-0-1. Oh, cool. Layback slide off the lip. Ethan's watching everything from out the back and slams into another tail throw. God, so impressed with the options that Liam has. But uh, yeah, Ewing watched every single turn from out the back. You always wonder, are they going to play close attention or are they going to kind of just stare out to see? I think it's good to get a, you know, keep an eye on your competitor, just get a gauge. You're always judging your own waves and giving yourself a score. As soon as the ride's done, you'll sort of put it in, then you'll hear the actual judge's score come down and you'll be like, yeah, okay, compare it against that. So it's good to keep a read on what your your competitor's doing too because you're sort of doing the, the arithmetic in your head and thinking, okay, I've got my 8.5, he's going to build on here and this is what I need. Uh, all that information comes uh, readily available via the, the beach announcer and also through the Apple Watch. Um, but, yeah, Ethan... Uh, his strategy, you can see right here, is to just drop anchor and wait for that perfect wave uh, that he can start uh, building some bigger points. Well, Liam O'Brien certainly did 7-3-3. And now he got a chance to catch up with Matthew McGillivray, who's now 4-0 against Sammy Pupo. He's with Vaughn. Matty, 4-0 against Sammy Pupo. And that's probably one of the toughest battles you've ever had with him, really having to throw everything, including the kitchen sink, on your last wave to get the score. Yeah, it was um, obviously Sammy's been absolutely ripping this event, so I knew it was going to be a hard matchup. And I mean, he, he started straight away with a big score and he was in rhythm in the heat, so I was kind of um, having a mental mind game uh, battle out there, just trying to stay calm. And um, I was definitely stressed, but just so happy to come back at the end there. And yeah, it really meant, it really meant a lot to me making it through that heat. It was a, a great performance, Ben. I just want you to take us through that ride, that last one, because uh, you really went at it with the first two turns, but then that last section loomed up and you just went, yep, yeah, I'm just going to go throw everything at this. Yeah, I mean, I, I realised that I had to. It was my last chance to get the score. And if I just did a normal snap or Larry, I probably would have... I wouldn't have got the score because Sammy betted his previous ones. So, um, yeah, I knew I had to go for an air. Um, and thankfully, my board stayed on my feet. So, yeah, there's a lot of emotion <laughs> riding out of that wave. <laughs> nice claim on that one, mate, but uh, well earned. Well earned claim. Um, number 22 in the world coming into this event, so crucial to get a result. You must be frothing now that you're into the quarterfinals, your best result of the season so far. Yeah, I'm so happy to finally be making some heats. Um, I mean, I've been really focused this year and trying really hard, and sometimes you're just hitting your head on the wall and you like, can't make it out of um, round three. So, um, yeah, I'm just so happy to finally get the ball rolling and um, get some confidence again. And yeah, hopefully we can keep it rolling. The next matchup's going to be pretty interesting. It's going to be a good one, mate. It's your old travel buddy and one of your best friends, Morgan Sivlik. I mean, it's so great to see you guys into the final. What do you think he's going to bring to that that approach? Oh, it's it's going to be it's going to be so much fun because um, we've been talking about it the last two days. We're like, oh, if we both make our next heats, we're gonna we're gonna match up together. And um, I don't think we matched up on the CT before, so it's the first time. And um, yeah, I mean, it's going to be a fun, a fun matchup. We're definitely both going to try our best, and one of us is going to be in the semi, so that's pretty oh, cool. Oh, mate, I can imagine both of you rubbing your hands together at the idea of that matchup. Congratulations, mate. Quarterfinal finish, or oh, sorry, into the quarterfinals here at the Rip Curl Pro, presented by Bonsoy, and uh, a great effort there. Can't wait to see in that one. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Good on you, mate. <laughs> Thank you, Vaughn. <laughs> McGillivray, happy to get his first quarterfinal of 2024 and to go against Siblick is an absolute classic travel partners for many years if you guys got to see make or break which was on apple tv plus 
uh, Box to Box Productions were following these guys around. There was one episode that was really just focused on Morgan, focused on uh, McGillivray. Uh, Liam O'Brien would pop up here and there as a replacement surfer that season. It was it was really that three pack that we were seeing, all coached by J. Bottle Thompson, and uh, the the conversations were. Just classic. Hilarious is what they were. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of Aussie, sl a lot of Aussie slang going on oh, in there too, mate. My I tell favorite, you. my favorite. So Sid looks a wild card uh, this year. McGillivray full time on tour, uh, which kind of brings up a point here. So we brought up Jay Bottle Thompson. He's from where Liam O'Brien's from. We brought up B Durbage. That's uh, where Ethan's from. Let's just kind of play like a little fantasy surfer here, heritage sheet. Like they're bottle, in a heat together? Bottle versus, <laughs> bottle versus bead. These conditions at Winky Pop, who gets the win? I uh, love you, Botsy, but I'm going to have to give it to Bede. I, I just think his adaptability, um, it was one of his strengths when he was on the tour. And, uh, you know, he's got that big forehand fan. Bede had this ability to, to really emphasize that front side snap and throw a ton of spray and keep his speed going down the line. Obviously perfected on the, on the point breaks up in Queensland there. But, uh, yeah, Botsy's um, more of a big down-the-line open face swoop. So in conditions like this, I'm going to give the nod to Bede. Gosh, that just felt good, you know. We haven't been able to break down the heat for Bede and, and Bottle in a while. It yeah. just brought me back. Yeah, it's good. It's cool. <laughs> I haven't seen uh, – well, I saw, uh, saw Botsy up at the Board Riders Battle a couple of weeks ago. I haven't seen Bede in a while, but uh, – I'm sure he's doing well. I'm sure he's tuning in right now, too. Yeah. So uh, all the best to the fellas. I'm sure Bottle's doing great after that big win for the board. Oh, riders. yeah. I think they're, uh, they're still at the pub. <laughs> Classic. Liam O'Brien out in front of this one. 7.33 and a 3.5 as is low. Ethan just one way, but one of the best of the day. 8.5. And he's got 20 and a half minutes to get another wave. There's He'll some surfers that just... No, they just need two waves, huh, Rich? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, you know, Coach Tommy Whitaker, who was uh, one of the best at just being patient and just knowing that I'm just going to get the, myself on the best two waves in the heat. I'm not going to stress around, muck around, trying to scratch for fours and fives. I'm just only going to take off on great waves. But, uh, you know, Liam, with nothing to lose here, he's trying to build the score line underneath Ethan Ewing. Liam O'Brien has given Ethan some trouble in the past as he Woo! goes for a big throw tail to beat the section. Nice rhythm down the line, snaps it off the lip again. Hustling towards this section, nice speed turns off the top, but now off the bottom. Love wow. these extended slides that he's thrown down on demand. Mixed up with variety, Ethan now is going to wake up for his second wave of the matchup. First turn, big vertical fin ditch out in front for that oh. carved to tail release. Whips it off the lip again. Total control and mastery of that oh, DHD damn. surfboard. Unbelievable read for Ewing. A giant score to go with this 8.5. Wow, so uh, patience is a virtue. And in this case, it has paid off for Ethan Ewing. And uh, well, Liam O'Brien, he just tagged that wave down the line did the most amazing surfing on that on that kind of inside runner that Ethan let go. Let's watch the replay here. So pumping down the line here, clicks with that first little section, keeps projecting. Now he starts to open up, throws the tail high, readjusts, gets the balance back in the stance. A series of front side snaps all the way down the line, up and over this foamy section, and then gets this strong finish as well with a layback hack to uh to really complete that ride to bookend it started off radically lots of work in between and then gets the the powerful finish oh, just so agile on his feet staying nice and light boards looking really good from what we understand a modified version of the juliet model of ethan's uh signature model that one stab in the dark you can see uh the mick fanning fins there just blowing them tail high a really swept back, swept back fin for these really rocket out boards. Just helps settle and control the tail of the board. Up and over that section, lots of drive. You can uh, you can tell what Liam was trying to do there, but uh, behind him on a bigger, better wave, Ethan Ewing. You can just see there's a difference in the speed execution of these turns. And you're watching one of the most efficient surfers on the tour at the moment. Radical tail slide into snap, 
No speed loss between any of those turns and then clicks with that finishing manoeuvre. There's so much speed. You can see he's actually accelerating through it, gets the tail release, re-engages the fins, quickly brings it back under his body again. So low to the surfboard as he gets up and through the lip. Watch the compression in the, in the legs. Nice and low to the deck, well balanced. Man, this guy, he's found something. Ethan Ewing looking incredible. Now Liam O'Brien stepping on the gas. Driving into a little layback, and he will try to find a better section down the line, building some speed, winding up for a big slob, oh. and lays back and does not recover. I almost feel like that's a good strategy. He, he needs to, to do something incredibly radical if he wants to take down Ethan Ewing. It's going to be hard to match Ethan on the, on, the, on the face here, just doing power hacks. Ethan's just seems to be cutting into the water a little bit deeper. Liam again, hunting sections to go Whoa. big and just lays into a meat hook of a carve. Lays it down again and blows the tail out. I love his energy. God, as I say that, he's just stepped it up a gear. Ethan Ewing's last score, 7-7. Seven seven. And Liam O'Brien responding incredibly well, just with energy, trying punts, going for even bigger carves on the open face. I mentioned how Liam's given, given Ethan trouble in the past. He's got him a few times as we look at this wave. Driving off the bottom here, a longer, more aggressive snap. Bang through the lip again, and then this final one leans into it so hard. Actually gets a little tail release through that turn, but manages to hang on to it. But you can see he, he's increased his energy output by probably 10 to 20% on this wave. And uh, this is exactly what he, he's going to have to do if he wants to uh, sort of match Ethan for power and speed. A beautiful turn there. Just, mate, just stays connected to the wave for 90% 90, 90 of that turn. Then that final 10% just lost it, but then re-engages the fins, keeps that rail of the board smooth. And then this final turn here, watch the him just throws his whole body into it. Back foot almost coming completely off the tail pad and just shoves it back down. Great execution, core strength coming into play. That was radical. I think there's this thing you run away with when you talk about progression. You're thinking airs above the lip, and then that's just a version of progression on the open face. Just unbelievable amount of speed. Big carve to holding your rail, and then a big carve to blowing your tail. That is just so much talent right there on a surfboard. O'Brien trying to find a way to come back in the seat. Ewing might have a go at this one. So he's seeing a way to improve on a 727. There's that cool tempo and rhythm. Now stepping into his first turn. Cool snap off the lip. Attacking that one down the line. Driving into a big hammer in his first fall of the matchup. And then right back to business. So I guess for a coach, Snake Patterson, he's looking for any sort of error or any sort of feedback. And he might go, why'd you need that wave? But maybe not, because if he lands that last turn with authority, maybe that's another excellent rate score and you could put it away. What do you think, Rich? Well, at this point, even a half a, half a point is going to push Liam's requirement up into the nines which will make it really, really difficult. I don't even think we've seen a nine-point ride today. So he's uh, he's going to have to produce one of the best waves of the entire day, Liam O'Brien. Let's check the replay here. Ethan Ewing pumping, driving. Look at the hands, very neutral in position, slightly forward. Jams on the brakes as he snaps through the lip there, but then uh, hits the accelerator again up and over this foamy section. And now gets into this final moment and just ropes it around and just loses it. Outside edge catches and over he goes, but uh, luckily just scoops his board up. Did well to catch that mid turn actually. Yeah, it was radical. Liam's up again. Nice fading wrap to kick things off, ton of speed. 
Quick tight jam on the pocket. And then wraps it again. Needed something really major to try to get the score. And we'll see him just throw the fins out no. into reverse. No, but no, no. he knew right away that wasn't going to be it. See, wave choice here. This is like at this moment in the heat or in that moment in the heat before Liam took off on that wave, it was like, okay, my opportunity now is to beat Ethan, but I have to find the biggest set or I have to wait for the wave that's going to allow me to get an 8.5. And uh, I, I'm, I just don't think that wave had it on it. Uh, an 8.5, I didn't see it. So Liam O'Brien leads three to one in previous championship tour matchups. Liam's beat Ethan at Pipe and El Salvador at Sunset Beach earlier this year. Ethan with one win, that was at Pipe at the start of this season. Liam beat Ethan at Pipe the year before as Hauschman walks down to the rocks on this higher tide. Cole taking on Kano Igarashi in heat number four. The rookie on tour trying to save his spot on the top 34. Coming through with the biggest win he's had this season over his hero, Gabriel Medina. You can see how different the playing field is, though. There's so much room to walk out on the lower tide. Now the water right up against the cliff. Can make it tricky to come in sometimes, especially when it's pumping. Yeah, yeah, and it's big down the line at high tide. You really do need to uh, pick your exit and entry point. But uh, the beauty of Winky Pop is that the wave doesn't really change too much in that, uh, uh, you know, it doesn't section off as, uh, you know, at low tide versus high tide. It has a pretty consistent pace, regardless of how much water's on the reef. Very special uh, type of wave down here. 10.30 on the clock. Ewing putting on a special performance, and so is Liam O'Brien, but it gets you thinking. Will Ethan Ewing be the Mophie Charger of the event on the post show? We'll be right back. Time to dive into the pulse for a massive day at the Rip Curl Pro Bells Beach presented by Bonsoy. Cole Hausman creating the biggest upset of the day. The three-time world champ has been absolutely crushing it. He surfed incredibly well in this seat. Really fast, tons of turns. 710, Charlie was loving it. It came down to this final wave. Medina with priority. Cole's positioning allowed him to get started. The combination out the back was one of the best combos for maneuvers in the matchup. Louie was proud of him, and Cole Bobby moves on. Bobby. Then we saw Kelly go down. His board looked fun and rippable. He looked inspired to perform in these conditions at Winky Pop. Ended up falling on an important turn. And then Baron was surfing really comfortably. Finishing his waves, good variety, 6-5 in the end to get his first win of his career over Kelly, the greatest of all time. As we also saw Cade Madsen under pressure of the cut, take down one of his heroes, John John Florence out of the event. 
a two-time world champ, a Bells champ. Had some great moments here, but it was all about Cade. The ocean went flat. John really didn't find a backup in this heat and ends up losing in the round of 32. Madsen, 5-1-7 in a 6-8-3. A very crucial heat for the rookie. Another major upset and a very happy coach in Jake the Snake Patterson. Round of 16 continues here with a super Australian heat. Ethan Ewing with the lead over Liam O'Brien, an 8-5 and a 7-2-7. And it's been fun talking about the surfboard models from a great human, a great shaper, Darren Hanley, who's one of the most successful shapers for this event specifically at Bells Beach Rich. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, Ethan Ewing, uh, obviously having a lot of success on this DHD Juliet model. Just one stab in the dark, and there's a there's actually a pretty cool story around it. So, you know, what these shapers do, Darren in particular, working with Mick in the past, you know, they'll be working on a model, but there'll be different variations of that model. And Mick used to call them uh, a different, give all these uh, boards that he was testing a different girl's name. And that's how we used to set them apart. So with Ethan, they were going through the same process and, and to sort of identify each individual board, uh, they were giving it uh, the letter of the nautical alphabet. So obviously Alpha, uh, Bravo, Charlie, as they go all the way down, and J is for Juliet. So that was the one that they eventually landed on, hence the name, the Juliet. I love that. So they went through quite a few. Yeah, well, all the way through the alphabet, yeah. all the way down to J, and each one of those boards would have been called that uh, corresponding letter of the that alphabet. It's beautiful. Delta, Echo, Foxtrot, yep. went through all those. I wonder what those boards felt like. I'm sure they're fantastic <laughs> as well, but <laughs> These there was a little bit of magic, right, yeah. in the Juliet model, and that was uh, that was the one. And then, uh, so Lobby's actually riding a slightly modified version of the Juliet, um, and that seems to be looking really good under his feet as well. Darren Hanley just won the stab in the dark with Kolohe and Dino. It's just an amazing contest where the surfers don't know which shaper shaped which board, and DH ended up on top. And that model was used for that win as well. So the Juliet, bit of magic. Liam O'Brien up and out, needing an 8-4-5 now with five minutes to go. Ethan looking to go back to back with his trophies here at Bells Beach. Two CT wins for Ethan, runner up in the world last season to Felipe Toledo. And looks like the man to be looking so smooth in this matchup. Yeah, blast the top out of these uh, first two turns. And then the third one does the big layback slide. And that was that 8.5, one of the best scores of the day. Liam O'Brien, you can see the wave height a little bit smaller, but some fantastic surfing nonetheless. Driving through these sections, getting to the finish, and staying quite radical. Trying to uh, show a, a great variety in his repertoire. But Ethan just on the big up, better waves, being more patient. He's only ridden three waves in this heat. But geez, uh, two of them have been uh, exceptional. You can just see the difference in speed, and that's what's setting these guys apart at the moment. Liam O'Brien uh, just having big individual moments with crazy layback carves. That was unbelievable to the tune of a seven point ride. But I love how oh. he's executing just a different style of surfing, adapting to what's needed in the heat. I actually like that one better Gosh. than his 7-3-3, and I thought that one could uh, perhaps have almost gone into the eight-point range. I thought it was excellent surfing, even though uh, he did take it way down the line, and I think that's perhaps why the, the score stayed around that seven mark, is that it was almost taken off right sort of halfway down the lineup, really. Oh, it's just the rat. If you have a photo in any part of those turns they're they're getting shots in the magazine if you're making a movie part you're using turns like that it's just that's the kind of surfing you you really want to see on the championship tour these are the battles that we hope we get more of this season because this is a fun kind of australian rivalry on tour ethan trying to bring a world title home last season did everything he could after the back injury in Tahiti. Everyone thought that was it, and you could just see an extra gear for his determination not to give up on a chance to to try to bring a world title home to Australia. Yeah, um, you know, he's, he's had a little taste of it, uh, being in that final five showdown. Exciting day of competition. It's all on the line, and uh, you know, obviously Ethan Ewing and Jack Robinson are sort of uh, touted as the, the 
big Australian hopes to to get a world title. Will 2024 be the year? We talked about the surfers who went back to back. We mentioned Nat Young, Ted Spencer, uh, MP. He went three in a row. Michael Peterson, MR, Mark Richards. He also had three in a row, ended up with four before he moved on. Sonny Garcia was able to go back to back with his titles. He had a few bells to his name. Andy Irons also a one of the huge names and often was compared to uh, Ethan Ewing style or Ethan was compared to Andy I should say when he first came on the scene. AI went back to back 2002 2003 that went with world titles. But pretty hard to accomplish that. T two different eras when you come back a following season and there's new people on tour different conditions. It's a huge statement that Ethan's trying to make this year 90 seconds on the clock. Ethan with priority doesn't really have to move unless there's a wave where he thinks Liam could get the 845. He's pretty much surfed a perfect heat here. Ethan Ewing conserved his energy here. No unnecessary waves ridden. Perfect heat strategy executed. Obviously the partnership with Jake Patterson working well down here at Bells. You can also see, we talk about his efficiency. He forces his competitors to just look at every option they can. You look at O'Brien, 10 waves ridden. So many different parts of the lineup surfed. He really exhausts his competitors. And he's only looked at three waves this entire heat. Well, a decent looking wave here. We will get a ride and I dare say, Ethan will uh, just hold lobby off this one. Take a victory lap. And Liam looking interested. Ethan Ewing rolls in with 30 seconds and flows into a foam climb. Another one just to get down into some open face. White water's keeping him honest there. But still looking real clean in his transitions as he's just kind of going through the motions on that final effort. 10 seconds left. And oh, Liam, hang on. Hold Liam the might phone. get into this one. O'Brien up in time, needs an 8.45. He's hustling down the line, going for something big. First turn, nice and clean, setting up a wrapping cutback. Staying engaged on this wave and just a little setup off the top and throwing a fin throw and he gets caught. Not going to be the number he was looking for. But Liam should be proud. I mean, one of the most entertaining matchups and one of the cool rivalries that we have on the top 34, Ethan Ewing, solid, moving on to the quarterfinals. Yeah, it was a good performance. I mean, when you look at Liam O'Brien's heat total, 14.33, I mean, that's that's good surfing, right? You know, he, he literally just did everything he could on the waves that he got, but uh, Ethan was just on the bigger, better waves. And you're looking at a man there that is in total control, in fine form, and uh, is really starting to uh, announce himself as the man to beat for this competition. What a role for Ethan Ewing. 8-5-7-2-7. Moves on to the quarterfinals. Coming up next, rookie Cole Hauschman takes on Kanoa Igarashi. We'll bring in the Blakey brothers for the call right after this.
the Rip Curl Pro Bells Beach, presented by Bonsoy, is brought to you by Surf Coast Shire. Head to surfcoastevents.com.au to find out what's on. By Bonsoy, the official milk of the World Surf League. By Bond University, not for profit and not to conform. Bond University exists for you. By WeatherGuard, official portable storage of WSL Australia. And by Hydrolite, official oral rehydration partner of WSL Australia. Moving through the round of 16, setting up quarterfinal clashes today. What a Saturday it is. The Rip Curl Pro, Bells Beach, presented by Bonsoy. We've seen some big heats go down. We've seen some tough results, some close ones. Mm. But the action continues here. Heat four, it's another stunner. Cole Hauschman is going to be taking on Kanoa Igarashi. Here, here for the call, Ronnie Blakey, joined by Vaughan. Mate, you've been out there in the field. You've been kind of feeling that pressure. People chasing big results yeah. to stay at the top end and others desperate to get themselves above that cut uh, line. It's been a pretty wild day, Ron. Like, uh, we turned up this morning. We basically looked at Winky and went, yep, cool, there's waves, let's rip it. And, uh, yeah, far out drama, really solid surfing, some excellent performances and uh, a huge crowd down here as well to enjoy all the action. Uh, if you can't see it from the cliffs, you just wander down into the the comp site and there's a big screen and there's heaps of people out there. How are you folks? Ew! <laughs> and uh, yeah, like, I mean, mate, the, the atmosphere is is what you expect here at Bills. It's, oh, it as, you know, it's a marquee sporting event, as we always say, but everyone really appreciates it. I was just down there while Ethan and uh, Liam were going at it and uh, every ride was just getting claps and cheers and a lot of gratitude for an uh, appreciation of the surfing on hand. Yeah, folks. Good on you guys for uh, coming down and enjoying it. I was actually upstairs too in the Kingdom of Froth, they call it. That's the Bonsoi activation down here or the home of the, you know, the Bonsoi uh, stand. Stand. And um, yeah, it, <laughs> it was just awesome, man. You got views from the top level looking down at the big screen, looking down across Winky and yeah, they gave me some socks. And mate, if you thought that the milk was good, socks are even better. They're so comfy. Rocking the, uh, the the soybean Sam, there. Sammy Soybean, yeah. Sammy Soybean, I love it. He's a ledge. <laughs> Beautiful view there uh, of Bells Beach taking that Melbourne flight cam. Sensational. Some folks enjoying a swim as well down there in the corner. But it has been a, a magic day and the, the action continues at Winky Pop. And uh, Cole Houchman, will his big run continue in this event? Another tough draw for him, Kanao Igarashi. Uh, just before we, we rocked up today, we were sort of talking about, you know, will we see a, a, a breakout performer? And even though Kanoa's had a lot of runs at this event, he's never broken into the quarterfinals before. So this is a, a key one for him. But yourself and Richie love it, sensing that, that something's clicking with Kanoa at the moment. Definitely. Um, I, I just really think his style of surfing suits these waves, whether uh, it's Bells or whether it's Winky. He's kind of got a full artillery that he can unleash on both venues. Um, he was impressive this morning. He looks dangerous. He looks really focused. Uh, he has that brilliant mind, that magic mind, helping him out in his coach's box. Yeah. And uh, I think he's going to be... Yeah. Yeah, I think he's going to really go at this heat uh, against Cole here. Yeah, well, uh, Jake Patterson might be the key ingredient for uh, Kanoa Igarashi. Cole Houseman has been working with Luke Egan. Obviously, uh, a lot of competitive success. And, and Luke tends to pick up goofy footers in his stable. And, uh, you know, I think that he's able to really help them uh, break down the locations where he's obviously spent a, a lot of time. Cole's looked really sharp uh, on the backhand throughout this uh, event so far. This is a big test, though. It's pretty classic. Uh, I remember seeing Luke Egan surf D-Bar years and years and years ago, right when he was at his prime. And, you know, he was one of the bigger guys on tour, Ron. Heavy power surfer. Like, really loved to just bury the rail. Uh, but could release and be explosive and progressive as well. Uh, but this day at D-Bar was tiny. It was like one foot dribble. And Luke was going ballistic out there. And I reckon he sees kind of a little bit of himself in Cole. Maybe he uh, can understand what he needs to bring to this elite level so that he can get the best results possible. And he's he's pulled off a, a huge one this morning. Definitely one of the uh, the biggest surfers that we've seen on the CT in some time. 6'3". Plenty of muscle on those bones, but it's going to be Kanoa Igarashi kicking things off here in heat four of the round of 16. And just look at the flow. This guy just 
sits on top of the water so beautifully and always pinpoint with the placement of these manoeuvres already flaring up that variety as he works his way down to the inside came out of the water after his last heat with a big smile on his face just loving competing at the moment and that could spell danger for the rest of the field as Jake watches on you can see that tide quite high at the moment yeah, this morning that was all bare rock and reef. And uh, right now it's uh, basically licking the edge of the cliff. And uh, these guys are really, you know, having to deal with a lot more lump on the face. Uh, but this, as an opening ride, is not too bad, I think, from Kanoa. It uh, hasn't got any sort of real major fireworks, but it's just so smooth. Down the line speed. It was a really lovely blow tail. Uh, a little bit of a sticky turn there and then bashes it off the inside down the line and I guess uh, you know there have been heats that have slowed down so just to get something on the board early is, is a good call yeah just a, a cool customer typically but you, you can remember back to when he broke through for that win in Bali when he had Jake in his corner there just how fierce the celebrations were also when he went back to back at the US Open so he, he has that competitive fire but I, I think Jake has helped him reignite it this year. And Jake did a similar thing for Stephanie Gilmore on, you know, and just getting her back to a seriously feisty mindset. Mm. Yeah, and I mean, Kanoa didn't finish or have a great year last year. So he wanted to come out after, you know, experiencing WSL finals just one year beforehand uh, and refine that magic, you know, click back into that competitive mindset. Um, Snake is the perfect guy to get you fired up and into that space. Look how high the tide is there. That's just amazing. There were so many people down there on the beach this morning. Uh, obviously, when Kelly Slater hits the water, Ron, you know, people just appear out of nowhere. It's like that uh, Simpsons meme where Homer just comes out of the bushes. That's what it looked like up in the car park. 583 for Igarashi on his first wave. And now we're going to see what Cole can do in response. Gets caught behind, though. It doesn't get a whole lot out of that one. Yeah, you mentioned that uh, that dip in form last year for Kanoa. He, he went from fifth in 2022 all the way back to 14th last season. Really well situated at the moment. Knocking on the door of that final five with a couple of surfers above him. You know, potentially making uh, room for him to climb a couple of rungs on the ladder. An important heat for him. Wants to crack the quarters for the first time here. It's, uh, you know, a, a really... There's a really good chance that we'll have a, a breakthrough champion, Vorno, on the men's side as well. We know we're going to see that on the women's side. The quarterfinals are set. They look remarkable, but all the former winners are out of the mix there. Mm. So we'll see. Yeah. It's been a big day of upsets, but... <laughs> Just based on that last performance of Ethan Ewing, I was like looking down from the top of the cliff and his surfing looked enormous, Ron. He just covers so much ground. His speed and his power is just, I mean, it, it felt like a real statement heat. Uh, even on his first wave, he just went full attack mode and he looked a foot bigger than just about everyone who surfed today. Well, that's the exception on the men's side, yeah. isn't it? Ethan Ewing still alive and, you know, here he is making his way up the steps. Seem very focused. Oh, lucky, dude. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> hey, well served. Dude. That was incredible. Thanks. The first wave was nuts. Yeah. All right, scores here for Blue's first wave. Blue, oh, a 5.83. 5.83. Yeah, that last one registered. Yeah. It's got 25 yeah. minutes remaining. Yeah. I know. Oh, oh, no, oh, oh, in the blue. Oh, in a 5.83. Yeah. Yeah. So first wave. Blue has priority. Yes. <laughs> He's a busy man, Jake Patterson. Coaching uh, right. Kanoa out there at the moment, but has just coached Ethan True uh, that heat. Nothing but uh, accolades after that performance. And, uh, well, the potential for those two to meet in the quarters. We gave Jake a ride to the comp yesterday morning, Ron, and uh, we got a little, I got a little personal taste of his coaching style. He uh, had recorded a post-heat interview I was doing. <laughs> He's coaching everyone. <laughs> and he goes, hey, Vorno, uh, 
cop the length of your question in this one, and it was me and Tommy Whitaker, and I just spoke for about two and a half minutes before Tommy got a, a word in. He goes, yeah, maybe uh, keep those questions just a little tighter, mate. So right, uh, yeah. there you go. Super coach. Yeah, it, offering just advice to anyone who wants it or not. <laughs> Oh, we're loving being that back here at Bells Beach. Rip Curl and the WSL, of course, acknowledge that we're here on Wadawa Run Country and we uh, acknowledge the people, the, the traditional owners of the lands and waterways we're on. I love that piece uh, with Humey, Anthony Hume, just talking about the, the power of Bells Beach, Jirak, you know, the glow of that, the cliff faces around here and, and how much good energy comes off them. And uh, his advice to people when you've had a crappy day is just walk down the beach, put yeah. your feet in the sand and just bask in that amazing glow. As you can see, the sun's gotten a, starting to dip a little bit now, so the sun's not quite on it at the moment. But it's a beautiful thing in the morning, Vorno. Oh, it's one of the all-time great scenes in surfing. I was just uh, thinking about it. Here it is, just this little headland as we cut to the action here, Ron. Yeah, Kanoa looking to back up the 5.83. Bit of a slower start to this heat so far, but you just know that with uh, the calibre of, caliber of surfer out there that you're going to see some, some big scores drop any moment. But, yeah, just on Bells, it's, it's actually surprising. When you first come down here, it's not a very big headland, you know? You think of, like, I don't know, Lennox Head or Burley Head. They're kind of these, these big monuments that just stick out in the ocean and have these beautiful points running off them. Bells is just its own little piece of heaven, its own piece of paradise. And uh, once you paddle out there, I don't know, it's almost just like the weight of the history uh, both, you know, sacred and ancient, right through into it, the surf history. It just, it's all just simmering out there. You can feel it in your, in your bones, man. Yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting. I, I genuinely mean that. Like, you, you, you walk down the stairs and you paddle out and you can feel something cosmic going on. For sure. I, I think, um, too, just chatting with one of Australia's great cricketers, Ian Healy, the other day on his uh, radio show on SEN here in Australia, a really popular program that he has. And he was just saying, it, how do these beaches compare to the East Coast and that white sand and the, the blue water? And I just said, it's so unique down here, the experience, especially for traveling surfers. And at the moment, Cole Hausman's uh, drawing some comparisons just to the characteristics of the face of the wave here at Winky Pop to what he rides back home at Trestles. But yeah, it is unique, just the the entry to the beach, you know, generally you're taking on a, quite a few flights of stairs mm. to get down there. Chunky, grainy sand and just a, a really interesting uh, surface. But it's just a really challenging uh, zone to figure out too. The, these competitors do such a fantastic job. Great response there to Kanoa's opening 5.83. Yeah, two major turns here. And Cole doing what he really does best, and that's just bash lips and uh, release the tail. And I really do think that that extra bit of tweak is just far out. It's what he's going to have to bring in this heat. We know that Kanoa has just so much variety in his surfing, but Cole can match it. And the backhanders can square up, Ron. You know that they're going to square up, mate. Yeah, well, it's, it's great to see Cole's backhand come to play because, you know, he was so strong on the Challenger Series last year. He blew minds at Narrabeam, winning in really solid conditions there. And, um, you know, getting on an incredible roll, backing it up with a second victory on the Challenger Series over at Bolido, and very early shoring up his position on the championship tour. And, yeah, he's just a, a really confident competitor. Yeah. Goes at it. But how just crazy. come on so strong. Like, you, you have back-to-back -back wins on the Challenger Series, and then you... you easily qualify for the CT and then you just get kind of bashed in your first few events, you know, you get a, a bit of a wake up call. So this has been a great result here for Cole and, you know, I'm really looking forward to see what he brings in this heat as Kanoa flies down the line. Yeah, really nice hit there. Always with that, that pinpoint timing, that fin throw, such a reliable move for him. And even when this wave gets all tricky and it has bumps all through it, he just manages to find a way through it and smooths things out. Another solid finish from him. Igarashi, 26 years of age, from Huntington Beach, but represents Japan. Got them a silver medal and will be representing Japan again in Tahiti this year. And he's had some big moments there, so he'll be well and truly primed to, to go one better. 
Man, this high tide is just wreaking havoc on these wave faces. It is so wobbly. It's like South Curly out there at the moment. <laughs> nice big snap off the top, though. Uh, and as you say, he, he irons it out, doesn't he? Just uh, flies down the line. I mean, this is such a hard wave to surf. Like, what he's been able to do on it is pretty remarkable. But uh, again, it's, it's just sort of a wave that won't put him in a really safe position in this heat just yet. I'm sure he's happy just to, to finish another one off at this point, though. 17 and a half minutes to go. Igarashi waiting on another number to drop here. Let's check in with last year's Bells champion, Laura, through to the quarters once again. Yes, Ethan Ewing putting on an absolute performance then. We've had some slow heats today, but you came out of the gates firing with the highest wave score of the day and the heat total. What was your approach heading into it? Because, damn, you made it look fun. <laughs> yeah, it was actually really fun, but uh, these inconsistent heats and, and days is super hard to, I don't know, it's super nerve-wracking because you just never know how many opportunities you're going to get. And um, I just went into it trying to get a quick start and obviously a good start. and. Yeah, the 8.5 was pretty good to start off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the 8.5 must have felt good. You know, going up against Liam O'Brien, you guys, you know, got some amazing scores on the board. Um, you know, waves last year at this event were quite like this on finals day. Have you changed much up with your equipment because you're looking just on point like you were last year? Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, no, it's pretty much the exact same board, same dimensions. Uh, I think the rail's a little bit different this year. Um, but yeah, Liam's such a good surfer. And uh, on, t on the tour, you kind of there's like guys that you match up against so much, and I feel like that's me and Liam. We've we've already had uh, three heats together this year, so um, yeah, he's such a good surfer and really smart competitor. So it feels good to get one up on him. And it's been a pretty wild day, wild day of competition. You are the only man left remaining with a bell under your belt, I guess I say. <laughs> um, how does that make you feel and how good would it be to go to your into finals day? <laughs> yeah, that would be amazing. Um, but you just never know. I don't know. I'm not sure how the conditions will be. There's um, still a fair few days left. And um, yeah, whatever day they decide to run, I'm, yeah, I'll do my best and try and get another bell. Amazing. We'll see you into finals day. Thank you. Congratulations. Perfect. Thanks, Laura. On you, Laura. <laughs> Unbelievable. And uh, thinking about Ethan uh, Vorno, just one of the great Bell stories, his victory oh, last yeah, year. Of course. This, this, and this Huge. event has so many. Obviously, in its 61st edition, there's going to be a lot. But, you know, that, that was one of the, the more famous victories. Just so cool to win not just a world-class surfing event like Bell's, you know, with all that history and legacy, but have your mum have done it you know, 30 years earlier is just incredible. Yeah, have your mum's name on that perpetual trophy yeah, and yours. And you're on it. Just remarkable. Here goes Kanoa Igarashi. His last wave came through at a 5.07. This wave's giving him the opportunity to open up a little bit. It's got a nice pace to it. And he's just trying to put together some big hits down the line. Loading up. Swings the tail free. Glides across the lip. Maintains control. Gets the finish. And that should do it. Cole Hausman being very patient on the outside. And now he, he makes his move. Great start here. Explodes through that first section. A really well-timed hit on the second. And now loading up. Has he got the speed to find the open face again? You know he does as he tweaks that tail and sends spray everywhere. And that is good stuff from the rookie. Oh, I like this. Things have just started to fire here. 14 minutes remaining. Uh, Kanoa, his wave was solid. It was smooth. It had a bit more intent, a little bit more sting to it. But Cole Hausman has really clobbered that first section, and he did so well to get that little bonus run through the inside. And you could see the body language again, Ron. He's building. He's building beautifully, actually. We'll have a look at Kanoa's ride first. Uh, again, uh, it was a little flatter on the face than what we saw uh, Cole on, but he's just doing so well and, and just piecing it all together. Yeah, he really is. But, you know, I think what this wave is showing us is his body language is so positive. You know, he's really going at it. Uh, the last few waves he's had have been really similar, flat. But he's able to really, you know, get that tail. Look at the technique there. That is incredible. Rides out of it cleanly. But, yeah, I think Cole's wave just stood up so nicely here. Look at that. That was such a power vert. 
Gets another second hit on it. And this wave did reopen for him. So opportunities on the inside to back up those first two turns. Nice little whip there. Up and over and cracks it again. And look at that. He's having a, he's having a ball out here right now. He's having a hell time. And uh, have a look, Vorno, at just how, how good's the technique in, in getting himself back in front of this wave and getting off good turns without looking like he's chasing the mm. open face. Perfect timing. Yep. Really good. I love this bottom turn. Wow. And this is, uh, he just clicks this thing in the perfect spot. Hammers the coping. And yeah, this is what you're talking about. Doesn't look too desperate. Just comes around that section. Nice little up and over speed float. And again, throws it up. Big sprays he throws, doesn't he? And when the board's zipping up and down like that, the vertical nature of it, I mean... Kanoa just hasn't had a wave that's bowled out like that yet. I think he likes it. He loves it. Yeah, that's a, a good feeling, especially just uh, remaining patient when Kanoa's sort of hunting around on the inside, trying to, you know, gather momentum. So uh, expecting a good number for Cole here, waiting for it to drop, but a 6.4 for Igarashi. The requirement, 6.53 for the rookie. Big unit, but you, you just... You don't see it, any surfing. No. Uh, much like uh, Ramsey, bookie him. Mm. You, know, you just, you don't really, they're just so good, even in smaller conditions. Yeah, the way he's able to sort of constantly get up and over the lip is what's really impressive about his surfing. He never looks wow. heavy on the wave. Oh, look at this number that's dropped in. 8.67, and Cole jumps up into the lead. Igarajin now looking for a 7.98. There is just on 11 minutes remaining here. We're going to take a Bonsoi brew break back in just a moment. Welcome back. Winky Pop providing today. Let's have a look at the Oakberry Surf Conditions Report. The swell coming in in the four to six foot range. Beautiful winds at the moment. There is a bit of texture out there, Vorno. That tide's filled in quite a mm. bit, but 
it's still providing uh, some opportunity for some pretty decent rides. One excellent ride, in fact, an 8.67 for Cole just before the break. He's in front. That's uh, been the biggest difference, really, in this heat. It's not like Canoa's having a shocker by any means. He's ripped these waves to pieces, but his waves have just been a little flatter. And when Cole got that one that just cupped out, it was a doots fest. He just went <laughs> whack, whack all the way through onto the inside and some big tail releases. And this will be the replay. And uh, this first turn is just far out. So cool. And the combo, you know, judges just gobble that up like it's an oak berry, mate. An oak berry bowl. And he, he just, uh, you know, got right through onto the inside. And it was just power, you know, he was able to really bring the power game to that wave. Just a steeper face, it'll always give you a platform to really attack. That power is, uh, you know, not that Kanoa Igarashi doesn't possess some, some serious clout of his own, but it, that real thumping backhand approach here for, from Cole gives him an opportunity to set, a, set himself apart from that nice fin release and slicing carving uh, approach of, of Kanoa. The judges absolutely dying down on it. That transition was silky. Oh, so nice. And it, yeah, it is a kind of one of the, the the advantages to be on the backhand. If you can square it up, time it right, you're going to really send a big old spray into the heavens, and that's what uh, Cole's done so well on this wave. Been some iconic, goofy-footed performances here oh, over the yeah. years, Vaughn, uh, but the goofs have some work to do to catch up to, to the regular footers. It, in all those years, the last 60 years, there's only been seven goofy-footed winners uh, versus the 53 regulars. So, uh, yeah, Cole's got a big opportunity here to join some pretty esteemed company. Yeah, well, uh, I know there's one name on there that everyone's probably looking at as the uh, benchmark for backhand surfing at Bills. That would be Mark Ocalupo, 98 champ. 25 years since he won his world title. And I believe it's 25 years since uh, the documentary, his uh, classic Jack McCoy biopic came out. That's right, yeah, they're touring, Jack McCoy's touring that uh, around the country. First time ever on the big screen. I think that's all kicking off uh, end of the month and then into May. So uh, go to jackmccoy.com and have a look at where you can catch that screening. Oh, Often's going to be turning up at those. But yeah, just thinking back to some of the more recent Goofy Footed champs. Matty Wilkinson had a huge breakthrough win here back in 2016. Italo 2018 had his first CT victory here at Bells. Um, other than those two, the great Barton Lynch, Damien Hardman rung the bell a couple of times mm. here, and Tom Carroll uh, had that amazing performance in 86, which is like really a, a famous year down here at Bells, isn't it? It really is, yeah. That was uh, the great heat between uh, the Goliath goof and the smooth regular footer, Karen and Oki, one of the all-time fa famous heats in pro surfing history. Yeah, that one was in the semis, as we see. Igarashi now going after the number he needs, 7.98. It's what he's chasing with five minutes to go. We don't think he'll get too many more opportunities at it with just a, a lack of frequency in those quality set ways today. So... Put it all on the line there with that final move and didn't make it stick. It's going to be hard now. With Cole assuming that priority on the outside, he'll dictate terms. He'll have that level of control going into the final four and a half minutes here. Wow, that was gnarly, that wave. It was so down the line, so speedy, but the, oh. the coping just wouldn't appear. Canola just hunting, hunting for some sort of section. How about this, Ronnie? <laughs> Wow, this is a massive moment for Cola Pinto. <laughs> oh, the Cola Pinto family. The dad Mitch, Mum Camille, they're down there. Yep. They're watching this one unfold. We got brothers hitting the lineup. This is like this is the moment, isn't it? This is a dream come true. Like I mean to have both these guys on tour is one thing. To be pulling on the rashy at Bells against each other, it's gonna be so funny. I can't I, well funny. Fun and funny probably. I feel like but it's I do like for the, uh, the little bro. You reckon the little bro? No chance, mate. <laughs> no chance. Well, it's going to be a good one to call. That's for sure. Looking forward to it. But at the moment, a bit of hustle here. Kanoa Igarashi on the cell. And Cole says, no worries. I'm buying. And races through those first couple of sections. Ooh. But sees a bit of rust down the Ooh. line. And sold a, a bomb. And now on the outside, Igarashi 
will get his chance. Big open face here. Couple of clean hits. Swings the reverse and he'll ride on out. 7.98 is the, the requirement. Far out. Tense. I thought for a second there that uh, Carl's worst nightmare might have come to life. Uh, he looks so fast coming off that first float. And usually if you've got all that speed, you rip into some sort of big major frontside car, but it looks like he had to cut it short slightly. Now he just bashed that lip into the air rev. Wow. Really good surfing. And uh, here it is, just, oh man, that was just a speed check. The air is super impressive. He hits it late. Technique is awesome. Feet slide up towards the nose of the board. Fins grab, he pulls it around. It's a major turn. And uh, he's looking up there towards the judges. Ooh. Personally, I just don't know if there's enough there. I mean, I could be wrong. It's a bigger wave. He's got that on his side. But it was kind of reeling off pretty quickly. So he had to sort of maintain that down the line approach. Did really well to get two hits in as we get to the GWM. Two minute warning. And, you know, just did so well to project off a, a tricky section and yeah. get the rotation. But when you, you break down the air and have a look at how much he rotated, how much height there was. Oh, I, have, I think I have to agree with you, and the judges do too. 7.33, not enough to turn yeah. the heat. Minute and a half remaining here. It was a pure emotional reaction for me. I just, I was watching it going, no, that's not, that's not a clean eight. And um, yeah, I, I, as good as that wave was, and as fast as he surfed it, and as critical as that last turn was, just missed that little bit of extra firepower. I think a big old wrap somewhere in there would have been the, the turn, especially off those floats. You know, when you you fang off the lip and you just come off the bottom and it's just sitting there for you and you can pretty much do anything. But that one just crumbled a bit. Yeah, if you're gonna, if you're gonna bust into that excellent range with a, a big individual turn, it, it has to be the, the, one of the better versions of that move that mm. you've seen probably not just in this event, but maybe all year. And uh, it maybe wasn't that, even though it was super strong. So Cole on the outside with priority, holding the lead against one of the top rated surfers at this current moment. And Jake Patterson throwing his arms up. Igarashi is going to take this insider. And now he will have to do something truly amazing to get the, the number he needs. Loading up, has the speed. Will he get the ramp down the line? Stepping on it, just praying that this thing stands up. Look how fast he's going. Speed Holy float there. Smokes. Drives up over the foam. Here's the ramp, it's just a small one oh, and he knows it. What a bummer. Nothing in it. And Kano Igarashi looks so switched on in this event, but just couldn't find it in this heat. And Cole is on his way to his best result in a championship tour event. He's into the quarterfinals as he looks to elevate his position above the cut line here at stop number four. Far out. How's the load up then from Canoa? It looked like sparks were flying off his tail. And just uh, <laughs> no section. And uh, he'll be frustrated. But a big story here now as Cole continues. He didn't have the greatest start to the year, Ron, but he's found something here at Bell's. And he huge. seems to be enjoying Winky as well. Yeah, a huge day for Cole Houchman. And he has stood up in a big way. He's moving through to the quarterfinals. Do not go anywhere because after the break, the brothers will go to battle, not just in the booth, but out in the lineup. Griffin Cole Pinto takes on his little brother, Crosby.
shot, huh? <laughs> Crosby Cola Pinto will have the matchup with his big brother Griffin. To have our first heat on tour together, this would be a good time for it. We both want to beat each other. I think we're both going to go hard at it. How fun is this going to be? The first head-to-head -head heat at the championship tour level for Griffin and Crosby Cola Pinto. Separated by a couple of years, Griff, the older bro, sitting number one on the rankings at the moment. Crosby making his charge up the ranks here at the Rip Curl Pro Bells Beach. Presented by Bonsoy in the booth for the call. Ronnie and Vaughan Blakey. I'm sensing a little brother victory for good reason. <laughs> Mitch and Camille watching on. Mum and Dad. What a, you know, what a proud, proud team they must be, but uh, also just a, an interesting one. Oh, yeah, this is a, this is a incredible moment for uh, the whole family oh, here. Look, yeah. Yeah, is on. Straight into it. Yeah, big brother just turning the screw here. Probably a slight crow peck as they go under that wave, I reckon. <laughs> well, here we go. It's Griff who makes the first move. Oh, and look at this. He gets nothing out of it, just a 1.17. And uh, little bro has stolen priority. Like it's the last cutlet on the table at a barbecue. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Here we go, on the outside now. It's actually Griffin sitting deeper. And he's gonna have to surrender his prior, uh, pro surrender to the man with priority, his younger bro. And let's see what Crosby can do with this. Can he put a good number up to get things started? Trying to hang on for a rotation. And it's going to be uh, low numbers for both competitors to kick off the exchange here. Yeah, this is a classic brother wrestle at the start of this one. No uh, real impressive scores on the board yet. Couple of falls, but plenty of attitude as they get in each other's faces. Let's see who's going to drop the first big number here. Nice turn there from Griffin. Pushing hard, swinging the tail to the point of release, loading up on the inside. Makes a habit of going to that rotation on his finishing turns, but no ramp served up there. So yet another low scoring way. I think we're going to have to wait to settle into this heat a little bit, Vaughn. It feels like there's going to be some nerve, nervous energy from both, both brothers out there. Yeah, well, uh, I don't, uh, you know, it's funny, I'm thinking about uh, Crosby in this heat. He's looking over and he's not seeing a, a gold jersey. He's not seeing the world number one. He's just seeing Big Bro and he just wants to take him down. So uh, this is going to be unreal fun. I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. And as you say, it's just been a little bit sort of messy at the start here. But early on, what man. happens when brothers get together is oh, always mate. a mess. Exactly. Well, early on, uh, once he graduated to the the CT and you know doing doing some media in the lead up to the the first event on the schedule this year uh, Crosby was asked what he's most looking forward to and he said I, I just I can't wait to my first heat with Griff and um, you know it, it just shows that little bro is hungry that he wants it that he's keen to go for it and uh, if we just lean back on some of our childhood oh here we go kind of battles yeah uh, not so much in, in heats but just straight up fist fights <laughs> uh, you were always pretty kind in that you wouldn't punch me in the face that was sort of a, a general yeah I rule found that it you, hard. you took in the heats but I, 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 I didn't have a problem with it no I, you loved punching me in the face but I mean I, the worst I could do to you was like a dead leg or a dead arm or something like that um, but I do remember a, another occasion where you had a brand new hot stuff surfboard shaped by Gil Glover. I got home from school, it was just sitting there in the rack and I thought, ooh, I'm gonna have to have a crack on this thing. This, uh, you weren't home yet, so I took it out for a surf. And oh, I remember the day. <laughs> I came in. Waves were pumping. Waves were cooking. And I came in and um, you were, uh, I don't know, pretty sheepish, not really like saying anything about it. And uh, that night, you know, we're sitting there at the table and you went, hey, I got a secret. Don't tell mum, though. No. you got to promise not to tell mum. And I was going, what is it? What's your secret? And you're like, oh, well, you know how you uh, took that board out? My board? We'll come back yeah. to that. Oh, yeah, look, okay. Yeah, well, uh, you go, you take me down to my board in the rack 
where it had been waiting, sitting by itself, and it was full of chisel holes. He's just got a hammer and a chisel and just Not one of my back of moments. Oh, mate. <laughs> but I, I did make you promise that you wouldn't tell mum, and as soon as you saw it, you just went, ah! <laughs> It's Ronnie true. wrecked my board. But, um, oh. mate, no, you deserved it. Yeah, and, thanks, uh, mate. your board was a piece anyway. I did you a favour. Anyway. Uh, Had those uh, Liam McNamara sort of channels in the bottom after that design. The, the, the point is, I, I think, little brothers, even in a, a loving uh, brother, brotherly relationship like Griffin and Crosby have, um, you know, there is a, a burning desire, a competitive desire there to, to get one back because you do dish out a, a lot of crow pecks and just mental abuse to your uh, younger siblings yeah. in your childhood. So let's uh, see. Let's right. see if Crosby can get one back here. He, he's got priority. No number on the board yet that's uh, of any consequence but when we think about siblings on tour there's been plenty in the past and this is one of the most unbelievable duos right here uh, mike and derek ho flavio neko paderats yep. of course on oh, tour at the same time two? competing oh the all-time bruce and andy combo on tour cj and damien hobgood cj getting the world title in 2001 shay and corey tanner and patrick gadowskis far out how cool. Owen and Mikey, of course. And at the moment, we do have Miguel and Samuel Pupo and, of course, Crosby and Griffin Colapinto. And it's a, it's been awesome to watch. You know, uh, so interesting, too, just thinking about the rights. They also had Tyler on tour at yeah. the same time, which was really cool. So cool. And, um, yeah, big shout-out to everyone who's watching, all the brothers, all the sisters. And oh. a big turn here from Griffin. Hang on. Big Brother's starting to throw some serious punches here. And that is going to be a keeper score. Griffin's looked really measured on his road through the contest so far. He's had some big numbers, definitely had some sections that he's just gone into with so much speed and let go of some really polished turns. But he's definitely ramping things up here. And that was a, an aggressive approach and really throwing some risk at that ride, Vaughan. Yeah, this is the, uh, the wave he's been waiting for. And he flies down the line. First turn, good little board slide. Loads up here, hammers a big Larry. Dropped his wallet way back. And just a really high impact turn. I think the judges are going to love this. It's been a, a bit of a slow heat so far, but every single thing thrown at this. And look at that, full disconnect from the back foot. Oh, that's something a little different. It is. So that's, that's going to give the judges quite a bit to consider here. I think I love the, the risk involved. As Griff does really well to, to just stay connected to his equipment there, staying nice and low. 7.17 for Griffin. As Crosby now loads up on the outside, has some speed. Got a, a, to the section a little late. Couldn't really get the pop that he was looking for off that section. Oh, 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 I like where this heat's going. Bit more risk. These two uh, are willing to, to throw it out there. I look forward to the back half of this heat, but right now let's check in with Cole Houshman. He's with Laura, he's into the quarterfinals. Yes, Cole, every event this year you have just built and built, starting with that 33rd into the 17th, 9th, and now you have found yourself in the finals day, the Rukel Pro Bells. How are you feeling? Yeah, it feels really good. It's um, it's kind of been a bucket list for me. Uh, I kind of had a really slow start to the year, um, just kind of finding my groove and stuff, and each event's been better. I guess I'm a slow builder. so. <laughs> Yeah, just stoked and happy with that heat, but yeah, a lot of fun. This event is so important for you. You uh, were down pretty far in the rankings at the start of the event. You have jumped up on the live rankings to 20th in the world. So how does that, that sound? Uh, it sounds good, but it sounds too close to the cut for me. <laughs> so I guess I got to make a few more heats. But um, yeah, no, I'm just trying to, um, at this point, it's like just try to go all the way now, you know, not think too much about rankings or uh, scores and whatnot and just go surf. So. And talk us through that heat. That was an amazing one with you and Kanoa. An 867, high score of the day, actually. But you were just saying it felt good to finally be able to just do the surfing you want to show. Yeah, that wave, um, I kind of had a slow start to the heat, almost a few mistakes. And then I passed up two waves in that set. And the third one, luckily, was just super clean. I kind of knew right away. It's like I got two turns done pretty well out the back. And then after that, you just kind of 
stop thinking and just kind of lets you freeze up, free up. And yeah, it was fun. It just, the wave went on forever. I was like, I was stoked on it. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, pack your bag. You're going to have a big day for finals day when it runs. Enjoy it. Thank you. Any, anyone you want to say hi to at home? Um, yeah, parents watching at home, mom, sister, my girlfriend, Michaela. And yeah, thanks to all the crew at home supporting. Awesome. We'll see you tomorrow if it runs. Thanks. Yeah. And there's plenty of them over there in St. Clemente. A big shout out to everyone tuned in and watching on. Cole's uh, done himself a, a solid here, jumping up six spots. It's a massive climb. But uh, as he said, you know, uh, 20th, really good, much better than where he was sitting. Um, but at the same time, a little too close to the cut line. So he wants to keep rolling here and now shifting his focus for him and he's able to do that into the, the quarters, starting to dream about maybe standing on stage at the end of this comp and giving that bell a mighty ring. Oh, that would be uh, an awesome experience. Wonderful achievement for Cole. I actually just noticed there he's, he's settled down a little bit in his post heat interviews. He was so frothing to just finally get through those early rounds. And now that he's into a finals day, he's, uh, he's just, just toned it down a bit just wants to keep his energy low and, and save it all for the, the big one. 21 and a half minutes remaining here. The current world number one out in front at this stage. 7.17. It's, it's the only real score out there at the moment. Crosby's had a couple of shots at it and uh, hasn't been able to bust out of the two-point range. He is out there with priority as we have a look at, at Griff's wave once again. Yeah, he just hammers this thing. I mean, <laughs> this this little frame grab is pretty incredible, but this here, I mean, this could have gone anywhere really, but he just has that technique where he's able to get back over his front leg, mm. pulls it in, rides out 7.17. Yeah, really impressive stuff, great control and really held on with everything he had to get the finish there. 20 and a half minutes to go here in the battle between the two brothers. We'll see who can get the win and move on through to the quarterfinals right after this. We are gathered here at Jirak. Jirak is the traditional name of Bells Beach. It truly feels like the backbone of surfing. It's been there before any other event on the calendar and it's still going. You have an opportunity to go and paint the most amazing picture for the fans on the hill. And there's so much history behind this wave. There's so many great performances, so many you know, past champions and greats in our sport that have, that have won in this event. It's the one trophy that's lasted throughout time, that, that bell, everyone wants a bell. Honestly, it's the only trophy I want. It's the only trophy I want to win. Knowing that every great has come through, it's what everyone fights for, what everyone dreams about. For me, it starts at the stairs. You walk down the stairs and you look at all the names of the people that were lucky enough to ring the bell.
Congratulations to Rip Curl, 50 years supporting this incredible event. And uh, it's going to continue as we take a trip on the Melbourne flight cam. And you can see our competitors sitting there at the takeoff zone here at Winky. And it is Crosby Cola Pinto out there with priority at the moment. And just staying right there, almost inside his jersey, just letting him know that he's uh, got the heat lead at the moment is Griffin. Paddling past him, going deep on the point here. We'll see if, if Crosby can get himself back in this heat. 17 minutes to go, plenty of time for these competitors. Fun looking at all the, the amazing uh, siblings who've competed together on the championship mm. tour of all. Now, who, who do you think had the most intense rivalries? Yeah, it's a good question because uh, some brothers are, are really, you know, close friends and super supportive. I'm thinking like of Owen and Mikey, for example, you know, they're, they're just so backing each other in any scenario. And then you had these other brothers that were really intense. Now, didn't love each other any less, of course, but just... Andy and Bruce spring to mind as two brothers who even in that classic old footage of them, you know, they're slinging surfboards at each other. There was always this intensity between uh, what they were doing and where they were surfing. And in both cases, it elevates your level of performance. But when it comes to a rashi, uh, putting on the rashi, it can also elevate the intensity and amplify it between that competitiveness that you have. Uh, the Bruce and Andy final in France, I think it was in the Bruce movie years and years ago, that was just one of the all-time great brother matchups, like in a final of a CT and, um, you know, kind of different surfers, but in a lot of ways the same. But Andy just, there was no way he was going to let Bruce win that. <laughs> there was no chance. No. And, uh, yeah, Bruce, when he won the Eddie, famously had a black eye. Yeah. When he hoisted the uh, the trophy, which Andy had dished up. That's, uh, it's just amazing, isn't it? Yeah, there's all sorts of different relationships there, but, uh, I mean, there's no bond like it either. No. Nah. Well, you know. Love you, mate. Love you, mate. <laughs> well, these guys are super supportive of one another. They and, are, um, yeah. Big time. Yeah, you, you even saw in, in that kind of hype reel before we, we got this heat underway uh, in the earlier rounds, you know, Griff sending Crosby out into the lineup with, you know, a lot of love and just wishing him all the best. He's had a pretty good run yeah. on uh, in his rookie season. I love you, Crosby. Here, have a 7.17. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, Crosby uh, and and Griff, it felt like we're destined to surf a final against each other over in Portugal. Um, but Ethan Ewing changed that, um, and Crosby ended up leaving with a third. But it saw him make an important jump up the ratings before getting to Oz uh, with the impending cut looming. So he's relieved a bit of pressure, and if he can survive this heat, he's going to be styling. As we see Griff on the inside here, kind of a sleepy looking ride to kick things off and he's over it. Trying to better a 3.9 to increase his lead here at the moment. That way he's not going to do it. But uh, he would be asking a, a lot of questions of Crosby who's sitting out there. Acting pretty staunch at the moment, holding that priority, waiting for his shot at it. It's uh, it's. A different heat for Crosby. All through this event, he's just looked so free. Uh, he looks like he's been having a lot of fun. He's been catching lots of waves, and, and his performances have lifted with every uh, heat that he's progressed through. This one's a bit trickier. This is a bit of a grind for Cross, so it's going to be interesting to see how he, he manages to turn this thing around. Forget the competitive yeah. uh, experience. Uh, obviously, Griff's got a real edge there, and, and just knowing this break probably a little better than Crosby. But talk to me about just like where Crosby surfing is at and how it stacks up against these big bro. Oh, good question, Ronnie. Um, Crosby, like just in his sort of career arc, he has kept right on Griff's heels in a lot of ways. You know, as you say, doesn't have the same experience on tour, but has put in massive performances over in Hawaii. You know, like. Every single season, he was just stepping it up, riding huge, big, thundering pits, really packing it. And, um, yeah, I, I think he's just kind of followed in that slipstream uh, of belief because Griffin uh, is obviously a great mentor and role model for him and has showed the way. But in his own right, he's done some pretty incredible stuff, Crosby. So I think he'll be like here going, yeah, I'm not just little bro. I've, I've got my own stuff going on as well. Yeah, he's had some incredible performances on the North Shore. Uh, Insane. A uh, couple of backdoor waves just. Oh. He charges. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I'm not going to uh, name the people, but just having just communicated with a bunch of the coaches even and talked to them about where they see 
uh, these two go and they say, I, I think Crosby has the serious potential to be better than Griffin, uh, which is interesting. It's, you know, it doesn't matter until Crosby starts achieving those big results and getting himself up into that world title conversation too. But he's young, he's, he's a little bit taller, seems to have like a really nice leverage through his forehand calves and you can see it, but... You know, we're, we're going to be the benefactors of these two and this rivalry growing over the next few years. Twelve and a half minutes to go here. And Griff just still hunting for something to better this 3.9 at the moment. And just put the squeeze, the anaconda squeeze on his little bro here who's <laughs> sitting out there with priority. What a great moment. I feel, like, I feel like everyone has just been so pumped to watch this heat go down, and we've just had a bit of a lacklustre, you know, pulse. There's just been not a whole lot out here for these guys. And, you know, at the very start, it was fireworks. There was a paddle battle. There was a couple of wave choices that both these guys wouldn't normally go. There was just that little bit of energy saying, you know, just, I want to get up over this guy, and it just hasn't really provided much of a platform at the moment. But neither kicked a goal in those opening exchanges. Nah. So, uh, you know, they missed an opportunity for a score uh, at the uh, at the early stages of this heat and maybe pushed each other a bit too deep with that paddle battle. But Griff made up for it. That, the wave he took, it wasn't a long ride. It wasn't a quality wave out here by even today's standards. But, you know, you throw that kind of risk at it and you, you're going to get rewarded. And you've got the, the 717. It's a huge advantage now as we get down to the 11-minute mark. Let's dive into a, a recap of what's unfolded so far here. We knew we were going to see a, a great little battle, especially for that inside position. All smiles before they hit the lineup. Yep. No toss under the coin there, just <laughs> going at it. And straight into it, all over each other. Yeah, so Griff got uh, the first wave. First couple of waves, there wasn't a whole lot on it. Big snap to slide to uh, kick this thing off. I believe this might have been the uh, 3.9, Ronnie. Yeah, that's right. Just a, a low number. Then he found this one. Not a whole lot of wall to work with, but he made it count. Yeah, nice big board slide to kick it off. And then pow! And a, a big blow tail there from Griffin Colapinto. And really, that was the uh, only moment of, of authority we've seen in this heat. Crosby's going to want to really get a wave soon because just the, the way this heat's going with Griff holding on to that 717, he's, he's going to need a couple of rides here because Crosby's falling a, a little behind as Griff gets busy on the inside now. Looking to replace this 3.9, chipping away at this one. And it's a, definitely not the best surfing he can do. He's capable of so much more, but he's been really smart with his decision-making on his road through to this point in the competition, and that hasn't changed there. He's just sort of taking any opportunity that comes his way to try and get rid of that 3.9. He's surfed twice as many waves as Crosby in this one. And, yeah, I agree, Ronnie. Crosby must be sitting out there going, come on. <laughs> What's going on? Don't uh, write him off just yet, though. Earlier on, we saw uh, Samuel Pupo against Matty McGilvray. Sammy just looks so on, but that with those mid-range scores, it, the door was still kind of open. And with a thumper set, Matty McGilvray was able to turn the heat in the final stages. So, oh, that was awesome. But hanging on to a 2.67 is not going to work in his favour. He's, he's got to get two rides. Yeah, and you think this is definitely going further north than 3.9. Couple of nice cutties, little foam climb, little punctuation on the end. What do you think? I think it's just easy to, um, you know, keep hunting for, for opportunities on the inside without priority. I don't think Crosby at, at this stage of the game can do anything but wait for a set because mm. the, the heat's over if he goes anything smaller and leaves Griffin out the back. What do you reckon they're talking about? I don't think they're saying a whole lot to each other at the moment. 4.5. So the requirement grows now for Crosby. And it gets a little harder to turn this one around with a single wave. Looking for a nine-point ride at the moment. Still with eight minutes on the clock. Has time to break it. Break it down with two rides. A spot in the quarters. Up for grabs here. 
And the winner of this one will take on either Baron Mamiya or Jake Marshall. Still some big clashes coming your way this afternoon. Heat 7, Kate Matson, Yago Dora. And to finish off the day and the round will be Rio Aida up against Kyle Belly. There's been a, a few heats today where just a competitors found themselves in, in Crosby's situation and, and waited, you know, about up to 15 minutes for a, a real opportunity. Yeah, 4.5 for that last wave of Griffin, so that makes the requirement a blue. 9 now for Cros. So Blue currently need a 9.0. Jake Marshall, and and have enjoyed watching him surf through this contest. Looking really sharp. What yeah, a magic roll. Definitely another one of those guys who just seems to be enjoying his surfing. I think similar to sort of what we've seen from Morgan Sibley in this event. Just no weight. He just looks like he's cruising. And, uh, you know, I think a, a, another good result here. He's, he's going to really put himself in a safe space. Oh, yeah, it's going to be sweet. So just under seven minutes to go, Vaughan uh, Griffin. You know, he's obviously blown our minds with his performances in the Rashi uh, in recent times, but you uh, hosted the premiere of uh, the new trilogy movie just before the event kicked off. Oh, it was so cool. Absolute masterpiece. Uh, the cinematography in it on a whole nother level. Like I was watching, uh, there, there were times where I was watching the surfing and I was thinking, it, uh, I didn't know I was watching a surf movie, if that makes sense. Like you, you kind of zoomed in, you're, you're panning around it, like just world-class vision there and uh, a wonderful film a less surf action film like the original trilogy and a bit more of a, of a story like a documentary style film where we get to find out a little bit about these guys where they come from what crafted them as surfers and athletes and yeah it's fantastic and those guys are really on their way to being the new trilogy you know um the original film with andy irons taj burrow joel parkinson it came out when they were at the very peak of their powers uh Andy already had the three world titles. TB was a superstar in and out of the Rashi. And Joel was on his way to his maiden world title. It was uh, around about 2009 it came out. So, you know, Joel was just ripping uh, in the lead up to that year. Uh, but these guys, you know, it's a slightly different thing. They're, they're kind of earmarked. Could have been anything. And, um, yeah, now uh, by the time sort of the f filming started on that project and now they have become those guys so uh, you know at yeah. the top of the game griffin in the yellow jersey ethan number two in the world last year it's it's unreal to uh, see their stories definitely uh worth checking out five minutes remaining now griffin with the real advantage as the the clock winds down and you can just feel the pressure starting to build on crosby now chasing a huge number Hoping for a, a sizey set wave so he can flex a, a bit of that leverage. That big frame swinging into some huge turns and get himself a good score to chip away at the, the requirement here. Far out. It's been a tough heat for both surfers, I feel. I, I think they both would have loved to have just gone out here and gone at it. Uh, Griffin has managed it well, though, hasn't he? He's managed it like a world number one. He's hustled when he's needed to hustle. When he got his opportunity, he threw the hammer. So he's, he's really built a pretty well-constructed heat here. But I think even he'd be frustrated. He would have loved to have just gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with the, the little bro. Mate, uh, yeah, he's made a, a point of sort of talking about how he likes to let go of expectations and just live in the moment, Griff. And uh, I think Crosby sort of followed him down that, that path. Both of these guys getting away and doing a big meditation retreat earlier in the year with Dr. Joe Dispenza over in Florida. Mm. And uh, just in a, a week, they did 35 hours of meditation. So they went deep, Vorno. That is really deep. I mean, you, you're way down the rabbit hole. Yeah, you'd be seeing some magic stuff, I reckon, meditating with that much focus for that period of time. Well, it's a, a win-win situation for the Cola Pinto family who are, are down here loving their time in Victoria and witnessing this moment where they see their uh, their boys go at it in a championship tour heat for a spot in the quarterfinals at the longest running surf event on the championship tour schedule in its 61st year. The remaining competitors 
with a huge goal to etch their name into the most iconic trophy in surfing. What's your favourite, Bill? Victory. Oh, man. I really enjoyed Ockies just because it was like my first trip to Bells, watching the event unfold. That was a special one, but I loved last year. It was amazing. It was so awesome. And uh, yeah, I always go back to the 2012 final with Mick and Kelly. Just an, an amazing performance and just the, just the absolute vibe and atmosphere around uh, the passing of MP and Michael Peterson, who, who'd won the event multiple times, and just uh, the big standing ovation that MP got just before the final kicked off was awesome. Yeah, Stephanie Gilmore in 2018 put on a show oh. as well. Yeah, they're all good. Absolutely love that. There's the it's GWM the two minute warning, Vorna. Time's winding down. He might have to do it in one wave here, Crosby. It's going to have to be the wave of the event, pretty much. A nine point ride. I don't think we've seen a nine yet. And uh, it's far out, mate. This canvas has been kind of torn to shreds by this high tide and slight roughly onshore wind. And it's been extremely slow. We've gone from, from hoping he gets the opportunity to break down the requirement in two rides. Now we're just, just begging the ocean to service up a set wave so he can get a shot at it. Certainly got some big moves. We've seen that. We've seen the highlight reels, the free surfing. We've watched him make his way through the Challenger series after a couple of tough runs on the regional QS. And Crosby Cola Pinto certainly arrived with a big semi-final finish over in Portugal, but this is the, the big one that he wanted. This is the heat that he was salivating over, a, a heat with his big brother. And unfortunately, it's been a little wave stuffed. It has. And there's not much we can do about it, but as we say, you know, Griffin, He's one of those surfers, kind of like Ethan. Like, I felt like we kind of got to see a little bit of real Ethan in that last heat. He was so big on the wave face. He looks so powerful and strong. Uh, Griffin still feels like he could just be idling to me. Like, I think he's got a lot more to show us in this in this event, if, uh, which it looks like he will be moving on. Yeah, he's, uh, he's hanging back, just getting ready to hash it out with his little brother here and you can see Crosby's just going oh man yeah I'm sure both of them just wanted yeah. to put on a fantastic show and Crosby just hasn't been able to do that a, a disappointing heat score total for him I, I think early on in the heat um, they they made some mistakes both of them um, but Crosby just cleaned did, it up. didn't get a chance to compete though that's what's that's what's uh, you know unfortunate for Cros in this instance Griffin Cola Pinto though he's going to be hard to stop in, in this event. The world number one still maintaining his position at the top of the rankings as he moves on through the, the quarterfinals. And you just know that you'll see these two meet again at some stage in a championship tour event. But Crosby Colapinto out of the contest. We are going to take a quick break. And when we return, we'll bring in Joey Tapel and Richie Lovett for the call.
The Rip Curl Pro Bells Beach, presented by Bonsoy, is brought to you by Cooper's Brewery, the official beer of WSL Australia. By Boost Mobile, official telecommunication partner of WSL Australia. By Biogland, official vitamin partner of WSL Australia. By GWM, official automotive partner of WSL Australia. And by Mophie, the official portable power bank partner of the Rip Curl Pro Bells Beach, presented by Bonsoy. Mophie, stay powerful. Yeah, all good, all good. Yeah. Better than not having to get together. Exactly. Griffin Colapinto, quick chat to his dad. You can definitely hear them just hoping for more waves, a bigger battle. But Griffin happy to take the win, 11.67 total into the quarterfinals as he works his way over to his younger brother, Cross. Crosby Colapinto disappointed as he really wanted to go toe to toe with his big bro, just a four, six, seven combined total. Jake Marshall getting started. How about that reverse? His stance so forward on that sharp eye and able to pull it off. His confidence has been through the roof this week. He's enjoying his time as a pro surfer on tour. You can just tell he's just his rhythms there. He's been winning and he's got his first heat on the CT against a, a good friend of his, Baron Mamiya. Joe Trapel with Richie Lovett for the call. Richie, Baron versus Jake. Uh, who has the edge here? Uh, well, in current form, I'm going to say Jake Marshall has the edge. He's he's uh, really surfed his way into form this season. He's looking really sharp. Obviously, equipment is uh, playing a big part in that, feeling very confident on his boards. But he, he just seems to have sharpened up his approach a little bit, Joe. And, uh, well, Baron, uh, he's been surfing well uh, in, in the early heats, but just not quite as on point as Jake. So I'm just going to give the nod to Jake in this one. But, um, you know, he's obviously seen what happened in the last heat too and went, you know what, I'm going to get busy real quick, even if it's on a couple of these little inside runners. Clicks with that turn and up again. So this is that four-point ride. You can see it's a much smaller way, but uh, Jake does some great surfing. And if he'd completed that final manoeuvre, perhaps would have uh, got a mid-range score up into the fives. Better ride here, though. Streaking down the line, more speed. And uh, a beautiful, uh, throws the reverse, gets the tail free. <laughs> Look at that foot right up near the nose of the board. But uh, the judges will be calling that one as a make. And as often happens, when uh, the ocean goes a little sleepy in one heat, it starts to wake up for the next. Now Baron Mamiya waiting patiently to get started. All the noise has been for Jake Marshall on now two waves. Baron looks at the first, repositions for the next opportunity here. A win takes you to the quarterfinals, so big opportunity for points and moving up the rankings heading into Margaret River. Meanwhile, lower position for the Californian. Jake's getting started. Quick hack to that first section off the bottom. Finn throw, oh. and he's going to slide another reverse around. Wow. Laying low to right out of it. It's such a unique kind of slingshot reverse, and the stance is going so forward. You're almost thinking, oh, he might pearl with all that weight over the center line, but man, he's been pulling it off now, back-to-back -back versions of that throw tail reverse. I think that second one was maybe even better than the first. And just amazing how he's able to ride out of these being positioned so far up on the board. And he's, uh, he's staying busy here. So a third wave. This one stretched out. Baron couldn't get it. So Jake went, yep, I'll take it. Hits the first section, then the second, just a real creative sort of whiplash reverse there. Hits this lip perfectly, and then watch the rotation here. Gets almost inverted, tail super high. Look at that back foot, nowhere even near the tail pad. And then as, he, as the board comes around under him, he is way up on the board here. That front foot almost like six inches, maybe 12 inches off the nose. Very, very difficult skimboarding. The fin's really not even engaging with the wave face at this point. 
but he gets the make. Wow. Degree of difficulty, extremely high on that final maneuver. And your stance moving so forward, that made that so radical. The back end of his board flying free above the lip. And he basically had three chances of that. He fell on the first, second one got better, third one even bigger. Just having a better positioning with Baron sitting pretty far out the back with priority. Jake Marshall, quarterfinals over at Sunset Beach. And he was able to feel that same feeling at the last stop in Portugal. Ended up losing to Crosby Colapinto. But he wants to, to match that result here at Bells, continue making the final series. And gosh, his rhythm is just really enjoyable to watch. Four, then to a 5-5, five, five, then to a 6.5 before Barron's caught a wave. And a pressure applied to Barrett Mamiya. Already looking at his watch, knowing what happened in that previous heat. Totally wave starved from Crosby. The Griffin, the champ, just being able to uh, manifest some scores on some inside waves. And that one wave in particular. And Jake's followed suit here. Just understanding that those big final exclamation point maneuvers really coming into play here. So we're getting close to a higher tide. Jake, man, this guy is most improved uh, over the last season. He has really started to come uh, onto the scene here and make a name for himself on the championship tour. Baron Mamiya starting to move down the line a bit, potentially taking this wave. He will catch up to it on his opener against Jake Marshall. Covering some ground, little speed jam to get around the corner, attacking the whitewater again. Looking for the wall to work with. Throws the tail towards the beach, but starts with a fall. Advantage Jake Marshall as now we have a chance to talk to Crosby and Griffin with Laura Ennevert. <laughs> yes, guys, I've wrangled both the brothers. Gosh, we really wanted to watch that heat. Watch you both go blow for blow, but the, uh, the wave tap turned off out there, unfortunately. I'm going to cut to the chase, Griff. How much did you want to beat Crosby? Uh, I think Crosby wanted to beat me, me more than I wanted to beat him. <laughs> so, I don't know. But uh, what do you think, Cros? Yeah, Cros. <laughs> I'd say we probably want to beat each other evenly. Like, when we got, first got out there and we got that paddle bow going in the beginning, I was like, okay, like, it's on. You know, screw this guy. But, but uh, I walked away with two twos, so, yeah, <laughs> that's how it went. <laughs> Yeah, unfortunately, Cross didn't work out for you that heat. But Griff, talk about just having this moment. You guys have waited your whole lives for this, to be here and, and do this in front of your parents and, and everyone around the world. Two Colapinto brothers in the heat. Uh, yeah, how cool is that? Oh, it's amazing. I'm, it's, uh, yeah, it's pretty rad that my parents were able to be here for it. Um, this is the first contest they've come together to like, ever, I think. And so it's pretty rad that Crosby and I ended up matching up. and. You know, unfortunately, the waves went slow, but I think we just hyped it up too hard, and <laughs> that's what happens, you know, so it got to stay even keel always. So, um, yeah, that was a <laughs> tricky heat, but we're still living. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm guessing it's not going to be the first. It's going to be the first of many. What do you reckon? Yeah, I, I hope we can get some more because that, that one kind of left a weird taste in my mouth, but <laughs> hopefully we can get one in some good ways, and that'll be, that'll be more fun. Oh, uh, congratulations to you both, Griffin, into finals day, keeping the ball rolling. Uh, yeah, we'll see you hopefully tomorrow whenever it runs. All right, thanks, Laura. Looking forward to it. Anything you want to say back to anyone still up at home? Uh, yeah, probably the grandparents and everyone in our family. I know they support a bunch. They're always awake for this stuff. And um, yeah, you know, the family, the family name. <laughs> We're able to double, double down on that one. So love you guys. And Crosby had the right rashy on this time too. Yeah. <laughs> All right, guys. Yeah. A little swapsies. Yeah. All right, guys. Back to you for the last few heats of the day. Uh, good hang time, Laura. Thanks so much. Uh, both Cola Pintos hanging there to break it down. You said you could tell that they're just it's it's not finished yet. They are waiting to do that again. They want it to be maxed out, firing the next time they have their names together in a heat. But Griff gets the first one as this brotherly rivalry heat-wise on the CT is just beginning. Yeah, I think they'll both uh, agree that that wasn't an ideal situation and, and given uh, the chance 
uh, you know, Griff, I think, would even say, you know, we'd prefer to go at it in a, in a more even matchup with uh, plenty of opportunity and waves ridden by both the surfers. And uh, it's going to happen. It'll happen again, time and time again. Oh, looking forward to it. McGriffin, number one in the world, uh, just thinking about that position, increasing with more points as he's in the quarters. Keep yourself in tune on the live rankings on WorldSurfLeague.com. Follow Jake and Bear Mamiya in their race for the final five. That's what Jake can really consider now. It's not just about staying on tour, learning the ropes of the top 34. He's just improving so much in front of our eyes and putting together some great heats. What's your take on the separation right now with Jake sitting really high up on the point? Yeah, I don't mind it. He sort of Jake's got free reign of the lineup now just because he has those scores on the board. So he can kind of explore the lineup, maybe uh, hope for, for a random wave to hit right up the top of uh, the upper section here. And Barron sort of uh, just positioned himself in the normal takeoff zone. So, uh, yeah, some good strategy here, and, and I like it, actually, because Jake's probably making uh, Barron question his choices at the moment, thinking, oh, maybe I should be up there where he is. He seems to be in rhythm with the sets, and, and each time there's a wave, he seems to be on it. So, uh, you know, you've got to try and find a way to break that rhythm and, and make sure that you're on the next set. But, uh, well, Jake with priority, too, at this point. So, you know, he's really in control of this heat at the moment. Jake Marshall on the Sharp Eye Surfboard program on a storm model. Six oh and a half. He said he actually didn't bring too many other models. He's been riding Sharp Eyes for a bit now and he just knew the storm works incredibly well. The bells and winky pop. He loves how it feels down the line on a wave. He just feels like it keeps his flow and rail and rail just engaged really effortlessly. And we got to witness that on on all of his rides, just gathering so much speed and really looks connected. Yeah, boards are looking amazing. Uh, that whole Sharp Eye program over the last few years has really come on strong. Marcio Zuvi uh, really connected with all these uh, riders there working, working really closely. Obviously, the relationship with Felipe Toledo uh, sort of spearheading a lot of uh, that interest in those boards and in the brand. And a lot of surfers gravitating now towards the Sharp Eye program. You can see with each uh, with each time the surfers getting on on the program, their boards are looking good. Yeah, and when you've got a big time shaper like Sharp Eye or Channel Islands for Baron, you have options around the world. As we look at Baron Mamiya, he had a 317 for the wave he fell on. Trying to find his flow, looks casual to start. Nice clean hack there with the fins out. Mid face wind up for the reverse, bit forced there. Another wave that he ends incomplete. Yeah, this is a different board too for what uh, Baron rode against uh, Kelly Slater earlier today. Perhaps something a little bit wider given the conditions have deteriorated a little bit, and uh, the the faces of these waves a little full up, a bit more slope in them, not as much cup in the curve. Yeah, Baron's been surfing a lot, surfing a bit of Bell, surfing a bit of Winky Pop, really balancing his time at both the venues. Jake with priority looking to increase his score of a 5-5. Let's see if he can do it here. Nice lip section to glide through. Setting up his second turn and whips that board all the way back to the pocket. Right into another clean forehand hook. Jammed a slide again for the Californian and now looking to just float it shut. but cruising through his points really well. Working with his coach and one of his best friends, Chris Gallagher. And Galley would have been probably reflecting on a lot of memories when he competed at Winky Pop and Bells, had a great career on tour, winning events like Margaret River. So a, a go-to coach for a lot of great advice for this part of the world. Would work with Taylor Knox in the past, uh, the Hobgood brothers. Many, many years of coaching, building boards, and still ripping today. And Baron was coached by Galley that sunset win, which really is one of the big reasons why he's still on tour today. 
as we look at uh, Mamiya's last. Yeah, so Barron gets a, a really long projection floater to start things off. Clicks a little snap and then tries to force that uh, reverse at the end of that wave. Just catches an edge. And further up the point, Jake just with some really great turns here, really whipping it round nice and fast. Just with each one of these snaps off the top, you can see just gets a little fin drip, but able to control it really well. Didn't quite get that finishing manoeuvre that he would like. He would have liked to on that way, but uh, certainly got some good work done outside. So he may even uh, surpass that five and a half. Jake just in such an incredible rhythm, making no mistakes. Baron Mamiya needs to try to take some of the rhythm back here as he will throw a quick snap down the line. Punches out the white water and slides away and the trouble continues for the man who won Pipeline to kick off the year and wore the yellow jersey in one of the most meaningful wins of his lifetime. Called it the best day of his career, beating John John Florence in the final with a perfect 10. And 10s are insane for a lot of reasons, but when Barron says he can't believe he made that way for the amount of barrels he's had at Pipe and Back Door, it's when he calls it one of his best, when he needs it in the final, it's how magical he his performance was that day. Yeah, it's uh, you get those days where everything just seems to happen for you. The waves come your way, you're in perfect rhythm, you're in tune with the ocean, and you feel like you can do no wrong. Your board just feels magical underneath your feet. And that was the day for Baron Mamiya. Had a lot of success in Hawaii, just needs to convert it into these, uh, you know, little point wave style conditions and the beach breaks needs to be able to to uh, show that versatility across all the different locations on the tour. And just having a little trouble here in this heat. Just a number of falls almost. He's fallen off on almost every one of his waves so far, Joe. So needs to tidy that up if he wants to take it to Jake Marshall because st he's st streaking out ahead here. Just dropped a 7.67 on that last wave. Way out in front now. Massive rhythm for Marshall. He builds on every wave so far. A four to a five, five to a six, five to a 7-6-7. Seven, seven. Baron is in a big combination. As we're about at the halfway mark, we're going to take a quick Bon Soy brew break and be right back.
rather go into Melbourne and visit all the regions surrounding the big city. It's a really unique experience. You can travel in just about any direction and find some breathtaking Australian countryside, a lot of awe-inspiring natural wonders and rustic villages. It's a magic place to be looking for wildlife. I saw a koala cross the street once on the Great Ocean Road. I didn't realize how rare that was. That's super rare, man. And You're lucky. Yeah, I got it on video. I'll show you. But it was uh, just, it took my breath away. I couldn't believe I saw a koala one in the wild, but then crossing the street. It made it safely. As we look at Baron throwing down the snap, trying to really force something on a small section. Series of speed floats. He's not given up on this thing yet. And then the throw tail at the end has just not been working for him in this heat. You can see the pressure that he's under. Just a totally different feeling from Jake just doing nothing wrong and, and Baron just really trying to make something happen. But still 12.15 to go and he is famous for major individual moves. Just this wave didn't give it to him. No, it was a much smaller wave on the inside and, and I feel like Baron is just trying to surf into some sort of rhythm here. Streaking down the line, you know, he was after this final section to, to really take to the air. Perhaps he needs to, to go for a different maneuver here, like a big straight air or some sort of mute grab, anything. But that, um, that kind of blow tail reverse just doesn't seem to be working for him at the moment. And uh, in contrast, stark contrast, actually, Jake Marshall. He's been uh, nailing his final uh, maneuvers. And uh, certainly uh, very high risk. It's paying off. He's got some great scores on the board. There seems to be this powerful movement for California on tour, especially when you got the the tour leader from San Clemente and then down the road in that Encinitas region, Seaside Reef. That's where you can find uh, Jake Marshall's hometown. And you think about the, the standouts that he got to grow up watching from Taylor Knox, from Carlsbad that's right next to Encinitas, from uh, Rob Machado who's got a view of all those waves from his house. Rob, uh, runner-up in the world to Kelly Slater. Uh, pretty cool to see Jake kind of represent San Diego as well on tour. And, you know, because it always, all the stats usually lead towards Tom Current, you know, as, as the leader. And sometimes at events, you're seeing multiple wins for California, but sometimes Tom, Tom owns all of them. Another big name from that region, Brad Gerlach. Gurr, former world runner-up, uh, really close to where, uh, you know, Jake grew up is where Gurr grew up as well. I think uh, then uh, Brad moved to Australia for a long time, does a lot of coaching, really works on technique, still rips, still loves to talk surf. So I'm sure Gurr's proud of all the Californians stepping up this year. Absolutely. There's a definite movement happening there. And, uh, well, Jake, is uh, he's found some form, no doubt. I just love the determination and the persistence of this guy just to hang in there, to keep going. He was without sponsor for a little while, reconnected uh, with, the, with his uh, previous sponsor, Hurley. They reignited the relationship. And uh, now the, uh, the kid is, he's off and running. Now 9.40 on the clock. Let's check in with uh, Bailey Ladder's leaderboard with Kaipo. Hey, it's time to check out the Bailey Ladder leaderboard. I'm here on my trusty P150 Bailey Ladder. Let's take a look at the men's quarterfinals, and we got some great quarterfinals coming up. Starting off with two good friends, quarterfinal number one, Morgan Siblick, up against Matthew McGillivray, and then quarterfinal number two, what a great heat here. Defending champ Ethan Ewing will be coming up against the rookie who has been on a roll, Cole Hauschman. Of course, quarterfinal number three, featuring Griffin Colapinto, and and the winner between Baron Mamiya and Jake Marshall. And remember, whether it's step extension or dual purpose, Bailey, Australia's number one ladder, keeps you elevated. Hey, Bo, the final series already stacking up here at the Rip Curl Pro Bells Beach, presented by Bonsoy. Right now, it's looking like Jake Marshall with the rhythm of the ocean and is surfing to make it into the final series. If he does, it'll be in back-to-back -back events. Baron fishing around under priority. These two guys have known each other for a very long time. 
As we see Barron now trying to hustle to get in the seat. I love his intensity to try to make a big comeback here. Can he find a big enough turn? Just kind of still forcing those fins out. And he's still going to be comboed with 8.10 to go. Yeah, just looking a little frustrated, isn't he? And uh, we know he's capable of so much more. And again, just trying to surf into some sort of rhythm here, but he's running out of time. Eight minutes on the clock. Baron needs to uh, find a good wave here because he's in combination land. He needs two good waves from this point. Well, he's better his score, but it hasn't really broken uh, combination for him. So it's back to the drawing board. He needs to figure out how he can wrestle a wave off uh, Jake Marshall, put a decent score on the board, and then do it all over again. Yeah, for Baron, he's one of those athletes that just loves kicking off the whole tour at home. You know, for Pipeline being his pet event, easily one of the best in the world in slabbing powerful, scary conditions. You know, you're looking for him to be the favorite if we move over to the box at Margaret River, that slab where you'd be fearing if you draw Baron Mamiya in elements like that. Absolutely, you know, but uh, this is a tour where you need to be well-rounded, you need to be versatile enough to surf any sort of waves, any type of conditions, and, you know, as good as Baron is in, in those big, heavy, slabbing waves of consequence, you know, you've got to sometimes uh, be able to perform in these kind of, you know, two to three, four foot conditions, a little onshore, a bit softer waves. So, uh, you know, the greats have been able to do it in all conditions, and, and uh, that's where... You know, you maybe sometimes need to go back to the drawing board and go, okay, what do I need to work on? What's my weakness? That's where I need to focus. Yeah, a lot of the greats like uh, Adriano de Souza was just the king of putting himself on the road year round, you know, to just learn the ropes at Bells and then became a champion at Pipeline and then became a champion. I don't know if anyone was, you know, more dedicated or committed to learning. You know, totally. as far as being Absolutely. on tour. Yeah, yeah, Mick did it as well. He went and spent a bunch of time at Chopu because he identified it was a, an area in his uh, repertoire where he, he needed to, to get stronger and get more confidence. So he did the work. Kelly's probably the best example out of anyone who just spent so much time at all these different breaks. When the tour left, he would hang around and stay for a week or two longer and just per perfect his performance at all the different breaks around the world. Lifelong commitment to your goal of being a world champion. 5.50 on the clock. Jake will take this wave. Saw it with some potential for Baron to break the combo. Speeding down the line, looking extra smooth. And ends up being a throwaway for Jake. First time he hasn't converted in a while because he's been increasing his score line every time he's gotten up to his feet. Yeah, unfortunately not able to convert that into a score, but what it did do was uh, still an opportunity away from Baron Mamiya. But the good news for Baron is that he now has priority. So he just needs to will some sort of swell line that he can perform on. Because uh, with each second that ticks down on this clock, his ability to catch two waves and convert them into a score is slowly dwindling away. Kate Madsen coming up next to take on Yago Dora. Important heat for both athletes, but when you look at the rankings, definitely the pressure will be on Cade. In heat seven, as we look at the recap, it's the Jake Marshall show. Four to a 5-5, five, five, then got a 6-5 six, and a 7-6-7, seven, seven. but these throw tail reverses where a stance moves forward oh. are unbelievable. Wow, look at them in the back. They're so dynamic and high risk. And uh, Jake's performed a number of them, but you can see here these waves that he's found. They've offered him clean face. These pockety little sections where Jake's getting that beautiful, clean, crisp, whap, uh, wrapping snap, which he just performs so elegantly down the line. These big finishing turns. And uh, trying to force a comeback here, Baron Mamiya. He's gone for a, uh, a number of these closeout reverse blow tails and just hasn't been able to convert on them. That's the closest he's come, but uh, yeah, showing signs of frustration here. Up and riding, this is live action. Mamiya looking to go for something big, little running section and oh, nothing no. there. Man, you feel for him. This, uh, this is just one of those heats where things just haven't gone his way. The flow, the momentum, it's all with uh, Jake Marshall now. I think we're going to see another Californian into the quarterfinals. 
Lots of American flags in that uh, in the quarters, Joe. That's a right. couple of Aussies, and we've got some Brazilians left to compete in this round of 16. So, um, with the lone South African and Maddie McGillivray into the quarterfinals as well. Seven Bells trophies have gone to surfers from the United States as we look at Barron. Three minutes to go. Not looking too invested in this one. Now, no, there he, he got goes, it. the throw tail reverse that he was hoping for. Well, perhaps that's just a little consolation prize. And uh, he'll be frustrated with this performance, unfortunately. We know he's capable of so much more. He is incredible in the air. And we know that uh, Baramamiya has so much more to give. One of the most electric, dynamic, and... Uh, well, courageous surfers on the two up, streaks down the line here, gets the pop, gets uh, the whole bottom of the board pointing towards the shoreline. So a really tricky maneuver here. Perfect execution off the lip. Just uh, showing the audience the fins, go and uh, check out the bottom of the board and then brings it around quite easily. The body language, it tells the story. 5-1-7 for Barron, does break the combination, now needs a nine for a spot in the quarterfinals. Well, there's a chance. Barron ended up getting knocked out of the event at sunset early in the round of 32. Same result in Portugal following the win at Pipe, but he's still sitting number five in the world. So he dropped a few spots after Stop number three this season. He's officially made the cut, so he knows he's going to be competing for a full year, and you know he's going to do everything he's got to try to fight for a world title in September, paddling into this one on his way back out. Chasing a nine, doesn't see it happening there. One thing I'm loving about his energy here, he's not giving up, even though the waves that he's taken off on look similar and smaller little runners. He's... He's really still trying to keep his head in the game, chasing a nine with one minute to go. Yeah, you never know. Stranger things have happened. I've seen it done time and time again. You watch pro surfing for this long. It, uh, you see amazing things happen, miraculous things happen in the final minutes. You just never know what the ocean's going to produce. This is when you're thinking of how you can get a 10. We've been ref referencing the, the Kelly copter, the full rotation punt where he got a perfect 10 for one move on the Bell's Bowl. Barron trying to think about what he could do to get a nine right now as he's speeding down the line, up and out, 20 seconds left. And now Jake Marshall rolling in. What a stellar performance from the Californian. Fell off the tour last season, worked hard to come back. Finaled in the Challenger Series in Portugal, saved that board, and he's been using it at this event. And takes out Baron Mamiya in a convincing win, 7-6-7 seven, seven, and a 6-5. Jake off and running into the quarterfinals, and he'll have that matchup in all Californian heat. Lost to Crosby over in Portugal in the quarters. Now he gets the big bro Griffin here at Bells Beach. Well, it's going to be a really cool matchup. And uh, we hope that it's blessed with good waves. We may run competition tomorrow. We'll be down here early. Checking conditions, so uh, let's see what happens. Yeah, we'll definitely be having a look. Plenty left in the day as well with Cade Madsen trying to keep that California story thriving. He takes on a solid goofy foot from Brazil, Yago Dora in heat seven of the round of 16. We'll be right back.
So many great things you could check out in Melbourne. There's almost uh, too many things to list. A big calendar of international events. The Australian Open, huge tennis grand slam that goes down. The F1, a lot of the surfers checked out the Formula One right before the start of this event. You've got the great MCG where you could watch, you know, the cricket and also AFL teams go to battle. I've been to that stadium before. It is electric on the big plays. And as soon as they hear my accent, there's about 20 Aussies surrounding me teaching me the rules, Aussie rules of the <laughs> AFL moments you'll never forget. And you're not too far from the coast here, about hour, hour and a half drive. You're a winky pop and bells watching the best surfers do battle. So for major sporting events and entertainment, State of Victoria is the place to be watching this little so roll in from Cade Madsen getting started against Yago Dora. Cade, the rook on tour. Youngest remaining in the draw, punches oh. out that section, showing his power. And now the difference from the backhander, Yago Dora, throws the snap, quick whip there. Attacking the pocket again. Throws it off the lip, Yago still hammering this wall hugging the pocket really close to the whitewater section and final turn hammers it shut great start to the matchup wow this is a great contrast of waves here yago getting multiple maneuvers on his wave and Cade just blasting three big turns the young rookie from california he's got some height and weight on him he is uh what is he six two joe Six two, six three. I saw a little thing that said six one, but he, okay. he stands. It really looks like he's six two. He, he's solid and just so powerful. Yeah, he's got that big front side snap on him, and uh, you know he uh, he reminds me of a couple of different surfers, Chris Brown and uh, Mike Parsons, and a few others sprinkled in there as well. I like that. But let's check out uh, Yago Dora. So obviously a, a slightly smaller wave to what K got, but. Um, Yago just getting this backhand hook just wound up time and time again, blasting off the lip. He keeps going multiple turns all the way down the line. So several, several powerful turns and really didn't leave much meat on that bone. And then Cade's wave. So Cade's a lot bigger, a bit more open face, cleaner. Cade just uh, getting two beautiful snaps off the top. And then the third, that was the exclam exclamation point. Very expressive in his hand movements and positioning. Really tight radius. Pivoting turn off the lip there. And uh, it's going to take some sort of powerful wave to knock this kid off his feet. Very sure-footed. Part of the uh, Matt Piolis loss squad. Yeah, it's amazing how much Matt does for... Uh, just a number of athletes globally, but especially in, in their hometown of San Clemente. Just creating world title boards for Caroline Marks last year, Carissa Moore for, for years and years. A lot of event wins, and he's got both athletes in the water now, Yago and Cade. Yago's last coming through to 6.67. The opener for Cade, a 7.67. I like it. I think it's a good spread. I think it's a fair uh, assessment of the of the opening scores. Um, you know, the judges really paying uh, the, the meaningful power in Cade's approach. Three back-to-back uh, -back turns, all done with commitment, power, degree of difficulty on that final turn. Uh, really eclipsed anything that uh, Yago did. Not discrediting uh, Yago's performance on that wave. Certainly rifled off a number of clean backhand hooks, but just the intensity, the, deg the degree of difficulty in Cade's uh, three turns, much higher. 7-6-7 seven, seven for the rookie. And even though there's all these experienced athletes that own Bells and Winky Pop and the stories of their experience dominating, there have been those rookie stories that have been fun to follow. And even just thinking of California, the goofy foot Nat Young, when he was first on tour, his backhand was so unique and his lines were different and he was confident, didn't travel with a coach. He just was winning heats and he finished runner up on the ball to Adriano de Souza. 
Nat was talking about visualization and he was just closed his eyes and hoped a bomb was going to come. He just was sitting out there with priority, opened his eyes and it was just white water across the Southern Ocean and his manifestation worked too well. And <laughs> the biggest set of the day rolled through and it was unsurfable really. Yeah, Nat, super powerful, consistent backhand attack out here at Bells. You get a second out here, when you? That was the second, yeah. That was that final moment with DeSouza. And gosh, it was fun to watch. Finaled with uh, Kai Otten in Portugal that same year, finished in the top 10 rookie of the year. As you check out the grandstands that are quiet now, because that's over by the Bells Bowl. Those dedicated to the champions that have won before. What are you seeing out the back, Rich? Lines approaching. <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's a hot sight to behold here, especially uh, when we have offshore conditions. But even in even in these onshore winds that we have now, you can see these corduroy swell lines just marching through into the zone. No takers on. Oh, hang on. Yago's going to take this one under priority. So late decision. Dora ends up throwing down his first turn into a nice second clean snap. And that'll do it, just a two-turn combination. He will improve on his second score. Cade, quick rip on that opening section. Throws in a quiet little backup for his 7-6-7. Seven, seven, and looks to hold his position with priority. Yeah, that wave just stretched out down the line, just closing out. So uh, Cade just opting to get back out of there, straight up to the takeoff zone. and. Uh, Really nothing substantial in those rides at all. Yago Dora dropping the, the 3.5, so he does take the lead. But obviously Cade only needing a small 2.5 to uh, take that lead back off him. So still a, a fun battle to enjoy. Yago Dora from Florinopolis. Fun, creative surfer that's thrown down some really cool edits in the last couple of years. I was on this little movie panel and his edit uh, blew my mind and I voted for it to win. Not sure if it got the win actually at the festival, but I was stoked to see him fit that in in the middle of working on the world title and winning heats. Uh, always a tough thing to balance and certain surfers can do it pretty well. Yeah, you know, it's uh, it's a different approach that Yago Dora has. You know, it's uh, I love his style, but he has these, you know, these funky maneuvers that he goes to really corked out, you know, backhand uh, aerial maneuvers and uh, even on the front side as well. You know, we saw him take to the air the Rottnest Island event and man, he was lighting it up. Yago Dora's dad was really, still is, it really into punk rock music. So he'd throw these festivals down in Florinopolis on the beach, set up these stages and bands like Bad Religion and Pennywise and a lot of the the sounds that you'd hear in Taylor Steele movies, those wow. bands would show Mental. up in Brazil. And there's pictures of Iago in diapers on the big speakers. <laughs> As we see him jam that section real quick and tapping the white water again, slips off at the end of it. His way before was a 3.5. So he's just trying to see what he can do under Kate's priority. Yeah, just staying busy and uh, fair enough. No harm, no foul. And it, we've seen the last two heats, Joe, it's been a complete one-sided affair where one surfer takes control, they're on the best waves, surfing well, dropping the bigger scores. But uh, this is a pretty even matchup from the get-go. And uh, Kate getting the better of the opening exchange by exactly one point. So Yago needs to make sure that uh, his second ride eclipses whatever Kate does on the next wave. Cade focused on the horizon and also his competitor learning so much in a short period of time. Successful run in the Challenger Series and was almost heartbroken when he lost in Sakurama. But Eli Hanneman got a win for him, which officially qualified Cade Matson for the tour. Said he was beyond words. He thanked Eli <laughs> for helping him get that spot with Yago running after a, a section here. He'll carve through the first. Running after a no. section to go tail high. Wow, and that nose was so close to his Super head. Super close. That was dangerous. 
managed to uh, whip his head out of the way there. But similar type of approach that really got him the win over Ian Gentile. And Gentile was ripping in his heat earlier. And Yago went for that crazy inverted backhand fin throw as we look at this one again. Yeah, difficult on the backhand. Gets that first snap. And then Yago just pumping down the line, comes right off the bottom. There's that backhand inverted rotation that we were talking about. You can see there, just gets his chin out of the way because that board wanted to give him an uppercut. But uh, he's getting close. You can see what he wants to do, right? He's just going, you know what? If I can put a score on the board under your priority and then shift momentum and pressure back to, to Cade, because at the moment, Cade is uh, in charge of the priority rotation. It's been quite a few stories of surfers that have injured themselves and then improved. You know, Yago fits that story when he had that terrible injury that sidelined him before the season started. That Liz Frank and then ended up coming back towards the halfway mark of the season. It was basically a warm up for the following year. And he just seemed better. He he went said through his toughest time when you can't surf, you're you're missing out on events, you're in your prime. He said he had to dig deep mentally through that, but then he found his energy in his rehab and just felt himself get stronger and stronger. And we find him some again. You're like, wait, you're actually better than you were before. Yeah, we have seen it so many times. I think, uh, you know, I back to when Mick um, had that horrific incident uh, over in Indonesia where he actually ripped the hamstring muscle off the bone. And uh, that's when he really clicked into training during that recovery period. And he came back, he was like put on, you know, a third of his body weight back in muscle. And uh, he just came back like this, you know, superhuman surfer and went on a crazy winning streak. Dora playing with some white water and it's going to be a short ride up and out. So he's got to be careful here because sometimes when you start riding waves like this, you can potentially miss a set. So you've got to make sure that you haven't ridden a, a wave that's not really going to go into your score line. And you can potentially miss uh, a set wave here. He needs to make sure that if a two wave set comes, he needs to put uh, a pressure on, on Cade so that he takes off on, on hopefully the first wave of the set. And then there's a bigger one out the back. So Yago Dora trying to make a quarter final at Bells. If he does, it'll be his first of his career. He's had a 25th, a 17th, last year his best at an equal ninth, which is this round, round of 16. But for Cade, it's all about getting past that top 22, which has been a tough season for him so far until this point. Huge win earlier against John John Florence. All you guys that put Cade on your team and Tier C on Fantasy Surfer, great job. Yeah, yeah, awesome pick. It seems to be a theme uh, with the Rip Curl Pro this season. Uh, we're seeing a lot of new faces into the quarterfinal bracket and uh, opportunity. Looks like we're going to see uh, a new face ring the bell, which is exciting. Gosh, Rip Curl celebrating 50 wonderful years, all starting with the founders, Brian Singer and Doug Claw Warbrick. Just uh, made surfboards in the beginning. They were able to produce about four surfboards a week back in 69. <laughs> and then they're like, okay, we've outgrown our little shack here. And they got a bigger space. They moved it up to 12 boards at a time. And they start hiring people over the years. You know, guys like Morris Cole, he was first shaping under Rip Curl yep. in the beginning. Wetsuits came on very early. Al Green joined forces for a year before moving on to another brand. They had that sewing machine that worked well with the dive suits and diving suits weren't very mobile for maneuvers and for surfing and they wanted to create suits that were performance based. It could keep you warm, but you could feel free like you weren't wearing too much. They did well with that and they kept moving their spaces. A lot of times they wanted quality control. Claw really and Brian Singer were really worried about that. So they were like, you know, what? we'll do it all from our house. We'll, yeah, wow. we'll hand make these suits start hiring more and more people. They finally moved to the big shop on Surf Coast Highway in Torquay in, in 1980. And it's still there now here in 2024. Big shop, all the offices there in the HQ and 
The entire company comes down to watch every single heat. Watching this now, Cade Madsen. Fun looking section to work with. Throws some water off the tail into a clean float. Looking for just a 257. He's doing well so far. The kid from San Clemente on a roll through every single point, throwing some water. It's just landing there as he is into his wrapping cutback. And now jams it again to finish off a long ride, well surfed. His support crew absolutely loves it. Nicola Pinto, Scotty Hammond, a great filmer, great surfer, who just had a big birthday the other day. Cade on a roll on that one, Richie. Yeah, really mature surfing for the rookie. He does not seem phased at all by this uh, situation. Being in the round of 16, up against the more established Yago Dora. Surfing so well, patient. You can see, uh, well, I can tell you that uh, Yago has caught seven waves and that's only Kate's third wave. And he's picked a good one. Some great opportunity here. Clean snap to start things off. Projection foam climb, keeps that speed, accelerates from that bottom turn. Nice clean snap and again up and over the foam section. Bit more spice on that one with some tail drift. Nice wrapping cut back. Just uh, slams on the brakes and then readjusts for that final turn into the shadows under the cliffs here at Winky Pop. Beautiful slow-mo actions here. You can see just how much control these surfers have over their surfboard. Even under these turbulent sections as they're driving down the line, watch this, clicks the fins out and then re-engages with the smooth, smooth face underneath him. Drives hard off the bottom, navigating through all these bumps. That weightless feeling when you're up and over those uh, whitewashed sections. Keeping that control, lots more flair on that turn, Joe. And then the wrapping cutback, so good variety on this wave. This is gonna be a really good backup for Cade. Well done for Cade from start and also finding a big jam to finish. He could have been exhausted by that stage, but these pros are so in tune with their training program. Gone are the days where people just rely on surfing alone to stay fit. It used to be a common thing you heard in post interviews years ago. Say, no, I just surf, that's about it. Even John, when he first qualified, would say it was all about surfing and then when injuries come, when you're really tested by the world's best, people become obsessed with their fitness program outside of the ocean, and they found a good balance today. It's like they're, it's like the surf is progress, or the surfing's progressing, but also the the training programs progress. Really, surf-specific exercise. So every facet of the sport is growing so quickly. Yeah, absolutely, and there are really so much variety into how you can train for surfing. Um, but I feel like, you know, uh, while weights and, and, you know, heavy lifting is maybe part of the program, too much of it, when you bulk up, you, you can, uh, you know, be in danger of losing that agility and that, that ability to stay n sort of nimble and light and agile on the wave. But you definitely need to have that power to be able to tap in that leg strength, that core strength. We've seen so many times today where surfers have gone for, you know, the, the natural footers have gone for that big layback maneuver, that big layback slice uh, to finish off their wave and that core strength to be able to stay on top of the board really coming into play. Yeah, it's cool to see how different some of these athletes look from their rookie season to today. Like a good example of that is Medina till, you know, the man he is now, it looks like a different person. It's like he's twice the size. I think a lot of these rookies are already coming in pretty big now. And you know, Ethan Ewing's another example. Darren yep. Hanley's been busy trying to add more volume for how much bigger he is since his rookie debut. Uh, Fanning, another example of him. He was a little rubber band slingshot guy that could go so incredibly fast. And then he just bulked up and became all about power with that big body torque wrap that took him to three world titles as we've got 12.50 on the clock here in heat number seven of the round of 16. Yago needing a 7.34 now because Cade's last wave is a 6.33. More to come after this.
You're watching the round of 16, 11 minutes on the clock, and Cade is still out front. Yago chasing a 7.34. Last heat though, Jake Marshall put on a clinic. Jake is now hanging out with Vaughn. Well, Jake Marshall, uh, you know, today there's been some grindy heats and then there's been other heats like your one where you've got more rhythm and jive than James Brown, man. You were just uh, absolutely singing out there. Yeah, I felt really good out there. Um, I kind of like my first few waves were kind of average waves and I felt like I was turning them into scores and it was giving me bunch of confidence and yeah I don't know I was just feeling in tune with the ocean in that one and felt really good out there. Mate we've seen you building throughout uh, this event in particular you know you just seem to be getting more and more in touch with the tempo of the ocean. For sure um, yeah we didn't get a ton of winky pot practice before the event because the waves were good over at the bowl and but the last couple of years here I've surfed out here a lot and um, I don't know the waves here are just super similar to what I surfed back in California so I'm wearing a wetsuit like I don't know everything just feels like home and um, yeah, I'm just feeling good. I got the momentum and I'm psyched. Quarterfinal matchup against uh, Griffin Colapinto, the world number one. How are you feeling about this matchup? That's going to be fun. That's going to be like a throwback to our Grom days. So <laughs> um, I'm really excited to surf that heat and I'm sure it'll be a sick battle and hopefully we can both put up some good scores and put on a good show. That's awesome, man. I've got some news for you as well. You've uh, jumped up four places in the ranking. So I believe that's to number six and you have officially made the cut. So. Uh, Oh, number four, sorry. You're up to number four uh, inside that top five. And yes, you have made the cut, so no pressure going into Margie's. Well, that's great. Uh, last year here was a bit of a different story for me, so it's crazy the difference a year can make. I've um, been working like so hard to, uh, to have these results start to come my way. And um, yeah, I don't know. I feel like I'm not done yet. I got a lot, lot more heats to go in this comp, so um, still got a ways to go. And I'm psyched for the rest of this event. Mate, congratulations and uh, best of luck in the quarterfinals. Right on, thank you. Thank you. Well done, thank you, Vaughn, and congratulations to Jake Marshall. What a difference a year makes going through that struggle from last year, going back to the Challenger Series, coming back better than ever into a, a final five position on the live rankings as we enjoy Cade surfing here on his fourth wave against Yago Dora, hitting the lip well deeper off the bottom and now in fun section to tee off the lip <laughs> again he's just belting that lip line and shuts it down tons of energy as we come off the backhand of Yago Dora he's answering back wraps it now timing another carve Dora stepping on the gas and goes for a quick whip on the reverse attempt but he's down Yeah, Bemi and Leandro looking a little stressed in the moment there. They wanted uh, Yago to complete that manoeuvre. They've seen him do that time and time again. And unfortunately, the pressure of the situation just maybe forcing it a little, pushing a little too hard, not able to stick that final rotation. But a good pick up here under priority. So Kay takes the first one. Gets a good clean snap to open up. Then find some better water down the line here. Plumes of spray going skyward. And uh, this wave just kept on giving Cade opportunity all the way down the line. Lots of flow and speed, momentum between each turn. Let's see if uh, Yago got some work done out the back. So just a little check turn to start things off. Deeper bottom turn. That's a better snap. And again. So uh, multiple maneuvers on the backhand. So we got some good work done outside. Comes through to this inside section, takes the low road. And uh, this was just really the only mistake. And if you'd finished that off, that, uh, that wave was looking good too. So uh, a mistake here from Yago Dora, and I think it's going to cost him. Really felt like he needed that finish since Cade is in such a scary rhythm. When Cade times the lip right, there's just a fire hose off his tail. There's so much spray. It's like a vertical type of plume of spray just straight to the sky. Uh, you just can't make those mistakes, not at this level, not with uh, under seven minutes to go in a heat where you're behind. And that was the turning point where Yago actually was looking to change the rhythm and the priority rhythm and get a score. But the worst things happened. Kay's actually looking like he's going to get a score 
Uh, and in and in uh, the meantime, he's also managed to get first priority back on Yago. So he's going to try and control the last six minutes of this heat. And any decent wave that comes through, Cage is going to steal it off him. So Cade Madsen trying to pull himself on the right side of the midseason cut, getting past John John Florence. Still leading over Yago Dor as we still wait for the last scores from the exchange to come through. But Kate, a part of a really fun rookie class with some of his best friends like Cole Hauschman, Crosby Colapinto, Eli Hanneman, Jacob Wilcox. When you saw them all on stage at the Lexus WSL Awards, it was just they couldn't stop laughing, like looking at <laughs> their just childhood relationships, their rivals. They just banded together in such an insane way that made us make comparisons to the energy of the Brazilian storm. The Aussies like yourself and your crew that stuck together and created yeah, such fun. a positive vibe around each other to lose your heat and then support your friend. You know, that's what these guys were doing all year last year as we watch now Dora fade the first section and step off. Well, it looks like Kate Matson has uh dropped a 6.33 which equals his uh, second best score so uh, he doesn't improve still waiting on previous of Yago so he still doesn't know what happened on his way before but he's looking for an air section on the wind up throws down the shove it and lands it so starting to get creative now as he rode away switch <laughs> Leandro enjoyed it Matty Bemro still applauding. <laughs> the boy's getting behind Yago Dora here. And trying it, to make a bit of noise and influence the judges. Way before that we were waiting for all the turns and the fall on the air. 6-1-0 for Yago. So he was still chasing a 7-3-4. Okay, on this let's wing. see what happens here. Okay, so clean, open face, streaking down the line, nothing yet. It's all about this one maneuver. Goes for the shove it, pulls it off. Progression, tick. But is it enough? Uh, it had some height, but it wasn't just, uh, I don't know, Joe, something in me is telling me it's not quite that 7.33. Just perhaps needed uh, one or two turns prior to this maneuver. If he'd got a couple of clean snaps out the back and then did this, then uh, I'd be confident that the score would be dropping. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's pretty funny to watch. So uh, I, I can actually tell when Bemi's uh, <laughs> <laughs> just hammering it up. And, yeah, why wouldn't they be uh, getting behind their guy? Still three minutes to go. Uh, Bemi is such a classic, especially when he's mic'd up, when they're making all these documentaries behind the scenes. He'll come up and just say the wrong thing on purpose. And Try just wait for everyone talking. to squirm yep. out of it. You know? Bait you into uh, Bait you saying into something. something. You're like, hey, don't you have a microphone on? He's like, oh, I didn't know that. He walks away. <laughs> but he loves it. He's uh, so passionate about the athletes he works with from Yago, Jack Robinson. Always supportive for Joao Chianca. Speaking of Joao, we're wishing you a speedy recovery. Can't wait to see you back. Last score for the shove it. Dora throws down a 6.13. Pretty rad move, but like you said, maybe a couple turns before it and that move, you're seeing the lead change. Even one big hack before it. Can imagine so many things. It's the size of the section that go into needing a big score. We've got time running away, passing the GWM two minute warning. Cade still has priority and is a better position now to shut this one down and continue his run in this event, beating John John Florence, still with the lead over last year's number six in the world, Yago Dora. And at a crucial time with uh, the cut approaching at Margaret River, Yago will take this wave and Cade let him go. Now Cade's just watching from the back. He's just hoping that there isn't a ramp on this one. One of the best in the air is Yago as he kicks out. Good leave by Cade. Yeah, that was uh, smart. Showing a lot of maturity here, the young guy from California. 
Just uh, understanding the system here. Knowing that uh, Yago wasn't going to get the score on that, so he didn't relinquish priority. Now he can really squeeze him in this last minute. Yago's going to have a new best friend here. Wherever you go, I go. So Matson, after falling out of the sky at Pipeline, tough losses to follow. Sunset Beach, Griffin got him at the end there with a crazy performance. Went down early in Portugal and now pushing as hard as he can to try to make this quarterfinal come true. Everyone holding their breath, 22 seconds on the line. Up next, it'll be Rio Waida and Caio Ibelli. The last heat to set up the quarters, 10 seconds to go. Kate has lost priority, so Yago can take this wave. Running after a ramp section, he'll be late to it, and he can't come through with a big ramp. <laughs> he salutes the crowd upstairs and the panel, and Cade Madsen will get a crucial victory that he needed desperately. Cade will move on to the quarterfinals and take on the winner of the next seed. Yeah, I'm stoked for uh, Cade Matson. Great performance from Yago Dora nonetheless. Geez, he surfed well on a number of those waves. His performance throughout this event has been uh, fantastic. But the young rookie showing some smarts and some great surfing to move through into the quarterfinals. And uh, even that achievement in itself in your first rookie season, it, it's a big one. And to do it here at Bells, you can see Yago, uh, I think he's giving a little thumbs up to the judges there. He'll go back and watch this heat, dissect what happened. Cade Madsen representing California. Knows how to party in the city of Torquay. Well done for Cade. Rhea Waida takes on Kiowa Belly next. We'll bring in Ron Diggity Dog and also Felicity Palmatier for the call. Good afternoon from the Rip Curl Pro Bells Beach, presented by Bonsoy. We're into the last heat of the round, and we're on the lookout for our last quarter finalist. It's going to be a heat between Rio Waida, the Indonesian, who'll be in the red jersey, looking to maintain a position within that cut line, and Kaio Abeli, who's already starting to make his climb. Kaio's going to be out there in the blue jersey. Here on the call, Ronnie Blakey, joined by Felicity Parmatier. Felicity, this is, uh, this is going to be a good one. One of those matchups where one of those surfers sitting inside the cut lines trying to hold off 
the fight from, from one of those below. It's going to be uh, a lot of fun. Oh, it's going to be fun, but I, I just think both not, surfers Not for do them. It. Not for them. For us, though. We're going to bring the fun. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see what uh, unfolds here. Rio looking to get things started early. He's looked great in his road through to this part of the contest so far. Nice swoop off the top. Moving a lot of water. Swift again on rail. This way fades away, though, and he opts out. Yeah, he's just trying to get that quick start. You know, we've had throughout the day, we've had some pretty long lulls. So just trying to get the feet in the wax. But I'm sure we're going to see that score be replaced. That's come through at a 3.5. But, you know, even though the waves, it's been challenging today, we've still, still seen some big scores. Guys that have been finding to, managing to find those waves with that really clean face, been linking together two to three manoeuvres. We've seen a few excellent scores today. So even though it's hard, they're, they're still out there. Rio looking to equal his best ever finish in a championship tour event last year in Portugal. He did make the quarterfinals there. Uh, this would be huge. Of course, Caio, he's been uh, around for some time, uh, initially as a, a replacement surfer. Then he, he graduated to the CT ranks full time and he's been here as a fixture. And uh, he needs a, a big finish in this contest to keep that place on the CT. But he has gone all the way to the final of championship tour events before, as we see him up now. So nothing from Rio really on those opening rides. It's going to oh, oh. threaten Kaio here, but you could feel that. His board clubbed him in the head, just that front foot slipping off. Whoa, that was really gnarly. Holy. I heard it. <laughs> I felt it almost. Wow. I also think he was probably on his way to a semi-decent score, too, if he made that last turn. That was pretty unfortunate. Looked really, really bad, the way that that board just connected with his forehead then. Let's get a super slow-mo <laughs> of it. He's all right. Well, that's that's why we can kind of have a little chuckle. But he's uh, he quickly got his board. And I think what he'll be bummed about um, is exactly what you said, not finishing that wave off. He was on his way to a good score. Really clean rail work on the outside here, even with all that bump on the face. Just yeah. needed the big finish. You could see that he just really had to extend that top turn there. Lots of lump and bump to deal with. Had nice variety here. Went to this carving turn, really burying that rail there. And this is the moment that we were having a bit of a laugh at. at sorry, Kaya. Oh, once he recovered, we will. Look at that, though. Oh, did it got him in the side of the head. Not nice. And then, nice. Uh, yeah, he was lucky to just get away from that equipment. It's happened to all of us. Oh. You know, and, uh, <laughs> your, mate, your mates generally enjoy watching that happen. But he was really quick to get his board back, so he knew he was OK. <laughs> Only a 2.93, so the opportunity to kind of win that opening exchange is lost. But I've been talking about, you know, Kaya's success, particularly in this event. We know that uh, he had that replay of the, the 2017 final with Geordie Smith earlier on, a heat that he was able to win, an important heat for him. Yeah, that would be feel, feeling good for Kai. I feel that Geordie's been in good momentum this year. I got to watch him at Pipe and then at Sunset, and I just feel like we've got a different Geordie this year. He's sort of reinvented himself again. I felt, I felt like... I mean, obviously, on paper, you're looking at that and you're thinking, OK, oh, yeah. Geordie's got this. But Kaya ran away with it. And, I mean, it's got to be feeling good for him right now. Kaya really needs a result. And I'm actually kind of surprised to see Kaya where he is. Like, he fights hard, but he's usually higher in a higher, in a higher seed than this, especially at this stage in the year. So true. Yeah, 27 and a half minutes remaining here. Kaya eyeing one off on the inside. Ops not to go. We have just seen Kate Matson win through, and here he is breaking things down with his coach, Jake Patterson. Unbelievable. Thank you. You turned it into that score. It wasn't a great wave. Yeah. You just it was a hard wave to serve. It huh? was. It's like up, as like you said, and you just it's delivered. Magic. Big turns. Yeah. Like for a big boy. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Great surfing. Thank you. Yeah. All positive today from, from Jake <laughs> Patterson, watching things unfold. Still got a couple of surfers in the mix for finals day and on the women's side as well. Soya Limblad, but yeah, just very complimentary of the effort there from Kate Matson. Yeah, a couple of big turns for a big boy. <laughs> but Jake's Health, Healthy heat score title, <laughs> yeah. 14 points for Kate. Yeah, no, re really, really good surfing. I've been really impressed with him. I feel like he's done a really good job at really just 
having a great pace on the wave. I feel like here at the well, at Bell's Bowl and at Winky, it can be kind of a wave that if you're out of sync or out of rhythm with that pace on that wave, it, it just doesn't look good. And your scores are reflected of that. And I feel like Cade has a good relationship with this. He's just very, very, very much waiting and placing his turns. And it's just been really pleasing to watch. It has. Rio Aida, he's, you know, looking to, to break through into the quarters for just the second time. But he's had some amazing accomplishments on his road to this point. Obviously being the first Indonesian to, to crack the championship tour ranks full time and uh, also representing Indonesia at the Olympics and got the ultimate honour at the 2020 Olympics. He was the flag bearer for the Indonesian team. So led them out. And uh, yeah, he's, he's a super talent. He is, and one thing that I picked up on uh, from his first year on tour was that he's just a student, you know, and he wanted to soak in all the knowledge, all the experience that he could, and knowing that he hadn't been to a lot of those world tour stops, he just kind of made that decision last year that, hey, I'm just going to stay on the road, spend as much time in these locations and get as familiar as possible because I want to be here for a long time. And as we see uh, Griff there just exiting the beach, looks like next to... Cade obviously stayed down after his heat, watched his fellow friend, San Clemente friend there, yeah. getting through. The San Clemente crew is going to be well represented on finals day. With Cole, Griffin, Cade, Sawyer, all into the quarterfinals. It's a good day for California on finals day. Wowzers. And these two uh, surfers you can tell just how, how, you know, desperate they are. You can see Rio looking to the beach. He's looking up those stairs. He's looking for Glen Micro Hall. Not easy to spot from uh, <laughs> far away. But uh, uh, he, he's just looking for some direction here in this lineup. Yeah, uh, even every wave that's come through, they've both been having a sniff at it. And I feel like that that is just a representation of the nerves and what this means to them. And just knowing it, how slow it has been today, few and far between in the sets. And just seeing big names go down, I mean, one heat I go back to is the John John heat. You know, he had that really high one score wave, but just couldn't find a backup. It's left out the back needing a 4.3. Yeah, we, we've seen, you know, in most of the heats, the surfers try to get a little bit busier early on in the exchanges. And that's exactly what Rio is doing here is he just comes hammering down the line here. A lot of speed. Looks looking super uh, psyched and ready to, to throw everything at this heat. Unfortunately, falls on that final move. So a mistake there that's going to cost him some points. For sure. I think that was definitely a mistake. He had a nice flow to that wave as well. But, yeah, I've got it. He's fell a couple of times now on, on that last turn. So I just feel like with the conditions like today, if you take off, you've got to be making these waves. It, beautiful first carving manoeuvre there. Gets it up into the lip here. It's eyeing off this section down the line. It's a little pop and the fin release, followed by another one, but that was crucial. I mean, the score's just come through. 4.4, you've got to be thinking, I mean, it would have been a mid-range five, maybe another point on that if he'd made that last turn. No, I just think, just with the conditions, and you know what, in, in my break, my long break I had, I went down to uh, the stairs at Winky and it, it's so, it looks so different compared to what you're seeing on the broadcast here. I mean, it, it honestly, it looks a lot bigger than what it really is down there. And then in another level, again, you go down to the rocks right at the bottom of the stairs and it's even a different ball game. It just, I think it, it's so tricky. I think it, this is making it look probably better than what it is. I feel like it is super challenging. And so to be on those good waves today and not be making those mistakes when you're falling on that last turn is just super crucial. Yeah, a lot of bump on the face. 22 minutes remaining here, just a 4.4 for Rio on that last wave. That leaves Kayo chasing a 4.97. We're just on 22 minutes to go. Well, earlier we did catch up with Cade Matson, And with uh, Rio having a look at this wave, we'll watch this unfold and then see what Cade had to say after a, a, an important heat win. Let's go to that interview now. Kate Matson, mate, you are into the quarterfinals of the Rip Curl Pro, presented by Bonsoy, and uh, a real tricky heat, especially against such a seasoned campaigner like Yago Dora. Yeah, yeah, it was super tricky out there. It was like 
I don't know, it's hard to tell when the wave's gonna be good because it's so like choppy and like broken up, but uh, it's kind of like similar to waves that I surf at home a lot, so I kind of feel pretty comfortable and yeah, it felt good. Mate, uh, we know that sort of this setup and these sorts of conditions really suit the Californians, you know, uh, it's a lot of waves and, and conditions that are like this at home. Yeah, like I said, I mean, lowers is kind of like similar to kind of this sort of wave. It's like reef break, like kind of sectiony. You got to create your own speed. So mm. I feel like a lot of us like feel like we're at home. So yeah, it's good. Mate, you're looking at home, that's for sure. But uh, you do have a little bit of local help. Jake Patterson, what's he brought to your campaign here at the Rip Pro? Yeah, it's been insane working with him. I worked with him about like four years ago and then he came back this year and I was frothing. You know, he's one of the best like competitive surfers ever. So yeah, just taking knowledge from him and uh, learning a lot uh, in the process. So yeah. And mate, uh, you've elevated yourself to number 23. So right on the cut line. I know it's been a tricky start to the year, but this is really the big switch, uh, flick of the switch that you were waiting for. Yeah, I'm just trying to not really think about the rankings, honestly, at this point. I told myself coming into this event, I wasn't really going to trip on it. You know, whatever God's plan is for me, is you know, it's going to happen. So, yeah, I'm just taking it moment by moment and, uh, yeah, just living it up. It's a huge achievement, mate. Quarterfinals, we can't wait to see you in action. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Cage seems super confident now where he came into this event with a big smile on his face. Um, I really believe him when he says he, he hasn't been paying attention to, or, or thinking too much about his position on the rankings. He just wants to do some good surfing. Up five spots already. Really knocking on the door of the cut line now. Wants to keep this magic run alive. And uh, obviously uh, he's going to be coming up against the winner of this heat. Whew, it's a big Good day in the office for Cade right now. Great day in the office. But I love what he's saying. Just I, All I want to do is just do some good surfing, some great surfing in the jersey, and, th and that is what he's doing right now. It's, it really takes that pressure off. I'm, it's a daunting thing, just thinking about, oh, no, you know, like I finally finally made it. I finally on the tour. Mm. And this is my rookie year, and all of a sudden I'm only getting, you know, five events. It's That's a tough pill to swallow. As we break down this one from Rio, that happened during that post aid interview, couple of foam climbs there in quick succession and four foam climbs backs it up with a bit of a tail release on that last one yeah he's just looking so uh, on at the moment he's just got to be careful chipping away on these medium-sized waves I, I think it's a good tactic at this point in time obviously without priority but you know uh, Kaya can sort of really take advantage of that priority if a quality set wave comes but you know, they have sort of generally been coming in in twos, those sets. Yeah, they have. And it, from just what I've been seeing, it's the second wave of the set you want. This first one here just looks so lumpy and bumpy. What happens is that first one goes through the lineup it, and then it cleans all this lump and bump up, you know. The second one that comes through is just so much cleaner. And I think the judges are going to love that if an opportunity comes up. up Kayo takes it. It's a cleaner faced wave. It's going to put a lot of separation between, you know, these mid range forwards. If Kayo can convert and if he makes, if he doesn't fall, I feel like there is opportunity there. There's only eight, min 18, there's 18 minutes left. It's plenty of time. I think. Haven't we said that a lot today, though? It's, there's plenty of time, <laughs> and then there's someone just sitting out there, just, you know, with barnacles growing on them by the end of the heat. <laughs> oh, They've been sitting there that long. They're, dropped they're, anchor. Yeah, not moving. Um, but. Hopefully we do see some great exchanges in this heat because Kaio feels like he's sort of warming to uh, with each performance and Rio has just seemed very switched on. So I, I, I think Rio's, for me, got to be the favourite in this heat just based on, on what surfing I've seen so far. What about you? Oh, it's tough. As we see David Silva having a little sticky beak, obviously down there. Love, I love the way the, the Brazilian guys sort of set the standard for you know supporting your countrymen mm. over the past few years we've seen a, a resurgence from other nations in, in recent times but uh, i think the way that they egged each other on oh there's that, so much passion yeah, so much sure. passion it just inspired great performances you someone always was there to, to cheer you up and you know even if you were last heat of the day and and people had lost out in the event you know so good to see david on on standby here, watching this one unfold, cheering on his mate Kaio Abeli, who's got the priority and, and at this stage really isn't chasing too big a, of a number to get himself in the lead here. 
Back to what you were saying before, I'm not sure who, what way I would go. I mean, it's it, it's tough for me as we see Kaio having a look. Well, let's see if Kaio can, can make this one count. A lot of bump on the face, sticking with it, threading things at the moment, just trying to keep some speed for a, a monster finish down the line, loading up. There's a nice carve, really ripping that board through all that bump with no problem at all. Oh. Forces are reversed on the end section. Didn't really have the speed to do it. And it'll be another sort of average score here. 16 minutes to go. Kaya's fiance watching on there. Wow, just that wave again. I mean, he's, time is ticking away. And I think I just got to go back to what you were saying. I mean, how many times have we sat here today? I mean, like, oh, he's got so much time, you know. He's going to be fine. He's definitely got to get a chance to get another score. But Kaya doesn't really have anything on the board yet. And he kind of had... He, he couldn't fall on that last one. I think that that was a little bit of a mistake. Still looking at from the water angle here, I mean, you can just see how tricky this wave is to surf. Kaio just really trying to pick the eyes out of it and find some smooth face here. Drops down into this section, gets a bit of a foam climb. That was kind of nice, getting that carving manoeuvre there for a bit of variation. And yeah, what you said, Ron, he just didn't have quite enough speed going into that tail throw. Well, just over 15 minutes to go, waiting on the numbers to roll through. Kaipo's out and about. What's going on, Kaipos? Hey, there's nothing worse than losing juice. Luckily, we have Mofi and the power banks here at Mofi, keeping us charged throughout the event. And Mofi, during the post-show of the finals, they will announce the Mofi charger of the event. The surfer male or female that shows the most commitment and charging throughout the entire event. We're going to unveil that post-show finals day here at the Rip Curl Pro Bells Beach presented by Bonzoi. Thank you, Mofi, for keeping us all charged up. Yeah, thank you. And uh, yeah, I like that. The, the Mofi charger of the event. Who's going to uh, take that honor? Uh, maybe it'll be Rio Waida if he can thread together some big turns here. Nice flow to kick this right off. And you can tell he's not pushing too hard through those bumps, but just really slicing nicely and bringing this one oh. through to the inside. Get some release in the tail there. Might even find a, another couple of hits down the line here. Really strong surfer. Got a, a, a powerful build, and it allows him to just keep punching through the sections as he gets right down the line here. That, that was, in my eyes, the best way of the heat so far. I think he's only going to improve on that situation. And, yeah, it was really well surfed. He had a couple of nice, really clean sections as well. Yeah, you're spot on. 5.83 for this one. Are you impressed with the, the way these surfers are able to pick a tricky lineup apart? Smooth oh. the, lo the, the bumps out? We've already spoken about it, but I sound like a broken record. It's so much harder than what it looks. And we... I feel like this right now is, is making it... These guys are just surfing so good. Sometimes when you watch it with this camera following at the same speed as them too, it's hard hard to actually give justice to just to how fast these guys are too. This was just so well surfed. It was so tricky. There was so many different sections to navigate. That turn there was the money for me. I feel like that's where most of the points came from. It was really progressive. It's a big fin throw made up a lot of ground through that section and got a little bonus there on the inside. Really well surfed. Loving Richie Lovett's call, just that comparison to Danny Wills. Oh, I think the, the sponsorship oh. factor plays a part, that sticker on the end of the board. <laughs> but Danny Wills had a, an incredible amount of power and punch for, uh, you know, a, a pretty short, nuggety guy. He just had pinpoint timing and amazing release out of the pocket of the wave. Uh, and, and Rio's displaying that at the moment. Starting to really just find some freedom out there too now that he's building some scores. For sure. Right now it just feels like he's clicked into free surf mode a little bit. Just arm um, down the line. May as well take off on that one. Throw the fins on the last turn. He's looking confident. I'd say the confidence is building now. And uh, definitely making that task quite hard for Kaio because, oh, how many... You have a look at this one. This wave was caught in pretty quick succession after that Last one that he got. Yeah, just busy too in this lineup, isn't he? And, and it's working in his favour. That was uh, his eighth ride. Kaio's been a little bit more patient, trying to make his priority count. He's had only three waves. 
And he's kind of getting left behind at this stage of the game. There is still plenty of time, though. Just over 11 and a half minutes to go as we take a Bonsoy Brew break. your trip to Victoria, come and surf the iconic Bells Beach, take a trip on the Great Ocean Road and suck up everything that <laughs> Victoria has to offer. There's plenty of good stuff to, to check out down here. It's been a, a big day for the Cola Pinto brothers and I think Vaughan's got some exciting news for Crosby. Well, the battle of the brothers lived up to everything we thought it was be. That was a uh the battle between me and Ronnie in the booth, by the way. We were commentating that heat, but uh, I know it was a bit of a frustrating heat for you, Croz, because uh, you never got to really dig in and uh, rip into your big bro, mate. Yeah. But I do have some good news for you. You have officially made the cart. Margaret's, all that weight's going to come off and you can uh, surf freely into the back half of the year. Yeah, that's, uh, that's exciting and it's really fun because now I get to go to like Chopes and El Salvador and Brazil and Cloud Break. So that's that's super exciting. And I don't know, it's uh, yeah, it's it's cool. I kind of came in kind of thinking like, oh, I ho hope I make it. And then after like a couple of results now, I like I feel pretty just like comfortable and and want to go more than just like scraping by to get by the cut. So yeah, so I mean now that that goal has been reached, where you can sort of open up a little bit more, what are your goals looking like for the year? Do you reconfigure, or were you always aiming for that WSL finals day? Um, at first it was kind of like I don't know if it was like make the final five was really too much of an option like rookie year, but like after the first couple of events and like the way I was feeling, I think it's. It's definitely doable if I just keep pushing and, and keep surfing with Griffin and stuff and the boys. So um, it's definitely a goal, but uh, honestly, just get the experience in the rest of the year and just like just really do my best surfing because that's that's kind of what it's all about is just to like do good surfing. It is, mate. Well, you've done great surfing this year. We can't wait to see you do a whole lot more of it as the uh, year goes on. So, thank you. Wow, well, that's huge for Crosby. I, I mean, I think all rookies probably after they they graduate to the championship tour, you know, in the back of their minds, they probably like put their head on the pillow at night and, and dream uh, about hoisting the trophy in their rookie season. But <laughs> I, I'm sure once you rock up that first event, it's like, OK, now I've got to make the cut. Please, 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 can I go to Fiji? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I want to surf Cloud Break. I want to surf Chopes. <laughs> oh, exactly. The back half of the, the schedule is, you know, definitely hiding some of the, the tour's gems and uh, all these competitors want to get a crack at them. 
And Kai Albelli, mm. he's been there before. He surfed those full seasons and, and he wants to maintain a position on this championship tour where he's been a fixture for close to 10 years. So he needs to, to switch into gear here. He's up against it, chasing a 7.96 with six and a half minutes to go. Yeah, this is really tough. And I've got to say, I mean, I've loved what Rio's done. He's just been so busy and, you know, ever so slightly just making that requirement just that little bit harder for Kayo. Looks like Kayo might have a swing here down the line. Oh, he's going to have to find that open face to get started. Just climbing up over that first section. The wave is sectioning off a little bit, but he's got some speed. So he's keeping pace at the moment as he loads up, swings the reverse. This time he gets a completion there. That'll be his best wave. He'll bring down that requirement a little bit and give himself a, a fighting chance here in the final six minutes. That was really well done. Under pressure as well, you know, he, he really needed to make that. He couldn't fall. He's had a couple of falls, similar, going for similar moves like that earlier in the heat. So that was super crucial. Uh, I don't think it's going to be that 7.96, but he's going to make that requirement a lot less. And the only thing is just time is the enemy. I ju and we'll break this down here now. So he goes up into the lip there. There's a foam climb. A lot of ground to cover here. A bit of a loosey-goosey foam climb, that one. And it brings it through to the inside. Ne knows he needs to get a bit of progression in there, a bit of variety. Because without this, it just would have been those two foam climbs. And I like that he put it on the line. He needed to do this. It was pretty critical. Yeah, he knows what he's got to do. You can see the uh, surfers wearing their Apple Watches. And they can get the uh, the full rundown. You know, they're not leaning on, on the on-site announcers, who are doing a fantastic job. But they really are aware of how much time's on the clock. Who's got priority? You can see Kaio scoping his wrist there. All the information we're privy to, the surfers have out there in the lineup. And at the moment, Kai's sort of saying to himself, well, you've got work to do. <laughs> That's what the clock's saying. For sure. I, I just get nervous. I just remember when we had uh, Chippo in the booth, or Jacob Wilcox, earlier today. And he was saying, you know, I was timing the sets. And sets are coming through every s more than six minutes. You know, we just had a set. And if it's still in that same sort of period and rhythm today, Looking like it could be a little bit difficult. Oh, there's Rio's brother. Great surfer himself. A bit more focused on the free surfing, but super exciting. So cool to bring your brother on tour with you, travel around, come to Australia, surf some great waves. Had lots of fun waves before the event period started. Some nice swell beforehand. Well, have a look at this on the inside. Kaio finds some space. Waiting on his last ride to come through as he punches through the lip. Looking fired up, but oh. just can't get ahead of this one. So that's not going to be it. Body language wasn't looking great then. Where is this uh, previous number going to go, though? Uh, they're obviously thinking about it for quite some time. I think <sighs> I love the progression that we saw at the end. I like how critical it was, and I like that he put it all on the line. I just am wondering about those, those first two floaters they were just... Well, the judges liked it. 603, best wave of the heat so far. Interesting. So Interesting. I think it was a slightly bigger wall. Yeah. Uh, I think that really worked in his favour. And Kayo has really narrowed the requirement now. He's right back in this heat. 5.73 is what he's after now. Rio on the outside. That'll bring him back to life. He'll be thinking, uh-oh. Got to, got to replace this 5.83 and make life really difficult for Abelli in the final stages of this heat. He wants to get back into a quarterfinal position. As he loads up, he's got some speed. Just sizing up his options here. Attacks the lip. Drives off the bottom. Big section here. Nice swoop off the top. As Rio finishes this one off on the inside. And that is feeling like the strongest number in the heat so far. Really great timing on that big front side. Rip through the pocket, Felicity. And, uh, yeah, I can see... This, uh, this going pretty high on the scale. Uh, I agree. That, that first combo was beautiful. It was super clean as well this way. Like, once he gets past this section, drops down here, goes to the lip, and then is able to really lay that board on rail. Could really, that was really well surfed. I really liked that wave. I'm just interested to see where it's going to go compared to this 
uh, 0-3 that Kaio just dropped. I think he is going to better his situation, and now that just leaves Kaio at the back with priority. As we watch that turn there, it was just super critical. It's kind of like he had to change his mind halfway through, went up to hit the lip, changed it to a floater, comes around this section, and, well, it was just a textbook carve. Remember, these competitors are trying to slot these counting moves in between pretty hectic lumps of chop. And uh, he did really well there. So the numbers starting to roll through. Looking pretty solid. But Kaya's going to get a, a shot at hitting back here. Climbs up on the foam. And now Ooh. drift in the tail. This wave standing up nicely oh. for the Brazilian. Oh. oh, as he just gets a little bog down there. And it just threw his flow off for a big finish there. And there's only 50 seconds to go. 6.37 was the score for Rio. Best number for him. Kaya needed a, needs a 6.28 now. Oh, I, got a th I think, yeah, Kaya bobbled at the end of that wave, but I think there was a bauble at the very beginning that kind of got a little bit hung up on that first turn, and it sort of the first turn, and it sort of got him out of rhythm for the rest of the wave. Everything was just slightly off as we see Rio. Yeah, it's been a, a <laughs> pretty close heat considering. I mean, tough oh. sections to read. Kaya was doing his best with that one, but. You know, he, he kind of really likes to lay his board deep on rail as he drives up into the lip. Rio pivots a little more quickly, sort of between the chops mm. to get to those sections. So it's not as rail to rail, rail for Rio. And it's kind of worked in these conditions, his approach. Yeah, for sure. I think he's just had a better read on selection too. I also liked his approach. He stayed super busy throughout that heat. It was really important. Glen Micro Hall with his daughter Zara there, great young surfer on the Rip Curl team. Oh, that one's got a sting. Yeah, tough one for Kayo, but he, you know, he definitely recaptured a, a little bit of form in this event. Didn't happen for him in this heat. As we see the, the replay of that last ride, you're right, got a little sticky there on that first move. Recovered well on the second, but sort of fell apart here on the end. Oh, just. And he knows it too, just quick get out of there. But yeah, it's just unfortunate that that was just, I feel like it almost to him and he's chasing that 6.28. It could have almost been it, but I just lost that little bit of rhythm at the very beginning. And I feel like from that moment onwards, everything else was just feeling a little bit disjointed. Well, Kyle will have a, a big job ahead of him, looking to stitch up a, a place in the top 22 and save his spot on the championship tour at stop number five, the Margaret River Pro. But Rio Aida, he has equaled his best finish in a CT event and he's not done yet. He is into the quarterfinals. And he is absolutely buzzing. So he should be. Stick around, we've got the WSL post show coming up with Joe, Richie and Vaughan stepping in to bring you all the highlights from today.
You are watching the WSL Post Show here for the Rip Curl Pro Bells Beach presented by Bon Soy. A beautiful sunset here on Easter Saturday and a massive day of competition finishing up the round of 32, finishing up the round of 16 and we've set up some big quarterfinal heats and we had an incredible Victorian crowd here on hand on the bluffs. They even got to sneak down to the steps on Winky Pop on the lower tide this morning as we look at the vacated Bell's Bowl. It's been a quiet sight, but a lot of incredible free surfs went down, including Steph Gilmore, who was out there, said she had a blast at the High Tide Rincon. Thanks for being with us. A lot to talk about today. Joe Trapel, Richie Lovett, Vaughn Blakey. Thanks for being with us. Uh, Rich, how was your day? Uh, it was long, Joe, yeah, <laughs> but it was really, it, really cool. And I'll tell you why, because the men did not disappoint. They produced some amazing performances. Mm. The surfing was incredible. You know, small winky pop. It's rippable. And uh, they, they just produced all day long. It was super exciting. You see a bit of everything, don't you? Winky pop this yeah. size, Vaughn, especially progression, airs, backhand. They look great. Everyone, you know, put in big performances. Yeah, yeah. There was some tricky heats, man. Like, it wasn't just smooth sailing. The surf was far from pumping. But as you say, you know, there's little cupped out sections the goofs could really square up on. We saw Kyle Houseman put in some great performances today. And then when you did see Clean Wall, you saw guys like Morgan Siblick. Yep. Uh, oh, there was many, many performances that stood out. But, you know, there was some good searing frontside cutties. Griffin Colapinto, of course, in the gold leaders, yep. leaders jersey just... He put on a show, too. Gosh, and a brilliant performance on Dark. That last heat of the day, Rio Waida into the quarterfinals. Rio's going to chat with Laura now. Yes, guys, Rio, you got down here before the sun rose this morning. You went out for an early surf. You've been down at the beach all day, and you've just made it through the quarterfinals after the sun set. How are you taking this all in right now? Oh, uh, man, I'm just really grateful to be in Australia. It's, today was not a beautiful day. The sunrise was beautiful and the sunset was beautiful. And uh, it was busy everywhere at parking and everywhere. And uh, just feel that energy and be grateful to be here. And uh, I'm happy, you know, there's an uh, Indonesian here. You know, I'm really happy to have them to can support me. So I'm really grateful to be here and, uh, you know, just really, you know, take that energy and keep working hard and keep moving forward. Two amazing performances today from you. You're into your first ever quarterfinal here at Bells. You have jumped up the ratings a lot right now. <laughs> How you're in 13th place on the ratings. Eight spots you've jumped today. So amazing work done here at Bells Beach. You know, what a year. Uh, yeah, well, first thing, I, I came here early and I saw the waves and then I was like, Oh, this is my wave. <laughs> I knew it's gonna suit me, and uh, and there's a uh, if there's opportunity for me, and take that advantage, and uh, and serve my best, and uh, really thankful to have my team here, you know, to make me feel comfortable. But you know, it's been really stressing with the cut and stuff. I start the year with the uh, was it 25th or something? That is the worst result, and then start thinking about cut and then stressing and stressing but at the same time because of that early loss at pipe makes me want to work harder and uh, push myself and also trust trust how much trust and believe how much i i work hard during the off season so and uh you know there's a lot and i'm really grateful to be here yeah. oh well it's showing rio we can't wait to see what you into finals day let's all get home and get some rest hey eh? <laughs> thank you i'm so hungry <laughs> <laughs> me too <laughs> back to you guys <laughs> yeah starving well done after all that surfing think about what rio accomplished today not just moving up the rankings in a significant fashion, but getting past a Bell's champ at Italo uh, earlier today, getting past Kayo, who's made the final out here. You'd, for Kayo and Italo, this is uh, one of their pet events. So he should be really proud and should sleep well tonight heading into finals yeah, day. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, n not for a second should that man think that he doesn't belong on the world tour. His surfing is coming in leaps and bounds. You know, he, he deserves to be here and you can see the progression. He's starting to believe that himself and that's translating in, into the performances he's giving. This wave is tailor-made for him. You know, we may see Rio Waida ring this bell. Wow, how about that? Big one for Indonesia as they have Rio Waida into the quarterfinals. So many special stories, but one watching Kelly Slater walk down the staircase at Winky Pop, whether it be bells, you're just filled with memories from him competing here now for 28 times, Vano. Oh, it's unbelievable. And um, 
you know, we've said it throughout the course of this event, but Kelly Slater, he's just always a draw card. Big crowds down here today who had just swelled like car park, but he had his hands full here with Baron Mamiya. Baron Mamiya looked really smooth with his decision making, got into the six range, and I think for Kelly it came down to a significant fall when he went for that layback hack. Rich, that might have been a big difference. Yeah, there. absolutely. If there was a moment, this is it for sure, when Kelly just uh, couldn't quite finish off the wave. And, uh, you know, he'll probably be reliving that one in his mind tonight, just thinking if I just kept the nose oh, of the board out, that for could, sure. could have been a completely different scenario and, and perhaps could be into the quarterfinals now. So, you know, you, the one good thing is that he can take away from this that he, his performance has risen in this event. Uh, you know, he's getting back into form and uh, that's, uh, well, danger signs if he continues on on the tour. But Baron surfed really well. It was kind of scrappy at the start and then he found this magical wave here and uh, some of the best surfing from Baron all day. And uh, you know, that real front-footed forward style, a uh, little bit of that wider stance, and he got it done on this wave. Rapid fire maneuvers all the way and got to the finish. Got his first win off Kelly in his career as they shook hands. Micro is happy to be in his corner for this one, and Kalani was there standing by, just glowing. Just being here in Australia, happy for that. But yeah, you know Kelly's determination. He wanted to break the record that he shares with Fanning and Mark Richards. This one ending just a little bit too quickly for everyone who's hoping that Kelly would get a chance to ring the bell once again. Uh, I know Vaughn's had a lot of great chats with Kelly over so many wonderful years. Earlier, Vaughn caught up with Kelly after that heat. Kelly Slater, thanks for uh, joining us. Um, Mate, before we get into the heat, uh, fourth decade competing at the elite level. Um, so many famous wins all around the world. Four of them here, famous ones mm. at Bells. Mm. Uh, coming down here, still a magic experience for you? Yeah, it's been fun. Uh, this is, you know, this is likely my last one. If I don't win, if I don't win at Margaret's, this will be my last Bells. So we'll see what the uh, future brings. But I, I, I can guarantee I'm going to get very barreled soon. Yeah. Yeah, but um, I'll enjoy, I'll enjoy Margaret's for what it is, and it. I'm not going to try to push him too much, but it looks like a good box well to start the contest. That's what I was going to say, Did man. Get some box. High tide all day yeah. and, and uh, good, good direction. Wow. That was a tease right there. That was just getting started, Vaughn. What did you guys talk about? I guess we'll see the rest of it on WorldSurfLeague.com, but he seemed to be in a good place post-loss. We're going to fix your mic in just a sec, Vano. But yeah, he was uh, talking about how he was breaking things down and and really patient with his time for just the, the chat and the interview. Uh, Kelly, uh, you know, he's looking differently these these days about just walking down the steps and trying to say hi to people that he's known here for, you know, the last 30 years. There's a vibe of reflection going on with Kelly, no doubt about it. And, you know, Maybe this is the last Bells that he's ever going to compete in, but he, he's certainly soaking it all in. There doesn't seem to be any sort of kind of bitterness or, or you know, longing to just, oh, I have to win. Uh, it's more of reflection and enjoyment and, and, and feeling the energy of, of the fans and the moment. And uh, I just think it's awesome that he's actually committed to going to WA because oh. we get to see him in one more event at least. Best news, best news. Kelly's going to WA. We love that. That brings us to the Boost Mobile heat of the day. So many heats to choose from. So this one really standing out today from the round of 32 all the way through the round of 16. Hard to pick, but when you look at the defending Bells champ and Liam O'Brien, the way they pushed each other in this one, Rich, was just insane. Yeah, it was uh, one surfer was just busy all heat long, just getting a ton of waves. But this man here, he only needed a couple, and Jeezy picked the eyes out of it, taking the two best rides and going to town on them. Liam, a valiant effort, some great surfing, some radical maneuvers, really showing good variety on a lot of his waves. You can see, uh, oh, well, we saw Ethan in the background there just going, oh, yeah, I'm checking you out on these little insiders <laughs> while I take the bigger, better waves out the back. Have a look at this. So Ethan just surfing with all that power, all that speed, total control as he goes through each and every one of these maneuvers, just showing flair and getting to the finish. Super strong, just so compact and efficient in his style. 
Uh, and the way that he's going about the heats as well, not expelling any extra energy by taking unnecessary waves. Oh, that turn was so rad. And then throws down another version of a power oh, carve man. and a tail release. Loved every bit of that. Liam O'Brien seven point ride through a 7-3-3 as well with a loss to Ethan Ewing. And Liam still leads in one-on-one -on -one matchups over Ewing. It's now 3-2 as this will be a rad Aussie rivalry. But Ewing still in an insane position to go potentially back to back as he's in the quarterfinals now. Yeah, it's um, well, it, it's a really interesting quarterfinal draw, and obviously Ethan Ewing, uh, last year's winner, still in the draw, and now we have a look at some of these matchups. Dude, checking out the Bailey Ladders bracket for final series set. Siblick, Matthew McGillivray, two good friends going head to head. Siblick, a wild card this time at Bells, then the Ewing Cole Hauschman matchup is is heavy, powerful, goofy foot, all focused on the cut. Uh, Griffin Cole Pinto getting past his brother Cross, all California. He's known Jake almost his whole life. And then Cade was clutched this evening. He takes on Rio White. Uh, so many different storylines in the mix there. Yeah, plenty going on, but certainly a lot of stars and stripes uh, in that uh, bracket there. So. You know, it's it's interesting. Normally, you know, bells can be reserved for the for the more sort of distinguished, uh, you know, legends of the of the tour. But we've got some newness in this mix here, and, and I think it's really exciting. Uh, we're set up perfectly for what could be a final day. Yeah, looking like uh, some options as well when we look at tomorrow, Easter Sunday. Um, also some talk about Wednesday, Thursday. Let's dive into a little bit closer with the Surfline forecast uh, showing that we'll see maybe a little bit of a drop tomorrow, but with some potential for a finals day. Richie, what are you thinking? Uh, to, there's every chance that we could run tomorrow. We've got that uh, that swell that's that we've seen and experienced all day long today. There was great lines and there was very very, very contestable waves all day long today. So really the swell size is gonna maintain through tomorrow. It's only the period that drops down. And then we have this new swell on hand, uh, which starts to pick up through Wednesday, which is really exciting. We're keeping an eye on it. Uh, the next few days, Monday, Tuesday, in between that eh, is looking a little bit dodgy and, and some bad weather, but certainly Wednesday, Thursday, a good possibility if we don't get underway again tomorrow. But we'll be down here bright and early uh, because conditions will be nice. Nice. That's right. Big thanks to Surfline. We've had Hugh around too, one of the lead forecasters from Australia, giving us the insights. So, yeah, we'll be up at dark. Renato Hickel said, hey, we're going to be looking at Winky Pop. We're looking at Rincon. We're looking at Bell's Bowl uh, for that potential finals day quarter set for the men and women. So, we have a lot to look forward to when we think about crowning our champions. Will it be Ethan's story of going back to back, or will we have kind of a fresh start with a new winner? You know, we know we're getting that on the women's side. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, they're all really cool storylines. And, you know, this trophy here, the, all our quarterfinalists will be starting to think. They'll be starting to just imagine what it would be like to ring that bell, you know. And you, you really, until you get to the quarterfinals as a competitor, you can't afford to give yourself that luxury of starting to think, I might actually win this thing. So now they can start to manifest that and start to think about it. Now it's time for the BioGland Daily Dose as we focus on the top five moments of the day. And a great list because we had so many great moments. This man from Newcastle, former number five in the world, fell off tour and he showed the world that he's ready to be right back in it on the top three. Oh, court. geez, he's surfing good. He's back. Morgs is back after a little hiatus there. And uh, he's been putting in the hard work and he's got a good little posse down here with all these mates. Uh, traveling with his Aussie brethren, brethren and uh, well, the performances like that, that's what we saw in that breakout year from Morgan and uh, he's got nothing to lose in this event. And number four on the list, Vaughn Cade makes his first quarterfinal. Yep, the, <laughs> yeah, the big fella's at it and uh, he's having a wonderful roll throughout this event. So stoked to see him just find some opportunities to really bring that power game to the fore. Uh, he was spectacular today. Did so well. Member had John John Florence, and John's won this event. He's so powerful, Vaughn, man. That's a huge win. Maybe the biggest of his career. Oh, easily the biggest of his career. And, uh, you know, John looked on, too. He Didn't looked he? so sharp. I thought, wow, he's just throwing air revs at, at will. And then also, Cade, getting past Yago Doravon as well. He was on a hot streak. I was down on the rocks for this heat, and uh, Yago really did throw everything at Cade here. But... Uh, Again, it was wave selection. He just got the big ones that mattered. 
He found a uh, good tempo with this wave and Winky and him, he, he feels at home out here. He just feels like there's a, a bit of a Californian feel to these waves and right on dusk in the shade of the cliffs, he gets the big pat on the back from the 2%. Making number three, Ethan Ewing, excellence. Yeah, well, it's just a, a completely polished display from Ethan Ewing, pretty much picking up where he left off last year. And uh, this is the type of performance that we've uh, come to expect from him. You know, he, he's matured in the way he competes uh, and his surfing just keeps be getting better and better. The power, he keeps tapping into it. Uh, and then he puts this radical edge on top of it and it's, uh, it's a pleasure to watch. So easy to watch him surf. It's like squeezy, squeezing honey in your eyes. I think that's the same. That'll, that'll do. <laughs> that'll do. Number two, Cole Hausman still causing major upsets throughout the day today, Vaughn. This was a massive heat, wasn't it? Uh, again, I was down on the rocks, and it's a really different experience watching it live. You know, uh, Medina and Cole, there was not a whole lot of size difference in these sets. So, you know, I know that there was some argument that waves were slightly bigger or smaller, but when you were down there, the biggest wave and the smallest wave, there was not that much difference between them. And Cole was bashing it, mate. He really did get to get upside down and throw up plenty of spray. And yeah, we saw uh, Medina's reaction, but Cole has had a very good run through this event and he backed it up the Savo with a really impressive performance. One of the biggest scores of the day. That big eight ranger was unbelievable. Yeah, it was incredible. And uh, you know, he, see his asset, along with Cade and a few of these bigger guys like Crosby, they've got this size and they're actually using it to their advantage. They're utilizing all that power and it's translating into giant turns and we know that the judges love that sort of surfing. And taking the win, number one was that brother battle and this was one of the best parts of it. How entertaining was that start for? Oh, well, I mean, yeah, sadly that was probably the most entertaining bit other than this <laughs> one wave that uh, Griffin got where he really got to, you know, I guess throw a little bit of brotherly flex. Uh, we call that like a crow peck in our family. <laughs> Just, uh, you know, making cross. But he never really got the opportunity to, to showcase what he's made of. And uh, unfortunately, this wave, this heat was wave staff. So, you know, it was the composure of the world number one that got the job done. Yep. You, you tell them they're on the rocks, they're on the bluff, and Laura's interviewing them, and they're still just like, it's not over yet. They just were like, still like, let us back out there. Give us another hour. I mean, I can't wait to see them in pumping conditions to go head to head. And you could really pick any venue on the calendar where it would be a, an incredible show. Yeah, absolutely. They're both so capable in, in any sort of conditions. And I mean, this is going to be the first of many matchups that the Kohler brothers are going to have and can't wait for the next one. Can we start picking a winner? Can't, are Ooh. we there yet, Vaughn? Is there anyone standing out, men or women? Uh, or is there one take for you? Yeah. Yeah, well, it's, uh, in the men's, it's Ethan Ewing all day long. He, his heat, I was watching it from the cliffs, and he honestly looked two foot bigger and wider than every other surfer today. And that's, you know, taking into consideration the big units, Cade and Cole. He just, uh, far out, the speed he generates, the distance he covers, the amount of water he's thrown around, he is absolutely the favorite for uh, a second bill. Yeah, I guess sticking with the men as well. That's what we saw all day today. Richie, is there, are you going to agree or disagree with Vondo there? Uh, no, absolutely. I'm going to agree with him. And I, I feel like the experience of both Ethan and uh, Griffin are going to be hard to, to, to kind of, you know, get up over. Uh, I think those guys could potentially meet in the final as well. So that's setting up well, but just something inside me, having been an underdog, kind of wants to see an underdog victory this time around. Yeah, and all the, the past champions on the women side are all out of the draw which is is kind of fresh we're gonna have a new champion this year uh, from some powerful surfers there's the Gabby Bryan Betty Lou kind of showdown uh, Sawyer Limblad still in the mix a lot of cool stories there as well Vaughn for sure but I I've got the feeling that we're gonna see the world champ step up you know she has never yeah. rung the bell uh, she is building beautifully into this year now and she actually did put on probably the best backhand performance we've seen in this event so far with a couple of eights in her last round. So, yeah, Carolyn Marks, I think. They call her Caralupo for good reason, Rich. <laughs> if they do, and uh, <laughs> for the sake of the discussion, I, I, I agree with you, but I'm going to disagree with you as Thank well. You. Uh, my picks at the start of the event were, were Betty Lou and also uh, Gabrielle O'Brien, and they're both in the mix. So uh, out of the two, you know, flip a coin, I'll, I'll go with Betty Lou. There we go. Make your picks around the world and be checking in with us early in the morning, 7.45 local time on Easter Sunday here in Australia for a quick start for potentially finals day and crowning our champions. We'll leave you with some highlights and we'll see you bright and early. Take care.
This copyrighted event broadcast is produced by the World Surf League for broadcast around the world and may not be retransmitted, reproduced, rebroadcast, or otherwise distributed or used in any form without the written consent of the World Surf League.